Chapter 181 Good Brother Ramon Single This is a large and lively looking city. Even more lively than Lion City. As we all know, if many people are willing to go to a city, it is either because it is safe enough and their personal and property can be protected, or it is chaotic enough there and they can find a lot of excitement. And Zingle is obviously the latter. There is a long row of tattered corpses hanging on the outer wall of the city, almost completely covered by dense flies. When the wind blows, a black mist will rise from the swaying corpses. The smell of rotting corpses and rotting vegetables fill the air, mixed with the smell of spices and opium in the market, forming a unique smell belonging to Singdal. Only the herbal stalls will reveal some exotic aromas from foreign countries that will make you dizzy after smelling them. Snack vendors fan their dirty straw hats and hawk meat skewers. The meat skewered on bamboo sticks was grilled on a stove fueled by cow and horse dung until it sizzled and shone with oil. However, the origin of this meat was quite suspicious. Bundles of silk were crowded on the counter. But blood stains could be seen on many of the satin surfaces. Most of the weapons dealers have used weapons. And basically every weapon has dark brown stains that cannot be washed away. Some Desha people, who were clearly outlaws at first sight, also openly sold their trophies in the market in single. Their trophies included chopped clothes, shoes and hats, deformed gold and silver jewelry, and even some with clear patterns, chapter shield and armor. Drug dealers set up pipes and straw mats directly on the street. Many drug addicts were lying on their sides on the straw mats and puffing in public. Moreover, there seemed to be people queuing up neatly next to the straw mats. This was probably the reason for the whole chaos. The most orderly scene you can see in the bustling market. In the middle of the market is a huge exhibition stand, on which the slave traders are waving their whips to display their wares. Some young men and women with their hands and feet bound are all naked. Every part of their bodies is inspected by the customers on the stand. From time to time, the dealers would open the slave's mouth to show the teeth. Of course, the slaves sold publicly were all low in goods. Next to the slave booth was the livestock market where horses and donkeys were sold. The sales process on both sides looked exactly the same. There were quite a few customers entering the market, but most of the locals with white cloths on their heads covered their wallets tightly and put their hands on the hilts of their swords, as if they were always guarding their backs. And customers from out of town wished them good luck. Anyway, the seemingly harmless urchins around are waiting for the opportunity. Occasionally, they will accidentally reveal some suspicious gadgets and small blades used to cut wallets from their sleeves. In addition to the market, the streets and alleys are also filled with people of all walks of life. There are members of the knights who still wear black armor and horn helmets on hot days. Snake cult warriors dressed in green viper costumes. There are also pagans wearing brown cloaks. Warriors carrying long-handled knives. And men in black playing with daggers. These various people look very different. The only thing they have in common is that they all have the same dangerous look. The kind of dangerous look that only thugs who have been killing people and setting fires for a long time have. These heretics and murderers walked freely in the streets, while the guards in the city wearing pointed helmets and wielding spears completely turned a blind eye to them. There are many tall courtyards on the street, which seem to be the headquarters of various organizations, but there are almost no door guards. Probably no one would dare to stay in front of these courtyards. Even the guards in the city have avoided the entrances of those courtyards. The murder deeds were posted publicly in various taverns in single, and some were posted outside the doors of some taverns. From time to time, People would take a look, but most of them would leave quickly. Maybe they were just checking to see if their names appeared on the wall. In the more dilapidated alleys in the city, dirty wild dogs and young orphans are fighting among the garbage. Some members of the Red Brotherhood are pointing nearby. They are recruiting members from these young children. Some stricken women stood at the door of low, dark houses wearing colorful and revealing skirts, providing special services for a few coins. Most of them wore veils probably to cover up some traces of pain and disease. The prophets, in tattered robes, were also preaching in the alley about the benefits of believing in cults. Behind them, in the small temple that was even more tattered than the robes, human sacrifices were being carried out openly. Fire and blood might indeed bring them success. Some believers, only those who appear to be mad at first glance can navigate these mean streets without hindrance. Their madness may be caused by contact with gods, or it may be caused by poison. But no matter what, only madmen are inviolable. The moans of lame beggars. The greasy cries of vendors. The melodious calls of prostitutes soliciting customers. The whimpers and barks of wild dogs after being kicked. The angry roars of victims. And the chants of priests in various accents. All this constitutes a symphony called, single. 
disharmonious, but very free. In the very center of single, a tambourine sound with an unknown rhythm drives the heartbeat of the city. But the center of the city is not the castle of the city lord, but a luxurious building that is taller than the castle. The lord of Sinjar was named Tahir, a caliph. Although he nominally served Bahad Khan, Kadin, his service was more or less limited to periodically trying to issue new orders in the city and nailing outlaws to the city walls. The stench of rotting corpses even spread to the wealthy areas of the town. But as long as Tahir continued to deliver sacrifices on time, Kadin Khan rarely interfered with Sinjar's affairs because he knew that even if he sent out troops, it would be impossible to conquer the forces in Sinjar's city. In fact, most Pender people believe that Singal is not so much the territory of the Principality of Desha, but a free territory outside of order and morality, because the orders and laws promulgated by Kadin Khan and Caliph Tahir only served to provide some topics for residents to chat. The power and justice of this city were entirely determined by dinars. In this city, the person with the most dinars is not the city lord Tahir, but a slave trader named Ramon. Therefore, Ramon is the messenger of justice in this city and also Xion. Gal's true words matter. Frau's slave catching team traveled thousands of miles to the Noldor forest to commit crimes because of a reward. The person who issued the reward was Ramon. Ramon is quite famous. In fact, the name Ramon is even more famous than the ruler of the Desha principality. Bahad Khan, Kadin, because he is the largest slave trader in Sinjar and the largest slave trader and ransom broker in the entire Pender continent. In other words, he is the spokesperson for all slave traders in Sinjar. Even Leong is familiar with the name Ramon. Whether in his previous life or now, Ramon's nickname is Good Brother. In previous lives, players would use this nickname when joking because players would sell prisoners to him after they got them and they met Ramon the most. But after arriving in Pendor, Leon discovered a wonderful coincidence that Ramon actually had the nickname Good Brother. But this is not because he has anything to do with the Brotherhood. In fact, Ramon is not a member of the Red Brotherhood, but his slave trading business is more successful than all Red Brotherhood agents. He made single slave market the first choice for buying slaves in the entire continent, and was the recognized leader of all slave traders in single. Ramon can get the nickname, Good Brother, mainly because he is good at making friends with people. Those who ignore his friendship and are unwilling to regard him as a good brother usually become a good brother after a long time. Slaves were sold or disappeared mysteriously. Well, it is also possible to be found. Such as a swollen corpse on the lake behind Single. Five of Single's first six judges were found on the lake this way. The last judge resolutely executed the fairest Single-style justice, which is determined by the number of dinar stuffed into his hand. Therefore, this judge has been peacefully serving as a judge of justice for several years. After becoming Ramon's good brother, life was quite smooth. Therefore, Ramon must be a good brother. All Sinjar people admit this, including the city lord Tahir. That luxurious building, taller than Tahir's castle, was Ramon's property. It looked like a luxury hotel. Perhaps that is indeed the most luxurious hotel in the entire Pinder continent. After all, this large building covering an area of nearly 10 acres has six floors above the ground alone and provides 300 luxurious suites. Enough to accommodate thousands of people comfortably. But in fact, the real body of the building is below the ground. There are three floors underground, each with different secret rooms. That is Ramon Slave Auction House. Unlike the low-end slave booths in the single market, this is the only place in the continent where top quality goods can be sold, such as those noble girls with noble blood, or those with beautiful faces, not many girls. Right now, Ramon was in a small luxurious secret room, handing a glass of wine to a middle-aged man wearing a noble robe. On the stage behind him, there were some girls wearing veils or just veils, playing tambourines with a cheerful rhythm. Good brother, are you sure that Frost can really get the older noble girl back? This man in noble robes was in his forties or fifties. He was burly and greasy, but his face was covered with a golden beard and his hair was also golden. He was obviously not from Dexia. There were two hot and scantily clad women sitting on his left and right, posing but he didn't seem to be interested in the women next to him at the moment. He only took a sip of wine and put the cup on the table. I just got the news from him half an hour ago. He has already succeeded. After all, he has obtained Odo girls a few years ago. I miss that auction very much. Ramon shook the red liquid in the cup and seemed to be nostalgic for the past. 
That is the famous work that made your auction house famous. Of course I know it. But they are just three elven girls. Not an older nobles. What I need are noble girls. You also know that letting an army come from it was not easy to pass through the kingdom. And I took a lot of risks. The greasy noble reached out and pushed away the woman next to him, who picked up the wine glass and intended to put it to his mouth. Ramon shook his hand holding the wine glass. And the two women left in a wise manner. Alfred, my friend, you have to believe in the power of dinars. Although Fruzi is a shameless bastard. As long as there are enough dinars in front of him, he will definitely be able to bring back the goods you need. Ramon seemed quite confident in Frau's slave-catching group. In other words, there is confidence in Dinar. He raised his glass to Elfried as a sign of inviting him to drink. But, when will he get the goods back? Good brother, I don't have much time. Alfred looked anxious and picked up the wine glass, but did not drink it. To be honest, Elfried, I don't understand. Why are you so anxious? And why would a noble like you spend such a high price to buy a slave? Ramon shook his head and smiled. I can see that you don't like beauty. Good brother. I'm just not interested in vulgar powder. I'm still very interested in an older else. Alfred shook his head and smiled. His eyes a little wary. Alfred, it seems that you don't trust me. I have the most beautiful women in the entire continent. But you haven't even looked at them. And what you want is an older noble. If the girl is just to get the Nolder elves, then any Nolder girl is the same. Why do you only want noble girls? Ramon put away his smile, stood up, came closer to Elfride, and said word for word, Friend, you don't want to continue to be brothers with me, do you? Alfred's face twitched a few times, but then he laughed. Good brother, don't be ridiculous. The drums here are so loud, I can hardly hear your voice. Ramon also smiled and waved, and all the girls wearing veils, who were playing tambourines behind him left the secret room. There are only two of us now. Elfried, tell me the real reason. I know you are definitely not the final buyer. Ramon took the wine bottle skillfully and filled the cup held by Elfried with wine. Well, to be honest, I want to offer the Nolder noble girl to the king. My king wants it. TSK, this wine is really good. The good brother poured the wine himself. And of course Alfred couldn't refuse. He picked it up and took a sip. Then he probably felt that it was indeed delicious. And took another sip. Dedicated to the king? You mean Ulrich? No wonder there are so many mercenary groups entering the Nolder forest. I thought your Lion Kingdom hired so many mercenary groups to annihilate a certain Nolder group. Ramon was also obviously surprised. Why would Ulrich want to get an elf noble girl? It can't be for the purpose of marrying an elf. Right. Humph. The king doesn't need to report to me. Alfred shook his head. It seemed that he didn't want to reveal any secrets. But there was a trace of ferocity on his face. Dead account con I'll play. Ramon frowned. And then quickly responded. King Ulrich blackmailed you? Is it to get enough dinars to recruit a mercenary group? Your castle of Keladin has been quite wealthy in recent years. It's normal for the king to come to borrow money. It's not about borrowing money. But to blackmail Ulrich into knowing that I sold the civilians in the territory to single as slaves. He used this to blackmail me and asked me to pay 100,000 dinars. Otherwise, I will not only lose my title and territory, and reputation will be ruined. Alfred said through gritted teeth. And after speaking, he picked up the wine glass, and drank it in one gulp. Then you still plan to fulfill the king's wish? I don't think you are such a magnanimous person. Ramon shook his head, with a smile on his lips again, picked up the wine bottle, and poured another glass for Elfride. Fulfill his wish? Ha ha ha. Ramon? Good brother, I paid to buy it from you. Of course to sell it to him at a higher price. I have to earn back the money he extorted. You have to. Hiccup. Give me a higher status. Alfred picked up the wine glass. Looked at it. Burked. Then raised his eyebrows and drank another glass. Apparently, the drink was really good. Even addictive. And Alfred seemed a little confused. Ramon frowned. I can understand that you want to resell the business and make a profit. But... An older noble girl can ask Ulrich to give you a higher status? He is not that kind of person. Right. What's the reason? Because the virgin of the Nolder nobles. Hiccup. The virgin's blood can cure the king's disease. If I can get the Nolder noble maiden, I can. Hiccup. In turn blackmail you are. Rick. Alfred seemed a little crazy and started talking about everything. Ramon had a deep smile on his face and his voice became softer. Then... The king must be willing to pay a lot of money. 
Alfred tilted his lips and showed a strange smile. A pure nolder noble girl. Hiccup. Three hundred thousand dinars. He fell crookedly, and the wine glass fell to the ground. The red liquid spilled from the cup onto the carpet, but dyed the originally red carpet into blue-gray. This is definitely not wine. Probably some kind of hallucinogen. Ramon smiled and looked at Alfred, who was lying on the ground in a state of intoxication, and shook his head. Since you are making so much money, how can I let you make this difference? Good brother. He exhaled and clapped his hands twice. Hearing Ramon's high five, several men in black appeared at the door of the secret room. Sir Ramon, a man in black who looked like a little boss came in with his head lowered. It seemed that they were both respectful and fearful of Ramon. The little boss didn't even dare to raise his head when he spoke to Ramon. Throw this bear into the auction house. Notify Castle Keladin and ask them to redeem him for 10,000 dinars. Let all the brothers gather together and let's go to greet that batch of expensive goods dot according to Fra's habit. He should bring a small team of people back first. Right. Ha uh ha. -huh. Chapter 182 The Beacon on the Border The Lord led the team to run through the night. One man and two horses. And arrived at a place he was very familiar with as quickly as possible. Near Chicha Fortress. This is the place where Leon led the merchants to make a fortune. Now south of the Sava River. The hilltop where the Double Eleven Trade Fair was once held belongs to the Kingdom of the Lion. Since Sir Lehman took charge of the Chicha Fortress. He deployed some fortifications on both sides of the Sava River. In this way, he completely controlled the section of the Sava River near the Chicha Fortress and controlled the bridges on the river. They even started to collect bridge tax and boat tax. Of course, these are all privately added taxes and not very legal. However, the lords these days rely on mountains and rivers to survive. Of course, they have to collect some tolls if they rely on rivers and bridges. Besides, Chicha Fortress is a military fortress with few residents around it. Even military supplies can only be supplied by Lysher City. How can the soldiers live without trying to make some money? Therefore, a makeshift, toll station, was built at the bridge south of Chicha Fortress. Several rows of horses blocked the bridge, and a group of soldiers sat at the bridge, wielding their spears and yawning. Hey! Captain! It seems like a caravan is coming over there! There are at least twenty or thirty people! A soldier looked eastward twice and became excited. Not many people have been crossing the bridge recently. It's not easy to meet a caravan of dozens of people. Since tolls were collected, there are not many people on this road. Of course, there are advantages to not having many people passing by. At least it is good for defense. Which is a good thing for a military center like Chicha Fortress. But of course the soldiers at the Quoto Toll Station hope to have a few more people. They are on duty in rotation and the opportunity to guard the bridge is a benefit that only comes once a month. But they may not be able to cross the bridge. Maybe they are going to Lion City. One of the halberdiers, who was called the captain, stood up with his halberd and looked at it twice, and then suddenly became excited. Hey! Those seem to be single people. Huh? It seems we have income. It was a single horse team of more than 20 people, with several carriages covered with awnings. It looked like merchants from single, perhaps slave traders, because the riders looked like skilled warriors. But no matter what kind of business he is in, for the soldiers guarding the bridge, collecting tolls is the most important thing. The team of single people was indeed coming here, and it looked like they were going to cross the bridge. Stop! The halberdier led this group of fully armed infantry to stand behind the horse at the bridge. Ah, dot brothers, thank you for your hard work. We are merchants from single. The leader of the Sinjar people was a bearded warrior and he was the only one riding an armored hunting horse. The others were all light riders. It's the same for everyone dot the toll. Five dinars for everyone. The halberdier began to speak loudly. There were too few people passing by today, so he temporarily raised the price, which was a little outrageous. What? The bearded man had already started to touch his money bag to prepare a bribe. But when he heard the price, he was furious on the spot. Why don't you go and grab it? But just after he finished speaking, he changed his words. Damn it! You guys are robbing me openly. Huh? You don't want to live. You wild ass. Right. It just so happens that the large troops in our fortress haven't come out to suppress the bandits for a long time. The halberdier sneered and used the derogatory name that people from the Lion Realm used for the Dexia people. This bridge is indeed very close to Chicha Fortress. Only a few miles away. The bastion of Chicha Fortress can be seen with the naked eye from a distance. You guys are... The bearded man was originally very angry. 
but after looking back at Chicha Fortress, he suppressed his anger and began to search for the money bag. But there didn't seem to be much cash in his bag. After opening the bag and looking at it twice, the bearded man gritted his teeth and threw the bag directly to the halberdier. Take it all! Let us pass! The captain of the halberdier squeezed the money bag slowly. This is not enough. One, two, three. You twenty-four people. Get one hundred and twenty dinars. It seems that this halberdier is pretty good at math and can probably be considered a man of culture in this era. Hey! Don't go too far. You saw it too. This is all the money I have. The bearded man had already suppressed his anger, but now his hair is growing again. Don't you have more than twenty brothers? Ask them to help you. I don't believe that so many of you can't raise a mere 120 dinars. Judging from the meaning of this halberdier, it is obvious that he wants to drain all the oil and water out of this group of Sinjar people. The bearded man pursed his lips and looked around a few times, then turned around and went back to find his brothers. Captain, look behind him. Died is that the Nolder sword? The sharp eyed armored infantryman kept staring at the weapon on the bearded back and suddenly asked softly, It seems really. This is very valuable. The halberdier threw the money bag to his men and took two steps forward with his halberd. Hey! Stop! Put down your weapons! This is a military-controlled area! To be honest, this is really a military-controlled area. If someone intends to enter the territory of the Lion Kingdom from here, it is a normal requirement that they are not allowed to bring weapons into the country. But the problem is that they don't intend to enter the Lion Realm, but simply cross the bridge. They came from the Sanguang area in the east and planned to return to Dexia through this bridge. Therefore, as soon as the halberdier said these words, veins popped out on his beard and forehead, and he turned around and drew out the Nolder sigil sword from behind. But after his face twitched a few times, he actually looked at the sword in his hand, then slowly put the sword on the ground, spread his hands and took a step back. The halberdier smiled proudly, moved the horse in front of him, and stepped forward to pick up the sword. Can we go? The bearded man asked in front of him. Don't worry. What kind of cargo are you transporting? Are they slaves? The halberdier leaned over to pick up the sword and answered nonchalantly. It seemed that he was still thinking about how to squeeze out more oil and water. Dog yes. Slave. The bearded man took a step forward while talking. Boom. Just as the halberdier was squatting on the ground looking at the sword. Beard rushed up with a lunge and struck hard into the knee. This knee touched the halberdier's face sending him flying two meters. Then, he rolled over and picked up the sword on the ground. He knocked off the shoulder armor of the halberdier with one sword. But the blade stopped accurately at the neck of the halberdier. Now you are my cargo too. Slave! The bearded man spat aside and looked at the halberdier with a ferocious smile. Tie him up! The bearded man kicked the halberdier whose face was covered with blood after being hit by his knee to his own men and directly overturned the horse in front of him with his sword. The bridge deck is blocked by several rows of horses, which must be cleared first. Otherwise cars and horses will not be able to pass. The more than 20 Sinjar people also dismounted, took out their weapons, and rushed forward. The halberdier's mouth had been gagged, and his hands had been tied behind his back in a matter of seconds. The speed at which these single people tied people up was extremely astonishing. The dozen or so infantrymen looked at each other, a little at a loss. Are you going to war with the kingdom? An armored archer shouted. But the bearded man turned a deaf ear and continued to clean up the horse. Fire arrows! Block the bridge and light the beacon! The archer gritted his teeth and gave an order that was reasonable in the current situation, but had serious consequences. It seemed that this armored archer was probably the deputy captain of this team. Seven or eight armored infantrymen from the fierce lion realm blocked the bridge, and five or six archers also started shooting arrows. There were more than a dozen infantrymen in this group guarding the bridge. They were all elites stationed at the border. If they really wanted to fight, they actually wouldn't know how to do it. Coward. But they really didn't expect that these single people would really dare to attack them. After all, they are the regular army of the kingdom. Professional soldiers stationed in the border defense area of Chicha Fortress. Attacking them is tantamount to declaring war on the Lion Kingdom. The individual combat capabilities of Bearded's men are obviously much better than those of the Lion Realm soldiers. Those who appear to be single riders have actual combat capabilities that are definitely not lower than those of the knights on this continent. Moreover, all of these people use Nolder weapons, although the narrow place on the bridge obviously restricted the performance of these riders. In just a few minutes, the dozen or so infantrymen guarding the bridge all fell at the end of the bridge, but none of the single riders died. However, 
The beacon tower next to it has been burning brightly in these few minutes. And the raging black smoke is rising high in the air. The Chicha Fortress must have seen it. Quickly retreat! Seeing that smoke and dust seem to be rising in the direction of Chicha Fortress, Lu Xiao immediately left with his men quickly, not daring to waste any more time dealing with the corpses and beacons, and just took away the already tied halberdier. Those are his slaves. And strong halberdiers are also very valuable in single. Just ten minutes later, Li Ang's cavalry arrived here. The Lord stepped forward and looked at the corpses, then at the beacon that was still burning, and frowned. My lord dot this is the wound caused by the Nolder sword. This is the work of those Sinjar people. The blood is still hot. They are not far ahead. Windadier was now dressed as a human female explorer, with her helmet covering her long pointed ears. She has studied sword skills for 300 years and is very familiar with the Nolder sword. Windadier, I know this was done by the single slave catching team, but this is the border between the Lion Kingdom and the Bacchus Empire. You probably don't understand what it means when these garrison troops were killed and the beacons were lit. The Lord sighed deeply. They are declaring war on the Lion Kingdom. These Sinjar people will cause chaos in the world. Sir, there is no other way. We still have to pursue it immediately. But we can't take this road when we come back. Do we want to put out the beacon? Lisa Dillon understands this situation better. Countless troops will soon block this place. And it is likely to trigger a large-scale war. No. It will only make things worse if they are destroyed. Don't worry about it. Let's catch up with those single people first. Leon knew that he could not inform Chicha Fortress that this was done by the Sinjar people. Otherwise the Lysher Kingdom would have no choice but to declare war with the Dexia Principality. Facing the Bacchus Empire is already troublesome. And then declare war with Desha. Emperor Marius of the Bacchus Empire would definitely be very happy. It is estimated that White Deer Castle will have to face another bloody battle. He can't extinguish the beacon fire or do other extra things. Because the beacon fire Chicha Fortress here must have been seen long ago. If it is suddenly extinguished now, it will only lead to a greater misjudgment of killing and then not occupying the bridge. Only after extinguishing the beacon fire, it looked more like a large-scale enemy force setting up an ambush. Moreover, it is difficult for Leong to explain to the people of the Lion Kingdom why he is chasing those Sinjar people. He can't just say that he is trying to save Nuoduo. Right? Then Leong is not only treasonous, but may also be said to be treasonous to mankind. Just ignore it. There is really no time to waste now. Leon can only lead his troops to pursue them as soon as possible. Half an hour later, another team came to the bridge. This force is large and carries the red double lion flag. That was the Lion Knights led by Lehman. From seeing the beacon fire to completing the army preparations and rushing from Chicha Fortress to the bridge a few miles away, Lehman's troops only took 40 minutes. This was a very efficient way to lead troops. It took more than 10 minutes to put on armor. 20 minutes. Moreover, he brought with him more than 500 people, 100 Lion Knights and more than 400 Lion Followers, which were all the members of the Lion Knights left in Chicha Fortress. Lord Lehman, there is indeed no body in the river. Several white guys emerged from the smooth and clear Sava River. Sir, with the weight of the halberdier's equipment, if it falls into the river, it will definitely sink to the bottom. But there is nothing in the river. In other words, a beacon fire was lit here more than half an hour ago. The team guarding the bridge was all killed. And the leading halberdier was missing. Lehman looked at the corpse and muttered. Then stood up and gave the order. Send someone to send a message to Lion City. The enemy has invaded. Moreover, the enemy has captured a captain who knows the defense zone and passwords to serve as a guide. The situation is serious. Sir, do you think it was the Bacchus Empire that did this? A lion knight next to him asked. The wounds on the corpses were all caused by very sharp swords. This really looks like the style of the Bacchus Empire. Lehman shook his head, stood up and looked in the direction of the Bacchus Empire. In any case, we can only stay here to see the situation. Send an order to the surrounding towns to be on guard and search for any traces of suspicious characters. If you wait until if we don't find the enemy tomorrow, then we will cross the bridge and go to Bacchus territory just like the enemy. If the enemy wants to fight, then fight. Ha! Huh. Glory is my life. Lehman's Lion Knight shouted in unison. Near Turda Fortress, a group of men in black were silently marching northwest. About 300 people in total. Good brother, Ramon is among the team. His unit has no name and is unknown. Because those who can see this army have basically been reincarnated. Most of the Sinjar people today are Ramon's good brothers. 
and this unit has not been deployed in large numbers for two or three years. In fact, these men in black are not the army. They work for Ramon. They are employees of his large entertainment city in single that integrates hotels, casinos, auction houses, taverns, brothels, etc. Of course, the work content is not too fixed. Sometimes I have to bring tea and water. Sometimes I have to squeeze my shoulders and beat my back. Sometimes I have to stab people with a knife. And sometimes I have to dig holes and bury corpses. Before working for Ramon, these people had another identity. They were all slaves at the lowest level. The kind that are bought and sold like cattle in the Sinjar market. Either they are criminals who have lost their civil rights. Or they are prisoners of war who have not been redeemed. In any case, they are the kind of animals with no future at all. That is, untouchables, whose descendants can only be slaves. However, after they were bought by Ramon and became Ramon's good brothers, no one would treat them as slaves anymore. Ramon gave them new jobs and lives allowed them to get married and have children, and even allowed their children to receive education. Even the dead brothers, wives and children would still receive such care. This alone is enough to make them die for Ramon. As long as Ramon is alive, their wives and children will still be treated like normal civilians. The wife will not be reduced to selling her body in the alleys of Sinjar, and the children will not compete with wild dogs for food. Perhaps this is the true sense of the brotherhood. Although Ramon is not a good person, he is at least a good boss. Sir Ramon, Frau's convoy is in the valley ahead. A black cavalryman came to Ramon to report. Very well, Dot, go tell him that I'm here to pick him up. Ramon waved his hand and followed the cavalry into the valley alone. The men in black behind him consciously spread out and surrounded him in an arc. Not long after, Frau's, the bearded man from before, saw Ramon. Sir Ramon, why are you here? Are you here to greet me? Ha uh ha. -huh. That's such an honor. Fruz looked surprised. Ha! Huh? Shameless fellow. Have you got the goods I need? Ramon smiled and rode up to Frau's. Of course. I, Fruzy, will take action. When have I ever disappointed anyone? I can catch any slave. Perhaps thinking that meeting Ramon meant he was safe. Frau's looked quite proud. Let me see. You didn't waste these valuable goods. Did you? Ramon rode straight to the carriages pulled out a sword from the waist of one of Frau's riders, and cut off the ropes binding the tarpaulin. Of course Frau's riders recognized Ramon and cooperated by opening the tarp. The carriages in front and behind carried a lot of Nolder equipment, as well as a lion halberdier whose face was covered in blood. In the carriage in the middle, there were three Noduo female rangers who were gagged and tied into rice dumplings. One of the Noduo girls was wearing an exquisite headband and had purple eyes. We will not have trouble with the dinar. Sir Ramon, everyone knows that the price difference between girls and women is at least ten times. Fruzzy smiled even more proudly. This is a big harvest. I can probably retire and enjoy the blessings. That is a real Nolder noble girl. She is probably related to a certain elf king by blood. Chapter 183 Good Brothers Take a gamble. Ramon nodded and looked at the Nolder prisoner seriously, with a satisfied smile on his face. Well done. But, are you really planning to retire? Of course. I also want to be like you. Enjoying life with the girls at the auction house every day. I really didn't expect you to leave single. If you stayed in single, no one would dare to deal with you. But you came out yes? This is really a blessing. Fruzzy shook his head and smiled exaggeratedly. And drew his sword while laughing. There was no guard around Ramon now. Ramon? I have wanted your auction house for a long time. If these beauties are auctioned, I can get at least 300,000 dinars. Right. I also want to try to become a real master of single. By the way, can you tell me, where is your money, Lord Ramon? Ha ha ha. As Fruzzy spoke, he laughed again and again, because his sword was already on Ramon's neck like lightning. Then, he turned and motioned to a rider behind him to tie up Ramon. You really want to kill me, Fruzzy. You are such a shameless good brother. You say you will never get involved in selling, but in your heart you want everything. Ramon curled his lips, with a strange smile on his face. As expected of Ramon, he can still laugh at this moment. Ugh! Frau's proud smile suddenly froze on his face as if it had been cut off. And he turned his head and tried to look behind him, because the single rider behind him did not walk to Ramon, but suddenly drew his sword behind Fruzzy. This is a standard stab in the back. The Nolder sword pierced the back of Fora's heart, 
and the sharp sword tip pierced through his chest and was then pulled out. Blood spilled all over the floor. Frows turned around with a fierce look at his eyes and moved the long sword in his hand as if he was planning to cut Ramon's neck and kill him together. But his wrist was held by Ramon. And then the sword was easily dropped and fell into Ramon's hand. Ramon seems to be good at martial arts. And his skill should be pretty good. But he probably never showed it. Why, why? Fruzzi turned around and murmured to the Sinjar rider, whose sword blade was still dripping blood behind him. Why? Fruz, he is one of the villagers you kidnapped in Yaxing a few years ago. He was once a slave you sold to me. But you never recognized him. You are really his good brother. The smile on Ramon's face disappeared. Fruz, you are always seizing civilians as slaves. As a result, there are fewer and fewer villagers in the villages around Sinjar. And food is getting more and more expensive. You always kill those innocent travelers. As a result, there are fewer and fewer customers coming to single. You are always deceiving those nobles. And now there are more and more lords who are hostile to us. Sooner or later, your behavior will make single have nowhere to go. Since you plan to retire, then retire completely bar. Dot no dot then dot isn't it because you want to sell slaves dot that I caught slaves? Frows had lost his strength. He rolled over and fell from his horse. Lying on the ground. The sound coming from the pool of blood was painful and low. Yeah. I'm doing this shameful business. But I know there will be retribution. And I don't think innocent villagers are slaves. And you have already planned to kill me. Right? You bribed my brother. Arranged spies to monitor my whereabouts. And colluded with Caliph Tahir to deal with me. I know all this. You want to replace me? But do you think my brother will be bribed by you so easily? Fruzi's eyes widened and his expression became frightened and helpless. He wanted to say something else, but all he could make was a sizzling sound in his throat. The most important thing is that you never intended to be my good brother. I used to really treat you as a brother. Ramon looked down into his eyes and spoke the last words. Frows finally stopped moving and stared straight at the sky. He died when he was at his most contented. Fruzi's other men all looked on in panic, but they did not avenge their leader. In fact, they did not move at all because they were surrounded by more than 300 men in black. Lord Ramon, the single rider who stabbed Frizzy dropped his sword and knelt on the ground. Good brother, thank you for letting me take revenge with my own hands. But I beg you, please give these brothers a chance. He pointed to Fruz's other men. The single riders. Of course, as long as they don't attack me. They are still good brothers. Of course, I will give them a chance. Every good brother will definitely get a fair chance. Ramon took out three rather delicate dice and said to the single riders beside the carriage, Come on, brothers, come and gamble with me. If you win, you can freely decide your own destiny. Fate. But if you lose, you must accept the fate I have arranged for you. The twenty-two Sinjar riders looked at each other and slowly walked up to Ramon one by one. Ramon's bet seems to be fair and simple. It is a pure bet. And let these twenty-two people bet with him one by one. After a few minutes, the final results looked fair. Eleven people won and the other eleven lost. As for the losing riders, the fate Ramon gave them seemed very fair. He let the eleven winning riders decide their fate. As a result, the eleven losing riders died at the hands of their colleagues. Because those riders who won actually had no choice but to kill their colleagues and hand in the certificate of surrender. And then join Ramon's men and become Ramon's good brothers. This was the wisest thing to do. Perhaps this is the scary thing about Ramon. He left no enemies for himself. Nor did he let anyone think that he was cruel and ruthless. Everyone would even think that he did give the other party a chance. Whether he is his brother or his enemy, he will be considered fair and trustworthy and a good brother worth following. However, just as Ramon was about to return to Sinjar with his carriage, a cavalry force appeared from the other side of the ridge. Fruzi was delayed for a while at the bridge next to Chicha Fortress. And Ramon was delayed for a while because of the gambling game. The continuous delays made the Lord finally arrive here before the girl rangers were taken to the west of Turda Fortress. Turda Fortress is the border of the Dexia Principality, and the most important military center in the east of the Dexia Principality. It is only a few dozen miles away from the mountains. It guards the passage to the Dexia territory between the mountains and the desert. The difficult-to-attack throat fortress was easy to defend and difficult to attack. So after General OSA gave Turda Fortress and single to the Duke of Desha, the Principality of Desha declared its independence. It is difficult to avoid the fortress and enter the territory of the Dexia Principality with troops. It is good luck to catch up with the convoy here. 
But the problem is that the dozens of enemies that the Lord originally expected have now turned into hundreds. Fortunately, I caught up Dot, but why are there so many people? The Lord looked very unhappy, since he had been chasing at full speed with one man and two horses. It was impossible to arrange any scouts in front. In addition, there was a ridge blocking his view. He had no idea that there were so many enemies here. However, after they came out from the side of the ridge, they were less than 200 meters away from the enemy. This distance did not allow them to deploy any tactics. Lord Leong, do you want to rush over directly? When Dadier also showed a hint of nervousness. Although she was highly skilled in martial arts, she certainly felt a little weak when she looked at the hundreds of men and horses in the darkness opposite. Raise the flag! Slow down! Leong shook his head and decided not to act recklessly. There were at least 300 people on the other side, all on horseback. 50 against 300 was still an unprepared encounter. Even if Wendadier could defeat one against 100, the best outcome would be that both sides would suffer losses. Who is that person on the other side? Ramon's men in black quickly gathered together, and a small leader began to shout loudly. The large golden griffin flag with a black background was taken out by the cavalry. This was Liang's troops' response to this problem. But the response given by Ramon's men was that several crossbow bolts flew over and were inserted into the open space in front of the cavalry. It was obvious that Ramon did not recognize the flag. The distance between the two sides was still relatively far, and Ramon's troops obviously did not fire the crossbows at anyone. This was just a warning. Warning Liang's cavalry not to get closer is a very common way of greeting when two troops belonging to different camps encounter each other. This kind of greeting usually means that I don't want to attack you. But if you want to cause trouble, I won't be polite. In this case, Liang decided to give a deterrent response to prevent those carriages from being taken away. Can you shoot the person in the middle? The one wearing black noble robes and not holding any weapons. The Lord Lord asked in a low voice the two Nolder elves beside him. Of course. You think that's their leader? But it doesn't look like it. Vindatil took off his bow and replied. Risa Dillon also nodded, indicating that it should be no problem. Ramon's attire does not look like the leader of this group of people, because he is also wearing a black robe. And from a distance, he is no different from other men in black. In fact, Ramon didn't even wear armor, so he looked inconspicuous on the court. However, he was the only person on the field who was not holding a weapon and the men in black consciously protected him in the middle. He was the only one who kept talking. As if giving orders, the Lord's observation and judgment are still very good. No, you can't shoot people. If you shoot him to death, the Nolder girls in the carriage will probably not survive. Shoot his horse, and the horses of the two people next to him. Can you ensure that every arrow is shot? The horse's head? From a distance of 150 meters. It was obviously impossible for Leon to accurately hit the horse's head. Lisa Dillon also shook his head, saying that he could not guarantee an absolute hit. Only when Dadier narrowed his eyes and drew his bow. I understand your intention. I will try my best to hit the horse's forehead with every arrow. Ramon was a little confused now. He didn't recognize the golden griffin flag raised by the cavalry opposite. But the troops he could encounter here should logically be the troops of the Bacchus Empire. But the problem is, in Ramon's impression, Bacchus doesn't have this kind of lancer. The troops on the opposite side look more like the elite cavalry of the Lion Realm. The small valley where Ramon is now has a ridge on one side. And Liang's cavalry just appeared from the other side of the ridge. The other side of the valley is basically flat land, which is the environment where the Lancers have the strongest combat effectiveness. Ramon has been engaged in prisoner of war trading and soldier ransom brokerage for a long time. And Ramon has a deep understanding of each branch of the military. If 50 elite Lancers charge forward, the damage they can cause is very high. Although there are many people on his side, anything can happen on the battlefield. And Ramon does not want to cause trouble at this time to avoid increasing losses. Therefore, if you can avoid fighting, try to avoid it. Fortunately, the cavalry stopped and seemed not to want to cause a conflict. But just when Ramon thought they could retreat without incident, a shining silver arrow fell from the sky and stuck into his horse's head, turning his horse into a unicorn. The horse died almost instantly without even a grunt and fell down without any reaction. Ramon was taken to the ground by surprise. The men around him quickly surrounded him, using their bodies as shields to block Ramon. At this time, another arrow was inserted into the head of the horse blocking Ramon, and another unicorn was created. Don't move at all! Stay back! Ramon got up with difficulty and shouted loudly. When he was on the ground, 
He had already seen the two horses falling to the ground. He had already realized that the other party was deliberately shooting the horses. The other party was telling him that he could take his life at any time. Sure enough, as soon as he finished speaking, the third horse turned into a unicorn and fell to the ground. Still beside him. Everyone stand back and put away your weapons. Ramon stood among the three dead horses, looking at the three arrows stuck in the middle of the horse's foreheads. Cold sweat had soaked his back in just a few seconds. The enemy's array was still 150 meters away, completely untouched. He has never seen such terrifying shooting skills. And, this is a Nolder arrow. Ramon already understood why this cavalry came. But he didn't understand why the Nolder arrows came from human troops. He took the horse rein from one of his men, got on the horse, and took a few steps closer to the direction of Liang's cavalry, and raised his hands and waved vigorously. Leon also let out a long breath. Fortunately, the other party was not an idiot. And fortunately, he brought Windadier with him. Don't move yet. I'll go talk to him. The Lord Lord made almost the same action as Ramon. He raised his hands and waved a few times, and then slowly moved towards the opponent. So the two men approached each other and met between the two armies. I am Leon. What is your name? My name is Ramon. Leon. I seem to have heard of this name. You are the casino tycoon. Ramon. Good brother. You are the real tycoon. Huh? Have you heard of me too? Ha ha ha. The two profiteers burst into laughter as soon as they met. The casino run by Ramon has just adopted the gameplay of My Xiong International's casino this year. And Leon has heard of Ramon's name in his previous life. Probably they have been friends for a long time. Your Excellency Leon is here for those elf girls? Ramon asked the question. Yes. Good brother. I will tell you the truth. Those girls are the family members of my allies. I must take them back. Leon told the truth. And he knew that Ramon would not lie to him either. He is a big businessman. And so is Ramon. Communication between big businessmen does not require lies. And there must be no lies. Good brother. If you can call me that, then you are a good brother. Those girls are indeed rewarded by me. But it is not me who wants to catch them. But Baron Elfride of the Lion Kingdom. I just an agent. Ramon didn't seem to be trying to deceive anyone. If that's the case, that means you didn't pay the cost? Leon smiled. Since Ramon had no big losses, this matter would be much easier to handle. No, I paid the cost. I lost a bottle of expensive medicine worth 3,000 dinars. And I also lost the friendship of Baron Elfride. At the same time, if you want me to give up these elf girls, then I will lose at least 300,000 dinars in profit. Ramon began to settle accounts. Good brother, regarding your cost, now that you have my friendship, I think it is definitely more valuable than Alfred. So not only did you not lose, but you also made a lot of money. As for those profits, Ramon, you should know very well that you can no longer take away those elf curls. What we should consider now is how to maintain our friendship to avoid irreparable losses at the cost you have paid. The Lord also began to settle accounts. You make sense. But that's 300,000 dinars. And I can use those noble and beautiful girls to organize another super auction that will shock the whole continent, which will bring my career to the top. Leon, good brother. You must understand what this means to me. Why don't you give up these Nuodu girls? I can bring you more benefits. For example, the army. Ramon seemed a little unwilling to do so and started reverse marketing. Ramon, I've heard about your deeds back then. The admission fee alone was a thousand dinars. Right. And paying a thousand dinars in advance only gave you priority in the bidding. It was indeed a unique event. Auction. But, good brother. If you just repeat this kind of slave auction without any new changes, it will be a loss. Because your previous achievements are no longer unique. Besides, what I just said I also said that those are the families of my allies. Family, do you understand? I must take them away. The Lord can understand Ramon's mentality. But it is impossible for him to give in. Family, well, it seems we can't reach an agreement. So we'd better decide in a fair way. Good brother, do you want to take a gamble with me? Ramon also sighed, thought for a while, and took out his dice from his arms again. Okay, let's take a gamble. The Lord raised his eyebrows and agreed without hesitation. Chapter 184 Windierf Ramon laughed. As expected of a casino tycoon, I almost never participate in gambling dot, but since we can't reach an agreement, this is indeed the best way. Leon also laughed. However, I don't want to bet dice with you. Ramon, 
Usually a guy like you who carries dice with you can probably control the points as he pleases. Ramon was stunned, then shook his head and put the dice back with a smile. Then what do you want to bet on? I have a silver coin here. Let's bet heads or tails. This one is easier. Leon took out a one-ounce silver dollar and showed the front and back. One side had the portrait of Emperor Barclay and the other side had the words, one dinar. Ramon seemed to have seen this kind of silver coin before and nodded. Backley Dinar. Okay. If I guess right, you will listen to me. If I don't guess right, you can take away those coins. How many girls? Okay. Ramon, which side do you choose to face up? The image or the text? The Lord held the silver coin in his hand and prepared to throw it, with the head facing up. This kind of bet does not require too much entanglement. Anyway, it is half and half. Ramon chose the avatar side without much hesitation. Good. The Lord Lord nodded and bounced the silver coin high. The silver coin kept flipping and bouncing several meters high and then fell under Ramon's horse. On the side facing upward, there are the words. One dinar. Without a picture, Ramon sighed in frustration. Well, it seems that I lost this round. Brothers, stay back. This guy was a good gambler. So he immediately turned around and waved for all his men to leave the carriage. The people in black retreated a hundred meters away obediently. The lord was not polite. He waved and asked his cavalry to come forward and surround the carriages. The handover was completed. Looking at the corpses of the single riders next to the carriage, Leong realized that Ramon had secretly killed Frouse. This obviously means that Ramon is not a heroic knight. So, does he have any other tricks up his sleeve? He said, I lost this game. This game? What's the next game? The lord thought for a while turned back to the place where he was gambling with Ramon and picked up the silver coin with a letter pointing upwards. Ramon? Wait! Ramon was about to return to his team with a tangled expression. But Leon stopped him, took out another silver coin from his body and came to Ramon again. Sorry! Good brother. These two silver coins are probably the same type of gambling equipment as the dice you are wearing. If I guess correctly, your dice are filled with lead. Right. Leon handed the two large silver coins in his hand to Ramon. With some apology in his smile, Ramon looked at the silver coin in his hand. These are two specially made silver coins. One has a portrait on both sides, and the other has words on both sides. Moreover, these two silver coins are a little thinner than normal silver coins. If you look carefully at the wheat ears on the edges, you can see that they are not uniform in size. They are obviously handmade. Ramon smiled bitterly in a low voice. Stack two silver coins, and flash the front and back like Leong did just now. When you hold it stacked in your hand, it looks like a one-ounce standard silver coin. I learned. But the tuition is really expensive. Huh. How did you know there was lead in my dice? Ramon did not show displeasure. Nor did he accuse Leong of shameless tricks. He was willing to admit defeat. He was not the kind of person who could not afford to lose. However, both men now know that the gamble is not over yet. Only crooks like us would carry gambling equipment with us. And for crooks like us, of course, the gambling gear must be tampered with. Ramon, did you also pour some lead in this valley? Leon smiled and whispered. Dice and silver coins are gambling tools. But the venue is also a gambling tool. The silver coin belongs to Leon. But the venue belongs to Ramon. Ramon was silent. Didn't speak. And seemed a little hesitant in his eyes. Good brother. Don't gamble your life. It's not worth it whether you win or lose. We are all businessmen. And I know that you must pay for taking things away from businessmen. Just treat it as if I use this dinar to take it from you. How about buying them back? Leon was still smiling. But his attitude seemed serious and serious. Dot well, since we are the same bastards, I won't bet on the second game. It is a great blessing to meet a good brother like you. Ramon was silent for a few seconds. Then put away the two special silver coins looked at Leon and said seriously, Just think that I gave you a huge discount for the sake of friendship, although I only earn one dinar. But I feel much more comfortable now. After speaking, he stretched out his arms and waved twice. Then, Leon saw hundreds of men in black standing up from the bushes on the side ridge. Just like Leon himself had ambushed the slave-catching team not long ago, the Lord Lord let out a long breath. Sure enough, Ramon still has the next round. But fortunately, Ramon is not only a gambler with gambling skills, but also a qualified businessman. Huh? So, we are real good brothers now. Ramon, 
I will give you a ransom brokerage business to make up for your losses. Have you heard about Levius of the Bacchus Empire and his son Ferdinand? Bias? They are my prisoners now, and I still have more than 400 Shadow Infantry soldiers. You can act as an agent for this ransom business. And I will only need to collect 100,000 dinars in the end. Now that Ramon had given in, the Lord of course wanted to reciprocate the favor. So he sincerely gave Ramon a good business deal in a merchant's way. And also gave him a very low wholesale price. His. The governor of Bacchus was captured by you? What an amazing fighting power. Baron Leon. Your friendship is indeed much more valuable than Elfride. This business is good. I will take it. Of course, Ramon would not refuse this kind of good business. He would definitely be able to make a lot of difference as a middleman. If nothing else goes wrong, the war between the Lion Kingdom and the Bacchus Empire is about to begin again. I will definitely have a lot of business for you in the future. You might as well send an agent to White Deer Castle. There are no Red Brothers in my territory. Yes, but of course, I need a ransom broker. I'm talking about a ransom broker, not a slave trader. After Leon finished speaking, he stretched out his hand towards Ramon. Good brothers, cooperation can lead to win-win results. As for your slave option, Ramon, have you ever seen any slave dealer who can live to the end of his life? I think, in the future, we may be able to work together to auction the city lord's position, or even the throne. Do you think such a business would be more interesting? Ramon's eyes suddenly widened. Auctioning the throne? This is really an amazing idea. I am looking forward to that day. You are right. Good brother. Cooperation is the only way to win-win. I really can't sell slaves for the rest of my life. Ramon held the Lord's hand and sighed in a low voice. Then he stopped worrying, turned around and left with his people in black. Without looking back, Leon looked at Ramon's retreating back, spread out his hands, and in his hands were three extremely delicate dice. That was what Ramon put into Liang's hand when shaking hands. Sir, I think I heard you call him Ramon? He is the biggest slave trader in Sinjar. Right. He is the underground king. You can actually convince him? Seeing Leon come back, Risa Dillon looked at the people in black leaving in the distance. A little hard to understand. He had stayed in single and had heard of Ramon's reputation. No, I didn't convince him. He chose to give in. I may have to return this favor to him in the future. Leon glanced at the dice in his hand again and put the dice into his arms. What kind of kindness can slave traders have? Slave traders deserve to die. Windadier kept holding the bow and staring at Ramon, who was leaving until the men in black completely disappeared from sight. Then he put the bow back on his back and said casually. Then, she came to the carriage, took out the sword from her waist, and struck the lock of the huge iron cage of the carriage with her sword. Sparks flew everywhere, and the lock was cut off with an extremely violent sword. Maybe but you also know that he could have taken hostages and forced us to give in. Moreover, we did not find the troops he ambushed on the mountain that were not even noticed by your ears, which means that they made no sound at all. If you send it out with such discipline and execution, your combat effectiveness can be imagined. The Lord shook his head and stepped forward, helping Wendadier untie the ropes that tied the Nuodua girls into rice dumplings. Are all humans so insidious? They all like to ambush. When Nadir didn't say anything else, he just grunted and released several new girls from the iron cage, then hugged the little girl with purple pupils, looking left and right to check if there were any injuries. Wendy! Fortunately nothing happened to you. It seems that Wendadier has a deep relationship with that new girl. Teacher Wendadier, I originally thought that a handsome prince would come to save me on a white horse. The new girl called, Wendy, did not show any panic. Instead, she looked around curiously at the people around her. Wendy, you should read less night novels. This is Baron Leon. He saved you. Wendadier shook his head and pointed at the Lord. Leon is now riding a black horse and has been traveling for several days in a row. His dusty appearance does not look very good. He does not look like a prince at all, but more like an ordinary mercenary. The girl caressed her chest, blinked her big bright eyes, and bowed to the Lord seriously. Lord Leon, I am Wendir and my life-saving grace will never be forgotten. I will repay you. This girl's eyes are clean and pure. Looking into her eyes can even give people the illusion that the purple starry sky is constantly flowing. Maybe the purple pupils not only meant her noble status, but also meant some kind of magical power. But Leon frowned deeply. Wendy, please wait until you get back to say thank you. It may not be considered saving you now. 
The color of your eyes is so beautiful. But they are full of danger. The Lord looked into the eyes of this beautiful girl. And there was obviously some anxiety in his own eyes. Lord Leong, what are you talking about? What makes a brave warrior like you feel in danger? Wind Knife turned her face sideways. The corners of her mouth curved. And her face seemed to be slightly red. Don't get me wrong. Wendy, this probably means that you are a direct bloodline of the Sindari Elves. Right? His Majesty Felgasian also has purple eyes. Leon looked at that beautiful face. Shook his head and sighed. Such eyes cannot be concealed at all. This characteristic of the Sindari Elves is also recorded in human books. Moreover, humans also know that the Sindari Elves destroyed the continent. I don't know how many years ago. From time to time, a small number of individuals with magical powers and the ability to release powerful magic appeared among the elves. They were called Sindari, which are also high elves. The magic power of Sindari elves is innate, and after they gradually master the ability to materialize magic power in their long lives, the individual abilities of some Sindari elves can be said to be no different from gods. In ancient times, the Sindarin elves once ruled a continent called Visdarian East of Pender. They built countless miraculous buildings and mastered magical weapons that could destroy the world. The elves who were born without magic and unable to use magic were called Noldor. At that time, the Noldor were just servants of Sindari. For the elves, their status had been determined from birth. In the eyes of those Sindarin elves, the Noldor who were unable to use magic were just servants, or even as if they did not exist. The Noldor cannot give birth to Sindarin elves if they combine with each other. Neither parents have the ability to use magic, nor do their children. This is why the Sindarin elves regard the Noldor as slaves. The children born by the Sindarin elves are also likely to be Noldor because this is completely uncontrollable like having a boy or girl. However, even the descendants of the noble Sindari elves, as long as they are Noldor, will still only be regarded as low elves. Of course, humans had a lower status at that time and were not even considered intelligent life forms. They could only be regarded as slightly smarter wild animals. In the eyes of the elves, they were no different from monkeys. Although humans had developed their own civilization at that time, for those ancient races, Having an extremely long lifespan was a key factor in their evaluation of intelligent life. Because in their view, just learning all kinds of knowledge and wisdom will take hundreds of years or even longer. In their eyes, creatures with too short lifespans cannot pass on knowledge. Perhaps when individual beings are powerful enough, they will lose their emotions because they may really regard themselves as gods. Ancient dragons, titans, and some of the top Sindari elves, they are almost emotionless and will never tolerate any grievance. As a result, a war between gods took place. The continent of Vistarian, which was originally home to various legendary species, completely sank into the vast sea. Those powerful beings as powerful as gods also joined the Sindarin elves. Extinct. The devastating magic aftermath even spread to the eastern part of the Pender continent. If it weren't for the towering misty mountains blocking the center of the continent, the entire Pender continent might have been affected. The Pendor continent that people now call is actually just a small area in the west of the continent protected by the Misty Mountains. Only a small group of Misty Mountain people like Andonga, who have tried to live on the east side of the mountains, know what the mountains to the east of the Noldor Forest look like. It is endless frozen soil with almost no life. Not even grass. Not long. The remaining Noldor elves came to settle in the continent of Pendor under the leadership of a young elf named Ava Dane. It is said that Ava Dane received some kind of oracle, and was lucky enough to lead his people before the continent was destroyed. Left, Avidane is actually a child of the Sindari elf. He has a distinctive feature, purple eyes. But it is a pity that he himself is only an older elf. And the only ones he can take away are the Nolder elves. Among the current Nolder tribe, the three elf kings are all descendants of Avidane. And they all have purple or purple purple sapphire eyes. It's just that it's not as obvious as when Deers. This girl looks like a complete Sindari elf with the brilliance flowing in her eyes, like a starry sky. Even humans like Leon, who have never seen magic, can feel the surge of magic from it. Windai's purple pupils were too bright and obvious, and her appearance was too fair and beautiful. It was really difficult to disguise her appearance in an era without contact lenses. Anyone can tell immediately that she is different. The situation we are facing now is that a beacon fire was lit at the bridge of Chicha Fortress a day ago, and the troops guarding the bridge were killed. If nothing else, the area near the bridge should have been completely blocked by now. And the Lion Kingdom must have sent a large number of troops to guard against the enemy. Likewise, the troops at the Sava River Fort of the Bacchus Empire would probably confront each other because of this. 
Leon was not sure whether his troops could successfully return to the Lion Realm under such circumstances. What's more, now he is carrying an older noble girl who is difficult to disguise. Sir, should we take another route back? Only Rasadalan understood what the Lord was worried about. We cannot change our route at this location. To the west is Turda Fortress in Desha. And to the east, we have to pass through the entire Bacchus Empire. The Bacchus Empire is probably starting to prepare for war. And we probably won't be able to get through. The Lord took out the map, made two gestures, and shook his head. Then he opened several other carriages. And then he discovered that there was actually a halberdier tied up in a carriage full of goods. The carriage was full of Nolder enchanted equipment. Are you a subordinate of Lehman? Leon looked at the coat of arms on the halberdier's body, used a knife to cut the rope in the halberdier's mouth, and pulled out a dirty rag from the halberdier's mouth. Well, the halberdier retched several times before he spoke. Yes, sir, I am a garrison at Chicha Fortress. I, I was attacked by some single people, and they killed all my subordinates. I guess, he was the one who killed those Sinjar people of your men. Right, Leon pointed to Frizzy's body. The halberdier jumped off the carriage and looked at it. Yes, he is the leader. Thank you for saving my life. My lord. Dot from now on, you should forget about these Sinjar people. Otherwise this matter will definitely trigger a war between the Lion Kingdom and Dexia. The lord sighed deeply and patted the halberdier on the shoulder. The kingdom and the Bacchus Empire have not ceased war yet. If war is declared with Desha again, then the Bacchus Empire will definitely form an alliance with Dexia to jointly attack the kingdom. Besides, being captured by the enemy is not an experience to be proud of. You should know what happens to captured soldiers when they return home. Right. The halberdier did indeed seem to be a somewhat educated man. He thought about it and shuddered. I listen to you. Sir, what should I do? A halberdier has joined your party. Chapter 185 The Real Storm The halberdier and several cavalry set off first. And they were going to carry out the tasks assigned by the lord. For the lord... Those who are in the team list of his system are basically reliable. It's a pity that Windadir, Windirf, and even the other two girl rangers did not join his team. So, the lord came to Windadir and Windulf. Windadir, your unique swordsmanship relies on your ear to determine the enemy's location. Right. The lord covered his eyes with his hands and gestured to Windadir. That's right. Lord Leon, but humans can't learn. Windadir nodded. Human beings cannot hear those subtle sounds. This is something they are born with and cannot be tempered. But we can hear where the enemy is and even hear how the enemy is going to take action. Just like we can see with our eyes. The same ears are not decorations to us. The implication is that human ears can only be regarded as decorations. Elves have long pointed ears, which can indeed be seen just from their appearance. The range of sounds they can hear must be much wider than that of humans. At least they can hear subtler sounds. However, they also encountered more noisy interference. Of course I can't learn it, Dot Windy. You are Windadier's student. You should be able to learn it. Right? The Lord turned to ask Windir. Of course. I am an excellent ranger. Lord Leon. Do you want to arrange any combat missions for me? Windulfa's eyes suddenly lit up. And she seemed to be looking forward to an adventure. It seemed that she had indeed read a lot of nightly novels. Yeah. I'm thinking about who should carry out the most important mission, Dot Windy. Besides Windadir's swordsmanship. What else can you do? The Lord seemed to be planning something. Sir, I know a lot. Windife became more energetic now. And her curiosity was aroused. What is the most important task? Can you tell me about it? A large army has indeed gathered near Chicha Fortress. Duke Brennus led the Lion Knights to rush here and take over the defense. And Lehman was leading his troops around the Lion Realm. Lehman's current task was to guard the flanks and try to find them. Kill the Bridgehead Garrison and then lurk to troops in the Lion Territory. The reason for this situation is that the garrison of the Sava River Fort of the Bacchus Empire also saw the beacon fire, and they discovered that the large forces of the Lion Kingdom were at the border of the Chin Army. In this case, they were responsible for the defense of the Sava River Fort. General C naturally wanted to summon a large army for defense. Then General Titus discovered that there were no troops on the hill south of the Sava River that were originally occupied by the Lion Kingdom. This is because Lehman came to the conclusion that the enemy has probably crossed the bridge and sneaked into the territory of the lion. Therefore, Duke Brennus believed that he should not divide his troops to defend the uninhabited territory in the south, so as not to lose sight of one and suffer enemies from both sides. So he gave up the fortifications built by Lehman on the south bank of the Sava River. 
gathered his troops, and deployed defenses around the Chicha Fortress, planning to be more cautious to prevent lurking enemies from attacking the surrounding areas of Lion City. If there are really enemies sneaking into the hinterland, this approach is actually reasonable, at least to ensure that the capital area is not attacked by surprise. Moreover, the current main force of Duke Brennus is the Lion Knights, who have outstanding plain field combat capabilities in fortifications or mountainous environments. These Lion Knights who do not have long-range capabilities cannot be used, so the defense zone is deployed to Chicha the plains surrounding the fortress are more suitable. But in this way, General Titus of the Bacchus Empire naturally took over the abandoned fortifications without ceremony and advanced the front to the south bank of the Sava River. So the armies of the two countries began to confront each other across the bridge. Because of this, the Lion Kingdom also believed that the attack on the defenders on the bridge was probably done by the Bacchus Empire. This kind of provocation must be retaliated. Therefore, Duke Brennus directly asked General Titus. The troops launched a tentative attack. Because of this accident and misunderstanding, the battle between the Lion Kingdom and the Bacchus Empire started again in a confused manner. But fortunately, both countries have a lot of domestic troubles. And neither side is willing to start a large-scale all-out war. The two sides were only engaging in small-scale conflicts over the ownership of the bridge. Your Majesty, we rescued an infantry captain across the river. He is a subordinate of Sir Lehman. He has important military information to report to you. In Chicha Fortress, a lion knight reported to Brennus. Bring it in. A halberdier was brought before Brennus. Mr. Duke, I am the captain of the infantry loyal to Sir Lehman. The halberdier looked quite nervous. He probably had never seen such a big man as the Duke. To put it bluntly, I'm not interested in your position. Brenna seems to have a rather bad temper. Sir, my defense area was attacked by a group of mercenaries before, and they killed all my team members. The halberdier stammered about the situation. Mercenary? Brenna's frowned. What do those mercenaries look like? They look like a slave-catching team. I told them that this area was a military-controlled area and asked them to put down their weapons. But they suddenly took action. There were many of them, and they were very skilled. We were no match. I was being beaten. Before I fell into the river, I heard them talking about His Highness the Prince's mission. The halberdier gritted his teeth and said that except for the last sentence, he basically told the truth. So he was indeed honest. Your Highness? Dot where did those mercenaries go? Breda's expression changed. They went south. I heard them saying that they had to do a full show. And I heard them saying that Baron Alfred was waiting for them. My lord, I don't understand. What is the mission of His Highness the Prince? I am not sure that I am. I didn't hear it wrong. Brennus's face twitched a few times. And he forced out a dangerous smile. That's the enemy's conspiracy. You don't need to understand. Then, he said to the Lion Knight next to him, Give this captain a hundred dinars in recognition of his loyalty. The halberdier was sent away because he didn't understand. So he could survive and still get the reward. In the view of Duke Brennus, what the halberdier said was very credible. He was just a small character and would not lie for such a thing. Because killing a group of troops guarding the bridge seemed like deliberately provoking a war. If the Bacchus Empire did not let the troops enter the Lion Realm, then there was no need for them to do so. It was originally a coincidence without logic. But now Brennus has found a logic. This is probably a conflict created by a Lanric's desire to seize military power? Indeed, it is only logical to think so. For most people, there is always a logic to everything. But reality often has less logic. And history is often more absurd than legend. But people will always consciously come up with a situation that they think is logical based on some so-called clues. Even if the truth of the matter is just because a slave-catching group leader who didn't want to waste time was ripped off. Soon after, Brennus withdrew his troops to the fortress of Seven Forks and sent a messenger to General Titus across the river. Later, Brennus returned to the Lion City with some of the Lion Knights. General Titus's troops also withdrew to the Sava River Fort. But the fortifications south of the Sava River that originally belonged to the Lion Kingdom have all been replaced by Titus Phoenix Flag. The initiative gained by Earl Odin and Leon here was returned to the Bacchus Empire by Brennus. Leon did not forget that Prince Alanric planned to pay for his murder. So he used the halberdier to give Alanric a ship basin. This would at least make everyone suspicious and suspicious of Alanric. And they wouldn't be able to verify it anyway. Of course, this is mainly to provide a temporary truce between the two countries. In fact, maintaining peace is beneficial to everyone. Ramon said before that Baron Eldred was looking for a older noble girl. 
which meant that Eldred must know a lot about the situation. So the Lord also told the Baron, to those who knew that the king was sick. This situation looked like Alanric was taking advantage of his father's illness to start a war. Ulric was unable to lead the army, and the prince was probably trying to gain a fortune. Military power. And the people who executed it seemed to be Alfred's men. Alfred is the knight commander of the Knights of the Lion. Brennus and Lehman are both administrators of the Lion Knights. A captain and a prestigious deputy captain of the Knights. They also know that the king is sick. But whether it is Brennus or Lehman, if the prince actually didn't tell them. Such a big thing. But let Alfred do it. This naturally means to them that the prince does not trust them, but wants to use them as cannon fodder. In this way, everyone will think of the issue of control of the Lion Knights. Everyone would also think that Prince Alanric was planning to stir up a dispute. In fact, no matter who is in charge of military affairs, as long as it is not Alanric himself, he will never go to war with Bacchus because of the prince's mission. Even if a war starts, he will have to force a peace because no one wants to be cannon fodder. Therefore, those in charge of military affairs would rather suffer losses than seize the war. This is what the Lord thought when he saw the halberdier. In fact, Leon just wanted to return to White Deer Castle safely. Only when there is no more fighting here can the Lord live well. At the same time, everything the Lord does is to seize the time to develop. During this period of accumulating strength, he does not want the two countries to continue to fight. It stands to reason that with a temporary truce between the two countries, Leon can easily return to White Deer Castle. But who knew that the Lord would actually meet someone he didn't expect at the bridge? Grand Bachelor Igor. Moreover, he also brought with him at least 300 people. All of them were Lion Knights and Lion Followers. And they were acquaintances of Lehman's men. Lord Leon, why are you here? Igor looked extremely surprised. Sir Igor, why are you here? The Lord was even more surprised. He originally thought that he would at least encounter Lehman when he got here. This is Lehman's territory. How could Igor be guarding it? I was ordered to go to peace talks with the Bacchus Empire. Mr. Leong, it seems you should explain why you came from Bacchus territory? Igor seemed confident, and he was probably really responsible for the peace talks. His position is indeed suitable for this job. I am a businessman. And, as you know, I have to raise money for His Majesty. The Lord Lord gritted his teeth and smiled. Igor stood up slowly. In that case, why not go see his majesty first? The Lion City is not far anyway. Lord Leon. After speaking, he waved his hand and asked the Lion Knights to step forward and surround Liang's men. Igor, what do you mean? Are you planning to attack me in this place? Leon pulled out his sword directly and stared at Igor with unkind eyes. Igor took a few steps back and retreated behind the Lion Knights. Catch him. He is a traitor. The Lion Knights did not move. Catch him. Otherwise, not only Raymond will die, but you will die too, Igor yelled. The lion knight in the front row said softly to Leon, I'm sorry, Lord Leon. Then, all the lion knights drew their weapons. In the past few days when Leon led the team to leave White Deer Castle, a storm broke out in Sherhu City. Grandon, the flag officer of the first flag guard of Lion Lake City, was accused of ravaging and murdering Nelda's maid. And the person who accused him was his wife Nelda. In fact, many of the maids in the houses of big nobles these days are the daughters of knights in the family. And they are nobles. Therefore, murdering a maid is not a trivial matter. And the crime is equivalent to killing a noble without reason. Although this accusation was not ultimately established. And the real murderer was sent to the gallows just one day later. The two divorced reasonably. The wife accused her husband of a capital crime. If they did not divorce, the families on both sides would neither are happy. On the day of their divorce, news of Alma's death was publicly announced, and Nelda succeeded him as Duke of Lion Lake City. Obviously, this divorce was initiated by the Horton family in order to prevent the Duke's power from falling into the hands of Grand Lawn, who already held military power. But Grand Lawn was not a lighthearted man. He incited the Sherhu City Flag Guard to hold a demonstration. More than 500 heavy cavalry troops arrested, rebels, on the streets of Sherhu City, causing people to panic. Of course, this traitor did not exist. But everyone saw his control over the standard guard. Nelda was of course panicked. She was just a smart woman. And she couldn't go to the battlefield if there really was a war. At this time, her lover Mirgan appeared publicly in the Lord's Hall of Lion Lake City. Just one day later, Nelda announced her marriage to Mirgan and handed over the authority of the Duke to Mirgan. Of course, 
this was only a private authorization. Without the recognition of the king and nobles, Mirgon could not become a duke, but he became the military officer of Lion Lake City. And within one day, he obtained the territory of Payne Village as a knight. But this was originally the territory of the Granlon family. Granlon was of course dissatisfied and came to argue with him. As a result, a duel broke out on the spot. Mirgon challenged Granlon to a duel in the name of a love dispute, which was barely a reasonable reason. Although Granlon was divorced and was now his ex-husband, any man would definitely accept a duel initiated by the person who cuckolded him. As a result, Granlon, who had fought with Ralph before, both of them were injured, went into battle injured, and was easily defeated by Mirgon. He was also humiliated. Miron slapped Grand Lon on the lower body with the blade of his sword, and publicly said that he was useless. When Miron first came into power, he probably got a little carried away and overdid it. It's understandable even if someone is killed during a duel, but this kind of humiliation is indeed a bit unnecessary. The Shurhu city flag guard rioted because of this. They refused to obey the orders of Mirgon and Nelda, and publicly declared that they hoped that Father would return to Lion Lake City to take charge of the overall situation. A day later, Fawcett did return to Lion Lake City, and he did have the support of the Lion Lake City Color Guard. In fact, he even had the support of Baron Kedron of Talon Castle, who brought him back. Then Father went into the Lord's Hall alone to see his sister Nelda, and when he came out, his face was covered in blood, and his eyes were cold and piercing. He announced that the Horton family would be taken over by him, as well as Lion Lake City, and that the murderer Mirgon would be immediately wanted. No one in the Horton family objected because Nelda is dead. Also dead at the same time were all the other children of the Duke of Alma and his four minor children. Fawcett became the first heir of the family, whether he inherited it from Alma or Nelda. He was the first heir, and Granlon also clearly supported father. In fact, it is obvious who the murderer is, but no one will confront father at this time. A person who dares to kill his own brothers and sisters is completely no different from his father. In fact, the people of the Horton family identify more with Fawcett because this kind of character makes him look like Alma's child. After being wanted by Fawcett, Miron, who only controlled power in Lion Lake City for two days, had to flee again. He finally remembered again the Griffin Sword mercenary group that had accompanied him for many years. But he didn't know where his troops were now. And the one who was chasing him was the first flag guard of Shurhu City, which was once again under the control of Granron. The two sides had a grudge, and they pursued each other very closely. As a result, Mirgon fled all the way south and then disappeared. However, the most unexpected thing was that the Shurhu city flag guard, who was originally chasing Mirgon, suddenly launched an attack on Chungha town. Moreover, Chungha town was actually captured in one day. This is not because of how powerful the first flag guard of Lion Lake City is, but because Gromlong actually holds the king's golden seal of the Lion Kingdom in his hand, and claimed that this was the will of the Lion King. There are only more than 500 people in the Shurhu City Flag Guard, and they are all heavy cavalry without any baggage. It was originally impossible to capture Chang'e Town, or even organize a decent siege. But Godric and Eric still took a boat from the dock and left Chang'e Town. They did not stick to the city. It can even be said that they had no intention of staying here at all. Instead, they gave up Chang'e Town, because they both know that no matter where the King's Seal in Granran's hand comes from, they can't fight with someone who holds the king's seal anyway. No matter they win or lose, there will be no good end. If you win, you will be defying the king's authority. But if you lose, you will naturally lose your troops and become prisoners. Moreover, they knew that the gold seal was real. In the room where Alma was stabbed to death, there was a king's order transferring Chunga town to Alma. The seals and handwriting on it are all real. Chapter 186 A Series of Changes Mirgon was probably lucky, but also unlucky, because Granlon and the Lion Lake City Standard Guard unexpectedly turned their mission to hunt down Mirgon into a surprise attack to seize the city. Mirgon fled to the vicinity of Yalagul, which is a village to the west of Chicha Fortress. Then, he met Raymond who was looking for enemy everywhere. Lehman and Mirgon are both very well known. They know each other and have some friendship. They are both frequent visitors to the Lion City Arena. After all, both of them are knights with strong martial arts skills. And they still have some admiration for each other. Mir gone? You look really embarrassed. Where is your mercenary group? Sir Lehman. Lion Lake City. Father has rebelled. 
Milgon didn't know that Gramon had already gone to Chang'e town. In order to use Lehman to help him avoid the pursuers, he spread a panic to Lehman. And his first sentence was bombsh. L news. Lehman was shocked on the spot. What's going on? Wasn't he exiled? He killed his father. The Duke of Alma. He also killed all the Duke's heirs with his own hands. Now he is the only one in the Holden family who can inherit the inheritance. And he has indeed regained control of Lion Lake City. My new wife Nelda. I'll die in his hands too. The more Mirgon talked, the angrier he became. He would indeed be angry when he gained and lost his authority. Lehman was indeed shocked. Father-son rivalry may not be new, but there were not many sons who killed their own fathers. Moreover, the last person to kill all his brothers and sisters with his own hands was Alma herself. Lehman even wondered if the Holden family had this parasite gene in their blood. So, Lehman believed it. Because Mirgon made the whole thing up very well. And most of it was true. Mirgon told Lehman that he had previously taken over the task of escorting Nelda, and thus developed a relationship with Nelda, and also gained the attention of the Duke of Alma. It just so happened that Nelda's relationship with Granlon, the flag bearer of the Lion Lake City Guards, broke down, and Granlon was disloyal to the Duke of Alma, when Alma and his son were fighting for power. Granlon defected to father, so Nelda had to fight Granlon. Divorce. Mildon claimed that the Duke of Alma also agreed to this matter, so Alma originally planned to let him marry Nelda, take over the Lion Lake City Standard Guard, and even planned to establish his Griffin Sword mercenary group for an order of knights. So he dueled with Granlon, forcing Granlon to agree to divorce, marry Nelda, and then be appointed as the military affairs officer of Lion Lake City. However, Granlon was deprived of his military power. As a result, Granlon held a grudge and led the Sherhu City Flag Guard to rebel. He took back the exiled father and directly rebelled. The final result was that his newlywed wife Nelda was killed. His mercenary group was killed and dispersed in the riot. But he himself was blamed by father and had no choice but to flee. This rings true because it appears to be the case. Mirgon was able to deceive so many girls. So he was certainly very good at weaving lies. And his words were always true and false. He even gave everyone a motive that fit their behavior. Granlon failed in the duel and was divorced and was unwilling to be deprived of his military power. So he would return to the exiled Fawcett and help Fawcett regain his power. This is very reasonable for anyone. And Fawcett has been exiled by Alma. Before being exiled, Alma personally used whips, salt water, and other tortures until he was transformed into a human being. Many people have heard of this. In order to regain the power that should originally belong to him, he committed parricide. It is very possible. After all, Alma herself has done this before. And the filial piety and kindness of father and son are in the same line. Milan did not describe himself as an innocent victim. He admitted that he had been in love with Nelda before her divorce. And he also admitted that he insulted Granon during the duel in order to anger her. This advanced lie-weaving method of putting the big blame on others and leaving small mistakes to yourself is actually very easy to win the trust of others. Coupled with Lehman's knowledge of Alma's family, Lehman completely believed Mergen's words. Moreover, Lehman felt that it was very likely that his bridge guarding team was killed because of this matter. If Fawcett murdered Alma, it would definitely lead to suppression by the king. Whether it was killing a duke or parasite, such a sinner would definitely be punished. In order not to be suppressed before gaining a firm foothold, Fawcett will definitely do something. Therefore, it is indeed very possible that Fawcett deliberately killed the garrison guarding the bridge at this time, thereby triggering a war between the Lion Kingdom and other countries especially the war with the southern countries. Lion City is very far away from the Chicha Fortress. In the near future, if a war breaks out with the southern countries, the king will be too busy to take care of himself and will definitely not be able to take care of father. At least he can buy him time and space. Yes, for Lehman, this kind of judgment is not just a guess, but a reasonable inference based on the testimony. It is a very logical judgment. Lehman feels that this is almost the case. Yergal is quite close to Lion City. So Lehman took Mirgon to Lion City immediately, intending to report the situation to the king. He felt that he should lead troops to seize father while his foothold was not stable. He, after all, the dozen soldiers who were killed while stationed at the bridge were all Lehman's men, and he must seek justice for his men. However, Lehman failed to see King Ulrich in the Lion City. The king was recovering from illness these days and was unable to handle official duties for the time being. Raymond only met Prince Alan Rick and Grandmaster Igor. 
however. Just after Lehman told Prince Alan Rick about the situation, Alan Rick issued an order that Lehman did not expect. His Royal Highness the Prince arrested Lehman in the name of stealing the King's seal. This was mainly due to the unfortunate timing of Lehman meeting Alan Rick. Prince Alan Rick's original plan was to summon an army to quell the rebellion on the grounds that he suspected Alma of stealing the King's seal and intending to rebel. Since the current marshal is Ulrich himself, there has been no change in the past six months. And the king is ill and cannot lead the troops. Alan Rick can temporarily replace his father as a prince and lead the troops to personally kill the rebellion. It is the king's duty. In the business of cleaning up the house, the nobles will certainly not overstep their authority. Alma itself is powerful. So Alan Rick can legitimately recruit the military strength of the nobles across the country and take this opportunity to get as many troops as possible into his own hands, such as the Knights of the Lion. As for Alma's crime, this is actually the reason why Alan Rick helped Alma escape and gave Alma the order to transfer the seal of Chonga town. They had discussed it and cooperated to act out a big show together. There was no need to actually fight. A huge civil war. After Alan Rick takes control of the military, he and the Duke of Alma can just find someone to take the blame. In fact, the person Alma expected to take the blame at that time was Leon. Of course, Alan Rick did secretly place the king's seal in Shirhu City. If his control of your military strength is smoother, it is not impossible to kill Alma through a fake show. But who knew that Alma would die before he could summon his army? And she would die so suddenly. Now Father has regained control of Shirhu City. And the method of control is parricide. In fact, at this time, the king should have recruited an army to attack Lion Lake City. But Father had not discussed it with Alan Rick. And he would definitely not cooperate. Moreover, we had to find someone else to take the blame for getting the seal to Shirhu City. When Lehman met Alan Rick, his royal highness the prince happened to be discussing with Igor who should be blamed for stealing the seal. Igor couldn't admit it himself. He would be beheaded. Although Lehman's title is not high, he is a vassal directly loyal to King Ulrich, the lord of Chicha Fortress, and a military attaché who specializes in dealing with rebellion. And he has many lion knights at his hands. For Alan Rick, this is obviously a problem. But Lehman had no handle, no in-law relationship to use, and it was not even easy to bribe him. Lehman was neither lustful nor money-loving. Therefore, Alan Rick simply put the charge of stealing the king's seal on Lehman. If possible, he could try to force him to support him. Even if you can't, you can still try to use threats to get the Lion Knights under Lehman. If Lehman, the deputy leader of the Lion Knights, is guilty of treason, then the Lion Knights are indeed likely to be declared an illegal knighthood and a large group of questionable accomplices will inevitably be discovered. As a result, Lehman was detained by Prince Alan Rick in such a confused way. Sometimes, the person who was charged with the crime did not make any mistakes, and might even know nothing. In fact, it was not just Lehman who was accused without knowing anything. Prince Alan Rick himself also felt quite aggrieved, because Duke Brennus also returned to the Lion City at this time, and led the Lion Knights into the House of Lords intending to find Alan Rick and ask questions. Because Leong taught the halberdier some rhetoric, Brennus thought that killing the garrison and triggering the conflict between the two countries was instigated by Alan Rick. For Brennus, it didn't matter who the king of the Lion Kingdom was, whether it was Ulrich or Alan Rick. It didn't matter if Prince Alan Rick wanted to fight for power. In fact, Brennus is more willing to support Prince Alan Rick because Alan Rick, unlike Ulrich, has no control over the Knights of the Lion and can only rely on Brennus. In this way, the Knights of the Lion can be controlled by Brennus for a long time. And in Brennus's view, young Alan Rick probably hasn't learned balance, yet, as the strongest duke at present, a young and inexperienced king is obviously easier to deal with. But, but, for Brennus, no one can use the safety of the kingdom as a means to gain power. Let's not let the Lion Knights be used as cannon fodder, because the Lion Kingdom is shared by the nobles, not the king alone. As the Duke of the Kingdom, Brennus certainly cannot allow Alan Rick to mess around. However, Brennus led his troops into the tower of the House of Lords, which caused Alan Rick to have a misunderstanding. He thought it was because he secretly detained Lehman, the deputy leader of the Lion Knights, which led to the arrival of the Grand Leader Brennus. The troops were raised to investigate the crime. The result of this small misunderstanding was that Alan Rick and Brennus had a conflict, because the first thing Brennus said after seeing Alan Rick was, Your Highness, why do you put the kingdom in danger? A place of life and death, like Chicha Fortress, is not a place to play games. Brennus's original intention was to ask Alan Rick why he 
provoked the dispute between the two countries to see what the prince wanted and to try to see if there were other ways to solve the problem. But Alanric thought that Brennus was talking about his detention of Lehman. Lehman was the lord of Chicha Fortress. Alanric was not willing to share his frame of behavior with anyone. And the prince felt that Brennus' tone was disrespectful to him. So he gave a very unhappy answer. I need to report to you when I do things. Really? Brennus, you led the troops into the king's private residence. Are you planning to rebel? As a result, as soon as the hat was slapped on, the grumpy Brennus immediately concluded that Alan Rick had no trust in him. Therefore, Brennus did not intend to have any more communication with the prince, and directly made an ultimatum-like request. No matter what you want to do, you must resolve all unresolved conflicts between the kingdom and other countries. Otherwise you nothing can be done. Then he left with his troops. Alanric didn't expect Brennus to react so strongly. He didn't want to be hostile to Brennus. In addition, he had to go to conquer Lion Lake City and originally wanted to ensure that the kingdom was free from foreign troubles. So he had to arrange for Igor to go and fight with Buck. The Sri Lankan Empire negotiated peace. Of course, Brennus's reaction also convinced Alanric to take control of the Lion Knight himself. So, Igor went to Chicha Fortress. Igor indeed shoulders the task of going south to see Yuan City in the Bacchus Empire to negotiate peace. But the more important task is to use the charge of stealing the king's seal, imposed on Lehman, and the complicity, and the Lion Knights are unreliable, to divide and coerce Lehman's Lion Knights. The deputy leader Lehman is involved in the crime of treason. Of course, these Lion Knights are also panicked because this may cause the Lion Knights to be judged as an illegal knight's order again. You know, it has only been 10 years since the Knights of the Lion were recognized by King Ulrich and became the National Knights again. These new generation of Lion Knights have just adapted to their privileges as Royal Knights. They are reluctant to become ordinary Royal Guards again. The Royal Guards are actually just retinues. And their status is much lower than that of the Lion Knights. At this time, the Lord came to the bridge and was surrounded by the Lion Knights ordered by Igor. Igor obviously planned to frame Leon on the spot. Who would let Leon come back from Bacchus? since Lehman's statement is that it was mostly fathered who instigated the murder of the Quoto garrison. Then the bachelor planned to use Lehman's own judgment to describe Leong as the specific executor of the Quoto garrison. That is, fathered, special's accomplice, considering that fathered once provided a large amount of precious food to Leon. This statement is at least reasonable. But these lion knights under Lehman had just participated in the process of taking Leon away from White Deer Castle in the name of suspected treason. The Lion Knights all understood that Lehman was definitely innocent. And Leon was probably innocent too. But now they must obey Igor's orders. Those who disobey will definitely be considered by Igor as Lehman's accomplice in order to save their own lives and to maintain the legal status of the Lion Knights. They had no choice. Of course, the Lord Lord will not surrender. Although he has always avoided such battles that will cause huge losses. The situation this time is obviously different. Igor obviously intends to kill him. Lion Knights! Where is Lehman? What is Igor threatening you with? Leon heard some clues from the reactions of the Lion Knights and Igor's additional orders. Maybe Lehman was caught? Is there even a charge? Don't talk to him. Grab him. Or kill him! Igor shouted behind the Lion Knights. He was blocked by the crowd and Leon couldn't see him. But Igor didn't even dare to say anything. The Lord was naturally sure of at least one thing. Igor couldn't make the Lion Knights obey absolutely. As long as Igor can be caught or killed. Maybe these Lion Knights can be persuaded? So Leon advanced instead of retreating. He suddenly drew his sword and forced back the two surrounding Lion Knights. And rushed towards Igor's position. But Igor was quite smart and hid on the other side of the bridge more than a hundred meters away. The Lord was blocked by the Lion Knights and could not rush over. So he had to shout. Kill that skinny old man! A short bloody battle began. The men and horses on both sides were originally good at riding lances, but neither side was able to speed up. In this siege, they all used two-handed broadswords or half-handed swords. This made it difficult for both sides to quickly cause relatively large casualties. The Lion Knights did not intend to kill Leon Liang's cavalry were just to break out. So neither side engaged in a violent battle to the death. Basically, they were blocking each other with swords and shields, making a clanging sound in Liang's team. A strange man with gauze wrapped around his head covering the entire upper half of his face. And a warrior wearing a full coverage knight's helmet followed the lord with two people dressed as female explorers. The man was wrapped with gauze and his eyes were also wrapped. As if he was a seriously injured person with both eyes injured. In his hand, 
was a strange big bow with arrows already attached. This is Windulf. The other, of course, is Windadir. Igor obviously had little combat experience. He was originally a scholar. As a palace bachelor, he probably had never been on the battlefield before. He probably thought it was safe to stand more than a hundred meters away. At this time, behind Liang, several arrows flew out at incredible speeds. The target of the arrow is Igor. This is the important task assigned by the Lord to Windilfu and Windadir. They all have the ability to shoot sound. The Lord will use them as snipers. Responsible for killing the enemy's leader. Chapter 187 50-year-old underage girl. The so-called acoustic shooting. Also called acoustic shooting. Refers to using only sound to determine the target position and hit it accurately. Many Nolder can do this. Including Resaderin. For the Nolder elves, relying on sound to identify locations is sometimes more accurate than looking with their eyes. And their bow and arrow skills have almost become instinctive in their bodies after years of continuous practice. Such voice shooters are certainly very powerful. In the view of the Lord, the Nolder elf should not use human fighting methods. Perhaps it was because the Sindarin elves in ancient times were too powerful and they used magic to fight. So the Noldor had no chance to go to the battlefield. The Noldor were originally just servants. And of course, they didn't have any martial arts skills. This is so that for a long time, the Noldor did not realize that they should start from their own strengths and use their own unique talents to fight. After fleeing their homeland and coming to the continent of Pendor, these Noldor elves, who originally had no martial arts skills, gradually learned human fighting methods and the human aristocratic enfeoffment system based on knights but only because of its long lifespan. It has developed human skills to a terrifying level through years of practice. This is also the reason why Rasadalin cannot teach humans archery. He can have such archery skills only because he has practiced it since he was a child and has practiced it for more than a hundred years. Yes, Rasadalin was over 120 years old. But among the Nolder, he could only be regarded as a young man who had just grown up. In fact, his archery skills are not scientific at all compared to human training methods and have almost no reference value to humans. It wasn't until Windadil developed her unique swordsmanship more than 200 years ago that the Noldor had their own unique martial arts. Vindadil may have been the first Noldor warrior to realize that the talents of his race should be used wisely. The sword technique she pioneered based on the elves hearing expertise to identify positions by listening to sounds actually has a strong restraint on humans. Human fighting methods rely more on the eyes. In offensive and defensive duels, you need to first observe the opponent's line of sight to judge the opponent's position. Action. Therefore, when the enemy cannot see Vindadil's sight, or is misled by Vindadil's sight direction, he will often be at a loss to attack unexpectedly. The Nolder elves, especially the Nolder girls, can fight with their ears. They can clearly judge the opponent's position based on the changes in the surrounding sounds, as if they are viewing the surroundings from a god's perspective. This way of fighting is like having eyes on the front, back, left and right. In fact, this is the same way radar works. In fact, Rissa Dillon also learned this kind of swordsmanship from Winda Deer. But male Nolder often don't use it so well. This kind of martial arts is more suitable for Nolder girls who have more sensitive hearing. So the combat effectiveness of the girl ranger is indeed high. For male rangers, this is not because women have better hearing than men, but because women are naturally more sensitive to the timbre identification and source location of sounds. In fact, the same is true for humans. When men obtain external information, their eyes and rational analysis dominate, so the brain will actively ignore some unimportant interfering information. Although there is no difference in physical structure, the difference between men and women makes the visual range that men can actually obtain wider, while the hearing range that women can actually obtain is wider. When Deerfew is Wendy Deer's best student over the years, this is probably because Wendy's ability to distinguish sounds is better than Wendy Deer himself. This is an innate talent. Through communication with Windadir and Windulf, the Lord discovered that the Nolder Elves, especially the Nolder Maidens, can clearly distinguish some sounds with very low or high frequencies that are not within the range of human ears. This sound that humans cannot hear is called infrasound or ultrasound. Common animals such as elephants and dogs can hear infrasound waves. Cats can hear ultrasonic waves. For example, there are vibrations that are silent to humans or whistling sounds that humans cannot hear or even the resonance formed by the internal organs when humans breathe. Therefore, humans often feel that these animals are particularly sensitive to danger. In fact, this is just because they hear sounds that humans cannot hear. And large animals such as elephants and whales use infrasound waves for their daily communication. 
The roars emitted by beasts like tigers are also infrasound waves. This infrasound wave can dislocate human ear joints and can also cause hearing loss and affect balance in some small animals. In the eyes of the Lord, the ability to receive infrasound and ultrasonic waves can actually have many effects. For example, the enemy's own infrasound or ultrasonic waves can be used to determine the location of key figures, and the Nolder's superb shooting skills can be used to quickly decapitate them. For example, everyone will continue to emit unique infrasound waves, which is the sound of the nasal cavity or lungs vibrating when a person breathes normally. The volume of this kind of infrasound is not small, but it is completely inaudible to humans. Moreover, this low-frequency sound is extremely penetrating and difficult to attenuate and can pass thousands of meters regardless of most obstacles. Yes, even thick walls cannot block the transmission of infrasound waves. In fact, this is why dogs can predict in advance that their owners are coming home. This is not just based on smell. Some smart cats can also hear. So we can always see cats and dogs waiting for us to come home at the door. The infrasound waves emitted by everyone are different. And humans cannot distinguish them. However, for species that can hear infrasound waves, this infrasound wave is like the sound of human speech and can be easily distinguished. Of course, when there are people everywhere, this infrasound wave will be interfered with. Just like being unable to hear other people's voices in a noisy environment. But right now, although there are many people around him, Grandmaster Igor is standing alone on the outside. So he is an extremely obvious target for the girl rangers such as Wendilf. Even if no one can be seen through the chaotic crowd, they can accurately locate the specific location of Grand Maester Igor. This is a positioning method that Leong has tried repeatedly along the way. For when a deer and when deer few. This is Leong suggesting a new direction for their skill development. So, just as the Lord and his men were resisting the Lion Knights, Igor was hit by two arrows at the same time. One in the throat and one in the chest. These happen to be the two locations where Igor emits infrasound waves. They also happen to be the two fatalities of human beings. Igor only had a look of horror in his eyes, and then fell down silently. He probably never expected that Leon would dare to shoot him directly. In other words, he didn't expect to be killed by Luya, more than a hundred meters away. These two arrows were caused by Windadier and Wendel shooting at nearly thirty degrees with only three quarters of the bow when they were blocked by the Lion Knights from seeing Igor. This is also the way Windadier shot his horse before it did look like a stray arrow. In fact, this accurate acoustic technology is comparable to radar guidance. It is easy to judge whether it is successful or not by listening to whether the target is breathing. After taking out the bow and arrow, Windolf nodded towards the Lord, then put away the bow and drew out the sword. Everyone stop! Igor is dead! Lion Knights! The Lord still couldn't see Igor, but he knew that Windolf had succeeded and started shouting. Some of the Lion Knights looked back and then started to retreat in horror. They couldn't understand. Liang's men were surrounded at the end of the bridge. It was not easy to even see Igor. Why could they shoot people to death across the bridge? After a burst of noisy chatter, the Lion Knights gradually stopped. The Lord was very satisfied with this effect, which was both intimidating and mysterious. The Lion Knights in front of him looked at Windolf as if they were looking at a god. This blindfolded mysterious man, with his incredible shooting skills. This image is infinitely close to the legendary Ulvit, the god of bows and arrows. The Lord's judgment is correct. As long as Igor dies, no Lion Knight will dare to continue to attack. They all know Leon. This guy can kidnap two governors with thousands of troops. And now he can kill Igor when he is surrounded. As long as the Lord is not dead, everyone will worry about being resented. And no one is willing to fight Leon without a mandatory order. Lion Knight! Who can tell me why you obeyed Igor's command and attacked me? Where is Lehman now? You know that I have a good relationship with him. A knight stepped forward, put his broadsword directly back into the scabbard, and replied to the lord, Lord Leon, we don't want to attack you either, but Deputy Captain Lehman is detained in Lion City. Igor University, the knight said it was because he stole the king's seal. In order to prove the loyalty of the Lion Knights, we have to. The lord looked at the Lion Knight and said, I remember you. You once supported White Deer Castle with Lehman. You also captured Governor Lemus of Bacchus with me. In that case, what is Lehman? Don't you understand this kind of person? He would steal the king's seal? Do you believe this kind of lie? Lord Leon Dot, but Dot Igor is now the king's envoy. And he represents his majesty the king. The Lion Knight obviously didn't know how to answer. Of course, he didn't believe that his immediate boss, Lehman, would conspire against him. But he didn't know how to explain it. 
Could it be that he was afraid of being implicated? Who told you that Igor can represent the king? He is just the king's personal advisor, assisting the king in handling the affairs of the House of Lords. He doesn't even have a formal position. Don't you think that the king's brother-in-law can represent the king? Then can I represent the goddess by wearing a goddess statue on my body? What you should do now is not provoke me here. But go back to Lion City to help your deputy captain clear his grievances. The Lord Lord looked around and looked at the Lion Knights around him, as if he was scolding a group of children. Lord Leon. But we. The Lion Knight hesitated. What are you afraid of? Whoever framed Lehman is the one who stole the seal. It's obvious. You fools would actually listen to Igor's orders? You are the royal knights who belong directly to the king. What do you need to worry about? If I were you, I would stay by the king's side. Let the king see your loyalty with his own eyes. And let the king personally give you orders. You can't understand such a simple thing. Right? The lord shook his head. A little speechless at these brainless knights. No wonder the guy Lehman, who has far more muscles than brains, became the deputy captain because the other lion knights were too stupid and had to be the tallest among the dwarfs. In that case, Dot Lord Leong, we will report everything that happened here to your majesty. You? The lion knight looked back at Igor who fell on the other side of the bridge. Just report it truthfully. That's it. Igor framed Sir Lehman, falsely reported the king's order and plotted to control the lion knights and attack me for no reason. As a result, I counterattacked and killed him. That's the truth. You have to remember. You guys, this is the Royal Knights. And you should not take orders from anyone else except the king and the commander-in-chief of the order. The Lord doesn't care at all. So what if he kills Igor? What happened to the king's brother-in-law? If this brother-in-law is really that important, he should have become a real high-ranking official long ago. But until now, Igor doesn't even have a formal title. And he has to call Leong, sir, when he sees him. Igor is not the legitimate son of the family. And his dead queen sister has not brought him any substantial benefits. Strictly speaking, he is just an ordinary young son of a nobleman. Just a knight. Framing Lehman and instructing the Lion Knights to attack him. This obviously means that Igor wants to control Lehman's Lion Knights. Would King Ulrich put up with something like this? I'm afraid Ulrika will say it was a good kill. The Knights of the Lion are the foundation for King Ulrich to secure the Silver Throne. Whoever dares to touch the Knights of the Lion will die. Leon killed Igor, which was a real act of rebellion for King Ulrich. So the Lord felt relieved. Besides, Leon still owes King Ulrich 100,000 dinars. How can a brother-in-law be as important as military power and dinars? The people of the Lion Knights retreated, and the Lord led the team back to White Deer Castle, still walking through the no-man's land between the Lion Realm and Bacchus. Windulf has taken off the cloth that blindfolded her eyes. It was just to prevent the Lion Knights from seeing her identity. Now there is no need to hide it. Lord Leon, I can feel that those Lion Knights seem to be a little afraid of you. Don't they claim to be the strongest knights in the continent? Why are they afraid of you? Windife was a little curious. My Lord has done many things before. And everyone in the Lion Knights knows it. Lisa Dillon began to tell when Deerfew what happened after meeting Leon. How 40 broke a thousand. Going deep into the enemy camp to kidnap two governors defeating the evil three prophets, etc. Wendy's eyes gleamed as she heard Sadron telling the story as an adventure story. And Wendy probably thought of these as nightly adventures. Lord Leong, can I join your team? I can't repay you for saving my life. I can only wield my sword for you and help you face powerful enemies. After walking to the mountains to the north of Shieldwind Fortress, Wendell suddenly asked, Wendy! Wendadier's eyes were full of surprise and incomprehension. Are you going back to the clan? But, teacher, Master Leong saved me. And I always want to repay you. You also said that grudges must be clear. Before, I thought that I couldn't help Master Leong. So I didn't mention it in order not to cause trouble. But now it seems that if I follow Master Liang's method, my archery skills may be able to help. Wendell took Wendadier's arm and rubbed it. But it was obviously not these reasons that drove her to do so. Wendy, I know you just want to take risks. I want you to stop reading those chivalry novels. Wendadier looked a little helpless. Lord Leong, do you need a team member like me? I know a lot. Wendy turned around and started to sell herself to Leong. It was obvious that Wendadier was right. She just wanted to take risks. Actually, that's fine. Wendadier, your learning skills are still very good. The temple is thirsty and the clothes are fierce. Of course, the Lord was happy to add such a powerful partner. But he looked at Wendelfa's young face and hesitated a little. 
Winnie's face was so tender. She looked like a 15 or 16 year old girl in her rebellious stage. She is only 50 years old. So of course she is not an adult. If she were an adult, I wouldn't object to her reading chivalry novels. Windadier said with a frown. The Lord almost fell off his horse on the spot. A 50 year old underage girl? Okay. The growth and development cycle of elves is indeed relatively long. What? I can't learn anything in the clan anymore. I can only shoot rabbits every day when I go back. Mr. Vendidal, I want to stay by your side. Besides, humans are adults when they are teenagers. Windulf was quite dissatisfied with the term. Underage. And rubbed Windetier's arm again and started acting coquettishly. Okay. Okay, Dot, but you can't make your own decisions rashly. Lord Leong is a wise captain. And you must obey his arrangements. Windadier sighed, smoothed Windeer's hair, and looked at Windy with doting eyes, probably unable to resist Windeer's rogue behavior. Of course, I've always been obedient. Well, I mean obey military orders. Windulf laughed. Her big eyes curved into purple crescents, and turned to face Leong. Sir, can I get a salary? I have a lot of things I want to buy. The Lord also laughed. I will give you the same salary as Lisa Dillon. Wendy, however, you can't make much money living on a salary. Wendy turned her head and gave Lisa Dillon a questioning look. I actually don't live on salary. Wendy, in fact, no one under Lord Leon cares about salary at all. Lisa Dillon also raised a rare eyebrow and smiled. If you don't rely on salary, what do you rely on? It can't be based on robbery. Right? Wendy suddenly became excited as she spoke. Hey, can we go rob the enemy? The Lord laughed loudly. Uh-huh. Wendy, we can make money much faster than robbing. Windorf has joined your team. Chapter 188 You always have to pay back if you come out to fool around. How about we let the Nolder Elves go plunder? At this moment, Amy said the same words as Windyf in the Lord's Hall of White Deer Castle. Uh-huh. Miss Amy must do things happily. I said that the elves should be allowed to rob him. And Dong Jia stood behind Anson, gestured with his thumb, then stuck his head out of the door of the Lord's Hall, and then came back. Huh? Fortunately, Sir Roland is not here. Don't say robbery in front of Sir Roland. Otherwise, he will easily talk about it. Since the last time, he escorted hundreds of elderly people to Serenis. Roland seems to have contracted the common habit of nagging among the elderly. And Dong Jia had only been in White Deer Castle for a few days. But Roland had already scolded her several times for swearing. And for not being able to change her bad habit of grabbing fruit from a street stall without paying. Things like robbery are not in line with the code of conduct of the paladin. Even if he incites the Nolder elves to rob, Roland will definitely continue to think about it. Warning these young people to take the right path and don't always think about crooked ways. Otherwise, the people in the territory will learn bad things, leading to an increase in bandits in the territory and the goddess Astalia will be unhappy. And so on. In fact, Sir Roland's thoughts are basically reasonable. And it is usually difficult for several young people to refute them. But no one can resist this old father's nagging. Therefore, when it comes to things that are not very legal, everyone will avoid Sir Roland with a tacit understanding. Of course, it is also possible to change the term and tell Roland. For example, Sarah changed her explanation now. Because the Lord often asked her to Pay attention to your words. In the past, she now has great experience in explaining nouns. Ahem. This is not called robbery. If Sir Roland asks, tell him that our allies took the initiative to help us regain the strategic materials that belong to us. Sarah looked around, and everyone present nodded. Then, is this settled? But, do we want to help? That is the first brigade of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. There are more than 300 people, and they are quite capable of fighting. Amy held her chin up, looking a little hesitant. Those are all Nolda Rangers. They don't need our help to deal with the Ebony Gauntlets, Sarah said. Anson, those Nolda Rangers have a good relationship with you. Go and talk to them. But your lord hasn't come back yet, and we can't command those Nolda Rangers. The people of White Deer Castle are already a little uneasy about their existence. Letting them rob nearby will probably cause panic. Anson was also a little hesitant. I think it doesn't matter. Isn't it normal for the Nolder Elves to attack the Ebony Gauntlet Knights? Wasn't it our original dilemma how to drive away the Ebony Gauntlet Knights? It's unreasonable not to let them enter the city now. But if they see so many Nolder Rangers in the city, the consequences will be even more serious. Amy stood up. Besides, there are so many Gato horses. If we can get those horses, 
We can train a large number of cavalry before the autumn harvest. Anyway, the Ebony Gauntlet Knights don't ride horses. So it's quite a waste in their hands. Everyone nodded in agreement. And even Anson felt that those Gatuma must be obtained. In fact, this matter started when the Ebony Gauntlet Knights were persuaded by Leon to go to the north of the Noldor Forest to pick up leaks. The Lord originally asked Dumbledore, the Knight Commander of the 1st Battalion of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights, to go to the north of the Noldor Forest, saying that he could stop the Gatoans and obtain Noldor prisoners of war and many Gatumas. Dumbledore did go, but he didn't get any Noldor prisoners of war. Few Gatoans who entered the forest could escape from the forest alive. So it was naturally impossible to capture the Noldor elves. But Dumbledore did obtain a large number of God of War horses. These were the horses left in the north of the Noldor Forest after the troops of Judah the Destroyer entered the Noldor Forest. At that time, there were only a dozen people left outside to guard the horses, and Dumbledore easily killed them. Then those ownerless horses left at the edge of the forest were smoothly taken away by Dumbledore. However, the supplies brought by the Knights of the Ebony Gauntlets were originally small, and now they had hundreds of more horses to feed. In addition, the Gatoans would definitely not give up and would probably come after them. In order to avoid fighting hungry, Dumbledore, we can only retreat first with people. A few hours ago, the Ebony Gauntlet Knights retreated from the north to the gates of White Deer Castle. They had no supplies at all and hoped to enter the city to purchase food and grass. But because Anson happened to bring the 200 Nolder Rangers back to White Deer Castle a few days ago, and because of the relationship between the Ebony Gauntlet Knights and the Nolder Elves, the two sides would definitely fight to a bloody meeting. So Amy didn't let them enter the city. In the absence of Leong, it is normal for Amy, a girl, not to let the armed forces enter the city. Although the people of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights were a little dissatisfied. They didn't say anything. They set up camp in a village outside the city and then went to the surrounding villages to purchase supplies. But at this time, Amy discovered that the Ebony Gauntlet Knights were carrying a large number of Gatuma. So she became curious. All members of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights were walking and not riding horses at all. It is normal to bring a few cars to load things. But why do you bring so many horses? And that's not a small number. It's more than 600 horses. And they are all top-grade war horses. So Sarah went over to communicate with the people of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. After learning that this was picked up from the north, Amy, who wanted to help the Lord increase his strength, couldn't help but move on the spot. Heart. There are more than 600 war horses, with a market value of about 300,000 dinars. If we could get these horses and train a group of cavalry, we would be able to have the strength of a duke just around the corner. Anyway, the Knights of the Ebony Gauntlets picked it up. Moreover, Amy has no good impression of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. The Ebony Gauntlet Knights have been capturing Nolder Elves around White Deer Castle for a long time, causing a lot of trouble to the residents of White Deer Castle. Some Nolder will even attack White Deer. The residents of the villages surrounding the fort took revenge on humans. The people of White Deer Castle have always hated these slave-catching teams. After all, they were the ones causing trouble. But these people ran away after causing trouble. And it was the civilians in the surrounding villages who suffered. In fact, Amy, like the Lord, also hopes to gain the trust and friendship of the Nolder. This will at least prevent the residents of White Deer Castle from being attacked by the Nolder Elves and also allow White Deer Castle to continue to expand its territory. If the Nolder no longer attack the people of White Deer Fort, then White Deer Fort can even extend its territory hundreds of miles away. Both the cultivated land and minerals can increase significantly, and the number of people willing to settle there will also increase. Many. So Amy had a plan to let the Nolder Rangers rob the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. The Nolder have been robbed by the Knights of the Ebony Gauntlet for a long time. This can be regarded as revenge and revenge. Besides, those Gatumas are also useful to the Nolder Rangers. The Nolder Elf horses are actually hybrid horses. Obtaining a large number of Gatumas is also very helpful in cultivating Nolder horses. So, that night, a force of 200 Nolder Rangers attacked the camp of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights at night. Dumbledore was probably having a bad year this year, as he was twice attacked by the Nolder at night in the camp. But he is indeed an astute commander, and he does have good judgment. Once again, he abandoned the camp and took the people away as soon as he was attacked. He knew that they would definitely not be able to defeat 200 Nolder Rangers at night. Well, you can't beat it during the day either. So they were chased for dozens of miles by the Nolder Rangers. Amy, Anson, and Dongjia and others led the soldiers to get all the Gatuma into White Deer Castle. 
because Dumbledore saw opportunities quickly. The casualties of the Ebony Gauntlet Knights were not large. But they once again encountered an even more unlucky thing. It is said that misfortunes never come singly. They happened to run into a Norse army south of White Deer Castle. Many troops. This is Islandel's army. Islandel wanted to talk to Leon about how to cooperate in the future. Since the Lord went to rescue the girl rangers, he sent a force to wait for Leon to return 50 miles south of White Deer Castle. As a result, the unlucky knights of the Ebony Gauntlets were attacked from both sides. But fortunately, Dumbledore met the noble lord again and returned here just at this time. I don't know whether I should say that Dumbledore is bad luck or good luck in this situation. Anyway, the two fatal situations Dumbledore faced were caused by White Deer Castle. But Dumbledore did not die both times. Moreover, he was saved in danger by Leon both times. In fact, the Lord didn't know what was happening at the time. Before meeting Dumbledore, Wendolf, who had extremely keen ears, suddenly said that there seemed to be the sound of a large number of weapons clashing in front. When such a sound appears, it can only mean that one thing is at war. So the Lord asked Windadir to take the Nordo girls and the team to avoid the woods first, and then cautiously approached the place where the sound came from. Dumbledore almost burst into tears when he saw Leon, because as soon as the Lord's banner appeared, the Noldor who were chasing him began to retreat. Dumbledore didn't understand the reason for this. In fact, even Leon didn't know the reason. Only the young Noldor rangers knew that since Leon's flag was back, this meant that Windadir must also be back. The Noldor rangers' attack on the Ebony Gauntlet Knights this time was an unauthorized act, and their teacher would be punished by Vendadir, who was usually very strict. Anyway, those Gatuma have been obtained, and everything that needs to be snatched has been snatched. Those Ebony Gauntlet Knights who hate Noldo are also dealt with by the troops of the Aino family, and they are probably dead. In this case, of course, they had to run away quickly to avoid being lectured by the teacher. As soon as they retreated, Dumbledore very smartly formed a circular formation with the remaining hundred or so people on the spot and stopped escaping. Later, Dumbledore himself waved their iron fist, flag and signal to Leon's cavalry, intending to wait for Leon to come for support. This decision barely stabilized the position. It was not because of how powerful the Ebony Gauntlet Knights were. In fact, they had already been defeated. They were able to survive only because the Aino family's troops also retreated slightly and did not attack them desperately. In fact, the Aino family's troops were a little confused. They saw a group of Noldor rangers chasing the Ebony Gauntlet Knights. So they temporarily helped. Now that the main chasing force has retreated, the Ebony Gauntlet Knights have also formed a circular formation. Of course, they will not increase their attack intensity at this time. They want to avoid losses as much as possible. The Twilight Knight who leads the team is the confidant who has been by Islandil's side. He knows very well that His Highness has never been willing to let them attack the enemy. If the losses are too great, His Highness Islandil will feel distressed. As a result, it was as if the two Noldor troops were afraid of Liang's flag. As soon as the Lord's Golden Griffin flag arrived on the battlefield, the war actually ceased. Dumbledore is now full of fear of Leon. The Noldor Ranger force behind him retreated without knowing where to go after seeing Leon's flag, while the other Noldor force retreated 200 meters and seemed to have no intention of taking action. Is Lord Leon so powerful in the eyes of the Noldor Elves? He only brought 40 or 50 cavalry. Can this scare away the Noldor troops of 3 to 400 people? Dumbledore would not suspect that Leon colluded with the Noldor Elves. After all, Leon himself kept Elven slaves. And Leon did save him from the Noldor Elves last time. Besides, given the hostile attitude of the Noldor Elves towards humans, Dumbledore did not believe that any human could command the Noldor army. Therefore, Dumbledore, who was rescued again, almost faced Leon with a pilgrim attitude. He thought this was because Leon had established a huge reputation with his combat power in White Deer Castle. After all, the Bacchus people said that Leon was a man-eating demon. So Dumbledore thought that Leon was probably the same in the eyes of the Noldor. If the Noldor elves can be so feared, doesn't that make him worthy of being called the Great Demon? Lord Leon, I am lucky to meet you again. Dumbledore didn't even dare to raise his head in front of the Lord. He was not so reserved when he met the king. In the eyes of his enemies, he was a devil, which was equivalent to a hero of his country. Oh, Dumbledore, didn't you go north? Why are you here? The Lord doesn't even know that his image in Dumbledore's eyes is basically equated with that of the big devil. He is still wondering, is Dumbledore actually so courageous? Do you still dare to come here to cause trouble for the Nolder Elves? Dumbledore was about to cry. Lord Leon, 
your original advice was indeed correct. We obtained a large number of Gatuma in the north. But just now, those horses were snatched away by the Nolder troops. Huh? No, no? Did you steal Gatuma from you? Leong doubted whether he was hallucinating. You mean, the Ebony Gauntlet Knights were robbed by the Nolder? Sure enough. You always have to pay back if you mess around. This is so embarrassing. The Knights of the Ebony Gauntlet have always been dedicated to robbing Noldor, and have always been proud of it. They also call themselves the Light of Humanity. This is indeed a shame. With a sad face, Dumbledore looked at the Noldor troops, who were gradually retreating into the forest and disappearing. Lord Leon, how did you do that? What? Leon also glanced at the Noldor troops, and he could realize that they might be Islandel's troops. Why are the Noldor so afraid of you? They retreated when they saw your banner appear. Dumbledore pointed to Leon's griffin flag. The Lord rolled his eyes and pretended to smile deeply. Dumbledore, I'm afraid you shouldn't be thinking about this now. Right. How much did you lose when you led the team this time? Dumbledore was stunned, obviously not expecting that Leon would turn the topic to losses. But he immediately understood what the Lord meant. Lord Leon, you are right to remind me. I'm afraid I won't be able to return to Chiaoyan Bay. Dumbledore now had less than a hundred men left but he had not obtained any loot, and all the mercenaries were gone. Originally, we had obtained a large number of Gatuma in the north, and our team's losses were not large, so we could give an explanation when we returned. But now, the Ebony Gauntlet Knights have lost more than half of their main force in his hands, and they were still beaten like this by Noldo. As the leading knight, if Dumbledore dares to return to Cliff Bay like this, he may have to become a slave as soon as he returns. The concept of class is completely finished, the entire knights would become a laughingstock. Maybe it will disband. In that case, Dumbledore, you'd better send someone back to report that you captured many Nordic girls with huge losses, but were robbed by the Gato people. Otherwise you will definitely not have a good life. Yes, it is better to be robbed by the Gatoans than to be robbed by the Nolder. At least you knights will not become a laughingstock. Let's go to the north and go back to Cliff Bay. You know, the Lord thought for a while and came up with an idea again. Lord Leong, you are right. Dumbledore felt that the Lord was indeed his noble man, and every suggestion he gave was on point. Maybe it's not necessarily a bad thing that the losses are relatively large. There are only less than a hundred people now, so at least they no longer need to worry about supply issues. The Lord was even kind enough to give Dumbledore a lot of food from his cavalry. So Dumbledore left this sad place with the remaining defeated generals, and turned to the north. He wanted to go around the north hook up with the Gato people, and attract the Gato people to come to the border. This is like, they were robbed by the Gato people. Lord Leon, you should know that we hate the Ebony Gauntlet Knights quite a lot. Wendadier, who returned to the team, expressed a little emotion to the Lord. Of course I know, but without them, there will be other knights such as Ebony Shields, Ebony Armors, or Darkwood Gauntlets coming to the Nolder Forest. Wendadir is a small group of natural, it is the noble people who are the cause of the hostility between the two races. Not the knights of the ebony gauntlets. They are just enforcers. And it would be beneficial to let them continue to exist. If they are completely eliminated, it will definitely cause some panic. But it will bring in more powerful enemies to the Noldor forest. Leon said to Wendadir seriously. Chapter 189. They are all traitors and traitors. Why can't we live in harmony? In most of the stories written by humans. Elves are regarded as allies. But why do they actually respond with malice? Wendell sighed and expressed her incomprehension. Because the novels are all written by poor scholars. Dot, but those who control the power are never poor scholars. Besides, do you think those ebony gauntlet knights really hate the Nolder that much? The Lord shook his head and smiled. Wendy, in order to maintain the species balance in the Nolder forest, your clan will control the number of animals in the forest. So you will be allowed to shoot rabbits and wild deer. But you guys really like to shoot rabbits. Wendy looked thoughtfully at the forest next to her. Sir, if you became the person who controlled the continent, what would you do? Would you also use this method to maintain the balance of species? Ha ha dot Wendy. The best way to maintain ecological balance is to introduce the missing animals into the forest to make the ecology complete. Killing innocent herbivores is not a method worth advocating. Several elf kings probably, I just did it out of necessity when there was no other way. The lord said with a smile. Introducing missing animals. I understand. There is a lack of beasts in our forest. So there are too many rabbits. But there is no place to find the beasts. 
so we have no choice but to kill the excess rabbits. Then in Pender. Sir, you should it's the rarest kind of beast. Right. Windolf looked at the Lord, her eyes full of expectation. No. Wendy, I am the one who breeds beasts. The Lord Lord looked at Windirfew and said seriously, Sir, maybe you should really control the continent. Windive seemed to be joking, half teasingly and half seriously. When Leong returned to White Deer Fort, the latest changes in Chunghe Town happened to be reported back to White Deer Fort. And Eric returned at this time. Chunghe Town was controlled by Grand Ron, the flag officer of the Lion Lake City Flag Guard. And he did so by holding the golden seal of the King of the Lion Kingdom. Although everyone thought this was outrageous. Eric said that Lord Godric could confirm that the gold seal was genuine. So although everyone is uneasy, they can only wait and see the situation. But Godric did not return to White Heart Keep. He is the commander-in-chief of the Eastern Military Affairs appointed by the king. Now that this situation has happened in Chunga Town, of course, he will go to Lysher City to find out. This is his responsibility. Only the operation of Chang'e Express has not been affected at all. Grand Lan may not know that Chang'e Express is actually an army. Therefore, it didn't take long for the Chang'e Express team to bring complete news to White Deer Castle. After Fawcett killed all his brothers and sisters, he led Sherhu City to commit treason. The crime of kin killing cannot be concealed. Alma once lost her territory because of the same thing. If Fawcett doesn't do something, he will definitely end up with a more tragic end. Therefore, before the Lion City had time to react, Father unilaterally terminated his allegiance to King Ulrich on the grounds that the king was unable to protect the lives and interests of the nobles, and publicly declared that he would no longer obey the Lion City. Any order from the kingdom. This reason actually makes sense. Because the death of Duke Alfwan was very strange before. But Ulrich ignored it at all, and instead plotted to seize Alfwan's fief. During the time when father was in charge of Lion Lake City, the king did not help him. Instead, he kept using him to contain Alma. When Chang'e Town was besieged by the three prophets, the king did not send troops to attack them. Instead, he symbolically imprisoned the three prophets after everything was over without even a punishment. As for Alma's death, the king didn't care at all. Of course, this was indeed because it happened too suddenly, and he didn't have time to care. But in any case, many nobles in the northern region felt that father's approach was understandable. And indeed many nobles, who were closely related to the Horton family responded to this matter. Another part of the nobles, who did not want to join Fawcett were forced to leave their territory and move to Fawcett. Fawcett asked them to leave the Gulf of Tonkin on their own, or else the whole family would be exiled. However, after Fawcett rebelled against King Ulrich, he did not act foolishly and declare himself king. He began to openly support Lady Ursula of Crowland and announced that he would help Queen Ursula restore her kingdom. It is said that Lady Ursula promised that if Fawcett could help her regain her kingdom, she would seal the entire inner sea of Lion Lake to Fawcett, the first duke. In fact, Father has now been appointed as the Grand Duke of Lion Lake by Mrs. Ursula. It is not Lion Lake City, but Lion Lake, which refers to all the cities along the entire Lion Lake Inland Sea. This is a huge area that spans most of the prosperous towns in Raven and Lion, and is almost the same size as a country. Fawcett's series of operations strengthened the Horton family's confidence in Fawcett. After going through many things, this young playboy finally grew into a real duke like Alma. The way he was acting now, he looked like Alma herself. Of course, the promise given by Mrs. Ursula is not a real reward. Ursula is actually just a rebel in the Crow Kingdom. Like Dalian, she is a claimant to the throne. Not a real king. However, what she claims is the throne of Crow Kingdom. Lady Ursula is the sister and biological sister of the current king of Crow Kingdom, Gregory IV. In fact, the legal claim she made is indeed quite reliable. Because according to the succession order in Pendor, Ursula, as the eldest daughter, does have the right to inherit the throne. And logically speaking, she is indeed the first heir. In addition, Mrs. Ursula is the chief knight of the Falcon Knights. Although this, chief, is definitely just because of her background. It can at least prove that she is not the kind of aristocratic woman who knows nothing. At least she can be considered. A man who is highly versatile in both civil and military affairs should at least have the same rights of inheritance and rule as Gregory IV. However, Crowland is a relatively traditional place. The men of Ravenland all call themselves brave guardians of the north. Yes, even the farmers call themselves that because 150 years ago, the warriors of Ravenland did fight back with their own strength. Massive invasion of the Misty Mountains. 
these Krolin warriors, who consider themselves brave, advocate force, so they have some psychological barriers to obeying a woman, especially the Highland warriors who fell into the bay. Strangely enough, those so-called barbarians don't discriminate against women, nor do truly civilized people. On the contrary, the kind of half-toned people who are between barbarians and civilized people will discriminate this way and that way, probably because of low self-esteem. Six years ago, when Gregory IV and Lady Ursula were competing for the throne, the exact words Gregory IV used to attract supporters were, My sister, that pretender to the throne and private knight, no matter what she is a woman no matter what, no self-respecting Northland man would follow a woman. As a result, such words really aroused the so-called dignity mentality of the men in Ravenland. For this reason, Lady Ursula lost the battle for the throne. Even the Falcon Knights were defeated by Gregory. The fourth was declared an illegal knighthood. This result has led to the civil war in Crolin that has continued to this day. The War for Restoration, launched by Lady Ursula has not stopped for a moment in the past six years. But no matter what the situation is between Ursula and Raven, at least Fawcett, who claims loyalty to Lady Ursula must be treason. As for Grand Long and Chang'e Town, it's a different situation. According to the escorts of Chang'e Express, Grand Lan did not take down the Golden Lion flag of the Lion Kingdom after occupying Chang'e Town. He even put the Duke of Alma's flag back on the city head of Chang'e Town. Moreover, he did not restrict the access to Chang'e Town, nor did he even harass the residents of Chang'e Town. He just kept increasing his military strength. The Shurhu City Flag Guard has 500 heavy cavalry. In addition, Gronlong did not know where he got hundreds of miscellaneous troops. But these miscellaneous troops seem to have quite strong combat effectiveness. In addition to continuously increasing his military power, Gronlong did only one thing in Lonha Town. He held a large-scale funeral for the Duke of Alma. In other words, it should be called a memorial service. After all, Duke Alma's bones had already been buried near Lion Lake City. But the funeral that Nelda held for Alma was so sloppy that it was unimaginable that the former first duke of the kingdom would be buried with only dozens of family members present. It was so shabby that it was not as good as some well-liked commoners. According to the etiquette that a duke should have, Granlon formally reorganized a proper ceremony for Alma. There were indeed many people in Chungha town who voluntarily participated in the funeral. Most of them middle-aged and elderly people. Alma actually did a good job when he governed Chungha town. He may have been seeking power throughout his life, rising up in conspiracies, and dying in conspiracies. But he has never harmed the civilians of Chang'e Town. Alma had governed Chang'e Town on and off for many years as an acting lord or administrator. To the old people in Chang'e Town, he was actually a good lord. Therefore, 2,000 people participated in this memorial service. Residents brought daisies that had just bloomed in early autumn to the ceremony, and their petals covered the Chang'e Town Square. Alma's life has finally come to an end. He actually fulfilled most of his wishes before his death. And after his death, 2,000 people were sincerely willing to give him bouquets of flowers. This may be a satisfactory result for Alma. Of course, Granlin's decision to hold this funeral in Chang'e Town may not be out of loyalty to the Duke of Alma. Maybe he was telling people in this way that he was still Alma's son-in-law. Moreover, he achieved his most important goal in this way. Father only brought a guard of more than a hundred people to Chang'e Town to express his condolences to his father. The funeral was watched by the bodyguards of Chang'e Express. The bodyguards saw with their own eyes that Father appeared alone in the square and was surrounded by Grand Lawn and others. The two sides argued for a long time. Of course, it is impossible to know what they said specifically. But in the end, Fawcett was brought to the square by Grand Lawn. And he knelt down in front of Alma's portrait and bid his father a final farewell. No matter how much father and son quarrel, they are still father and son after all. After the funeral, the guards brought by Fawcett left Lunga Town. But Fawcett himself could not leave. He was detained by Granlon. After learning all this, the Lord had a rare hesitation. He began to repeatedly calculate the strength in his hands and seemed determined to do something. But he was a little undecided. Leon actually rarely hesitates. He makes decisions quickly most of the time. Even if he makes a mistake, it is better to make a quick decision and then correct it quickly than to hesitate. But this time, he fell into thinking for a long time and did not even organize everyone to discuss it together. In fact, no one could discuss his thoughts with him this time except Godric, who was not here. He wants to raise the banner of rebels and attack the rebels in Chang'e Town and Shurhu City. The Lion Kingdom is now full of rebellious officials and traitors. 
What a great opportunity. However, to fight against rebellion, you have to do your best. And many things must be stopped. Moreover, once troops are sent out, there is no turning back. And there will be many sequelae. The Lord's hesitation is actually because it is difficult to measure the cost effectiveness. Is it more cost effective to send troops to fight rebellion? Or is it more cost effective to concentrate on development? If we raise troops to fight against the rebellion now, and while Fusset is still under control in Chang'e town, the escorts who use the Chang'e Express to cooperate inside and outside to capture Chang'e town should have a high chance of success. If you capture Chang'e town at this time, you can control Fathered, which is almost equivalent to capturing Shuru city at the same time. But there are consequences to taking Long River town. Just like Godric is unwilling to resist Gronlin. Attacking Gronlin, who holds the king's gold seal, may be settled by the future. At the same time, Liang's troops are insufficient. There are Shuru city flag guards in Chang'e town. And hundreds of unknown troops with strong combat capabilities. If the escorts of Chang'e Express can think that the combat capabilities are very strong, they must be beyond the level of the general garrison. Moreover, he didn't understand Granlon or the unknown army. So he could only do his best. This means that to fight the war, you may need to rely on the power of the Nolder Elves. However, before the Nolder Elves were accepted by people, they appeared in Leon's team to fight together. This may make Leon the target of public criticism and be detrimental to future development. At the same time, now is a good opportunity to hide in White Deer Castle and develop rapidly. We have made so many arrangements before and even let those Nolder Rangers live in White Deer Keep. As long as Wushi develops for a period of time, reaches a long-term cooperation with Islandel, and then uses food and logistics to control the eastern region according to the planned plan. It is inevitable and relatively safe to become a big boss in the east in a few months. Once a war breaks out, these solid development plans will be interrupted, and many efforts will be in vain. Therefore, the Lord hesitated all night and still could not make up his mind. Chung Ha Town Grand Ron was playing with the king's golden seal. He was also hesitating. And he was also hesitating all night. He hesitated whether to kill Fawcett or exchange Fawcett for Lion Lake City. After welcoming Father back from Raven Realm and taking charge of the Lion Lake City flag guard again, Grandlon was the first to discover the king's golden seal in the Lord's Hall of Lion Lake City. The seal seemed to appear out of thin air. Of course, Igor's men secretly put this in the drawer of the Lord's Hall. Fawcett almost never stayed in the Lord's Hall in Lion Lake City. He had been living in the garrison camp since returning to Lion Lake City. He killed his own sister in the Lord's Hall. And of course, he didn't want to stay there. Therefore, Fawcett did not know that there was such a sudden appearance of the King's Seal. Granlon had no intention of telling Fawcett. In fact, Granlon wanted to kill Fawcett. On the one hand, Nelda is Granlon's wife after all. Even if the relationship breaks down and the couple gets divorced, they will still be bonded. But Fawcett killed Nelda as soon as he came back. On the other hand, Granlon welcomed Fawcett back. His original idea was to use Fawcett and Mirgon to fight in the ring. And he would benefit from controlling the military power himself. If he hadn't had this idea, he would not have supported Fawcett. He remembered the way Fawcett used to control the first flag guard of Lion Lake City to control everyone's wives, children, and children. Moreover, Granlon repeatedly jumped between the Duke of Alma and Fawcett which was a sign of disloyalty. Sooner or later Fawcett would not be able to tolerate him. But who would have known that Fawcett quickly took control of the power of Lion Lake City with a series of ruthless performances, leaving Milgon with no room to perform. And Granlon's ideas were also in vain. So Granlon felt that his life was in danger, and that his whole family was in danger. So, Granlon left Lion Lake City with a Lion Lake City flag guard on the pretext of hunting Mirgon, and at the same time took away the king's gold seal. Then. He went to Chang'e town and tried to deceive the city. Unexpectedly, he easily used the king's seal to capture Chang'e town. Granlon felt that when the opportunity came, he felt that he could lure father to Lung'e town and kill him. If Fawcett dies, Lion Lake City will definitely be in chaos again. Granlon can completely rely on his connections in Lion Lake City and occupy Lion Lake City with the flag guard, who is the representative of the citizens of Lion Lake City. At that time, he could even return to the Lion Kingdom with the saying of Enduring the country with humiliation and eliminating rebellion. Granlon felt that he might be able to take the position of Duke because of this. It doesn't matter even if he occupied Chang'e town with lies. The Duke of Alma's series of operations after returning to Lion Lake City not long ago has made Grandron understand a fundamental truth. As long as he has soldiers and horses in his hands, 
There will naturally be people to help him weave lies. So Grand Lawn held a memorial service. Fawcett did come. And entered the memorial service alone. And fell into Granlon's hands. But Granlon did not dare to kill him. Because father claimed to have detained all of Granlon's family members in Shurhu City. And if something happened to him, his men would kill Granlon's family. Moreover, Fawcett also proposed a plan that made Grand Long very interested. The two sides are now holding each other hostage. Then Fawcett is willing to trade Shurhu City for Chang'e Town, allowing Grand Long to become the master of Shurhu City, and exchange Fawcett to settle in Chang'e Town. From the bottom of his heart, Grand Long is willing to change cities. But the problem is that his current status is embarrassing. With Father still alive, it will be more troublesome for Grand Long to completely control Shurhu City. Only when Father dies will Lion Lake City truly listen to Granlin's orders. But if he killed Fawcett, his whole family would probably die. And he didn't want to risk the lives of his family on what Fawcett's men would do. Therefore, Granlon hesitated, hesitating all night. Chapter 190 Elite Gathering Sir, there is an urgent military situation. At night, the Lord's hesitation was forced to end. A soldier on duty at night ran into the lobby on the ground floor of the main building and handed Leon a letter. The letter contained some not-so-good news. The Crow Realm's army was heading south across the Gatu grassland. This letter came from Baron Leofric of Brave Shield Keep. The Raven Kingdom had previously assembled heavy troops in the area of Shielu City and Oldenburg. But at that time, it was to deal with the Gato people. Now that the Jada people have retreated, the Crow Kingdom's army has not disbanded, but has gone directly south. Although the Crow Kingdom did not declare war on the Lion Kingdom, their army moved southward after entering the Gatu grassland. This was obviously not to fight back against the Gatu people, but to enter the Kingdom of Lion. This is obviously a plan to attack the Lion Kingdom without declaring war. The Crow Kingdom crossed the Gatu grassland to attack the Lion Kingdom. This was actually very rare, because it was difficult to predict how the Gatu people would react. The Crow Kingdom and the Lion Kingdom rarely fought in the Northeast. Moreover, an undeclared war will be regarded as malicious aggression. A country's unjust and sudden attack on a country that has been living in peace before can easily lead to the entire continent joining forces to fight against it. In this era, wars between countries usually have an origin. For example, last year King Ulrich launched a war against the Bacchus Empire on the grounds of recovering lost territory, and the Bacchus Empire's attack on White Deer Castle was a counterattack against this war. The Lion Kingdom and the Bacchus Empire have not signed an armistice agreement for more than half a year. So under this situation, no matter how they attack each other, they are tenable. However, the Crow Kingdom and the Lion Kingdom had no unresolved disputes before, and they had even signed a peace agreement. So undeclared war against a peaceful country would be purely an act of aggression. Of course, looking at it from another perspective, the Crow Kingdom can indeed send an army into the Lion Realm now. And there is also a barely tenable moral reason for Fawcett to take Lion Lake City and declare allegiance to Lady Ursula and Lady Ursula is a rebel from Ravenland. The Crow Kingdom marched towards Shurhu City on the pretext of exterminating the rebels. This was reasonable. But the extermination was really a bit far. But the problem is that the castle directly facing the border of the Lion Kingdom is not Lion Lake City, but Eagle Claw Castle and Brave Shield Castle. The intention of taking advantage of the situation is obvious. Therefore, Baron Leofric immediately sent people to spread the news to various towns. And White Deer Castle was probably the first to receive the news. Leofric was not sure how the Raven Kingdom's army would operate, nor how the Gatoans would react. He felt that the Gatoans might also take advantage of the situation, and was worried that his brave shield castle would not be able to withstand it. So he asked Leon requested reinforcements. After receiving the news of asking for help, the Lord no longer hesitated. The current situation was obviously not suitable for sending troops to quell the rebellion. Otherwise it would just be a wedding dress for other countries. The chaotic struggle within the Lion Kingdom has obviously been known to other countries. If nothing else, in addition to the Crow Kingdom, Fields Way and the Bacchus Empire may want to seize the opportunity. Although the Lion Kingdom and fears we just signed an alliance more than half a year ago, King Vides may not be bound by a piece of paper. And this person only became the king, from, chief, more than half a year ago. The alliance boss may need a victory to consolidate his position. And the empire of Bacchus finally came to an end. Risa Dillon Go and call Winda Deer. The Lord Lord shouted towards the side of the seemingly empty hall. It was early in the morning. And the space on the side of the hall seemed dark and empty. But Leon knew that someone must be protecting him. Sir! Lisa Dillon went to guard the outside. But I am here. 
Wendell jumped down from the top of the pitch black hall. Looking for teacher Wendell here at this time? Sir, are you lonely? Wendy's current job is similar to Lisa Dillon's. She will serve as the Lord's guard. And by the way, she will also provide necessary protection for Amy, who also lives in the main building. Lisa Dillon is a male after all. And it is not convenient to get close to Amy. Boudoir. Go quickly. Wendy, this is for business. Leon didn't even know what Wendyrf was thinking about all day long. This 50-year-old underage girl obviously knew everything. But she acted like an unscrupulous and rebellious bad girl. Making jokes all day long. But teacher Wendadier is in the guest room upstairs. She must have heard your call. Wendy disappeared into the darkness again as she spoke. She has come down to find you. My lord. This is true. The Nolder elves have such good hearing. They can definitely hear the lord shouts in this silent night. Lord Leon. Are you looking for me? Wendadier walked down the stairwell and looked at the empty hall. He seemed a little hesitant. There was only Leon in the hall. The soldiers who reported the news had already gone out. Wenda dear, I have an idea that I want to ask for your approval. Due to the urgent military situation, we must discuss the result as soon as possible. The Lord's expression was extremely serious. At noon, with heavy dark circles under his eyes, the Lord received important guests in the Lord's Hall of White Deer Castle. This is one of the twilight nights under Islandil. Obviously, Islandil was very concerned about the only human Lord who was willing to cooperate with Nolder. He asked the Twilight Knight to wait near White Deer Castle. So Windadil only spent half a morning to kill him. Brought it. At this meeting, Vindadil also attended as the Tribune of the Nolder Rangers. Those young Nolder Rangers listened to Vindadil's words. But most of them were not her people. These Rangers came from four different Nolder groups. But they all learned how to fight here. Windadir himself didn't intend to be a lord. So Leon imitated the title of the Bacchus Empire and gave her the title of Tribune of the Nolder. On the one hand, this means that the lords regard the Nolder as the same citizens as humans. On the other hand, it is to express to the Nolder that the Nolder are only bound by the tribunes here and let the Nolder manage the Nolder. This is Leon's promise. When Dilfu and Rissa Dillon were actually also in the Lord's Hall, and they were both present as the Lord's personal bodyguards. However, although they are both Nolder nobles, the two young men have little say. The Nolder elf who has the most say is actually the representative of Islandil, the Twilight Knight who was waiting for Leon on the way, but ended up temporarily beating up Dumbledore's ebony gauntlet knights. This Twilight Knight's name is Noel. This name reminded the Lord again of the strong men of Mettenheim who had returned to their hometown. Your Excellency Leon, His Highness Islandil has authorized me to contact you. His Highness originally wanted to come here in person, but it is indeed difficult for him to appear in human territory. I hope you can understand. Noel is a very polite Nolder elf. In fact, most Nolder elves will maintain good etiquette and education. The Twilight Knights who have the authority to lead troops seem to be relatively qualified. And the same is true for Cedarin. After all, they are hundreds of years old. Lord Noel, let's not be polite and let's talk straight. I plan to open a trade area in the forest east of White Deer Castle, where the trade between the Nolder elves and White Deer Castle will be carried out. First of all, carry out reciprocal trade such as the food and cloth you need, and the weapons and furs we need. I will set a reference price for these goods, and no one will want to be a profiteer. Let us first let the people of the two races get familiar with each other and establish a relationship friendship and subsequent cooperation can be discussed based on the situation. The Lord gave a trade plan very directly. This is a good method. Sir Leon, I think His Highness Islandil will also be satisfied. Neuer nodded repeatedly. This was smoother than he imagined. In fact, as long as he could buy food from White Deer Castle, it would be a good result for him. Enough food would be of great help to the reproduction of any ethnic group. The trade area will be jointly protected and restricted by Ms. Vindadil and I. At the same time, I will count the outer part of the Noldor Forest near White Deer Castle as the territory of White Deer Castle. I will issue a decree to refuse any outsiders. Carrying weapons into the territory of White Deer Castle can provide good protection for your tribe. But it should be noted that the Nolder must also abide by the laws of my territory. And killing people must be punished with life. Of course, if a human kills even if Nolder dies, I will capture him and hand him over to your disposal. I hope His Highness Islandil can make Aldarian willing to cooperate with this cooperation. The plan given by the Lord is obviously very beneficial to the Nolder. And Neuer has begun to smile. This is great. Your Excellency Leon. 
We will make the people abide by the rules. We will also convince Alderian. Until he is willing to cooperate. I can lead the troops to protect the trade area. Please don't worry. Noel stood up with satisfaction. Bowed and stroked his chest and saluted. Okay. Then finally. I want to resolve the hatred between you and humans. Mr. Noel. Leon also stood up. I plan to take your troops to rescue four brave shield. This is the plan that the Lord and Winda Deer came up with after discussing it overnight. This actually didn't fit any of the plans he considered yesterday. Since he received news in the early morning that the Crow Realm army was moving south across the Gatu grassland. Leon planned to send reinforcements first and take this opportunity to solve the most troublesome problem so that the Nolder Elves and the people under his rule can coexist peacefully. In other words, how to prevent others from pursuing the idea of Nolder Rangers like White Deer Castle especially those girl rangers whose worth is so high that most people regard them as walking dinars. Leon's method is very simple. He wants to lead the Nolder rangers to reinforce the border. Let the Nolder fight side by side with humans. And let the Nolder protect the villagers in the war. With this kind of real battlefield friendship, everyone in the border areas can see the dedication of the Nolder elves to humans. Yes, the sacrifices come from both sides. Leon led his men to fight bloody battles for the safety of the Nolder people and thus gain the trust of the Nolder Elves. So, if the Nolder also fight to protect human civilians, they will naturally be recognized by humans. At least they will be able to appear openly, and openly in the territories of Leon and his allies, such as White Deer Castle and Brave Shield Castle. And in this way, it can also solve the problem faced by Leon himself. If the Nolder help the people in the Lion Realm fight, then the Lord can publicly claim that the Nolder people are his allies and this will not incur anyone's hostility and hatred. Attack. There may still be people who covet the beauty of the girl rangers, but at least people will no longer regard the Nolder as monsters, and they will no longer think that capturing the Nolder as slaves at will is something to be proud of. After taking this crucial step, the Nolder elves will have a real future. Originally, it was okay to just bring the young rangers for reinforcements, but Windadier had already agreed in the early morning. But the Lord intends to take this opportunity to include more Nolder tribes and fight side by side with more human troops. This will greatly speed up the integration of the Nolder Elves into Leon's territory. Of course, the Lord also had another intention that he did not tell Windadir. He wanted the Nolder to get used to fighting under his own leadership and to fight under his griffin banner. It is natural to provide help to allies. I can also restrain my subordinates. But I am a little worried about other people's reactions. Lord Leon, I mean the human soldiers of the Lion Kingdom. Will they attack us? Neuer is not opposed to collaborative operations, but it is normal for him to have such concerns. If I lead the army, and you and the Nolder warriors hold my banner in this battle and follow my orders for the time being, there will basically be no problem. I have already written to tell my allies that there will be no problem multiple elves fight together. The Lord stretched out his hand to signal Rasadalin to hand the griffin flag to Neuer. Noel reached out to take it, and nodded after a moment of silence. I will obey your command. Lord Leong, but I hope that my people will not suffer too many casualties. I will try to reduce casualties as much as possible. Don't worry. I never fight an uncertain battle. The Lord was extremely serious from beginning to end this time. Neuer can also understand that some sacrifices are necessary, and there will inevitably be sacrifices in battle. But this is indeed necessary in order for the Nolder and humans to live together under the same blue sky. A few days later, Fort Brave Shield received an unimaginably powerful reinforcement. Nearly 400 Nolder Elves and 600 human troops, totaling about a thousand people. At this moment, this army of thousands of people all carried the Blackback Golden Griffin battle flag. This powerful army was led by Leong and divided into five teams. The first team was the young Nolder Rangers led by Vindadil. They were all equipped with the Gatuma they had just obtained during the last robbery. Amy divided the weapons with them and asked each of the Nolder Rangers to choose one. One horse, and the others went into the stables of White Deer Castle. The second team is the regular army of the Aino family led by Noel, including four Twilight Knights, a dozen Nolder nobles, about fifty Nolder rangers, and more than a hundred Nolder warriors. The third team is the Lord's own army, a mixed force of nearly two hundred people led by Sir Roland. This is a non-commissioned officer unit tied to the Lord's Land Group responsibility system. The fourth team was led by Raphael, and the horns of two hundred people summoned the rangers. The fifth team is led by Amy and Sarah. This is a special force of 200 female explorers. To be honest, these five troops are rare elites in the entire continent. Most of them are not loyal to Leon. 
but at least they are willing to fight under Liang's banner. The Lord has actually quietly accumulated the equivalent of a duke. Strength. Leon did not even use the garrison at White Deer Castle, nor the guards left by Godric for Amy. Those female explorers are from the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group. To be precise, it comes from the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group without mere gun. It was Sarah who brought them back. Sarah's persuasiveness may not be as good as that of Leon. But no one can resist her ability to empathize when her true feelings are revealed. When women call the same scumbag together, they will definitely become best friends quickly. The Griffin Sword Mercenary Group was waiting for news about Mirgon and True Brun. They had suffered a lot of casualties due to Mergen's actions, and they were already feeling depressed. Later, they heard that Mirgon left them and went to Lion Lake City to meet Nelda. So they felt that Mirgon seemed to have abandoned them. Not long after, I actually heard that Mirgon was being hunted and fled. In order to marry Nelda. Yes, in the eyes of these women. This is what it looks like. The focus of their attention was not on power and conspiracy at all, but on the fact that Mirgon actually married Nelda and was hunted down because of Nelda. As a result, the women in the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group started to curse, and they all claimed that they would castrate Mirgon if they saw him again. But before castrating Mirgon, they always had to eat. So these 200 or so female warriors, who originally belonged to the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group, have now become the mercenary troops of White Deer Castle. Their employer is Amy and Sarah is the leader. Perhaps these women's claims of castrating someone were unreliable. If they saw Mirgon again, there was no guarantee that they would change their minds. But at least now, most women are willing to follow Sarah to make a living with Amy. In fact, I am afraid that no one can find Mirgon now. The guy has escaped to who knows where. Maybe he has left the Lion Realm. Amy is very interested in the experiences of female explorers and is willing to hire them. In fact, Amy has long wanted to establish a female army. And now she has achieved her wish. And those horns summon the rangers. Fifty of whom had followed Ralph to White Hart Castle. Another hundred or so were summoned by Raphael from various villages along the way. The more than fifty rangers who followed Ralph's horn call officially became the subjects of Makes Angling after Leon returned. Because these people did not have their own property. But other members of the ranger group have their own homes and real estate. And they do not need to rely on others. After being dispersed to various villages by the Duke of Alma, the Horncall Rangers did not gather again. This powerful armed force has actually dispersed and returned home. They don't have a leader now, and they don't plan to deal with Granlon in Changa Town. After all, Granlon is also a noble of the kingdom, and he has not harmed Changa Town. Just like Alma's illegal means of occupying Longa Town, Granlon's occupation of Longa Town is also an internal struggle among the kingdom's nobles. As long as they do not harm Longa Town, the rangers will not participate in it. But it was different when facing foreign enemies. After learning that foreign enemies might invade, the members of the ranger group responded to Raphael's horn call and joined the team. More than 200 people gathered along the way north. Chapter 191 Ranger and Ranger In fact, the members of the horn call rangers were very confused when they first gathered into the main force. Because the rangers who have been guarding Longa Town for a long time do not like the Nolder Elves very much. After all, the Nolder Elves have killed many civilians in Longa Town in revenge. Especially Eldarian's troops. Although there has not been much conflict between the two sides in recent years. It is indeed difficult for the Rangers to become friends with the Nolder Elves. But in fact, the Lord wanted the Rangers to cooperate with the Nolder Elves in fighting. So as to alleviate the conflicts between them with the friendship of comrades. Perhaps at present this is just an army of thousands of people forcibly gathered together. And there is no cooperation between them. But no matter what. Such a scale and elite level are definitely first class in the Pender continent. And they are enough to face any strong enemy. The moment Leofric saw the reinforcements, he couldn't believe it. Who would have thought that Leon would bring such a large scale of elites? Lord Leon, the troops of the Crow Kingdom have indeed come to Brave Shield Castle. My scouts have determined that a Crow troops are now camping dozens of miles northwest. But they will probably be scared to death when they see your team. Uh, Leofric was now so relieved that he began to laugh heartily. They'd better come quickly, so we can hurry up and kill them first. Liang was not at ease at all, and his expression was quite serious. The Crow Kingdom just fought a battle with the Gatu people not long ago, but now they dare to cross the Gatu grassland. This is probably because of what they have achieved with the Gatu people. According to the agreement, I think the Gato people will probably mobilize in large numbers. The Lord was not as optimistic as Leofric, because he had just asked Dumbledore to take a walk in the grassland a few days ago. In fact, this reasonable suggestion 
To lure the Gato people was originally intended to alleviate the hatred between the residents of Noldor and White Deer Castle. The Lord originally wanted the Ebony Gauntlet Knights to attract a few Gato people. And then he took the student rangers of Windadier and fought side by side with the people on the eastern border to kill the Gatu people they attracted. After all, the Gata people are the common enemies of the Noldor and the people of the east. And fighting side by side is the best way to resolve the original conflict. And Dumbledore only has about a hundred people under his command now. And he will definitely not be able to attract too many Gato people. The Lord has actually planned this for a long time. But no one expected that the Crow Kingdom would suddenly cross the Jata Grassland and enter the Lion Realm. Now that the Crow Kingdom's army has passed through the Gatu Grassland safely, there is obviously something fishy between them and the Gatu people. The Lord feels that this battle is not as simple as it seems. In addition, Dumbledore's Ebony Gauntlet Knights are probably causing trouble in the Northern Grasslands. So it is difficult to determine how the Kato people will react. I heard that something happened in Chungha Town. Should we ignore Chungha Town? Alma also sent people to arrest me before, saying that I should go to Chungha Town for investigation. Before I could decide what to do. He I heard that he died in Chungha Town. Leofric turned to ask Leon. After repelling the foreign enemies, consider how to quell the rebellion later. This is the principle. Even the first generation of the Lion King. Didn't he first repel the foreign enemies and then resolve the internal rebellion? The Lord shook his head and sighed. You're right. That's how it should be. And Lion City will probably react. Leofric nodded and smiled looking at the golden griffin flag behind the lord, with a rather meaningful look in his eyes, when he led the troops to set fire to the camp of the three prophets. He also had this honest smile. Liang's premonition was confirmed half a day later. Raphael, who was familiar with the terrain, went on a reconnaissance trip and reported that the Crow Kingdom's troops did not continue to approach Brave Shield Castle, but instead set up camp in the grassland dozens of miles northwest of Brave Shield Castle. In fact, that place is closer to Fletcher Village. Basically just north of Fletcher Village. About 30 miles across the river. Strangely, armies generally choose to camp near rivers for easy access to water. But the Crow Realm troops chose a grassland 30 miles away from the river. Which made the Lord sense danger. Judging from the scale alone. The total number of the army was about 1,500. Raphael saw many flags. Probably from multiple lords. And couldn't tell who was leading the army. At such a scale. If the logistics personnel are excluded, the combat effectiveness is only a little over a thousand. This is definitely not the main force of the Crow Army. Just a partial division. But whether this partial division is to intercept reinforcements from the Lion Kingdom or for some other purpose, it should be closer to Fletcher and Brave Shield Castle, especially closer to the Tontian River. After all, the river bank across the river is more suitable for interception. And the archers of Crow Realm are notoriously strong. The location where they camp now is more like the style of the Gatu people. If the team has a large number of cavalry, or even all cavalry, then they should really choose to camp on a flat and unobstructed grassland. This is to maximize the mobility of the cavalry and avoid being attacked by surprise. Most of the Crow division that appeared here may be cavalry. It must be to use the high mobility of the cavalry to cut off the connection between Shurhu City and the eastern border. This means that most of the main infantry and archers used by Raven Kingdom to attack the city are heading toward Shurhu City. Although I don't know how big their main force is, nor what their movements are, but no matter what, they must have a military strength of 5,000 to be normal. Leon felt that Shurhu City was in danger. After roughly confirming that there were no other troops near the enemy's partial division, the Lord simply led the team to the camp near Fletcher Village that Ralph had built before. It was also the camp where Leon initially fought a bloody battle with the Gatu people. Today, Fletcher Village is guarded by about 80 Red Arrow Longbowmen. And it is relatively stable. These Red Arrow Longbowmen are actually Charles's subordinates. But they are not loyal to Leon. The allegiance relationship in this era is like this. His subordinates are not his subordinates. In fact, the Red Arrow Longbowmen are probably more willing to be loyal to Godric. After all, they were founded by Godric. But they were from the village of Fletcher and were Charles's subjects. Charles still has not returned to Fletcher Village. In fact, Charles has completely lost contact with him during this period. He seemed to have disappeared after he ran from Chang'e Town to Kerwin Village. Now that Charles is away, the Red Arrow Longbowmen are arranging defenses spontaneously. They are actually quite nervous. After all, the Crow Kingdom's army is only 30 miles apart. Seeing the Lord's large army approaching, the Longbowmen cheered. They still knew the superior Lord's flag. 
now that they saw their superior lord bringing so many people over. They did feel safer. But that sense of security quickly turned into chatter. They saw the Nolder in the procession. Liang did not come forward to appease these red arrow longbowmen. After all, the fact of fighting side by side was always more useful than persuasion. And he was not familiar with these longbowmen. Since the Crow Kingdom's troops did not advance and there was no movement, Liang was worried that there would be unpredictable changes if the stalemate continued. Relying on the elite level of his current troops, he planned to take the initiative to launch an attack. In other words, they were launching a tentative attack to see if they could directly defeat the Crow Kingdom's partial army. At present, the Raven Kingdom certainly does not know that Liang has such a powerful mixed force. So the Lord plans to send a small group of cavalry to lure the enemy and then annihilate them in one fell swoop. Leofric also has more than 300 cavalry in his hands. Leon's request for him is to support him from the flanks. After the main battlefield begins, Leofric will lead his troops to cut off the Crow people's return route from the side and occupy the enemy's camp. This plan is not complicated. The Lord's plan always has a purpose so that every team has one and only one simple and clear goal. Some of the girl rangers under Windadier and the rangers led by Raphael took on the task of luring the enemy which was also deliberately requested by the Lord. Letting the girl rangers come forward to lure the enemy will probably be effective. However, the Nolder elves may not be very accustomed to fighting on the grasslands. So let the horns familiar with the environment call the rangers to cooperate to avoid accidents. At the same time, this dangerous mission can quickly establish a comradeship between these two somewhat hostile teams. Raphael respected Leong very much. Now that Leong had an explanation, he set off with 50 rangers. When Dathier also started to disperse with dozens of girl rangers, and she herself followed Raphael. She was not familiar with the environment, and she had to fight with Raphael. When Dathier knew that Leon's intention was just to let Noldor fight side by side with humans. She had discussed these matters with the Lord all night before. This Noldor swordmaster is not good at tactics or strategies, but she has a high-end advantage that most people don't have, a sense of purpose. After deciding what she wants to do, she will do it resolutely in order to protect the Nuita girls from the tragic abuse in the past. She has honed the fighting method most suitable for the Nuita girls for more than 200 years, and has been training the girl rangers without slacking off, in order to try to find a long-term future for the Nolder tribe. After deciding to try to integrate into the human world, she will resolutely do it to the end, even if her teammates are the horn call rangers she doesn't like. There was no problem with Liang's thinking, and both teams put aside their grudges and tried to cooperate. However, the Lord also had something he did not expect. Originally, Leon hoped that Raphael, who was familiar with the environment, would take care of the Noldos as much as possible. But in the end, Raphael almost capsized in the sewer during this operation to lure the enemy. Raphael, who had followed Ralph on missions for a long time, was originally a very good ranger. He often did this kind of thing when dealing with the Gato people. Although he was not old, he had a lot of experience. The Crow Troops camp was built on the grassland. But there was no one outside the camp. So Raphael planned to get closer and hook up. He had to find a suitable place to let the enemy see the many girls. But in the end, Nuodua's girls were not close behind. As soon as Raphael arrived within 300 meters of the opponent's camp, he encountered a large group of Ravenland riders and rangers who rushed out in terrifying numbers. At least seven or eight hundred. No wonder the enemy would camp on the grassland. It seems that the camp may be full of cavalry. And it seems that they are ready to fight at any time. Raphael did not expect such a situation. The enemy's reaction speed was beyond his expectation. Before he could seduce him, the enemy rushed out. Of course, we had to turn back and run away quickly. After all, the endless grassland could not hide anyone. But Raphael was not very lucky. He was closest to the enemy. And the enemy fired a hail of arrows at him from more than 200 meters away although this wave of arrows was too far away and did not hit him. It blocked his route. He could not turn around in a circle along the original route. He could only rein in the horse and turn around and start again. The rain of arrows thrown by the enemy from a very long distance plays this role in order to make Raphael's rangers lose speed. As a result, Raphael's horse stepped into a hole in the grassland because of the horse's unintended turn. It should be a mouse hole. The mice on the grassland are very big. The hole is just big enough to trap a horse's foot. And it is completely hidden in the grass and cannot be seen. There are many such rad holes on the grassland. It is indeed easy for mainland horses to encounter such situations after entering the grassland. It is not uncommon for horses to break their legs while running. 
But Gatuma and Chungha Town geldings generally don't fall into this kind of mouse hole. They can probably feel or smell it. After all, they live here. Raphael was riding a Chungha Town gelding. It would have been very reliable to let the horse run on its own. But Raphael's forcible reining in of the horse in order to avoid the arrows was not in line with the horse's own judgment. And it ended up stepping into the horse's body. Mousehole twisted his leg. The horse stumbled and threw Raphael far away. Fortunately, it was the grassland. It was good that he didn't fall out. There are a large number of enemies chasing behind them. Under normal circumstances, the team that lures the enemy will not rescue them when encountering this situation. Otherwise, everyone will probably be finished. But when a deer didn't understand the rules of human combat, when a friendly soldier fell from his horse, she turned back to rescue him. The Nolder Elves will definitely rescue their people in any battle. Because the Nolder always pursues smaller losses. Winda Deer is extremely brave in battle. Not like a woman at all. Since it was a short trip to lure the enemy, no one brought spare horses. Raphael lost his horse and could not run away. While Winda Deer was riding a relatively small Gato horse and could not carry two people. So Winda Deer directly shot the enemy who was chasing the fastest with one arrow. Rushed forward and took away the enemy's horse then turned around and ran away. A large number of enemies chased her to a distance of a hundred meters behind her. Raphael did indeed escape. He saw the opportunity, jumped on his horse while running, and began to ride and shoot with Windadier. The girl rangers who were scattered around saw that their teacher was in danger. So they all gathered together and gradually moved closer to Windadier. The rangers who could have escaped and scathed naturally gathered around the Nolder elves when they saw this situation. The Nolder girls, all of whom seemed to be young girls, we're fighting to kill the enemy. The rangers as men. Of course we cannot be timid. Otherwise we will lose face. As a result, what was originally expected to lure the enemy turned into a fierce chase. The girl ranger and the horn call rangers total close to a hundred people. They are all top elite cavalry who are good at mounted archery. It is actually difficult for any troops to chase them. The easiest way to achieve results in mounted archery is to shoot reflexively to chase your own. Enemy. The Horn Call Rangers also saw the combat effectiveness of these numerous female rangers and their reliability on the battlefield. It goes without saying that the Nolder Elves are proficient in bows and arrows. The rangers also knew this. So they were not surprised by the girls' precise shooting skills. But what they don't know is that the Nolder are always accustomed to taking the initiative to help their comrades out of danger in battle. This is the habit of the Nolder. They always try to avoid losses. In the culture of the Nolder, killing enemies does not achieve great merit. On the contrary, rescuing companions merits greater merit. Islandel also said to Rissa Dillon, however, killing the enemy cannot atone for one's sins. Only saving one's tribe or bringing back knowledge can. As a result, the girl rangers took the initiative to use their shields to help the rangers block many arrows. And some of the girl rangers took the initiative to go to both sides of the team for special defense. The rangers who had never fought such a safe battle suddenly had a new outlook on the Nolder Elves. In addition, the one who is protecting himself is actually a girl. What a beautiful young girl. Which man can let a girl protect herself on the battlefield? In addition, Raphael had just been rescued by Windadier. So the horn summoned the rangers to actively slow down and stand behind the team to block arrows. They carried shields on their backs and rode larger and armored Changha town geldings. They were at the end of the team to block the enemy's arrows during the pursuit. Arrows. In a high-speed chase, the power of arrows in the same direction is not high. Just like after Leofric set the fire. It is no problem for larger or armored horses and will not cause too many casualties. But the people running in front turn around and shoot backwards. But the power is completely different. And the Nolder's arrows are really accurate. The rangers realized that if they acted as shields, it would be better to let the Nuabdo girls fight with all their strength. So the rangers stopped shooting arrows and began to focus on protecting the girl rangers. This protection gradually turned into an unexpectedly good cooperation. The rangers would walk between the enemy and the girls, using short spears and shields to reduce damage. The girl rangers used bows and arrows to slow down the enemy and kill them. Since they all know a lot about mounted archery, the rangers will get out of the way of sight and arrow paths when the girl rangers draw their bows. And the girl rangers will constantly adjust their positions to facilitate the rangers to block. Occasionally, Enemies who were chasing close would be accurately shot by Windadier. This troop of less than a hundred people actually left at least 700 Crow cavalry helpless. Therefore, the Crow Realm cavalry did not chase for too long. They quickly realized that it was not cost-effective to continue like this. The chasing side suffered a lot of casualties. 
but the chase side did not suffer much loss. This was completely different from chasing the Misty Mountain people. They are two concepts. After chasing for several miles and losing at least 50 people, the cavalry of the Raven Kingdom stopped pursuing. However, when the Crow cavalry began to retreat, Vindatil and Raphael simultaneously remembered that the Lord's mission goal was to lure the enemy. What if the enemy doesn't pursue me? They both realized at the same time that their troops seemed to be too strong, and they might not be able to complete their task of luring the enemy. So the two men turned around bravely and started to attack actively. The Lord did not expect that before he taught Raphael and Windadier how to fight guerrilla warfare. These two people spontaneously understood the essence of the enemy's advance and our retreat, the enemy's garrison and our harassment, the enemy's fatigue and our attack, and the enemy's retreat and our pursuit. Chapter 192 Eagle Claw Fort's Plan When the enemy is stationed, we harass them. When the enemy retreats, we pursue them. This is what Windadier and Raphael are doing now. But they don't do it very well. Because the cooperation between the girl ranger and the rangers gradually began to have problems at this time. Despite the fact that they cooperated very well when being hunted. In fact there is still a huge gap between the members of the Horncall rangers and the Nolder elves. Although these Nuodua female rangers are young. They have lived for at least 70 or 80 years. And have had more or less conflicts with humans. The rangers also had some relatives and friends who died at the hands of the Nolder. After all, there is still bad blood between the two sides. In the tense situation of being chased by the enemy at the same time, the two teams will put aside their grudges and cooperate closely. This is entirely because no one thinks too much at the critical moment. Vindadil's brave rescue of Raphael set an example and led the girl rangers to take the initiative to support. When the beautiful Nordo girls took the initiative to protect the rangers, the rangers must of course behave as men should. Look! However, when the enemy began to retreat, and they began to pursue and harass the enemy. That is, when the situation was not so dangerous, both sides would think of their past grudges again. Of course, they did not engage in internal strife at this time. Their previous cooperation had already played some role. And at least, they still maintained a friendly attitude. However, when harassing the enemy, the teams of Wendadier and Raphael were clearly divided into two parts. Both sides fought independently, and there was no cooperation. This makes pursuit and harassment less effective. When the wind is going against us, we will work together closely. When the wind is going against us, we will fight on our own. This is probably what will happen when you first cooperate. In fact, whether it is the Nolder Elves or the Horn Call Rangers, their archery skills and range far exceed that of the Raven Rangers, and their riding skills and horse endurance far exceed that of the Crow's Long River Town Geldings and Gato Horses have extremely strong endurance and are very adaptable to the environment of Gato Grassland. Although there was nearly ten times the number of enemies, they did not suffer much losses. And no one was even killed in the battle. Only some people were injured and harassed outside the enemy's range. Of course, it was not easy to die. However, due to poor coordination, the two teams not only failed to form a joint force, but also often influenced each other. Even the intentions of the two sides were different. The girl rangers were more concerned about how to avoid losses while the rangers were more concerned about how to increase the results. As a result, the rangers were chasing after each other sparsely and firing arrows. But the girl rangers would not catch up too close and fell behind. The harassment of the rangers alone could not cause much damage to the enemy. The girl rangers were far apart. But they were all pursuing them. In this case, it is easy to see that they are luring the enemy. The commander of the crow troops can naturally see this. Therefore, even though they were harassed several times by the rangers, even though dozens of Noda girls were just a few hundred meters away, and even though the force consisted of less than a hundred people, the Crow Realm troops still resolutely withdrew. So the mission to lure the enemy failed. But fortunately no losses were caused. The mission was not completed, and the enemy retreated to the camp. When Nadir and Raphael had no choice but to return to the Lord first. How's the battle going? You two? The Lord Lord watched them come back, and saw that there was no enemy behind them. He knew that the large army might have waited in vain. But Leon was not disappointed and still had a smile on his face. Sir, I'm sorry to disappoint you. We failed to lure the enemy, so I brought them back alive. Raphael seemed quite unwilling. What he cared more about was obviously failing to complete the task of luring the enemy. So he captured a ranger who had been injured in the pursuit, which was an extra gain. Disappointed? Not really. Just hope you're all safe. Thank you for your hard work. Raphael. Of course. Remember to learn from your experience. 
if the new girls can't successfully lure the enemy, then it's definitely not the enemy's problem. Leon shook his head. It didn't matter if the mission failed. As long as Naldo and humans could start to cooperate. He didn't expect the two sides to perform perfectly the first time they cooperated. Lord Leon, it's really not the enemy's problem. We didn't cooperate well. But I think the situation is okay, and we will succeed. Only Windadir knew that what Leong asked about was not just the situation of the enemy, but also the situation of the Noldor and humans fighting together. So she thought it was okay. Judging from the performance of the rangers, she did see hope for the Noldor and humans to coexist, although it was not satisfactory. Very well. Vindatir, I think you should talk to Noel about your experience of cooperating with human troops. It was rare for Windadir to say, I didn't cooperate well. The Lord smiled and asked Windadir to go to Neuer to convey some influence, and then turned his attention to the prisoner. The ranger that Raphael captured belonged to Count Stephen, the Count of Oldenburg, who had previously killed the plundering team led by Ndonga. Earl Stephen is also the current supreme commander of the Ravenland army. The captive's words were not harsh, and the Lord easily learned from them Earl Stephen's intentions. He camped on the grassland north of Fletcher Village, indeed to prevent the eastern border from reinforcing Lion Lake City. They are basically all cavalry. More than a thousand cavalry. And their combat purpose is just to keep an eye on the eastern region here. The main purpose is to prevent the large forces of the Lion Kingdom from attacking from the eastern border and cutting off the food routes and return routes of their main forces. The main force of the Crow Kingdom is almost 4,000 people. And they are all heading towards Shurhu City. They are indeed going to Shurhu City too. Cruel the rebellion. And have no intention of targeting the eastern region. These more than a thousand cavalry camped 30 miles north of Fletcher Village, which was indeed enough to block the reinforcement route on the eastern border of the Lion Kingdom. Due to the existence of this partial division, no army can successfully march hundreds of miles to the jurisdiction of Shurhu City unless this Crow cavalry is annihilated. Otherwise, they might harass them all the way, cut off their retreat, attack Fletcher Village and Brave Shield Castle, or even break into the hinterland of the kingdom but it is not easy to kill thousands of cavalry on the grassland. And Earl Stephen does not seem to be an impulsive person. He can even restrain the troops not to pursue Nuoduo. Most human lords may not be able to resist this temptation. As soon as Raphael approached, the Crow Realm cavalry swarmed out. This was actually because Count Stephen made a slight error in judgment. He thought that as more than a thousand cavalry should be able to quickly kill this small team of less than a hundred people. Earl Stephen did not expect that this small force would be so elite. In fact, Earl Stephen is also adhering to the policy of guerrilla warfare and arranging tactics to attack if he can hit him and retreat if he can't hit him. If a large force wants to go to Lion Lake City, he will harass them all the way and if the troops of the Lion Kingdom leave in large numbers on the eastern border, he will directly enter the hinterland of the kingdom from Fletcher Village. Anyway, the overall intention is to nail down the troops in the eastern part of the Lion Kingdom and ensure the safety of Raven's main force. However, the first pursuit resulted in the loss of nearly a hundred people. So Stephen will definitely be more cautious. In fact, it is quite troublesome to encounter an opponent with clear goals, like Count Stephen on the battlefield. Because his strategic intentions and tactical logic are simple and clear. And he does not hide it from anyone at all. This means that everyone in his army knows the overall tactics. And it is not easy to make mistakes. Moreover, the location where he camped was in an unobstructed grassland. So a sneak attack was impossible to deal with such a force. He could only fight hard. And Leong has always been unwilling to fight tough battles. So this is the most troublesome type of enemy for Leong. But fortunately, Leong had no intention of dealing with the Crow Kingdom's main force. Since the Crow Kingdom was to defeat Lady Ursula's rebels, the Lord did not intend to get involved. He waited until both sides of the Crow Kingdom and the rebels were defeated before picking it up. Isn't it nice to be cheap? In other words, the Lord does not need to worry at all. He only needs to repel Earl Stephen to ensure the safety of Fletcher Village. So Leon led his troops and began to slowly approach Earl Stephen's camp, preparing for a head-on battle. He did not pursue annihilation, but only needed to defeat Earl Stephen. Chungha Town. Granlon did not kill Father after all, because he received news of the Crow Army's attack, which was a letter from Ketelin, the Lord of Talon Castle. He basically received the news at the same time as Leon. If you kill Fawcett at this time, it will be equivalent to helping the Raven Kingdom. And Lion Lake City will most likely be captured. So Granlon released Fawcett and took the Lion Lake City flag guard back to Lion Lake City with Fawcett. Similar to the logic of the Lord using foreign enemies to let Noldor and humans fight side by side. 
Fawcett and Granlon also decided to fight side by side at this moment. Granlon's Lion Lake City Standard Guard must defend their homeland. And Fawcett must also unite everything at this time. Forces that can be combined. When there is a common enemy, whether it is hatred or power disputes, they can be put aside temporarily. Of course, someone still needs to mediate. And their middleman is Ketalan, Lord of Eagle Claw Castle, who is their common ally. Kedron's family had extensive marriage connections. And the Baron himself had a wide range of friends. Fawcett was considered his nephew. And it was Ketlin who brought Fawcett back from the Crow Realm. So the relationship goes without saying. Grand Lon and Ketlin have also been friends for many years. In the letter, Keldalan advised Grand Lon to put aside their grudges and work together as a go-between. Under such circumstances, Grand Lon naturally made a wise choice. Father pulled most of the troops from Lion Lake City, while Grand Lon took away his standard guard leaving only the seemingly strong motley army stationed in Chungla town. The troops on both sides totaled nearly 3,000 people and were heading towards Eagle Claw Fort where Kedron was located. Eagle Claw Fort is the front line facing the main force of Crow Kingdom's army, northeast of Lion Lake City, Eagle Claw Fort. In fact, Eagle Claw Castle does not have any Eagle Claws. And the appearance of the castle has nothing to do with the Eagle. This castle was not built on a high mountain, but near the inland sea of Lion Lake and there were not a large number of raptors such as falcons settling here. The reason why it is called Eagle Claw Fort actually comes from the establishment of a famous knight order hundreds of years ago. Order of the Falcon. This castle was once the residence and training camp of the Falcon Knight Sergeant, Falcon Claw. The Knights of the Falcon were established in the 94th year of Pinder's calendar. That is, more than 260 years ago. At that time, the kingdom of Pinder ruled the entire continent, and it was a glorious era when all knights were blooming. The Order of the Falcon has a very significant feature. They allow and encourage women to join the Order and become Falcon Knights. In their day, this was a big deal. In fact, the Order of the Falcon was the first order to allow women to become Knights. Moreover, when the Knights were recognized by the Charter of Valets, a new clause was specifically added to the Charter to allow women to become Knights for the legal establishment of the Knights. Yes, it was the Falcon Knights that significantly improved the status of women in Pinder. This is mainly because among the five founders of the Falcon Knights, there is a female knight with an outstanding record. Her name is Valera. And everyone in the continent of Pender knows it. She is an idol worshipped by countless women. This female warrior was the most dazzling hero of that era. Her strength on the battlefield and her adventures have always been talked about by all Pender people. She was the first and only female pioneer lord to successfully establish a territory in Pender. Talon Castle was her territory. And she eventually became a countess. This is a woman who completely relied on her own ability to become a count from an adventurer. In the era when the kingdom of Pender ruled the continent, the status of women was not as good as it is now. To be able to achieve this, Valera is indeed a unique legend. This is mainly due to her excellent fighting ability. In her day, her strength on the battlefield could even be described as invincible. As long as a knight despises women, he is likely to face a challenge from Valera. No matter how distinguished a man is, she will challenge him one by one. After each battle, people discovered that no man could stop her lance. Later, no man dared to stand in front of her one-on-one. -on -one. After that, Valera joined the Falcon Adventure Group and led the Adventure Group to conquer the North and South, defeated the invading barbarians of the Misty Mountains several times, and saved various towns in the north of Pender many times. The large-scale heretics that appeared around Sherhu City and the horse thieves who were entrenched in the grassland at that time were all eliminated by her. Later. After the Falcon Knights were officially established, Valera became a pioneer lord. She established Eagle Claw Fort and began to train the sergeant, Falcon Claw, for the Falcon Knights. The Falcon Talon is a sergeant affiliated with the Falcon Knights. It can also be regarded as Valera's own independent armed force and only recruits women. Due to Valera's influence, many women who were recruited into Falcon Claw eventually became Falcon Knights. Valera secured the same status and opportunities for women as men in that era. When she was training Falcon Claw at Eagle Claw Castle, the Jata people had not yet arrived on the Pender continent. So Valera searched for bandits and gangsters all over the continent to train for actual combat. As a result, she patrolled the inner sea of Lion Lake with Falcon Talon from around Eagle Claw Castle to around Lion Lake City to Cliff Bay and other places. Under her prestige, Bandits were once extinct in these places. After she returned to Eagle Claw Fort, no bandits dared to approach Bibu Gulf. 
even the Red Brotherhood of Lion Lake City retreated and disappeared. It can be said that the entire continent was in awe of her at that time. No one dared to be an enemy of Countess Valera. Not even the Charter of Valets dared to impose obstacles on her. Therefore, at that time, many women were proud to be members of the Falcon Claws, and the status of the Falcon Knights was once comparable to the two national knights of the Griffin and the Lion. The rapid prosperity of the Lion Lake City area was largely due to the deterrent power of Valera's Eagle Claw Fort and the Falcon Claws she led. During the decades when Falcon Claws were stationed at Eagle Claw Fort, this area can be regarded as the safest area in Pender Continent. Under the same conditions, people would of course prefer to go to places with good security. Since Eagle Claw Fort was a strictly managed female military camp, people could not move and it will. So many people stayed in the nearby Lion Lake City, making Lion Lake City quickly become a prosperous and prosperous city. But things are impermanent and vicissitudes of life change. Sherhu City and Eagle Claw Fort, which once had the best security in the continent, have now completely changed. Today's Eagle Claw Castle is full of rogue knights and gangs of rogue bandits. Eagle Claw Fort, which was originally avoided by bandits and robbers, has now become the base camp of evil forces. The current lord of Eagle Claw Castle, Baron Kedron, established a private army in this heroic place with these rogue knights as the main body. This was the legacy of the Duke of Alma. The Duke of Alma was a man of his word, and he did give all the power he had gathered from the Red Brotherhood to Ketalan. There are more than a hundred rogue knights, and they lead more than a thousand gangsters from all over the Lion Realm. Perhaps Baron Ketalan was the first noble lord in the Lion Realm to support Lady Ursula, but he did not disclose this to anyone. The reason why he supports Ursula is probably that Ursula, who is relatively simple, convinced him by herself. In fact, Ursula herself was in Kedron's bedroom now, and the two of them had only one nightgown in total. Kedron, the Crow Kingdom's army is probably coming soon. When will Father's troops arrive? Mrs. Ursula, wearing a loose nightgown with her breasts exposed, left the bed directly and walked to the window to pour a glass of wine. This is the highest point of Eagle Claw Fort. There are drinking utensils placed on the window sill. Looking out from the window, you can see the calm sea under the moonlight in the distance. Honey, you shouldn't say these things at this time. Kedron sighed, walked naked behind Mrs. Ursula, hugged Ursula from behind, put the cup in her hand to his mouth and took a sip. Kedron, now I am wandering around without a fixed address, and my brother wants my life. I will never feel safe at any time. Our father's troops definitely here? Ursula sighed. This woman in her thirties kept looking at the inner sea of Lion Lake. She handed the cup to Kedron and put her hands around her shoulders. Don't worry. Dear, father has already arrived at Eagle Claw Castle. This Grand Duke of the Lion Lake Realm has raised an army of nearly 3,000 people with Grand Lawn. They will stop your brother's army with a smile on his face. Kedron said firmly, As for us, we don't need to fight against the Crow Realm troops at all. We will split up and go to Shurhu City and Chang'e Town at dawn. Your followers you can probably take over Long River Town, using Long River Town as a bargaining chip. King Ulrich can only ally with you to deal with the Crow Kingdom. You have enough time to rebuild the Falcon Knights in Long River Town. Chapter 193 Don't Guess What the King Is Thinking Are you sure that the Lion City will not send troops? The Crow Realm army is entering. Is Ulrich just sitting back and ignoring it? Ursula looked a little uneasy. No matter how bad the kingdom of the lion was, it had to react to the invasion of foreign enemies. Because your brother helped you. The Red Brotherhood's informant sent back the news that the Crow Kingdom's envoy went to Philzwai's Miss Cage City. And then King Vidi sent a large number of troops we must have gathered at Gaiabeo at the border and know what this means. Ketalan drank the wine in the glass and turned to sit on the bed. Fieldsway? Didn't Fieldsway just form an alliance with the Lion Kingdom? Ursula turned her head and looked at Ketalan. Will King Vides break the alliance? He doesn't have to tear up the covenant. Now that Alma is dead, Vides can declare the covenant invalid. Last year, Alma went and signed the agreement with Fieldsway. The name on that covenant was Alma Horton. Who would do you care about a dead person's name? Ketalan spread his hands. The Kingdom of Lion is now surrounded by enemies on three sides and the Bacchus Empire may also intervene. Ulrich must ensure the safety of Lion City. He will probably not dare to send troops easily. In other words, we can easily capture Chang'e Town and Lion Lake City. Kedron. Are you planning to let my brother occupy Eagle Claw Fort and then defend the two major cities to support the enemy and make the best of both worlds? Even the Raven Realm dare not touch you? Ursula looked relieved and turned around to face Kedron. It's not that you don't dare to touch me. 
it's that you don't dare to touch us. My dear. Ketalan stretched out. We will be the final winner. The next afternoon, when Fawcett led the army to Eagle Claw Castle, the Crow Kingdom's army was already in front of them. Both sides were caught off guard and started fighting directly. But Kedron and Lady Ursula both disappeared. With his army of rogue knights, Kedron took over the Sherhu city without much defenders without much effort. Mrs. Ursula was near Payne Village at this time. There were less than 200 people around her, and they all seemed to be a motley crew. But from the look and temperament of this motley group of soldiers, it can be seen that they have all experienced hundreds of battles, and their combat effectiveness should be quite strong. Ursula looked back at the direction of the inner sea of Lion Lake, with an inexplicable smile on her face. Madam, you won't really follow Kedron's idea, will you? A knight suddenly asked. Kedron? Hey, Sir Ren, I am the true king of Crow Realm. How could I listen to the arrangements of a rogue? He wants to be an opportunistic warlord, but he can't do it. He doesn't understand the face of a king. Ulrike is not the kind of person to compromise on what he would do in a desperate situation. Ursula turned her head and smiled at the young knight. I just need him and father to help us stop the Crow Kingdom's army. That's good. Madam, but are you really planning to go to Chungha Town? I think Chungha Town is not suitable for rebuilding the Falcon Knights. And you can't really control Chungha Town now. And you can't hold it after you defeat it. The knight named Rin wears a Falcon Heraldry robe and is obviously a Falcon Knight. He is also the only knight in the team who wears the Falcon coat of arms. Of course I won't go to Chungha Town. Rin, I want to go to the Lion City. I can see Kedrin's thoughts. And I don't want to be a shield. I have no interest in the territory of the Lion Kingdom at all. Ren, go to Fletcher Village. Earl Stephen should be there. Go and tell him that Gregory IV has a deal with Jata Warlord Zahar. And he may die if he continues to stay near Fletcher Village. Ask him how he plans to return the favor to me. Ursula didn't look as worried as she did last night. Her tone became relaxed and she looked quite calm. Then you go directly back to Dark Falcon Castle to gather the army. I'm going to take advantage of the emptiness in Raven Realm to join forces. The Lion Kingdom has captured Xiaolu City. That's where we should go. Madam, you will definitely be able to rebuild the Falcon Knights. Sir Ren bowed his head respectfully and then headed east with dozens of people. Mrs. Ursula, on the other hand, only took more than a hundred people to the south and rushed towards the Lion City. Two days later, the throne room of Lion City, Ulrich finally reappeared on the Silver Throne. But at this time, Ulrich seemed to have no trace of illness. Apart from a slight hint of fatigue, he looked quite healthy. There were three people standing beside him. Brennus, Duke of Cliff Bay, Godric, Chief of Military Affairs of Chang'e Town, and Lehman, Lord of Seven Forks Fortress. Dot your majesty, do you really plan to let his highness the prince lead the army? But he has never led an army in a war dot, and none of our troops can leave the territory. Brennus frowned, seeming to be a little worried about Ulrich's decision. Brennus, my closest comrade in arms, since my arrogant son thinks he can do it, then of course I will let him go. When he gets to the battlefield, he will naturally understand that war is not like him, that's why it's so simple. Ulrich said calmly, with almost no expression on his face. Your Majesty, the Crow Kingdom's army will probably crush Alanric. He is your only son, Godric said a little uneasily. Brennus frowned and stared straight away, while Lehman's eyes were blank, as if he hadn't heard anything. Yes, my only son. My only son imprisoned Lehman privately, stole my seal, and caused a lot of disputes. My only son also sealed the town of Chungha to Alma. He I simply don't understand what Chungha town means to Alma. If Alma hadn't died suddenly, the Lion Kingdom would have been torn apart by now. It's hard to tell whether the expression on Auric's face was ridicule or sadness. I would rather not have such a son. I didn't expect that after just being sick for more than half a month. The only people I can trust are you. How many? Your Majesty. Then, what are the arrangements now? The Crow Kingdom's army has entered the Biba Gulf. And enemy warnings have been sent back from the eastern region. Fields Way in the west has also gathered many troops in High Cliff Castle. And the Bacchus Empire in the south, as there seems to be an intention to attack Chicha Fortress. Duke Brennus became more and more irritable as he spoke. They are all bastards who are taking advantage of the situation. My troops have to guard the northwest. And Lehman also has to hold off the Bacchus at Chicha Fortress. The entire Lion Knights cannot move out. Biba Gulf. Just letting Prince Alanric lead an army to conquer. I'm afraid there's no chance of victory. Humph. What are the chances of winning? Brennus. 
I have never counted on Alanric. Don't worry about the High Cliff Castle and Fields Way for now. And take the Lion Knights directly to Lion Lake City. In fact, my son has no chance of winning. I don't dare to go to the battlefield. I will appoint you as the marshal. And you can collect the men he recruited on the way. And then go to the Gulf of Tonkin to kill the troops of Ketalan and the Raven Kingdom. Ulrich shook his head. With a clear expression of sarcasm on his face. I asked Alan Rick to lead troops to the Gulf of Tonkin. I just wanted to know who had defected to him. And also to see what troops he could control. But no matter what kind of army they are. They will not follow a cowardly child who dares not go to the battlefield. Brennus, do this well. And after this war is over, bring your son Marbert. I will make him my adopted son. I understand. Your Majesty. Brennus took the order and left. Ulrich turned to look at Godric. Godric, you have to take back the Chumha town you lost. I know you are worried about the king's seal in the hands of the traitor. I really can't declare my seal invalid directly. Liang is your close ally. Well, he is a rebel now. And rebels don't need to care about the king's seal. Go and tell him that it is his duty to kill the rebel. By the way, he still owes me a sum of money. Let him give it to him. Send it to me, and bring me my seal at the same time. Ulrich's tone was still indifferent. But he seemed confident and more powerful than before. Godric shuddered for some reason. He felt that Ulrich's expression now looked a lot like that of the three prophets. Which always made people think. There is nothing human about it. But Godric still followed the order and left. At least now Ulrich seemed to have a clear mind. And the orders he gave were all reasonable. He could even take into account that Godric was in trouble. Not only was he not crazy, but he was also quite intelligent. Easy to use. Lehman, I'm sorry. I knew you were detained by Alan Rick for several days, but I didn't release you until now. I hope you can understand. I'm not sure what my son will do. King Ulrich looked at Sir Lehman, who was the only one left beside the throne, and unexpectedly apologized. Your Majesty, you don't need to say this. I won't complain about this. Lehman was a little stunned for a moment. He has followed the king for nearly 20 years from his youth to now. But he has never heard King Ulri apologize. I know. I know you won't complain. But I shouldn't let you suffer such injustice. I know that only you are the most loyal lion knight around me. I have the most important task for you. Ulrich seemed quite sincere when he spoke to Lehman. Which was obviously the biggest reason why Lehman was loyal to him. When he said this, Ulrich waved to the attendant on the side. The guard came to the side door and then left without saying a word. A woman in her thirties walked in, wearing a blue noble robe from the Raven Realm, with a conspicuous falcon emblem on the robe. Your Majesty, Sir Lehman, I am Ursula, the true king of Ravenland. Mrs. Ursula introduced herself without waiting for Ulrich to speak. She took the initiative to, salve, to Ulrich, and then looked at Sir Lehman. Obviously, Ursula had already met Ulrich and reached some kind of agreement before Lehman and others came here. Lehman. Mrs. Ursula will be our loyal ally. Take your troops with Mrs. Ursula to the Crow Realm. Cut off the supply line of the Crow Army, leaving them with no way to retreat. And take the opportunity to capture the Dawn. Furnace City. There was a faint smile on King Ulrich's face. Since the troops of the Crow Kingdom dare to enter the Lion Realm. Then of course we can also invade the Crow Realm. Your Majesty. What should we do about Chicha Fortress? The Bacchus Empire may take the opportunity to launch an attack. Of course, Lehman is willing to go to the Crow Realm to fight against foreign enemies. But he doesn't understand. King Ulrich is sending out all his powerful troops. The combat power of Lion City and Chicha Fortress will become very strong. Weak. Don't worry about Chicha Fortress. The Bacchus Empire will not attack. I provided a lot of military funds to Sheila uses. And now there are rebels everywhere in Bacchus. Huh? Everyone thinks I did that. How much money is there to recruit mercenaries to capture the Nolder Elves? Do I really look that stupid? Ulrich shook his head and smiled. But the look in his eyes was quite cold. As you command? Your Majesty. Your Majesty. I will make the Raven Kingdom surrender to your crown. And you will become the greatest king in the entire continent. Mrs. Ursula also bowed respectfully. Of course. I'm looking forward to it. Ma'am. Oh. No. Maybe it should be. My queen? Ulrich watched the two people leave with veins gradually popping out on his forehead. But it wasn't until the two people completely left the door of the throne room that he frowned, his face full of pain. Hurry up and get the medicine. I can't bear it anymore. My head dot hurt so much. North of Kerwin Village, Prince Alan Rick finally got his wish and led the army to the expedition. 
Perhaps Ulrich was indeed unable to lead an army on a campaign. So he authorized Alanric to lead an army, at least in Alanric's eyes. But it was not to send troops to quell the rebellion, but to regain the lost territory of Sherhu City and expel the enemies of Crow Realm. Kedrin's judgment was indeed inaccurate. Although Ulrich did not go out personally, he sent a large army to Lion Lake City. As Ursula said, it is unpredictable what a king will do when faced with a desperate situation. It is actually difficult for a vassal to know what arrangements the king has made, and to use what he sees and hears to guess the king's behavior. It may be possible in normal times, but when the country is facing enemies on all sides, the king will also gamble. Especially the thoughts of a king like Ulrich are difficult to guess. However, Alanric, who finally got the chance to command an army, no longer looked as proud and fearless as he did in the Tower of the House of Lords. His uncle Igor died under a streaming arrow in a conflict that shouldn't have happened, and he was shot in the vital point more than a hundred meters away from a small team of Leon. It is said that there was still a gap in the middle at that time. Several hundred members of the Knights of the Lion, Alanric, who had never been on a battlefield, could understand the risks and uncertainties of the battlefield just from this description. But after his right-hand man Igor was killed, he now had to personally contact the nobles who supported him. And he also had to personally arrange the affairs that the army would face when going on an expedition. But he soon discovered that he didn't know how to do most things. He can neither arrange logistics nor inspire morale. He doesn't even know how to arrange camp locations and route plans, let alone what tactics to plan. Fortunately, he found Baron Alfred to help him solve most of the basic affairs problems. However, after the troops successfully set off and left the Lion City, Alanric found that he was scared and nervous. He is not as brave as he thinks, nor as capable as he thinks. King Ulrich may not be a good father, but he obviously understands that his only son, Alanric, is indeed afraid of going to the battlefield and is trembling with fear. After all, he had never been in a battle or even fought with anyone. His only fighting experience was the occasional gesture with a swordsman with a wooden sword. In fact, anyone who has never been on the battlefield will be filled with fear when they go out for the first time. This is not a shameful thing. But Alan Rick is the leader. Anyone can be afraid. But the leader cannot. No matter how scared you are, you still have to show that you are not afraid. But Alan Rick couldn't do it. He couldn't even ride a horse alone now. His hands and feet were stiff and difficult to move because of fear. From Lion City to Kerwin Village. This was probably the farthest road Alan Rick had ever walked in his short life. And it got hairier the further he walked. This section of the road was full of dark fog. And many corpses could be seen from time to time. The unknown whining sounds never stopped. This environment made Alanric's already uneasy heart even more frightened. And even made him want to vomit with fear. In addition, after continuing to Sherhu City, in about two days, he will go to the battlefield in person to face a bloody battle. Alanric was under a lot of pressure. He had never thought that going to the battlefield was such a terrifying thing. Talk and actual operation are really two different things. Those things that you thought were easy at first will only turn out to be so daunting and even a mess in your mind when you have to actually do them yourself. This is especially true in matters of life and death such as war. So Alan Rick stopped the troops at the bridgehead of Kerwin Village. His Royal Highness plans to take a breath of fresh air in this windy place. He now had nearly 3,000 men with him. The prince's constant tricks on the tower did attract a considerable number of followers to himself. Among them, more than a thousand people were actually small and medium-sized mercenary groups. Of course, Alanric promised to make them nobles and use the temptation of high salaries to win over these mercenary group leaders. This also brought him a direct army. But of course, the quality of these soldiers varied. Alanric probably did not really intend to pay too much salary. Anyway, mercenaries who died in battle did not need to be paid. The other troops came from two more powerful noble lords. What is the lord of Keladin Castle? Baron Elfride the knight commander of the Lion Knights, who just returned from single. The other one is Lord Yaragar, Baron Leofen, who is currently the commander of the Royal City Guards. They took the initiative to follow His Royal Highness the Prince to destroy the enemy and regain the lost territory. So Ulrich agreed to them and allowed them to bring the king's direct troops who were willing to follow the prince to fight. So Elfried brought about a hundred Lion Knights and four hundred Lion Retinues, while Leofen brought half of the Royal City Guards and 500 night retinues. In addition, they also brought levies from their own territory. About 800 people in total. This large force, with a total of nearly 3,000 people, is actually very strong. At least they are all veterans with battle experience. 
However, no matter how strong the army is, it must have a reliable leader. What if the commander-in-chief of the army is not only a new recruit, but his face is always pale with fear? His hands and feet are always trembling. He can even speak with trembling. And his voice is quieter than a mosquito. No soldier would want to fight with such a commander. In the eyes of the soldiers, this cowardly prince would probably abandon them and run away as soon as he saw the enemy. Chapter 194 It has nothing to do with bloodline. Your Highness, you seem to be a little too nervous. If this continues, the morale of the army will be weakened. You must let the soldiers understand that there are benefits to following you. Alfred felt that it was not good to go on like this. The morale of the troops was quite low, and they would probably collapse as soon as they came into contact with the enemy. So he began to give Alan Rick suggestions. What? Benefit? I don't know. I don't know how to deal with these rude soldiers. What should I do? Alan Rick can't speak fluently now. He really doesn't know how to boost morale and make the soldiers trust him. But after blowing the cool breeze for a while, his mind became very clear. He also understood that it was difficult for the soldiers to have any fighting spirit in his current appearance. But he really couldn't control his fear. The closer he got to Sherhu City, the more he became afraid. Fear. Quit is said to be a place of rebellion. Your Highness, there seems to be a man named Dalian who claims to be the royal family of Pender here. Baron Leofen and Elfride looked at each other and then looked back at the village of Kerwin they had just passed. Half a day later, Brennus brought 1,200 people from the Lion Knights to the north of Kerwin village. Then, he saw the unspeakable noise and tragedy. Almost every house in the northern area of Kewen village was on fire. Children were crying everywhere. Many villagers were running around in panic. Soldiers could even be seen raping women in public in the fields. There were corpses of civilians hacked to death everywhere. And countless villagers were lying injured and bleeding on the roadside crying. It seems that most of the civilians have been harmed. And it looks no different from the Jata people entering the village. The only ones that were not harmed were the noble manors in the center of the village. What caused all this was not bandits. Kewen village was a large town with nearly 10,000 people. Ordinary bandits were not capable of harming such a place. It was Alanric's troops, including Alan Rick himself, who harmed the civilians in northern Kerwin. The two barons, Leofoen and Alfred, were both noble lords with combat experience. In their view, it was understandable that Prince Alan Rick was nervous when he went to the battlefield for the first time. So they planned to teach him his royal highness has some experience in adapting to the battlefield atmosphere and relieving stress. At the same time, it also includes the experience of improving the morale of your subordinates. These experiences come from their past personal experiences. Before they went into battle for the first time, their predecessors taught them how to harm a civilian village and allowed their subordinates to burn, kill, loot and rape women. After doing all this, you will basically no longer be afraid of war, and your subordinates will be willing to follow you. It can indeed improve morale and replenish military supplies. Yes, most of the nobles in the western region of the Lion Kingdom did this. And it seemed to be effective. At least the soldiers under his command will be able to fully understand the benefits. But ordinary nobles would not harm a big town like Kerwin. At most, they would cause trouble in some remote mountain villages. However, after all, a prince is not an ordinary aristocrat who brings trouble to a small village. Of course, a prince must have a big scene to be worthy of his status. Of course, a big town like Kerwin couldn't plunder for no reason. So Leofen mentioned Dalian. To suppress rebellion is certainly a very convincing reason. Suspecting that someone is harboring treason is a very convincing reason to search every civilian and search every house. So, when Alan Rick, instigated by Alfred, personally lit a civilian house with a torch, his soldiers immediately became excited. Every soldier understood what His Highness the Prince meant. And they indeed became morale-like in an instant, while shouting, Follow His Highness the Prince to the death. They rushed towards the houses of the civilians with full energy. Then, a large number of civilians were robbed. Girls were insulted. Houses were burned. And property was plundered. Alanric is indeed not very scared now. He seems to be a little addicted. He is violently violently raping a panicked girl with his own hands. And beside him are two barons who are equally interested in helping. It may take a lifetime to learn to be kind. But it only takes half a minute to learn to be evil. Crossing the moral door and eating the conscience hidden inside the door only requires a simple reason. Kerwin Village, which had always been peaceful and peaceful, was more than half destroyed in this way. The nobles in the manor were unable to fight against this huge force. They could only pray that this would end quickly. Half a day later, they saw the savior, 
Duke Brennus came with the Lion Knights. But then, they were disappointed. The people of the Lion Knights turned a blind eye to all this. As if the tragedy that was happening did not exist at all. Brennus himself didn't care at all about the plight of the civilians. He just led people directly to find Alanric, who was cheerful and disheveled. The prince was coming out of the house while tying his belt. And immediately after that, Brennus had several lion knights gag him and carry him away. Brennus didn't even pay attention to Eldred, who was still laughing wildly in the house. Or to Leofen, who was whipping an innocent child on the other side of the house. After taking away Alanric, Brennus led the lion knights straight through the still chaotic village formed an array outside the village, and then blew the assembly horn. The trumpets continued intermittently for a full hour. But still the soldiers were not all assembled. The troops led by Alan Rick were supposed to number 3,000 people. But in fact, less than 2,600 people came together. The mercenary group, which originally seemed to have the worst overall quality, has almost all the members there, with only five or six missing. Most of the vacancies came from the levies of the Lion Knights the royal guards, and the two barons Alfred and Leofen. It seems that your army's military discipline is not very good. Brennus glanced sideways at Eldred and Leofen, his eyes full of sarcasm. Lord Brennus, isn't his highness the prince leading the army? The two barons asked somewhat sarcastically. They were all subordinates of Brennus. Seeing Brennus, they could only be obedient. They all knew that the duke had a bad temper and would definitely be whipped if he talked back. He's sick. It's going to be windy soon. Don't worry about those who are late. Take your troops and set off. Our goal is not Eagle Claw Fort, but Lion Lake City. Brennus casually helped Alan Rick get sick, and then motioned to the messenger next to him to blow the trumpet. The marching horn sounded, and the large army left Kerwin and began to move north. Charles and Dalian are both here at the Countess's vineyard, as are many of Kerwin's old nobles. In fact, none of the noble manors have been plundered. So far, no soldiers have entered the noble manor. But the nobles of Kewen have a deep understanding of what it means to be a gangster. These soldiers are worse than bandits. Bandits all know not to take things too far. It is best not to kill if you can. But these rebels had no scruples. Dalian couldn't help but wanted to rush out for a long time. But Charles hugged him tightly. After Dalian was inadvertently rescued by the drunkard group, he met Charles, who came out of the countess's manor, and was about to run away. Then Charles found that Dalian, and several of his men were locked in a prison car without any supervision. Based on the principle that most of the people captured by the enemy are friends, Charles released them. Therefore, after knowing that Charles was a knight under Leon, Dalian became Charles's friend and also mentioned that Eric was building a Griffin Knight station. So Charles also went to visit the ruins. But he didn't meet Eric. Eric had already gone to Long River Town to rescue Godric at that time. So Charles stayed in Kerwin and waited for news about Eric. Charles was a servant, and was very good at observing people's behavior. He could see Dalian's temperament. And he could also realize that Leon must have arranged for Eric to follow Dalian. There is a reason. Later, when he heard that Eric had rescued Godric, Charles felt relieved, and did not leave in a hurry. The Countess is also happy to let Charles stay in her own manner. She is very good to Charles now. Charles, who has lacked maternal love since childhood, is indeed a little reluctant to leave. As a result, I stayed until now. Charles has been with Count Odin since he was a child and has seen the faces of various nobles. He has heard a lot about such nobles harming the village. So of course, he will not be impulsive. Charles, don't stop me. Since they want to arrest me, I just have to get out. Why are they doing this? Those are innocent civilians. Dalian's teeth were almost broken. He knew that the troops entered Kerwin village in the name of pursuing rebellion but he couldn't understand why the nobles of the Lion Kingdom wanted to harm the civilians of their country like this. Burning down houses, robbing property, raping women, and killing innocent people. What does this have to do with the pursuit of rebellion? Don't be impulsive. Dalian, you will only die if you go out. It won't help. Don't be impulsive. Charles tightly restrained Dalian and refused to let him move. Charles didn't know why those nobles wanted to harm the common people. Anyway, Count Odin had never done so. And as far as he knew, Alma, Leofric, Leon, Godric and other nobles in the eastern region had never done this. It seems that this is a characteristic of the western aristocracy. Charles also didn't understand why the west, where there were fewer wars, would develop such a trend. Charles, let me go. I know they are here for the blood of the Pender royal family. Let me out. I don't want to kill so many innocent civilians because of me. 
Dalian felt that this force was coming to hunt him. And he was now filled with guilt. Royal bloodline? Humph! Dalian, they are not here to catch you. No one cares about bloodline. They are just using this excuse to rob civilians. The countess walked up to Dalian. But if you go out, they will plunder our manor on the grounds of harboring treason. Dalian, who was tightly held by Charles, stopped struggling, became quiet, and seemed a little confused. Before this, the nobles of Kerwin, including the countess, had never paid attention to Dalian's great cause of restoring the country, and would not even have anything to do with him. But they all knew Dalian. However, in their eyes, Dalian is just an upright but impetuous child. Regardless of his royal status of pender blood, they don't want to care about him. But when Alaric's troops harmed the village under the pretext of pursuing treason, they joined forces to control Darian. This is not to give Dalian out, but to prevent Dalian from taking people out to fight, so as not to bring more trouble to Qin village. These old nobles have rich experience, and they know very well that these rebels were not actually invited by Dalian. Alan Rick just found a random name to rob the civilians of Kerwin village. As long as Dalian does not appear, Alaric's troops will not attack the nobles' manor. But if Dalian impulsively appeared in front of Alaric's troops, then the estates of their nobles would most likely be thoroughly searched. So, they took Dalian and hid in the countess's manor. Now, these nobles are cursing those shameful rebels. The Lion Knights, Prince Alan Rick, and by the way, King Ulrich who gave birth to this scourge. Perhaps the nobles of Kerwin were not very kind to the common people on weekdays. But now everyone was extremely angry. Kerwin, a once excellent retirement place, had suddenly become dire and devastated, making everyone angry. Dalian, when you asked for support before, you seem to have said that you were the successor of a certain knighthood. Are you planning to rebuild the knighthood? The countess suddenly mentioned this matter at this time. And the nobles present stopped cursing. Dalian stopped struggling and became quiet. Yes. I want to rebuild the Griffin Knights. Madam, I am of the royal blood of Pender. Have you seen this ring? Dalian raised his hand and turned the ring outward to signal. This griffin looks like the flag of Baron Leon. Dalian, if you are willing to form a knighthood to protect this village, I would be happy to support you with money and food. But this has nothing to do with your royal bloodline. Look at that outside. What have these princes done? He is also the royal blood of the Lion Kingdom. I just hope that this place can be protected. However, if you just want to find the support of the nobles with your so-called blood status, then I hope you leave Kremlin one. Don't come back again. So as not to provide an excuse for these disasters again. The countess didn't care much about Dalian's ring or identity. She just purely didn't want something like this to happen to Kerwin again. Yes, we are willing to support a knighthood that protects the village. But stop mentioning royal orthodoxy. Yes, just like the Horn Call Rangers. They don't participate in power struggles. I heard that Fletcher Village and Charles also formed a longbow team. If you just want to fight for power and become king, then try your luck elsewhere. Young man. The other nobles were silent for a while. And then, they all agreed. They basically had the same idea as the countess. Dalian looked at the countess blankly, and then turned to look at Charles. He was a little confused. This was completely different from what he had always accepted and imagined. It has nothing to do with bloodline. It has nothing to do with bloodline. Charles, don't you care about bloodline orthodoxy? Why are you loyal to Lord Leon? Dalian looked down at the High King's ring on his hand and murmured. I don't understand blood. Master Leon selflessly helped me avenge my father's murder. So I am loyal to him and swear to never betray him. Charles shook his head slowly. My father didn't have a noble background. And he once said that a true knight is one who is willing to protect the common people. This has nothing to do with blood origin. So he became the Horn Call Ranger the grand leader of the regiment. Protecting civilians is the true knight. I understand. Madam, everyone, I will form a knighthood to protect this village. Dalian seemed to understand something. He looked around at the people in the manor, then turned the ring back and put on the helmet. But before that, I should be a qualified knight first. Charles, let's go clean up the scourges outside. Their large army seems to have left, and those who are still reluctant to leave. We should let them stay forever it's here. The sound of marching horns came from far outside the village. And Dalian was still very familiar with these military signals. Charles nodded, took off the two-handed sword on his back, and walked out of the manor side by side with Dalian. Kedron really didn't expect that the large army of the Lion Kingdom would arrive at the city so quickly. He was a little worried in Shuru's city 
because his legion of rogue knights was not suitable for defending the city, and the people of Shuru City would not help them. Not only will they not help them, but they will also be hostile to them, because after those gangsters entered the city, they either robbed homes or stole chickens and dogs. As a result, every house in Shuru City was closed, and there were no dogs on the streets in broad daylight. Although Kedron has been restraining them from doing anything too violent that would cause outrage, the citizens of Shuru City are still extremely unfavorable to them. Only one brave citizen stood up and raised the flag to revolt. Outside the city is an army of nearly 4,000 people led by Duke Brennus. And basically the entire Lion Knights are here. Of course, Ketelun is feeling very frightened. He knew that in recent years, this 1,800 strong Lion Knights had basically no opponents in plain field battles. When the extraordinarily skilled heavily armored Knights of the Knights of the Lion charged into the formation, they were like a torrent of steel and lances. So far, no troops in the entire continent could withstand the charge of the Knights of the Lion in a field battle. So he couldn't even run now. And he would definitely die if he left the city in the wilderness. But there seems to be no good results in staying in Shuru City. Maybe when Breda starts to attack the city, there will be a citizen riot in the city. The desperate Ketaline couldn't understand. Did Ulrich not care about the safety of Lion City? Why would he send out all his elite troops? And why didn't he take back Chang'e Town first? Why come directly to Shuru City? There is not much time left for Ketelun, because Bredis' army has already sounded the horn of attack. In fact, when Ketelun saw the army, he directly raised the kingdom's lion flag and waved the white flag at the top of the city. He has not publicly claimed to follow Ursula. And so far, Ketelun is still considered a vassal of the kingdom. But Bredis seemed to have not seen the flag on the city head at all. The duke did not even send any envoy to ask. He directly sent Alfred and Leofen. Using the Lion Knights as the supervising team, forcing the two barons to lead their levies to attack the city. Chapter 195 The Northern Plot Things in this world are always not as satisfactory as expected. So it was with Kedron. And so it was with Lady Ursula. Ursula did successfully form an alliance with the Lion Kingdom and received the support of the Lion Kingdom. She made a marriage contract to Ulrich and signed an agreement with the Lion Kingdom as the suzerainty in exchange for the freedom of the Lion Kingdom an army of 2,000 men led by Lehman. The army led by Lehman was the majority of the garrison in Lion City and Chicha Fortress, and was a relatively experienced mixed force. The trajectory of his and Ursula's actions also went north through Kerwin Village, and then directly crossed the Jatta Grassland and entered the Crow Realm. If they can capture Dawnforge City, then the eastern part of the Crow Kingdom will definitely fall into the hands of Ursula, who will rule the eastern part of the Crow Kingdom as a vassal. By then, Ulrich will marry Ursula and legitimately gain the right to rule Ravenland. Of course, for Ursula, she can also gain the right to rule the Lion Realm through this. The marriage is actually fair to both parties in a sense. As for what will happen in the more distant future, then it depends on God's will. But the problem is that Ursula and Lehman failed to capture Shialu City as they wished. The person who blocked her was Earl Stephen. Ursula originally thought that Earl Stephen would help her because she had asked Ren to inform Gregory IV about the deal with the Jatta people. In her opinion, if Earl Stephen knew the truth, he would probably support her, or at least not hinder her. In addition, she asked Ren to return to Dark Falcon Castle to prepare troops, which could form a double attack with her and Lehman's troops. If everything is executed right, it might indeed go her way. But the problem is that Ren failed to see Earl Stephen, and Ren failed to return to Dark Falcon Castle. Dark Falcon Castle was once the residence of the Falcon Knights. After the Falcon Knights were declared in a legal knighthood, the people of Dark Falcon Castle have been hostile to Gregory IV because the Falcon Knights had been standing in the fight against the Gargoyles, the forefront of people, coupled with the past reputation of the Falcon Knights. In the hearts of people in the eastern part of Ravenland, the Falcon Knights are even more like the National Knights than the Dragon Knights. But in order to ensure the throne of the king, Gregory IV sent troops to destroy the Falcon Knights a few years ago. Or it should be called suppressing the rebels. This is actually understandable. After all, Ms. Ursula is the chief knight of the Falcon Knights. This knighthood will definitely support Ursula. So of course Gregory IV will classify the Falcon Knights as an illegal knighthood. Of course, the consequence of such suppression was that the Jatta people invaded more frequently. The Dark Falcon Castle, which had always resisted Jatta's entry, could no longer stop the Jatta people. Especially this spring. The Jatta people did not attack the Lion Kingdom at all. And all Jatta troops turned to attack the Crow Kingdom. Dark Falcon Castle, 
and the surrounding areas of Oldenburg have been severely harmed by the Jata people in the past few years. The Lord of Oldenburg is Earl Stephen, and the Lord of Dark Falcon Castle is Earl Stephen's son, Lord Faramund. In other words, Earl Stephen's family suffered huge losses due to the destruction of the Falcon Knights. Of course Earl Stephen was extremely dissatisfied with this, but it was blameless for the king to send troops to suppress the rebellion. So even if he was dissatisfied, Earl Stephen could only endure it and formed a ranger force to fight against the Jata people. This Earl's military strength is actually very strong. He is located on the eastern border of Ravenclaw. The two counties of Oldenburg and Dark Falcon Castle have to face the Jata people in the south and the Misty Mountain people in the north. If he is not strong, he will be over. It took several months for Earl Stephen to gradually drive the Jata people out of the Crow Realm. In the meantime, he also annihilated a group of Misty Mountain people, namely Andonda's plundering team. But because Gregory IV was only thinking about how to suppress the rebellion and had no regard for the life and death of Oldenburg and Dark Falcon Castle, Stephen had a very difficult time fighting in the past few months. In order to protect the people under his rule, the Earl almost paid the family as empty. On the contrary, Ursula provided some intelligence support to Stephen during this period. Of course, Ursula actually only made some attitude to win Stephen's allegiance, mainly to prevent Count Stephen from dealing with her rebels. But everything is afraid of comparison. On one side, the king who has the responsibility to protect his vassals did not give any help to his vassals. Instead, he devoted himself to annihilating the rebellion when facing the invasion of Jatu, while on the other side, the weak rebel army was already in danger. Lit a helping hand to Stephen, even if the support was not much. Under this circumstance, Count Stephen became increasingly dissatisfied with Gregory IV, and even began to protect Ursula's rebels. Although Earl Stephen is kind-hearted and has always been extremely loyal to the Raven Kingdom, no matter how kind-hearted a person is, he still has a temper. However, in the eyes of Gregory IV, he has never been able to find Ursula and has been unable to exterminate Ursula's rebels because Earl Stephen did not cooperate with the king and felt that Earl Stephen lacked the necessary respect and loyalty to him. At this time, Gregory IV received news of the civil strife in the kingdom of Lion Lake and heard that Father had openly pledged his allegiance to Ursula and was made the Grand Duke of Lion Lake. Bossett and Ursula were able to meet. Of course, it was Baron Kedron who was the matchmaker. But neither of them knew that this was an opportunity that Ursula took the initiative to create for Gregory IV. For Gregory IV. This was of course an excellent opportunity. Because this situation meant that Ursula's rebels were in Lion Lake City. And Lion Lake City's defection to Ursula also gave him an excellent excuse. If we can seize the opportunity to capture Lion Lake City, we can kill two birds with one stone, eliminate Ursula's rebels, and capture the northern part of the Lion Kingdom. In addition, the Lion Kingdom is in civil strife, so the chance of success is quite high. So Gregory IV wasted no time. He reached an agreement with the Jata warlord Zakar, using Count Stephen's Oldenburg and Dark Falcon Castle in exchange for the support of the Jata people. Gregory IV is going to march to the Lion Realm and Count Stephen naturally has to obey the call. This is equivalent to transferring Count Stephen's army and giving Oldenburg and Dark Falcon Castle to the Jata people. He could directly cross the Jata grassland to attack the northern part of the Lion Kingdom, and quickly capture the Lion Lake City before the Lion Kingdom could react to resolve the civil strife. In fact, in the eyes of Gregory IV, it was a good deal to exchange Oldenburg and Dark Falcon Castle for the Jata people's cooperation. Ursula's rebels had been operating in this area for a long time and this area was originally owned by the rebels. Turf. And Earl Stephen's family is covering the rebels. Again, for Gregory IV. These rebellious territories that were already disobedient and used for trading could be regarded as waste utilization. Earl Stephen naturally didn't know about this deal. If he knew about it, he would probably rebel immediately. Therefore, if Earl Stephen could be made aware of the existence of this deal, then the Earl would definitely return to the army to expel the Jata people and fully surrender to Ursula. Ursula can bring the military power of Oldenburg and Dark Falcon Castle, plus Lehman's troops, to easily capture the currently relatively empty Xialu city. Not only that, she can also cooperate with Earl Stephen to block the return path of the Crow Kingdom army. If you want to return to Crow Kingdom, you can only go to Oldenburg or Dark Falcon Castle. In other words, Ursula could not only occupy the eastern part of the Crow Kingdom, but also be sure to hold it. But things in the world are always full of surprises. A few days ago, before Sir Ren arrived at Count Stephen's camp, Leon had already led his troops to fight a less fierce frontal battle with Count Stephen. 
the number of troops on both sides was similar. But the level of eliteness was very different. And the battle was not intense at all. The bows and arrows of the Nolder Elves controlled the battlefield from a distance of a hundred meters. The precise rain of arrows prevented the two sides from advancing to the stage of close combat. The battle ended after only a few minutes. Earl Stephen lost more than a hundred people again. And then withdrew directly with this cavalry force. Since Earl Stephen retreated to the north. The Lord did not order the pursuit. His purpose was not to annihilate the Crow people. But to ensure the safety of Fletcher and Brave Shield Castle. He knew that the Jada people were already here. Because several embarrassed Ebony Gauntlet Knights had already fled to Fletcher Village. And beacon fires were also lit over at Brave Shield Castle. Three beacons. Which means that the number of Jata people may be beyond imagination and even difficult to count. Dumbledore returned to Brave Shields alive. But only the thirty or so skilled Ebony Gauntlet Knights were left with him. He went to lure the Jata people before. Originally just to make a gesture and see if there was any way to get some loot. But no one expected that the Jata people would actually send out such a terrifying number. Baron Leofric allowed him to leave Brave Shield Castle. But now that Dumbledore no longer wanted to run away, the loss would be too great, and there would be no good outcome if he returned to Cliff Bay. It would be better to stay in Brave Shield Castle to fight against the Jada people. When Sir Ren arrived near Fletcher Village, there were no troops from the Crow Realm here. Only countless Jada camps, 30 miles north of Fletcher Village, where Earl Stephen's original camp was, extending north to the end of the line of sight. As far as the eye can see, there are all Jada camps that can be pulled by draft horses, and have wheels. That kind. Judging from the scale of this camp. The Jada people sent out at least 5,000 people. This did not seem to be for plunder. But more like a clan migration. Ren had no way of knowing where Earl Stephen was. And he didn't dare to look for it. In fact. He had no intention of looking for him at all. He was discovered by the Jata people as soon as he arrived here. And was chased for more than 10 miles. Of course. Ren fled in the direction of Fletcher Village because there were grasslands in other directions, and he couldn't escape. But he actually couldn't escape in the direction of Fletcher. The troops he led could not outrun the Jata people on the grassland, and were overtaken by two Jata sentries a few miles away from Fletcher's village, under siege. However, Sir Ren was lucky, and he was saved by a force carrying the flag of a golden griffin on a black background. And this is an all-female unit. What saved Ren was the griffin sword mercenary group led by Amy and Sarah. When being rescued by the female soldiers, Rin thought for a moment that she was encountering Falcon Talon. Except that they were not wearing sky blue falcon smocks. The female explorers overall looked really like Falcon Talon. They are also all women. All use women's crossbows. The same adventurer helmets. The same fighting methods. And the same courage and combat effectiveness that are not inferior to any man. When the Jatha cavalry saw this female troop, they gave up the siege of Rin and evacuated directly. This was not normal. The difference in military strength between the two sides was not big. Based on the Jada people's past practices, they would probably use 200-man squadrons to hold back the female soldiers. And then add a steady stream of troops. This direct withdrawal reaction seemed like they were unwilling to start a war. Ren probably just accidentally ran into them and was beaten conveniently. Thank you for your rescue. Ma'am. Ren, who was still in a daze, kept looking at the female soldiers. He saw the leader Amy, but Amy was observing the retreating Jatta Centurion and did not get close to Rin. Rescue? Maybe. The Golden Eagle in blue. Are you the Falcon Knight? If I remember correctly, the Falcon Knight seemed to have been destroyed by Gregory the Fourth a few years ago. Why are the Falcon Knights still chasing Grey? Goalie four fights? Sarah walked up to Rin, looked at Rin's shield and horse clothes, and waved to the female soldiers to surround Rin with unkind eyes. She thought that Ren's small team came from the cavalry under Count Stephen. I am Falcon Knight Ren, but I did not follow Gregory the Fourth. Madam, you may have misunderstood. I am not from the Crow Kingdom now. Ren looked at the ebony military swords in the hands of the female soldiers and spread his hands. It seems that you are not Falcon Claws. I thought it was Olvid, the god of the north, who guided me to find the Falcon. The remaining sergeants of the knights. As far as I know, Falcon Claw does not believe in Olvid. And the god of the north may not be able to guide you in the lion realm. You are not from the raven kingdom now. Huh? Knight of Rin. Of course you are not a raven now. Because you have been captured by me. The speaker was Amy. She looked at Rin's dozens of riders wearing Crow Kingdom's iconic short skirts. Then looked back at the two Jata sentries who were going away. And said thoughtfully. Later. 
Sir Ren was taken to the camp where the Lord Lord was. As they passed the bridge, Sir Ren watched with straight eyes another team that shocked him as they came out of the village to hand over to Sarah. They were the Nolder troops led by Noel. He was fighting with a griffin sword. The female soldiers changed defense and patrolled the other side of the river in place of the returning female soldiers. Dot the scale of the Jata people is beyond our imagination. With their military strength, they can launch a direct attack. But why do they stay and camp on the opposite side? The Lord Lord was currently discussing with Raphael and others in the camp with a serious face. But even Raphael, who was most familiar with the Jata people, didn't know what the enemy's intentions were. And everyone could only shake their heads. Sir, we are back. Sarah and Amy brought Rin to Leon. We met him on the other side of the river and was besieged by the Jata people. This guy brought dozens of crow riders, but said he was not from the crow kingdom. These Rin Krolin men really don't know how to lie. Leon turned around and reached out to hand Amy a glass of water. Didn't the Jada people set any traps elsewhere? No. We circle around. Except for the north. There were no Jada people anywhere. We just encountered this guy being chased. And the Jada troops besieging him were acting strangely. Amy described to the Lord the scene where the Jada people retreated when they saw them. Did the Jada people change their temper? After seeing so many women, they actually retreated? Raphael walked over with a puzzled look on his face. This situation has never happened before. The Jata people usually kidnap women. Even if they suffer losses for this, they will not give up. Their fighting method usually results in losses. Very large. They have always relied on abducted women to reproduce their offspring. I probably know the reason why the Jata people did this. Your Excellency. Lord. Sirin finally had a chance to speak. And he also saw that Leon was the leader here. What is the reason? The Lord signaled Ren to continue. Rin was hostile to both Jatu and Gregory IV. So he would naturally not hide this information. So, are the Jatu people setting up suspicious troops for a show? Just to cooperate with Gregory Ivy's attack on the Gulf of Tonkin? No wonder they don't attack us. Leon reacted immediately. But then he shook his head. But we went out to test. And the thousands of tents arranged by the Jatu people are all real. They did come with thousands of people. If Greg the fourth generation just allowed the Jada people to plunder the Dark Falcon Castle, and I am afraid that he may not be able to get the Jada people to cooperate with him at such a high price. Gregory the fourth provides the Jada people with more than just ordinary plundering opportunities. He wants to let the Jada people completely occupy Dark Falcon Castle, and he will give the entire county to the Jada people. At the same time, and he also promised that after occupying the Bibu Gulf of the Lion Kingdom, he would give all the land west of Eagle Claw Castle to the Jata people and the hundreds of miles of hilly grassland where the horses were herded. And he would give all of it to the Jata people, Rin said quickly. I heard this with my own ears. They were negotiating on the bridge south of Oldenburg. And I happened to be hiding under the bridge at that time. I swear on the dignity of a knight. I said it's all the truth. The face of the Lord Lord gradually turned gloomy. Gregory the Fourth dot can he be considered a king with this behavior? Giving the land and people of the country to the plunderers? Sir, I can understand the Crow King's intention. And Dongjiao raised his hand at this time and pointed at the map on the wall. He probably wants the Jata people to block the Misty Mountain at Dark Falcon Castle. The north of Dark Falcon Castle is where we went down the mountain before. Chapter 196 Fight Against Jata Together And Dongjiao's guess was probably right. The Lord curled his lips and said, Let a man-eating wolf live in the house to help him block the lynxes that steal food? Does Gregory IV think that the Jata people are better than the Misty Mountain people? More friendly, Gregory IV doesn't care about this at all. In his eyes, the throne is obviously more important than the country. Sir Ren sighed. If he really loved the Crow Kingdom, he wouldn't destroy the Falcon Knights with his own hands. Are you from the Knights of the Falcon? What is your intention in coming here? Leon looked at the coat of arms on Ren's body. My name is Ren. My lord. I am now loyal to Lady Ursula. She and I are probably the only remaining Falcon Knights. I am here because Lady Ursula asked me to come to Earl Stephen and tell him about Grey. Gory foresold his Oldenburg and Dark Falcon castles. Ren did not hide his mission. In any case, Amy led the female soldiers to save his life. He is not the kind of fool who does not know what is good and evil. Moreover, now that Count Stephen has left, his mission cannot be completed. The Lord Lord nodded. So... Mrs. Ursula intends to get Earl Stephen to surrender to her and withdraw her troops to block the Jata people. It seems that she can achieve at least half of her purpose. Earl Stephen withdrew his troops two days ago. As for the other half, 
she probably can only talk to Earl Stephen in person. Sir Wren, I do not intend to be an enemy of Mrs. Ursula. In fact, you can leave now. But I think it may be difficult for you to return to Lynn now. It's Crowland. It is indeed difficult. The North is now full of Jada camps. And Wren does not intend to be hunted down again. So Wren shook his head directly. Both the Jata people and Gregory IV are our common enemies. In fact, Her Majesty the Queen has now become an ally of the Lion Kingdom. I can be with you here. Deal with the enemy. If you wish. My lord. Queen? You mean Lady Ursula Dodd she has become an ally with the Lion Kingdom? What is going on? Leon didn't know Ursula's plan. Dot the Crow's army was actually lured out by Her Majesty, the Queen Dot according to the original plan. I was supposed to return to Dark Falcon Castle to gather an army and wait for Her Majesty the Queen. But now it is difficult for me to cross the Jada Grassland. Your Majesty the Queen I probably won't be able to get through it. So, what I should do now is try my best to gain your friendship and gain an ally for Her Majesty the Queen. Ren took the initiative to tell the Lord all of Ursula's plans and also spoke frankly about his intentions. So, Mrs. Ursula is in Lion City? Don't you need to report the situation to her? Leon looked at Ren carefully, and he was a little surprised by Ren's reaction. He knew that this was supposed to be a companion in the game, a knight who had been trying to restore the status of the Order of the Falcon. It is not surprising that Ren became a subordinate of Lady Ursula, just as Frederick once served Fauché. However, the relationship between Ren and Ursula is a formal allegiance. After all, they are both members of the Falcon Knights. Therefore, it is impossible for Ren to join Liang's team now. And he has a mission. Logically speaking, after confirming that he cannot complete the mission, he should immediately go to the Lion City to report to Ursula. But he planned to stay with Liang. My lord, Her Majesty the Queen may have already set off. It would be safer and more appropriate for me to wait for her here. In fact, I hope you will meet her. And I think you may also be happy to have an additional ally. What Ren said to Liang was somewhat meaningful. The word he used was ally rather than friend. This was probably because Ren saw the Nolder Elves and the female soldiers of the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group. As a knight who grew up in Lonsong Harbor, Ren had little contact with the Nolder Elves. It was not popular among the nobles of Ravenland to show off Nolder slaves at home. So Ren had no prejudice against the Nolder people. But he knew that no human had ever been able to command the Nolder Elves to fight. But the Baron Leon in front of him did it. Not only that, there are actually female soldiers in Liang's team who are not much different from Falcon Claws as well as members of the Horn Summoning Rangers. In Ren's eyes, this means that this lord is very unusual. A lord who can command the older elves is probably not something that the Lion King can control. Therefore, Ren told Leon all about Mrs. Ursula's plan. Under the current circumstances, Mrs. Ursula's plan had failed. Telling everything openly and honestly could gain Liang's trust. Ren directly regarded Liang as an independent force and actively expected to establish a cooperative relationship with Liang. The Lord also looked at Ren with admiration. Of course, he saw what Ren meant. There are really not many people who are so perceptive. In fact, Ren's combat power in the game is very average. And all the statistics are average. It seems that he is not even worthy of such a special status as the last Falcon Knight. But now, Leong knows why the mediocre Ren became the last remaining Falcon Knight besides Ursula to live for a long time. Most of them did not rely on force. It's just that the game cannot reflect the intelligence and adaptability of these characters. At this moment, Sir Roland came in. My lord, Dumbledore from the Knights of the Ebony Gauntlet is here. He has captured a Jatsu prisoner. Leong turned around and went out. Dumbledore was outside the door, covered in filth, either blood or mud. It looked like he had fought a battle with the Jatsu people at Brave Shield Castle, and he had worked very hard. He brought with him a Jatsu man who was wearing jaw armor and a face-covered helmet. The Jatsu man seemed to be of a high status. But now, he was tightly tied and covered with bruises. Dumbledore, your knights are really good at capturing prisoners. It is not easy to capture such Jatsu prisoners. Have the Jatsu people attacked Brave Shield Castle? The Lord is sincerely praising him. Only the Ebony Gauntlet Knights have this ability. It would be really difficult for other troops to catch Jatsu officers alive. Lord Leong, the Jatsu people did not attack Brave Shield Castle. I saw a lone Jatsu team and took the initiative to get some loot. By the way, I also found out what the Jada people were going to do with such a large scale. Dumbledore frowned and pointed at the prisoner. But the problem is, no matter how much we torture him, he doesn't speak, and we can't understand Jatu. 
Baron Leofric said you might have a way to make him this guy opened his mouth. So I brought this guy over. Raphael. Come here. Oh. Wait. Anson. Bring Drash here. The Lord originally wanted to find Raphael. But then he realized that he had a more suitable translator than Raphael. The Jatta prisoner looked very similar to Liang's groom Drash. He looked like he was dead without saying a word. When he saw a Drash, the Jatta prisoner asked a few questions with straight eyes, and then actually started chatting with Drash. From the looks of it, he seems to be an acquaintance. Sir Dottie Dot is my clansman. Drash speaks much more eloquently now. For so long, this middle-aged man who turned from a warlord to a groom has always been said to be conscientious. Of course, this is probably because he really likes to raise horses. Perhaps for Drash, it is a good job to only raise horses and not fight. And the Lord has always been kind to him. However, the more important reason is that Drash once mentioned that Leon already knew that Drash was a subordinate of Destroyer, Judah. He had been captured. If he returned to the tribe, he would only suffer more cruel treatment, torture, and all the wives, children, and children will be reduced to slavery. But if he never appears in the group again, his children can live like human beings. So he won't run away and he won't mess around. He has no place to go. This was the case with Judah's tribe. Before there was an order to retreat, those who fled for their lives on the battlefield would be shot to death, and the whole family of those who surrendered to the enemy would be made slaves. Only the brave warriors who marched forward could give more property and women. This high-pressure inertia formed a sense of honor, which led to Judah's tribal fighting while being quite strong. But it was also because of this sense of honor that Judah's troops had only two tactical instructions, to advance or to retreat. The other great warlord Zachar is different. Zachar's tactics and strategies are even feared by the Nolder. The Jatta man who was captured by Dumbledore was obviously a subordinate of Judah and was from the same tribe as Dresh. Dresh chatted with his tribe for a long time and then told the Lord that the Jatta people camping nearby were not a pure army. They were actually the tribe of the expelled Jatta tribe Judah. The great warlord Zakhar took advantage of Judah's loss of thousands of elites in the Noldor forest to expel the tribes who disobeyed him. The prisoner didn't know much about the situation. But he said he did not intend to attack Fort Brave Shield or Fletcher. They only planned to wait for the war at Eagle Claw Fort to end and find a place in the grassland east of Eagle Claw Fort. Settlement. Therefore, Shudah's tribe, the expelled Jada people, are also very worried now. They just want to see the situation. If they encounter a team of crow people, they will attack easily. But they will not attack Brave Shield Castle or Fletcher in a large scale. They will retreat directly when they see a larger team. They have no intention of fighting now. I understand Dot I understand. Leon suddenly realized it now. The warlord Zacher negotiated a deal with the Crow Kingdom not just to plunder the Crow Kingdom. He also had a greater purpose. The Raven Kingdom promised to give all the hundreds of miles of grassland hills east of Eagle Claw Castle to Zakar. So Zakar planned to expel Judah's tribe to this grassland hills. Speaking of which, Zakar was quite kind. It indeed gave the expelled tribes a place to live. But the problem is that Zachar expelled Judah's tribe to the east of Eagle Claw Castle to block the warring armies of the Lion Kingdom and the Crow Kingdom. No matter what the battle situation is, these troops will not be able to go to the Crow Kingdom. Since he has such an idea, it means that Zachar himself will lead his troops to Dark Falcon Castle, Oldenburg, and may even capture Shialu City. These places are now quite empty. Perhaps Zahar wanted to transform the Jata people from a nomadic and raiding tribe into a semi-settled one. Just like the Desha Principality. Nation. He is not dealing with Gregory the Fourth at all. He intends to take advantage of the opportunity when all the elites in the eastern part of the Crow Kingdom are available to swallow up the entire eastern part of the Crow Kingdom. It seems that everyone is planning to take advantage? But in the current situation, it seems that no one can take advantage. The Lord touched his chin and thought for a while. Then turned his head and looked at the female soldiers of the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group outside. Amy. Do you know Countess Valera and her Falcon Claws? Ah? Uh? Leong. Do you want to? I want the Falcon Claw to return to Telon Castle. And the Falcon Knights to return to Dark Falcon Castle. No matter what other forces have planned. They must fight against Jatta with me. Eagle Claw Fort. Gregory IV was engaged in battle with Father's forces. The war has been going on for several days. Since the Lord of Eagle Claw Castle, Ketalin, sold his teammates and went to Lion Lake City. The army of Ravenland had the upper hand at this time. Father was defending the city. And Granlin's Lion Lake City Flag Guard was supporting Big Lynn Village on the flanks of Eagle Claw Castle. The two sides were at each other's horns. 
and they could still hold on for a while. The two people who had a grudge against each other worked closely together for a few days. After all, they all grew up in Shuru City, and they would still fight to the death when faced with defending their homeland. But now, the war situation is very unfavorable for them. When Kedron left, he took away most of the food and military supplies, and the defense reserves of Eagle Claw Fort were seriously insufficient. It seems that there are less than 5,000 troops in Crowland. It seems that Father can completely defend the city with more than 2,000 people. But war is not about numbers. The troops dispatched by the Crow Kingdom, this time, are all elite. They came across 700 miles of grassland. And of course, they would not bring too many miscellaneous soldiers. Basically, those sent out were experienced veterans. Moreover, there are many high-level shooters in the Crow Army. Even if they defend the city, Father's troops still suffered heavy losses. They were almost shot at Eagle Claw Castle and could not hold their heads up. Fawcett's troops suffered heavy casualties and their morale was getting lower and lower. In fact, their morale was not high at the beginning because they did not see Ketalan and Ursula when they entered Eagle Claw Fort and there was nothing in the warehouse. But the enemy had already engaged and they could not retreat easily. But now, they had just received the news that Ketalan had occupied Sherhu City and their morale was even lower. But now that they are surrounded in Eagle Claw Castle, it is not easy to retreat. Being sold by friendly forces, their homes stolen, morale low, and lack of military supplies. The overall combat effectiveness is naturally not much left. It would be good if these 2,000 people can exert 30% of their combat effectiveness. The armored guards of Raven Realm had attacked the city wall twice on this day. If Granlon hadn't led the Sherhu city flag guard to the rescue in time, Eagle Claw Fort might have been breached. Granlon rushed outside the city not only to rescue Fawcett, but also to convey the news to Fawcett that Kedlin had stolen the house. He did not enter Eagle Claw Castle and had been cooperating outside the city, so he could get this information. Of course, Granlon planned to return to the army first to kill the thief Kedlin, and stay in Sherhu City to defend his homeland. Sherhu City was his hometown. He would lead troops to Eagle Claw Fort just because once Eagle Claw Fort is lost, Lion Lake City will be completely plunged into war. But Kedron occupied Lion Lake City at this time. Which means that Kedron, the thief, is using Father and him as cannon fodder. Without Lion Lake City to deliver supplies, Eagle Claw Fort cannot be defended. So Granlon planned to return to Lion Lake City and then resist the Raven Crows in Lion Lake City. The Sherhu City flag guard he led was a powerful heavy cavalry force. And it was outside the city. If he wanted to retreat, the Crow Realm army would not be able to stop him. But the problem is that heavy cavalry alone will definitely not be able to recapture Lion Lake City. He must rescue Fawcett and work together with Fawcett to fight back to Sherhu City. Fawcett is gathering men in Eagle Claw Castle. He is indeed preparing to break out. Granlon has just dispersed the Ravenland troops to the west of Eagle Claw Castle. Now is a good time to break out of the city. But just as he was getting ready to rush out of Eagle Claw Fort, he saw billowing smoke coming from the east. That's the Jada people. Your Excellency. The Duke. They're the Jada people's cavalry. The soldiers on the wall shouted. At this time, the Crow Realm troops, who were attacking under the city, also blew the horn to withdraw their troops. Dot, what's going on? Dot, why are there such huge Jata cavalry? Father obviously didn't dare to break through. From the city wall, he could see a large number of Jada cavalry coming towards Eagle Claw Fort. There were at least several thousand. Going out of the city at this time was basically courting death. And he would definitely not be able to return alive. Lion Lake City. Granlon also quickly evacuated the battlefield at this moment. He didn't know what the situation was. But it was obviously not a good thing for so many Jada people to come. But he did not go to Sherhu City in the west. But went directly south. Facing the armies of Raven and Jatu. Father will definitely be unable to get out of Eagle Claw Castle for a while. Heavy cavalry alone will not be able to recapture Lion Lake City from Kedron. Granlon leads a lone army nothing can be done. Glancing in the direction of Sherhu City. Granlon gritted his teeth and spit. Kedron. He then withdrew southward with his banner men. Ketalan, who was worried about his whole family by Granlon, was currently shivering in the Lord's Hall of Lion Lake City. He originally wanted to occupy Sherhu City and Chungha Town, intending to benefit from both sides. But who knew that Ursula did not go to Long River Town, but formed an alliance with the Lion Kingdom in a way that was consistent with her status as a claimant to the throne. Kedron betrayed his teammates, but turned around and was betrayed by his teammates. Brennus led a large army to capture Lion Lake City in just one day. The price paid for this was that the two barons Alfred and Leofen almost spent all their knights and recruits. Soldiers, 
That is, there was no cause to Brennus himself. In fact, both Eldred and Leofen understood their situation. They followed Prince Alanric while King Ulric was still alive. Of course, the king would deal with him. However, they did not expect that the punishment would come so quickly. Chapter 197 The looters were robbed. Elfride has been relieved of his status as Knight Commander of the Lion Knights. And is now just an ordinary Lion Knight. Leah Furban has also lost his position in the Royal City Guards. Brennus will not use Lion Knights to fight siege battles with the Royal Guards. This is an army directly under the king. He dismissed the two barons, leaving them with their own levies to earn performance again. However, after Duke Brennus forced them to attack the city and announced that they were relieved of their duties, he never mentioned anything else. Not even a reprimand. As if nothing happened. However, Alfred and Leofen both had good minds. They knew that this actually meant that Duke Brennus was giving them a chance. Their old leader did what he should do according to the king's wishes. Matter. But it also gave them the opportunity to stand back together. So the two men worked extremely hard when attacking the city. And it seemed as if they had a deep grudge against Ketelin. They also knew that after crippling their own troops, they would no longer pose any threat to the king. Then the king would definitely let them go. At least their territory and lives would be saved. They are all nobles who understand the rules of the game. Brennus indeed did not make things difficult for them anymore. And after taking control of Lion Lake City, he gave them another opportunity to take their remaining soldiers to acquire all the properties of Lion Lake City, including Ketalan's property. Of course, the Duke must make sure that his hands are clean. Private plundering a property must of course be done by people who are already unclean. Brennus then led a group of Lion Knights into the Lord's Hall. Ketalan saw Brennus coming in and planned to use extreme self-rescue at this time. Lord Brennus, my brother-in-law, we are all vassals of the kingdom. I even left my territory and took back Lion Lake City for the kingdom. And I have raised my flag to surrender. Why do you insist on attacking? Kedrin does look like a loyal minister now. Although his hands are a little shaky. Come on! Kedrin, Mrs. Ursula has sold you. And no one can save you. Brennus found a chair and sat down. He looked very kind. But he had a sword in his hand. My cooperation with Ursula is just a temporary measure. Just to allow the traitor father to resist the Crow Realm army. I can do my best to repel the Crow people to prove my loyalty. Kedron tried his best to explain. Intending to describe himself as an undercover agent who sacrificed his territory to save his country. But Brennus shook his head gently and smiled. Kedron, these are actually not important. I only want to ask you a question. You have slept with Mrs. Ursula. Right. Duke Brennus obviously knew his brother-in-law very well. Kedron was stunned. After a few seconds, a stiff smile appeared on his face. Ha uh -huh. ha. Uh -huh. Yes, I have slept with her. Many times. I understand. I knew it. Now his majesty is engaged to Mrs. Ursula. Of course. This is only part of the agreement. The engagement will only count after the agreement is reached. But even so, his majesty cannot tolerate you. After Brennus finished speaking, he waved his hand. You should be glad that I am here. Ketelin. I will give you the honor of dying in battle with honor. I promise that nothing will happen to your family. Several lion knights walked over and took Kellen out of the Lord's Hall. The direction Kedron was taken was Talon Fort. Brennus's legion did not stay too long in Lion Lake City. He still had to fight off the ravens. However, he took away all the valuable gold and silver in the warehouses of Sherhu City and asked his own private troops to take them back to his territory. Cliff Bay. There is a reason why Chiaoyan Bay is so wealthy in order to increase their harvest. The two barons Alfred and Leofen also led the remaining soldiers to plunder the civilians of Lion Lake City. However, these two barons also put all the proceeds from the plunder into the command of Duke Brennus. On those carriages returning to Cliff Bay. Anyway, when the army enters the city, there will always be some scum with bad military discipline. Anyway, these scum are not under Duke Brennus. The troops brought by Brennus to Eagle Claw Castle were the remnants of the Lion Knights. The Royal City Guards and Catalan's men. Kedron was not abused in any way, and no one even stared at him. He led his troops at the front, and there were about 400 people beside him, including levies, rogue knights, and underworld. Kedron has stopped trembling now, and if nothing happens, in three hours, he will attack the enemy in the most heroic way. People will always be afraid of the unknown future, but when they know what will happen in the future, many people will no longer be afraid. Kedron is not so scared now, even though he is about to die as cannon fodder. Because only in this way can he save his family. 
he was just silently missing his son. Lord Monteverdi. Kedrin knew that he was bound to die. He was trembling before because he was afraid that he would die in the name of rebellion. And his whole family would be ruined. However, Brennus gave him an opportunity to die gloriously as a vassal of the kingdom. Leaving his life behind to fight the enemy to the death. This behavior was enough to prove that he captured Lion Lake City. Brought back fathered. And an action such as contacting Ursula are all expedient measures. His only mistake was to put Ursula to sleep. In this way, he was still a vassal of the kingdom. As Duke Brennus testified, no one would say that a man who heroically killed the enemy and died on the battlefield was a traitor. Then his son can inherit his status. His family will not be affected. And he may even receive praise from the kingdom. After all, Brennus is Ketalun's cousin in law. So he does give him face. However, when they arrived near Eagle Claw Fort three hours later, what they saw was a scene that was difficult for them to understand. The troops of the Raven Kingdom formed their formation north of Talon Castle. The Jatta Cavalry, which is slightly larger than the Crow Kingdom's army, is east of Eagle Claw Castle, and Father's flag was flying on the castle of Eagle Claw. The three parties formed a strange tripod. Seeing this scene, Brennus naturally did not dare to act rashly, and he also stopped to form an array on the west side of Eagle Claw Fort. So the battle situation here turned into four camps arrayed in a pen shape, with the Eagle Claw Fort in the middle of the pen shape. Now Eagle Claw Castle really looks a bit like an Eagle Claw. In fact, the Lord is also near Eagle Claw Castle at this moment, and he probably forms the little finger of Eagle Claw. However, the four forces probably don't know that he is here, because he and his team are hiding in the woods several miles away. These Jada people were naturally led here by Leong. No matter what Zachar's plan was, he drove Judah's tribe to the south or west of the grassland. This was not a good thing for Leong and even the entire Lion Kingdom. Judah's tribe seemed to have no choice but to be driven away. But they were a group of hungrier wolves. And the Lord would certainly not sympathize with them. Instead, he planned to kill them. Why were Judah's tribe expelled to the southwest of Jatta grassland by Zahar? This is of course, because their behavioral logic is different from Zahar's. Compared with Zachar. Judah's tribe is more pure destroyers and plunderers. They have never thought of establishing any order. Judah's name is Destroyer. Maybe Judah's tribe really doesn't want to fight with the Lion Kingdom now. But if they are allowed to settle on the grassland between Eagle Claw Fort and Fletcher Village, it will be a disaster for everyone in the entire kingdom. From now on, they can only plunder the Lion Kingdom. And the frequency and intensity of plundering will definitely be far greater than before. If the Judah tribe that was expelled to the south is not killed now, Liang's Fletcher village may not be able to live in the future. And the entire eastern and northern parts of the kingdom will probably have to face constant wars for a long time. Therefore, Liang planned to take advantage of the Crow Kingdom's army still in Eagle Claw Castle to use the Crow people and father's troops to kill Judah's tribe. They are all enemies anyway. And letting enemies deal with enemies is the most cost-effective deal. This can not only relieve the crisis in the kingdom, but also make the Nolder elves willing to be dispatched by him and can also use this to gain more benefits. Liang is a rebel, and he has the right to occupy the rebel territory that he conquered alone. The intelligence provided by the prisoners brought by Dumbledore was very important. Judah's tribe was expelled here. They were waiting for the war in the west to end, and did not want to fight a big war easily. In other words, they actually brought a large amount of household items. Cattle and sheep. This kind of situation with a family and property is really not suitable for fighting a large-scale war. Even if the Jatta people seem to have a large number of people and a large military force. Therefore, the Jatta people will not easily attack an army that has reached a certain size, let alone attack at this time. The Jatta people are not rich to begin with, and they will definitely not leave their property alone. Before they have determined a place to settle, they will not attack. This means that the Lord can let his troops deploy calmly without worrying that the Jatta people will suddenly attack Fletcher or Brave Shield Castle. For example, Several cavalry teams of more than 200 people each were sent to the periphery of the Jatta camp group to set fire and plunder. Yes, just as the Jatta did to the people of other nations. The grassland in August is lush with vegetation, which is the most suitable season for setting fires. The fire was lit smoothly, because it was not intended to kill the enemy, but to burn part of the grassland and drive the Jatta people westward. The Jatta people must protect their camps. Cattle and sheep. The defenders have no right to choose whether to fight. They have to fight if they don't want to. There is such an advantage if the troops in hand are elite enough. Even if they are divided into several teams to fight independently, 
they will still have sufficient combat effectiveness and execution efficiency. In addition, both the Nolder and the Ranger groups, including the Griffin Sword Mercenary group, are all cavalry, and they also have leaders who are reliable enough. Moreover, Leon also contacted Fort Brave Shield to participate in this large-scale arson operation. When Baron Leofric received the Lord's plan, he looked at the letter given to him by Leon with exclamation marks all over his face. He actually asked me to set fire every time. It seems like he has a lot of experience in doing this kind of thing. Robbing the Jada people? It's really new. But after all, he still quickly organized a cavalry team to participate. As a result, several cavalry teams set off separately from Fletcher and Brave Shield Castle to the outskirts of the Jata people's camp area. These cavalry teams, each with a size of more than 200 people, went to various directions of the Jata camp group, including the west. The Lord himself is on the west side of the Jata people, in the female soldiers of the Griffin Sword Mercenary group. These Jata people did not pay attention to the several cavalry units on the periphery at first, but cautiously gathered their troops in the middle of the camp to prepare for a surprise attack. But not long after, the Jata people discovered that smoke was rising from three directions, south, north and east at the same time, and there were more and more fireworks, gradually connecting into one. The Jata people's camps are spread out relatively widely, which is a characteristic of the nomadic people. They do not cluster their camps together, but are separated by a certain distance from each other. More than a thousand tents cover a large area. Therefore, it was impossible to burn down their tents with a fire, and the Jata people would not think that the fire was intended to burn them to death. But when they saw such a continuous firework, they must have avoided it first. Once the fire on the grassland became large, it would be difficult to extinguish it manually. After all, the place where they camped was not on the river bank, and it was 30 miles away from the Tontian River. In addition, the wind on the grassland is unpredictable and can blow anywhere in order to avoid damage to their cattle, sheep, horses, and other property. They had no choice but to run away first. Of course, grassland is no better than forest. The line of fire will eventually extinguish slowly and will not completely burn the grassland. And even if the area is burned, new grass will grow in the spring, and it may even grow better than before. Therefore, this fire was not a life and death threat. It was just to allow the Jata people to move westward and stay away from Fletcher Village to prevent the Jata people from attacking Fletcher Village after a while. These Jata people deployed their troops to the periphery, and then dragged their camps and began to move westward, although they knew that the fire was set by people from the Lion Kingdom. In the eyes of the Jata people, it was just forcing them to leave. In fact, these Jata people could also understand that they were too close to Brave Shield Castle and Fletcher. People are worried about their attack so it is normal to set fire to force them away. Given their size, they didn't think the lords of the Lion Kingdom would actually attack them. But after walking west for a few hours, these Jata people discovered that those cavalry teams were not just for setting fires. At this time, the fire line in the east has been connected and is still not extinguished. There are always fires burning on the north and south sides of the Jata people's migration team. The cavalry on three sides have been setting fires all the way. Not long after, there were huge roars in the west. Amy was using the sound of muskets to give orders. They had already made the Jada people reach the expected position. Subsequently, the Nolder cavalry and rangers on the flanks began to harass the Jata people. Not only were they trying to slow down the movement of the Jata people's camps, they were also wreaking havoc, such as throwing torches to drive away the sheep and cutting the ropes of the carriages, set fire to part of the camp, and kill a few people along the way. To the west, that is, in front of the Jata people, the Lord Lord and Amy led their troops to block the front. It seemed that they wanted to prevent the Jata people from leaving the coverage of the burning line. As a result, the Jata people gathered their warriors and divided the troops into hundreds of troops. Dozens of hundreds of troops began to drive away the surrounding cavalry separately and used their horns to communicate with each other to call for support. They want to protect their property. The Jata people seem to have become the Horn Call Rangers at this moment. And the Horn Call Rangers and the Nolder Elves are now happily doing the work that the Jata people used to do. Murder, arson, robbery, plunder. It also includes that kidnapping women is not actually called kidnapping, but called rescue, because the women locked by the tent are all women from the Lion Realm or the Crow Realm. However, the long-term life of slaves has caused their eyes to lose all the sparkle, and most women do not even respond when faced with the rescue of the cavalry. But there were still many women standing by the tents holding high the belts that bound them. 
and they were greeted by the Noldor or members of the rangers, who cut off the belts. So soon after, women were running away everywhere. Cattle, sheep and horses with their ropes, cut off, were running everywhere. Gradually, some of the tents were also set on fire. The Jata people finally understood that if these teams were not killed, all their property might be destroyed. Moreover, the Jata people have discovered that those who harassed and robbed them along the way were mostly their long-time biggest enemies, the Nolder Elves and the Horn-Calling Rangers. They also saw a large number of Nua Maidens, as well as many women. It was the Jata people who had been plundering these people. But unexpectedly this time the plunderers were robbed. So the Jata people no longer made any trumpet summons in the form of a centurion. Anyway, the property damage is already great enough. So it is better to have a good fight and capture these Nuadua girls and women. Maybe they can make up for the losses. All the Jata people began to disperse, intending to use their specialty of forcing the siege to gather the enemy together and then launch a siege. But just when the Jata people were determined to kill these cavalry teams, there was another roar of muskets, and all the cavalry teams suddenly scattered and quickly gathered in the west. At this time, the fire line in the east was still spreading. Baron Leofric kept chasing behind and setting fires. No matter which way the wind blew, he had been ensuring that there was always a fire line burning to the east of the Jata people. This was the task given to him by Leon. This was mainly to ensure that the Jata people would not turn around and attack Fletcher and Brave Shield Keep, and Liang's troops gathered in the west, which was exactly what the Jata people wanted. They wanted to gather these troubles together and annihilate them. Thus, a pursuit that was bound to go west began, and the Jata people of the Judah tribe sent out most of their fighting force. Liang's troops fled westward, and the Jada people pursued them all the way. Baron Leofric, who set fire behind them, collected the fleeing women, cattle and sheep along the way, and really gained a lot of benefits. But after pursuing them 40 or 50 miles away from Eagle Claw Fort, the Jada people lost trace of Liang's force. This is actually the result of Raphael. Raphael was very familiar with the terrain in this area, because he had pretended to be a Jata man to rob in this area according to Liang's plan. He had been wandering around here for a long time. And he knew where to hide. Naturally, you need a hiding place if you want to plunder. Raphael and his team hid in a deserted forest south of Eagle Claw Castle. This was the place where he originally hid with the 100 rangers. The Jata people frantically chased for a day and a night. But lost the pursuit. They were in a hurry and basically didn't bring any supplies. They were far away from the tribe at the moment. But Eagle Claw Fort was very close. So they could only go to Eagle Claw Fort. As a result, the battlefield situation of Eagle Claw Fort became what it is now. Chapter 198 How to Make Them Fight Leon, the Lion Knights of Brennus are actually here. How do we get them to fight? The question was raised by Amy. Raphael had already taken some of the best rangers to explore the battlefield. After returning, he drew a situation map on the ground. Now the leaders are discussing countermeasures together. It's best not to harass the Jata people anymore. I don't want to fight the Jata army alone. Judging from the current situation, only the Lion Knights have no worries and can only let them break the deadlock. The Lion Knights must be here to deal with the Crow Army. Just in time. Ren, didn't you bring dozens of Crow Riders with you? The Lord Lord looked at Sir Ren. Lord Leon, you are planning to. Ren didn't mind helping. He wanted to kill the Crow Kingdom's army more than Leon. I plan to ask your men to go to the Lion Knights to provoke Brennus. This Duke has a very bad temper. Let your knights find ways to insult him. And he will definitely attack the Raven Kingdom. Of the troops. The Lord took a wooden stick and tapped it on the ground at the location marked. Brennus. And then drew a line extending to the location marked. Raven. As long as they fight. The Jata people will definitely try to take advantage. If you let your men finish their work and run to where the Jata people are now. They will probably be able to escape. The wooden stick in Liang's hand drew an arc. From Crow to Jatu. I understand. I'll make arrangements right away. Ren went happily. As long as he could destroy Gregory Ivy's army here. Ren didn't care about the loss at all. After all, the Crow King is his and Ursula's biggest enemy of the rebels. Gregory IV was very relaxed at this time. Because he had a little misunderstanding. He thought that the Jata people were the Zahar tribe who had negotiated cooperation with him. He had previously made an agreement with Zahar. And he would give the grassland east of Eagle Claw Castle to the Jata people so that the Jada people could cooperate with him in attacking the Lion Kingdom, and at least block reinforcements from the eastern part of the Lion Kingdom. So he thought it was Zahar who was, very kind, in sending a large force. 
He felt that the Jada people would definitely not attack him. Of course, he also knew that the Jada people would not be kind enough to help him fight. He thought that these Jada people were planning to come over to see the grassland they were about to get and to pick up some bargains along the way. The Jada people would definitely plunder. He was about to attack Eagle Claw Fort before. But the reason why he chose to retreat when the Jata people arrived was because he believed that Eagle Claw Fort would be called his territory at any time. And he did not want the Jata people to take advantage. After all, he couldn't restrain the Jata people. What would he do if the Jata people took advantage of the Eagle Claw Fort to break through and plunder? Therefore, he withdrew his troops in time and planned to wait for Father in Eagle Claw Castle to surrender. After all, Father certainly didn't want to fall into the hands of the Jata people. Right. So Gregory the Four sent envoys to Eagle Claw Fort to persuade them to surrender, and then camped north of Eagle Claw Fort. But who knew that before the envoy could enter the city, Duke Bredis came here with the Lion Knights. Moreover, not long after arriving, Bredis broke the situation on the battlefield. In fact, Bredis' army is the one with the best situation among all the forces here. With Sherhu's city under his control, he could get a steady stream of military supplies. Moreover, the teams he led were the Lion Knights and the Royal Guards, all of which were directly under King Ulrich. Brennus's own private troops were already heading to Craggy Bay, laden with a large amount of treasure. In other words, now Brennus will not care too much about the loss. At least there will be no loss for him. It's just that there are a large number of Jata people here, so Brennus didn't intend to act rashly. He just asked the troops to keep an eye on the Crow army and see what happened. But what he didn't expect was that a dozens of crow cavalry troops actually appeared in front of his formation. They all took off their crow skirts and exposed their buttocks to the duke. He even kept shaking his lower body and making various disgusting and obscene gestures. As the duke of the kingdom, he was greeted politely everywhere he went. When had Brennus ever received such an insult? So he immediately ordered an attack on the crow kingdom's troops. Of course, Brennus was not completely carried away by his anger he asked Kedron to attack as the vanguard. Kedron must die anyway, and preferably at the hands of the Crow Kingdom's troops. Kedron himself knew this, so he charged directly without much hesitation. But the small force mounted their horses and ran away, and Kedron's men could not catch up. However, Kedron didn't care about the deliberately disgusting team. He led the team directly towards the Crow Kingdom's large army. This seemed like a tragic act of suicide, but there was a small accident in the middle. Ketelun himself was willing to use his own life in exchange for the continuation of the family. But the rogue knights under him did not think so. These rogue knights have no intention of following Ketelun to death. They are just the leaders of the Red Brotherhood. How can the underworld participate in such a fatal battle? It would be suicide for hundreds of remnant soldiers to attack a military formation of several thousand people. As a result, the hundreds of men under Ketelun dispersed during the charge and planned to escape separately. This happened to cover Ren's men and most of the crow riders came back alive. The men fled in all directions. As a result, when Kedron rushed to the crow kingdom's military formation, he was already alone. The troops of the Raven Kingdom were also a little confused when faced with this situation. Gregory IV was even dumbfounded. He originally thought that the Lion Kingdom was going to use hundreds of death squads to rush into their array. And then the Lion Knights returned, riding a massive charge. This is a common field battle method used by the Lion Knights before the heavily armored knights of the Lion Knights charge. They often send a group of fierce Lion Cavalry to charge forward to clear obstacles such as horses and spears. Even if they cannot be cleared, the Lion Knights behind them can know where the dense areas of spearmen and archers are, so that the Lion Knights can bypass the spears and break into the enemy's weak point. The first wave of civilian cavalry who rush into battle are equivalent to death squads. If they survive and are not disabled, they will obtain the status of armed retinue of the Lion Knights. That is, they will become the assistants of the Lion Knights in battle. Being able to change from civilian cavalry to Lion Retinues actually improves their status a lot for these cavalry. They will become members of the Royal Knights. Of course, the vast majority of them still cannot become Lion Knights in the end. After all, they are not of noble origin. But no matter what, people are still eating royal food. No matter what era or place, people are always more willing to eat royal food. In fact, this is a tradition of the Lion Knights. But this tradition has changed a bit now. This tradition existed when the Knights of the Lion were first established. In fact, it was part of the honor system of the Knights of the Lion. It originally meant that one must have the consciousness and spirit to sacrifice for the country before one can become a member of the glorious Knights of the Lion. At the same time, 
This method is also used to replenish the establishment of the knights, who have been damaged by the battle, so that the bravest and most sacrificial people can be replenished. This is not only fair, but also in line with the first creed of the Lion Knights of protecting the country at all costs. But now, this is probably simply a civil service examination, a life-threatening public examination. As the Crow King, Gregory IV knew a lot of things. He also knew the field-fighting tradition of the Lion Knights. Therefore, he originally cautiously allowed the Crow Realm troops to shrink completely. The front row was currently neither spearmen nor archers, but Highland warriors holding big swords. He planned to let the first wave of soldiers from the Lion Kingdom rush to the front of the formation and let the Highland warriors deal with it without exposing his array, and use the enemy's corpses to form an obstacle for the Lion Knights to charge. He planned to wait until the main force of the Lion Knights began to charge, and then deploy spears and archers in a targeted manner. After all, the Knights of the Lion were famous for their powerful combat power. Gregory IV was actually very careful and mentally prepared to withstand a large number of casualties. But he didn't expect that the group of people who rushed over dispersed a hundred meters away. Only Kedron rushed over single-handedly. Although he rushed hesitantly, he seemed to be quite determined. He was alone and hesitant, of course. But Kedron knew that he must die at the hands of the Crow army. And of course, he was still determined. But in the eyes of Gregory IV, this meant that the troops of the Lion Kingdom did not dare to charge into battle. Have the first wave of death squads, who were once the bravest and most unafraid of death, become like this now? Capture this man! The army of the Lion Kingdom seems to be a little corrupted. The Lion Knights may not be as strong as before. The whole army moves forward. Gregory IV felt that the army of the Kingdom of the Lion was probably no longer good, judging from the lack of fighting spirit of the soldiers. Maybe the Knights of the Lion were no longer useful. Or Auric himself was not present. In case they have no morale? So Gregory IV ordered the entire army to advance in formation, intending to test the reaction of the Lion Knights. Kedron originally planned to die, so he did not resist or surrender when the Crow army came. As a result, Gregory IV's troops welcomed him into the Crow Kingdom's military formation as if they were welcoming him. Gregory IV even praised Kedron lavishly. He felt that Kedron was the only warrior in the Lion Kingdom, and he actually dared to charge bravely when all his men were gone. Your name is Kedron? Your Excellency Baron, you are a warrior. But why did your troops abandon you? Also, dot, how did the Lion Knights come so quickly? Does King Ulrich not care about the safety of the Lion City? Gregory IV was going to ask about the specific situation of the Lion Kingdom of Ketelin. Kedron originally wanted to die, but his troops ran away. But he did not die. Instead, he was welcome into the enemy's camp and scathed. What does this mean? This means that he is completely rebellious. Brennus asked Ketelan to rush into battle and die, but his troops ran away, and he himself was welcomed into the array by the enemy. This situation seemed to be completely surrendering to the enemy on the battlefield, especially in the eyes of Brennus. This must be a defection. Now, Ketelan's family is probably doomed. Kedron also reacted. He messed up his last chance to save his family, so Kedron doesn't plan to ask for death now. Before, he asked for death for the survival of the family. But now this situation means that the whole family will inevitably be destroyed. So he should find a way to stay alive. If he wants to live, he must be recruited by the Raven Kingdom. So Kedron reacted quickly and gave Gregory the force some misleading. And he was ready to save himself to the extreme again. My Eagle Claw Castle was attacked and occupied by the traitor father. So I originally captured Lion Lake City and planned to exchange it for a city. But who knew that Brennus privately led troops to sneak attack Lion Lake City and plundered it. Lion Lake City took away my property and insisted that I was a traitor. Not only that, Brennus also planned to use my soldiers as cannon fodder. I couldn't let my soldiers die, so I let them leave on their own. But now I really have no way to go dot your majesty. Please give me a decent death. I have lost everything, and now I just want to maintain my honor. Ketelin is indeed a cunning noble with a flexible mind. This kind of story of a tragic lord who was slandered and persecuted is actually the easiest thing to attract in front of a king. I will not kill a noble like you. Since the kingdom of lions cannot accommodate you, you might as well join my kingdom of crows. However, Baron Ketelan, I heard that Ulrich is ill. In other words, is the appearance of the lion knights here just a personal act of Brennus? Sure enough, thinking about the way Ketelan charged into the battle alone, not resisting but not surrendering, and wanting to die, Gregory IV was even a little moved. His Majesty the King is indeed seriously ill, 
And I don't know why the Lion Knight showed up here. Anyway, they attacked Lion Lake City indiscriminately. Kedron was telling the truth this time. He really didn't know. But his answer obviously gave Gregory IV a great misleading. Gregory IV felt that the will of the Lion Knights might not be too firm. So he once again ordered the entire army to slowly move forward for a certain distance. This was still a test. And the Lion Knights also responded this time. Brennus asked the Lion Knights to split into two teams sideways. And it seemed that they had no intention of launching a charge. So Gregory IV came to the conclusion that the Lion Knights may not have been sent by Ulrich, but by Brennus, the leader of the group, to do things for profit. He did not dare to harm the Lion Knights. It's too big, with the Jata army also here. As long as Brennus is frightened, the Lion Knights will probably retreat. The whole army obeys the order. Line up and move forward. Kill the Lion Knights. Gregory IV believed that this might be the best chance to defeat the Lion Knights. An army that is not determined enough to dare to suffer losses will simply not be able to exert its due strength. If the Lion Knight's undefeated record could be ended in a field battle, it would be more valuable to the Crow Kingdom than obtaining a large territory. Moreover, as long as Brennus's army is defeated, then there is no need to worry about Eagle Claw Castle at all, and just drive straight into Lion Lake City. Lion Lake City can be easily captured, because Father in Eagle Claw Castle did not dare to come out in the face of the current situation. The Jata people were still here. Gregory IV regarded the Jata people as an ally. Although this alliance was unreliable, it could at least scare people. Right? So the Crow army went out in large numbers and launched an active attack on Brennus Array. Brennus was angry first, and then surprised. The first thing that made him angry was that he originally gave Kedron a chance to clear his name. But Kedron actually surrendered to the enemy regardless of the lives of his family. He felt that his brother-in-law had spent all his efforts in vain. And then the surprise was that the brother-in-law didn't seem to surrender to the enemy, but led the enemy to attack on his own initiative? This is really like being an undercover agent. Brennus thought it was Kedron who had sent the Raven men to attack. The enemy actually took the initiative to attack the Lion Knights in the field. This was indeed a huge surprise to Brennus. He just asked the Lion Knights to divide into two teams to the side. Originally, he just felt that Ketalan's troops had escaped and failed to test the situation of the Crow army formation. It was best to be stable so he adjusted the queue. But if the Crow people take the initiative to attack, then there is no need to be steady. The enemy cannot set up a spear array while moving. What the Lion Knights like most is to have the two armies clash in the field. Lion Knights! Charge! Glory is my life! Neat shouts rang out. And hundreds of Lion Knights armed like cans lined up from both sides, formed two rows in front of the formation, and began to charge against the enemy. The Lion Knights were in the front row and the retinues were filling the gaps in the second row. After the first round of Lion Knights set off, the second round of Lion Knights started charging in the same way from a few dozen meters behind. The entire Lion Knights used their best method to launch five rounds of charges towards the approaching Crow army. There was a loud killing sound, and the roar of horse hooves. The sound of lances cracking came one after another, and the screams of people were almost completely inaudible at this time. One wrong judgment may ruin everything, especially the king's judgment. Gregory IV's misjudgment, when he faced the battle caused the troops of Raven Realm to be rushed to pieces by the Lion Knights in just a few minutes. The Lion Knights came under the order of the king, and their fighting will was much stronger than he imagined. And their commander Brennus didn't care about the loss at all. The reaction of the Jata people was completely beyond the expectations of Gregory IV. While the two armies were fighting, the Jata cavalry attacked the original camp of the Crow Kingdom troops. The Jata people actually went to get supplies. When there is a misjudgment about something, it will always lead to a series of mistakes. Gregory IV was also wrong about Father. He thought Fawcett did not dare to leave the city. But Fawcett firmly left the city at this time. The Lion Knights ravaged the Crow Realm troops to the west of Eagle Claw Castle, while the Jada people went from the east to the north of Eagle Claw Castle and occupied the Raven camp. This led to Father in the city seeing an opportunity. In fact, Father had already started making preparations since he saw those Jata people. Prepare to run away. Chapter 199 None of them are good things. Fawcett is clearly the worst off of all the forces. The supplies in Eagle Claw Fort have been basically depleted. Morale is low. His hometown of Sherhu City has been lost. And he is surrounded by three forces, and he cannot defeat any of them. After seeing the banner of the Lion Knights in the West, Fawcett also understood that Lion Lake City would probably not be recaptured. He only had one thought in his mind and ran away quickly with his most elite family members. This judgment is undoubtedly wise. At the moment, 
The remnants of Catalan soldiers are fleeing in all directions. The Raven army and the Lion Knights are fighting together. The Jata people are only looking to take advantage of the Raven's military camp. This is the best opportunity to escape. But Fawcett also understood that if he directly told the soldiers that he was going to retreat, this might cause the already low morale to collapse directly. Because the soldiers also knew that Lion Lake City was lost. Once they left Eagle Claw Castle, they would be a lone army without a base. And they were all rebels to both the Lion Kingdom and the Raven Kingdom. In this case, the best result is probably that all the soldiers will become deserters. The not-so-good result is that some bolder guy will take Fawcett's head to take away the merit. Besides, it is impossible for Fawcett to evacuate everyone. Those slow-moving infantry or wounded people will definitely not be able to escape. The Lion Knights are right next to them. In order to ensure that he can escape, it is best to let some people break up and create better opportunities, such as completely disrupting the battlefield. But under the current circumstances, I'm afraid no one is willing to cut off the rear. And it can't even be said that they are retreating. So Fawcett gave a deceptive speech to his soldiers at Fort Talon. Brothers, have you seen those Jada people? Don't be afraid. They are friendly forces and are here to help us. You have also seen that they have occupied the military camp of Raven Kingdom. Fawcett waved his sword and looked as if he was about to win. Brothers, now we face the best opportunity. Our enemies are fighting outside the city. I will open all the castle in a few minutes. Gate, everyone is ready. We are going to attack with all our friendly forces. Everyone will attack, disrupt the battlefield, and then annihilate the enemies fighting outside in one fell swoop. We can counterattack back to Shuru City in one fell swoop. Cheers, brothers. I will take you back home. Oh dot oh dot oh. Sometimes, deception can also boost morale. When they heard that the huge Jada troops were friendly forces, the soldiers of Eagle Claw Fort really cheered up. If the Jata people were really friendly forces, then they would launch a full-scale attack and possibly defeat the Lion Knights and the Raven troops who were fighting to death at the same time. Fawcett's speech was actually not very inflammatory, but he cleverly used the current situation to describe the Jata people as friendly forces and his plan to run away as the entire army will attack to bring the brothers home. This is obviously in line with the wishes of the soldiers in Eagle Claw Fort. Although the soldiers were a little surprised that the Jata people would send such a large-scale friendly force. It was also consistent with the actual situation of the Horton family. The Duke of Alma had cooperated with the Jata people. In the eyes of the soldiers, father was Alma's biological son, so it seemed normal that he could contact the Jata people to help rescue the siege. As a result, all the city gates of Eagle Claw Fort opened at the same time, and more than a thousand soldiers rushed out with all the residents of Eagle Claw Fort and rushed into the battlefield. Yes, Fawcett's full-scale attack was the kind that brought out the people living in Eagle Claw Castle together. He wanted to make the situation more chaotic and make it easier for him to escape. And just as they rushed out, the Jata people set fire to the Raven Army's barracks. In fact, this is just the looting habit of the Jata people. But in the eyes of everyone, this does seem like a close cooperation to light a fire as a signal and fight out together. No one expected that Fawcett's troops would abandon the city at this time. No one expected that Father would dare to let the troops lead civilians to disrupt the battlefield at this time. The battle situation suddenly became quite chaotic, and even the charging troops of the Lion Knights were a little unsure of their direction. As for Fawcett himself, he did not participate in the melee. He left the city from the south with several hundred elite members and began running southwest. Towards Payne Village, it stands to reason that the Crow Army is fighting fiercely with the Lion Knights in the west and the Jata army has just moved from the east to the north. In fact, the southeast direction should be the safest now. Moreover, to the southeast of Eagle Claw Fort, there are endless hills and hills, as well as many woods, and beyond that is hundreds of miles of no man's land. As long as you hide in the hilly area, it will be difficult to be found. This location was once a place where many bandits and bandits were entrenched. Riva used to be a bandit here. Fawcett is a local and he actually understands the terrain. But he still did not go southeast, but retreated to Payne Village in the southwest, because he had to tell a complete set of lies. If he went to no man's land, his men would find out that they had been deceived, and they might mutiny and kill him. He had to run to the jurisdiction of Shurhu City, which was like bringing the brothers home. This is a helpless choice. Many times on the battlefield, we are very helpless. In such a battle situation, Father's ability to adapt to circumstances and find such a way to survive is already considered good. 
It was also a good thing that he didn't run to the southeast. Otherwise, he probably wouldn't have been able to escape. The Lord's troops were actually in the woods in the southeast at the moment. Father's unexpected operation also forced Brennus to change his tactics helplessly. Originally, the Lion Knights would definitely be able to overwhelm the Crow Kingdom's army in a field battle. In fact, they have now been completely defeated. But Father's large army all left the city at this time and joined the chaotic battlefield, which made Brennus very nervous. He also thought that Father and the Jada people were in the same group. Otherwise, how could Fawcett dare to abandon the city and deliberately disrupt the battlefield? After all, disrupting the battlefield is most beneficial to the Jata cavalry. Brennus also knew about Alma's Horton family's long-term cooperation with the Jata people. Therefore, even if the previous rounds of charges by the Lion Knights were effective and they had the upper hand, Brennus still had to make a helpless decision to give up chasing the Crow people and instead deal with the Jata people. After all, the Jata people have set fire to the Crow Kingdom's military camp, and it seems they are probably planning to rush into the battlefield. In fact, these Jata people just want to take advantage of the chaos to get some loot. Their supreme leader, destroyer, Judah is not here, and they are actually not willing to fight a big melee. But Fawcett's troops rushed out to disrupt the battlefield, and the Jata people seem to be gathering strength. This scene really looked like Jatu and Fawcett teamed up to destroy the Lion Knights and the Raven Kingdom. It looked like they had wiped out all the troops in one fell swoop. Therefore, Brennus had to withdraw his troops. He felt that he could no longer fight against the Crow army. At present, all members of the Lion Knights are on the battlefield. And Brennus is accompanied by the Royal City Guards. This was originally a reserve team, ready to pursue the Ravens at any time. But now there is no need for the reserve team to be thrown into the chaotic battlefield. So the Duke quickly made the most correct judgment. He blew the assembly call of the Lion Knights, and led the royal guards to the Eagle Claw Castle. Go! Blowing the rally call at this time actually means that the Lion Knights will withdraw from the battlefield and spare the Crow Kingdom's troops. Duke Brennus is also a veteran of long-term wars, and his decision is actually very smart. Under this current situation, the Crow Kingdom military camp was burned, the baggage must be gone, and the ability to attack the city on a large scale was temporarily lost. The Jata people were all light cavalry, and did not have the ability to attack the city. The Lion Knights currently have the upper hand and will not be trapped. They can come and go at any time. Father's troops left the city in large numbers. Now that the city gate is open, if the speed is faster, maybe they can lead the Royal City Guards directly into Eagle Claw Castle? Anyway, the Raven Army's barracks were burned by the Jata people, and they would definitely have to fight to the death with the Jata people, and no matter who of them won, they would not be able to attack the city. In this way, you can sit on the mountain and watch the tiger fight, and let the Jatu and Crow Kingdom fight for their lives. Brennus's idea was quite good, but who knew that just as he was charging towards Eagle Claw Fort, the Jatu people also began to charge towards Eagle Claw Fort. The Jatu people saw Father's troops leaving the city in large numbers, and the city gates were wide open. They had never encountered such an easy opportunity to enter the city and rob them. Of course, they had to take advantage of the opportunity. No one stopped the Jata people from entering Eagle Claw Castle. After all, there was basically no one in the city. So some Jata people stayed near the military camp of Raven Kingdom to sort out the looted supplies. Ready to run away at any time. Another group of Jata people took the opportunity to enter Eagle Claw Castle and began to plunder the city. In this case, Brennus rushed faster. He thought that the Jata people had seen through his judgment and were preparing to capture the city with him. On the Crow Kingdom side, the troops had just been charged several times by the Lion Knights. And the formation was quite chaotic. The military camp was occupied by the Jata people again. And the supplies in the military camp were being robbed. Gregory IV was almost desperate. Of course he realized that these Jata people were not his allies. But his enemies. Now the soldiers in Eagle Claw Castle were killing each other in large numbers. Gregory IV felt that the situation was over. And he was facing enemies everywhere. Moreover facing the Lion Knights in a field battle. It would be difficult to even escape. He was even considering surrendering. But at this time, he suddenly discovered that the Lion Knights retreated at this time and quickly withdrew from the battlefield. This feeling is like the resurrection of the Jedi. And Gregory IV almost burst into tears. He now feels that Duke Brennus is really a real nobleman with a sense of honor. He spared himself when facing the Jatta people. This is obviously his intention to fight against Jatta with him. Although this was a misunderstanding. Gregory IV was right to have this idea. Most of Brennus's thoughts now are indeed on the Jada people. In the past few years, 
the Kingdom of Lion, and the Kingdom of Raven had indeed cooperated to fight against the Jata people. No matter how the two countries fought, they would indeed have the same hatred when facing these Jata raiders. Gregory IV also knew that the best thing to do now was to seize Eagle Claw Fort. But his troops had just been disrupted and needed to be reorganized. It was probably too late to rush to occupy Eagle Claw Fort. So Gregory IV Rick reorganized his army and launched an attack on the Jata people who occupied their military camp. The Jata people burned down the military camp, which was originally just a behavior habit of the looters. But in this way, the Crow people were forced into a desperate situation. And the Crow army lost all their baggage and supplies. They are going on a thousand mile expedition. Even if it is just to survive, the Crow army must kill these Jata people. They must snatch back the supplies and seize the Jata people's horses. Otherwise they may not be able to return. As a result, the shape of this battlefield finally evolved into what the Lord expected. The troops of the Crow Kingdom were desperately looking for the Jata people. The Jata cavalry obviously wanted to retreat. But a small group of Crow cavalry tried their best to hold them back. And the fight had to become a big battle. And Bredis led the Royal City Guards to fight with another group of Jata people in the Eagle Claw Castle on the streets. And the fight was inextricable. The Lion Knights did not enter the city. These heavily armored knights were not suitable for street fighting in the city. So Bredis asked them to clean up the rebel soldiers outside the city who were deceived by father. And kill them together with the civilians. Killing the rebels has been the job of the Lion Knights for the past ten years. No one is idle. Brothers, move out. Advance to Eagle Claw Fort. After the scouts determined that all forces were fully engaged in battle, Leon led his troops and began to march towards Eagle Claw Fort. Leon, how can you be sure that they will eventually fight with the Jada people? Amy followed the Lord. She was a little curious. Leon just asked Ren's crow rider to stimulate Brennus. But why did the situation on the battlefield become like this? Was it all expected? If this could be expected, it would be terrible. I'm not sure. Who knows what it will be like in the end? I only know that several hostile forces are here. As long as one of them is slightly stimulated, they will probably fight each other. No matter who they fight who at the beginning, or who they fight at the beginning. Whatever the final result is, as long as I am the last one to show up, I can control the situation. Leon looked at the Eagle Claw Fort in front, shook his head and smiled. Moreover, no matter which country's army, they will definitely not let the Jada people have the last laugh. The probability that they will fight with the Jata people at the same time is the highest. Yes. Amy, I could not have predicted all this. But from a probability perspective, this result is the most likely to occur. After all, the Jata people have no order at all. They are just destroying and killing. The war between countries may not be just. But at least they are lawful countries. Pure plunderers like Jatu. In the end, of course, it will become the common target of everyone. Vindadil next to him also nodded. The Noldor elves and the Jata people have had a blood feud for more than a hundred years. The Noldor are now even more motivated than the rangers. Sir! The Lion Knights! They are! Massacring civilians! Raphael in front interrupted their conversation. His voice frightened and intense. It seems that the Knights of the Lion Kingdom are not lawful at all. Windadier frowned and shook his head. A bunch of bastards! All of them are not good people. The whole army. Forget it! We can't save those civilians now! The whole army turns around. Let's go east. Don't join the battlefield yet. Liang's originally smiling face gradually turned gloomy. At this time, the troops had arrived about two miles away from Eagle Claw Fort. They could already see the Lion Knights massacring people on the west side of Eagle Claw Fort. The Lion Knights were killing everyone outside the city indiscriminately. Half of them were probably rebels. But the other half were civilians in Eagle Claw Fort. But at this distance, it is indeed impossible to save those civilians. By the time they arrive, they will probably all be dead. Liang's face looked quite bad. He exhaled a long breath and gritted his teeth. Follow me! We will cooperate with the Crow Kingdom from the east to stop the Jata people and force the Jata people to enter the city. A thousand elites followed the black golden griffin banner and rushed to the east of Eagle Claw Fort. The Lord Lord led his mixed troops from the east side to join the battlefield where the Raven Kingdom was fighting the Jata people. However, he did not charge to kill the enemy. Instead, he ordered all the troops to shoot from a distance and try to force the Jata people towards Eagle Claw Castle. Direction the Jada people gradually gathered their forces together, and they recognized this army as the one they had been chasing for a day and a night. However, 
The Jada people did not want to get close to Liang at this time. They followed this strange army and chased them. As a result, they fell into the battlefield. At this time, this army appeared again. Maybe there was something else wrong. Therefore, the Jada people felt that they could not be fooled and it was best not to attack that strange army. Moreover, the Jata people made a very smart decision at this time. They forcibly broke away from the battle with the Raven Kingdom, gathered the entire army, and began to enter Eagle Claw Castle in large numbers. Their thinking is probably similar to that of Brennus. No one is suitable to attack the city now, so occupying the castle is the safest. This is also the reason why Liang can force them to enter Eagle Claw Castle. The Crow Kingdom's army and Liang's troops are flanked on both sides from the east to the west. The Jata people will suffer a lot if they continue to fight. To the north is the inner sea of Shirhu Lake. With no way to go, entering the city southward is the wisest choice. If you control the city, you are likely to drag down all the troops outside. The Jata people have just grabbed the supplies from the Crow Kingdom, and they can hold on for several days. The various forces outside the city will not be able to attack the city in a short period of time. At this time, the Lion Knights had completely eliminated all the rebels outside the city and had produced more than 2,000 corpses on the west side of Eagle Claw Fort, half of which were civilians. Brennus has also discovered the Lord's troops at this moment. Of course he knew Liang's black golden griffin flag, since it was the army of the Lord of the Lion Kingdom. It was of course a friendly force to Brennus. However, it is not convenient to say H, low on the battlefield, and a large number of Jata people are entering Eagle Claw Castle from the North Gate. So Brennus must stay in the city to supervise the battle. So he erected the marshal's flag on the tower of Eagle Claw Castle and blew the call call. This was asking Leon to enter the city to join him. And he was also asking the Lion Knights to station in Eagle Claw Castle to assist in the defense. Brennus can no longer hold on relying solely on the royal guards. There were too many Jada people. And the street fighting in the city was fierce. The royal guards suffered heavy losses. Brennus is now the marshal of the Kingdom of the Lion and it is only right for him to give orders. When the summons sounded, the Lion Knights immediately began to enter the city from the west gate. The Lord also heard the call, but he did not obey the military order. Chapter 200 Meat Grinder Leon did not let the troops enter Eagle Claw Castle, but kept the team in the east. It was not until he saw the Jata people pouring into Eagle Claw Castle in large numbers that he slowly led the team to block the east gate of the castle. Of course, he would not submit to a marshal who allowed his subordinates to kill civilians. This was not only for his own moral values, but also for the joint force he had finally organized. Besides, he had no problem not knowing that Brennus was a marshal. After all, he did not receive a formal marshal order. As for the marshal's flag, he could have not seen it from a distance. It is understandable that the call of the trumpet cannot be heard in the chaos of the battlefield. After all, one has to adapt to changes on the battlefield. Blocking the Jata people's path is also what the Lord of the Kingdom should do. If you want to block a city gate, you only need one or two hundred people. Vindatil and the Nolder Rangers aimed their bows and arrows at the city gate. And after shooting down the dozens of Jata raiders, who were the first to rush out, including their men and horses, no one dared to leave the city anymore. The Jata people even closed the city gate. Whether it was the compound bow of the Nolder or the crossbows of the female soldiers, the range was much longer than that of the Jata people's nomadic bows. With the door open, they could only get beaten in vain, taking advantage of the fact that there was no one on the east wall at this time. Leon personally placed a strange package under the city gate, and then ran back quickly. Later, the Lord erected a golden griffin flag outside the east gate of Eagle Claw Fort. He and Amy led a group of female soldiers to stay under the flag, and distributed all other troops in the north and south directions. Go out. Windife was also under the banner of Griffin at this time, and her job was to follow Liang as a close guard, as an underage young elf. This is the first time that Windulf has participated in such a large-scale war. For this war, Liang also gave her a new position. Windy is now not only Liang's personal guard, but also the liaison officer between Liang and the two Nolder forces. In fact, she is the messenger. However, when Deerf is very satisfied with the position of liaison officer, so she should use the word, official, after all. Look at Rasadalin. He is also a Nolder noble. He is over a hundred years old. He has not even held an official position. He is just a bodyguard. Although Windy's status can be called noble. Among the Nolder tribe, she is just a girl ranger who has not yet graduated. Although the people in the clan doted on her, they would never let her hold any important position. 
everyone just regarded her as a child. It must be Mr. Leong who is discerning. Windy thought. Although it was the first time to face such a large-scale battlefield. Windife was not nervous because the Lord never seemed to put the troops in any danger. Windy had been following the Lord. Watching Leong drawing on the ground while constantly dispatching people around him in various directions. Until only the female soldiers led by Amy were left outside the east gate. Wendy couldn't understand the crude sketch that Leong drew on the ground. But she could feel that the Lord seemed to be planning to sit here and command the entire army. Almost all the rangers in the Horn Call Rangers became scouts. Scouts kept returning and scouts were being dispatched. It seems that the Lord is receiving reports from the scouts anytime and anywhere. And arranging tasks for the scouts anytime and anywhere. Anyway, this kind of situation has never been seen among the Nolder people. Even Islandel, who is recognized as being good at commanding, can at most carefully lay out plans before the war begins. But Islandel certainly cannot handle such dense intelligence. Nor can he pass orders so frequently. It was hard for Wendy to imagine that scouts were reporting back every moment and that they were giving orders to scouts and messengers every moment. Is this how human lords direct war? How can we react immediately to such dense information? The crude sketch drawn with a wooden stick on the ground has been constantly changed and changed, and it has long been beyond recognition. Can the lord see the entire battlefield with this graffiti-like thing? Wendy was also sent out once to convey military orders to Windadier. The order was simple. If Breda's troops enter the city, block the south gate directly. Wendy didn't quite understand it at the time. So she asked Wendadier to block the south gate? What do you want to do? Lord? However, Wendolf's doubts did not last long. And she knew the answer when she came back. Because she saw the layout of the east gate of Eagle Claw Fort. The bodies of the Jata people who had been shot over outside the east gate were piled at the city gate together with the horse corpses. But it seemed that the gate was not open inward to block the city gate. These corpses were piled on both sides of the strange package placed by Leon occupying more than half of the city gate, and arranging some obstacles. And Amy led the female soldiers to form an array more than a hundred meters apart. This is equivalent to blocking the east door from the outside. But the blocking is not tight, leaving a gap. But it is estimated that no one would dare to move the corpse. Anyone who is at the city gate will face the crossbows of the female soldiers. This further increases the difficulty of rushing out from the city. The city gate only leaves room for one person to pass through. Anyway, it will definitely be difficult for the Jata people to break out. Their cavalry bows have insufficient range, and they are not heavily armored. It would be difficult to rush out of the city gate despite the rain of arrows. Sir, do you plan to block all the Jata and other troops in the city? Wendy was a little confused. But this city has four gates. We can't block all directions. Right. Yes, there are four doors. But precisely because there are two more doors that are not blocked, the fighting inside will be even more severe. Leong turned around with a strange expression on his face. Wendy! What's going on in the city? You should be able to hear it. Right. Windolfa's hearing is much better than that of the Lord. Of course she can hear the sounds of fighting everywhere in Eagle Claw Castle. At this time, Rasadalin and Noel came back from the north. Sir! The ravens have entered the city from the north gate. And all the scouts they sent to the northeast have been killed. Very good. Now we just have to wait. Leong nodded and simply sat down. Soon after, people gradually became visible on the east wall. Mostly Jata people. But most of the Jata people were not shooting arrows outside the city. But into the city. It seemed that the fighting was quite fierce inside the city. My lord, may I join the battle? Wendy took off the bell on her back and pointed at the Jata people on the wall. She wanted to shoot the enemy down. Leon looked at the movement on the city wall. Then looked at Wendy. Do you hate the Jata people? Of course I hate it. The Jada people have killed many of our people. Every year they attack our northern forests. Their big boss even uses the weapons of our people. Wendy said with a bit of gritted teeth. Wendy, even if you can hit 100 times and use up all your arrows, you can only kill 32 at most. The Lord tapped the sketch on the ground with a wooden stick. There are thousands of Jata people in the city now. Save the arrows for the last time, when they can bring the greatest harvest. It is best to hold back hatred on the battlefield. The goal we want to achieve is not just to destroy the enemy. If it's not to destroy the enemy. What is that? Wendy put away her bow obediently. She said she would obey military orders when she joined Liang's team. But she still wanted to ask clearly. Wendy, there are more than 10,000 people fighting in such a small castle. Who do you think will win? Liang asked softly. I don't know. But the Lion Knights are quite capable in combat. So maybe they're the ones? 
Wendy answered a little uncertainly. No, it won't dog Wendy. In fact, the fighting power of the Nolder people is far better than that of Jatu. In my opinion, the fighting power of 200 Nolder rangers can match a thousand Jatu people. But your people it is difficult to gain the upper hand in a war with the Jatu people. Why? Because the Jatu people are not afraid of death. The more desperate the situation, the less afraid they are of death. Leon sighed as he spoke. Wendy! In the narrow street fighting in the city, we can only fight life and death. And most tactics are not used. In the end, the one who wins the final victory will definitely not be the one with the strongest fighting ability, but the one with the strongest combat effectiveness. The ones who are least afraid of death, dot the Jata people will definitely win in the end. And we, or you, will eventually appear at Eagle Claw Castle as the saviors who kill the Jata people and save the remaining soldiers of the two countries. Wendy was stunned. This smart underage girl really knew everything. She understood Li Ang's complete intention. Because no one can attack the city, and no one has much supplies. No one will let the Jata people easily occupy Eagle Claw Fort. All forces will fight with the Jata people in the streets of the city. Now that Leon has blocked the east and south gates, Duke Brennus is probably trapped on the south tower of Eagle Claw Castle. The Lion Knights will not easily withdraw their troops before rescuing their grand leader. The Crow people had no supplies and suffered heavy losses. Leon also asked Noel's troops to kill the scouts sent by the Crow people to the northeast. As long as the leader of the Crow people has a clear mind, he should understand that now he is still in a situation where everyone is facing the enemy, and he cannot fight in the field. Whether he is facing the Lion Knights or Jatu, he cannot fight in the field. In other words, the Crow army could only occupy Eagle Claw Fort and defend the city, and they also had to grab enough food from the Jatu people, such as their own supplies or Jatu people's horses. Then we can only enter Eagle Claw Castle and risk our lives with the Jatu people. This is also the best choice because the Crow army can actually be said to be the most suitable for street fighting among all the forces currently. As for the Jata people, when they see the Lion Knights and the Crow Kingdom's army entering the city, they will definitely want to go out of the city, but they can't get out through the four city gates, so they can only fight hard inside the city. Of course, it's okay to jump over the city wall and run away, but even if you don't fall to death after jumping over the city wall, you will definitely be shot to death by Liang's troops outside. This battle will definitely become a strange battle that will always be recorded in the history of Pindor. And it may also mean that it is unprecedented and unprecedented. In fact, the scale of this war was not particularly large. The total number of troops participating in the war was only more than 10,000. But this was probably the only war in the history of the entire continent in which the Jata people defended the city and other forces attacked the city. Yes, it has now become a strange scene where the Jata people are defending the city in Eagle Claw Castle while other forces block the castle from all directions and attack the Jata people. And all forces are hostile to each other. Most of the Jata people must have been panicking. They certainly didn't expect that when they entered the city, all the forces would block them in the city. You actually have to defend the city? Speaking of siege, the Jata people may still have some experience. Although siege is not a job they are good at, they still have some experience. Can defend the city. The Jata people are really inexperienced. If Judah himself were here, the Jada people would probably not take such a trick against a fierce man like Judah. They would rather fight head-on in the wild than enter the city easily. Look at the situation inside Eagle Claw Castle. It's just like the Colosseum. The flag of Brennus was erected on the southern city wall. The royal guards held spears and kept stabbing down the city wall. However, there were all Jata people under the city wall, and Brennus' situation seemed to be in danger. Fortunately, the royal guards had wore spears which were very useful on the city wall. The Jata people couldn't kill them even after a while. The east wall is currently the territory of the Jata people. The Jata people have stood in a row on the wall and are shooting arrows into the city. There is also a group of people trying to attack the north wall. The four walls are actually connected together. When fighting inside, controlling the city wall will give you a huge advantage. The northern city wall was basically filled with Crow Kingdom Rangers, all of whom were very skilled archers. They were shooting at the corners of the city wall with the Jata people in order to compete for control of the city wall. The rangers of the Crow Kingdom currently have the upper hand. The lethality and accuracy of the walking bows are indeed much better than the Jata people's mounted bows. As for the west city wall, there are not many people on it. The area to the west is controlled by the Lion Knights. But the Can Knights on the city wall will not be of much use. The Lion Knights do not have long-range capabilities. 
Bows and arrows are not easy to practice. And they are not a traditional sport of the Lion Kingdom. There are not many knights in the kingdom who are good at bows and arrows. As noble knights, the Lion Knights are of course unwilling to use crossbows. In their eyes, crossbows are assassination instruments used by civilians and are without a sense of honor, similar to muskets. But now they probably wish they had a crossbow. The area of Eagle Claw Fort is not particularly large, and the city could only accommodate a few thousand people originally. The Jata people alone were enough to crowd the city. And now the Lion Knights and the Crow Kingdom's troops were pouring in. There were more than 10,000 people in the city, and it was basically a crowded place. On the street, the cavalry couldn't even think of moving a step. A large number of Jata horses had blocked the street, no matter how skilled the rider was. In this environment, they could only dismount and fight on foot. The Lion Knights have all dismounted and are fighting on foot with shields, and have driven most of their mounts out of the city so as not to get in the way. In fact, the Lion Knight is quite powerful when dismounted. At least the equipment is hard enough. And the Lion followers are also very skilled. In addition, all members of the Lion Knights are equipped with maces, which are very suitable for street fighting in the city. In the city, the Lion Knights certainly couldn't use lances. Except for the special heavy-duty lance used by Lehman. Ordinary lances are actually disposable consumables. The gun barrel is made of brittle wood and is easy to break. This is to protect the knight's arm from being injured by the reaction force. If you really want to talk about it, the most commonly used main weapon of the members of the Lion Knights is actually not the lance, nor their silver-plated giant sword, but the mace. This is their most commonly used weapon after the lance was broken. The structure is very simple. It is a wooden handle less than one meter long, with a caltrop hammer of about two pounds. This common short weapon looks very inconspicuous and not handsome at all. But it is the one-handed weapon that knights use most skillfully, because it can kill enemies wearing heavy armor. And it is very suitable for dense crowds. Such as the current situation. The members of the Lion Knights held a shield in one hand and a mace in the other, and were attacking the Jada people in the city. The inside of Eagle Claw Fort has turned into a narrow killing field like a battle cage. This is a real hand-to-hand -hand encounter. Shields collided, hammers struck, and blades clashed. The various harsh sounds of impact and metal friction made one scalp numb. There is nowhere to dodge in the crowded crowd. And there is no way to retreat. Either kill the enemy in front of you or fall down. In this scenario, the Lion Knight with better equipment does have an advantage. The Jata people's scimitars basically couldn't cut through their armor. So they quickly advanced to the center of the castle. And then all the way south, they were about to meet their grand leader Brennus. But their advantage only lasted for a quarter of an hour. The Lion Knights are well equipped and well protected. The play chain composite armor is indeed difficult to be cut by a knife. But the problem is that the defense of this thing is very good. But it is too heavy. Wearing a full set of plate and chain armor to fight on foot. And constantly swinging the hammer. Surrounded by people. He couldn't get any rest at all. Anyone who can persist for more than a quarter of an hour is considered to have good endurance. Moreover. Just like what Liang said to Indirf. In this situation. What determines victory or defeat is not the equipment and combat power, but the lack of fear of death. After being killed and wounded everywhere, the Jada people became more and more courageous as they fought. They gradually began to counterattack and pushed back the Lion Knights. No matter how good the defense is, there are always gaps in the armor. Killing a weak Kan Knight is actually not troublesome. Moreover, the Lion Knights do not have such determination to die. As a result, the Lion Knights were gradually pushed back to the west side of the castle by the Jata people. After repelling the Lion Knights, the Jata people saw that Shiman seemed to have a chance to break out of the castle, and began to attack Shiman in an all-out manner. They had realized that it was impossible to completely occupy the castle. If they could break out, of course they would. There's no need to get stuck here and fight a bad fight. Originally, the Lion Knights were probably preparing to retreat out of the city. But the Jada people's full-scale charge made the Lion Knights realize that if they retreat now, they may be smashed into pieces. So they resisted with all their strength. And at this time, the troops of the Crow Kingdom from the north pressed up. While most of the Jata people focused on rushing out of the West Gate, the Crow Kingdom's troops gradually gained the upper hand. Coupled with the fact that the archers of the Crow Kingdom were covering the high ground on the north side. When the Lion Knights were retreating steadily, the Crow people gradually reached the center of the castle, and suppress the Jata people. So the Jata troops had to shrink back so that the shooters on the roof on the east side could cover them. This gave the Lion Knights a breather and regained the gap on the west side. But they had just fought to the death with the crows not long ago. 
and the crows had not forgotten that some of their crow troops started attacking the lion knights again. However, the raven crow rangers were unable to take care of the center of the city, and lost the cover of their bows and arrows. In addition, the raven crow were attacked from both sides. It didn't take long before they suffered heavy losses, and gradually retreated. When the Jada people saw that the Crow Kingdom's troops began to shrink, they turned their heads to the north again, planning to see if they could rush out from the north. Therefore, the troops of the Crow Kingdom also realized that they must not retreat. If they retreat, they will be overwhelmed by the Jata people. If this situation is overwhelmed, they will be dead. The three forces thus formed a tug of war like a meat grinder. The streets in the middle of Eagle Claw Castle have turned into a mountain of corpses and a sea of blood. As Leong said, it was because there were two doors that were not blocked that they fought harder. The Jada people suffered countless casualties, but they did become stronger as they fought. As the Jada people became more and more desperate to break out of this prison, neither the Lion Knights nor the Raven Kingdom could retreat. Whichever side cannot withstand it will be completely crushed by the Jada people. Chapter 201 The Legendary Magister Outside Eagle Claw Castle, Leon was still sitting there, but most of the troops have returned to him. Only Raphael and the Horn Call Rangers are not here. Everyone was quiet. No one spoke. Sir, there seems to be not much movement in the city. The sounds of fighting are very rare. Windulf has been standing next to Leon and listening to what's going on in the city. There were not many Jata people on the city wall anymore. There were dozens of them standing sparsely. But they did not shoot any more arrows. Instead, they turned and stared outside the city, looking at Liang's troops. Then it's time for us to take action. The Lord Lord stood up, turned around and picked up an arrow. The arrow's tip was wrapped in oilcloth, and Amy stepped forward and lit it. This is a rocket. Wendy, did you see that package under the city gate? Shoot it. Leon handed the rocket to Wendirf, and then pointed to the strange package that had been placed under the east door. Wendell took the rocket in a daze. She didn't quite understand what it meant, but it was not difficult for her to hit a fixed target. Wendy took a casual aim with the arrow and took action. At the moment when the arrow hit the package, Wendy discovered that the city gate seemed to have suddenly collapsed. The corpses piled up at the city gate seemed to be flying. Boom, boom! Half a second later, she heard the most terrifying thunder she had ever experienced in her life, which could make her ears ring from a distance of nearly 200 meters. This is the sound made by lightning hitting a big tree. The result was the same as thunder and lightning. The city gate of Eagle Claw Castle instantly fell into pieces and the horse corpses piled at the city gate were even blown away more than 10 meters away. Huge thick smoke rose up from the city gate. After the thick smoke passed, the city wall near the city gate became scorched black. The horses neighed in panic one after another. Fortunately, they were far apart. Otherwise a large number of horses would have been frightened and ran away. The Jata people on the city wall were obviously greatly frightened. Several Jata people even fell down from the city. After that, no one could be seen on the city wall. Obviously, this terrible sound frightened the Jata people, and no one dared to go up the wall. It's so powerful. I'll have to try it with a seal can next time, Leon whispered to Amy, then looked at the stunned team behind him, and drew his sword. Everyone dismount. Get ready. And listen to my orders. Leon did not attack immediately because the troops behind him were a little frightened at this time. They all looked at Leon with fear in their eyes. The only one who remained calm was Amy. He wanted to wait for the troops to calm down. But these troops were frightened for different reasons. The female explorers of the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group are relatively calm. These explorers have traveled extensively and have heard about Buckley's new weapons. Moreover, they had seen a musket in Amy's hand, and they could guess that the explosion was related to gunpowder. But they didn't expect the movement to be so big. They are also the troops with the fastest response at present. After hearing the order, they all dismounted, drew their swords and held shields and moved forward. They formed a formation dozens of meters away and prepared to charge. But the expressions of the Nolder elves were extremely complicated. They are not afraid of the power of this explosion. But they are suspicious of the cause of all this. Windulf also stood there in a daze, looking at the bow in her hand, and then at the city gate that was blown open in front of her. She was very frightened. The other Nolder elves also looked at Windulf with complicated eyes, and then looked at Leon, and the others with obvious awe in their eyes. For the Nolder Elves, the legendary thing that summons thunderstorms to destroy the city does exist in their historical records, but it exists in another form, called magic, a magic that only Sidarian Elves can use. Wendy! You? You can use magic? Wendadier asked, stammering. 
Her throat was a little dry, but a look of surprise gradually appeared on her face. Sindari! Wendy! You've awakened! Ha uh ha! -huh. This is the Thunder Method! This is the top magic talent! Twilight Night Noel's reaction was even greater than that of Winda Deer. He had already started laughing wildly, probably thinking that the elves were about to rise again. No! I. This is not! Windife looked at her right hand helplessly. But at this moment, the Nolder elves all started to salute Windy with their breasts in their hands. Hey dot I dot you guys dot this is arranged by Master Leong. This is not my doing. Windy took a step back and looked uneasily at the elders, who bowed to salute her, waving their hands helplessly. The Lord found the reaction of the Nolder very interesting. So he simply fooled him again, in a joking way. Ah, oh, Wendy, it was you who did it. I'll teach you a more powerful one next time. Magic is guaranteed to allow you to knock down the city wall with one arrow. Amy covered her mouth and laughed secretly. Wendy was even more confused. Lord Leon, what's going on? This magic has nothing to do with me, right? Amy put down the hand covering her mouth, put on a serious look, stepped forward and patted Windirfew on the shoulder. Master Leon can guide your hidden magic power. Wendy, you are now a magician already. Originally, Amy was just cooperating with Leon to fool around. She knew that after this battle, everyone would understand that this was gunpowder. But now she is also happy to let the Nolder misunderstand. After all, everyone has bad tastes. However, Amy's words suddenly caused a sensation among the Nolder elves. Almost all the Nolder looked at Leon and made the same voice. Magister. Then, all the Noldor, including Wendadier and Neuer, knelt down on one knee to Leon with pious faces and bowed their heads deeply. This is probably the highest etiquette of the Noldor. The Noldor elves would not kneel down and bow their heads like this even when facing the Elf King. Touching the chest and bowing is already the etiquette of the elves showing respect. The Lord Lord looked a little confused. When did the proud elves bow their heads to humans? He realized that he seemed to be joking too much. But looking at Wendadier's pious look, Leon knew that he must not expose this joke like deception. Otherwise he might be beaten. After thinking about the fighting prowess and violent tendencies shown by Windadier, the Lord swallowed his saliva and turned to look at Eagle Claw Fort. There are already Jada people peeking out at the city gate, and they should march immediately. So Leon did not explain any more, but raised his sword. Everyone, follow me. The whole army attacks. Afterwards, the Lord took the lead and rushed towards the blown city gate. All the troops followed Leon and began to charge. The Nolder elves seemed particularly active at this time. They all ran very fast and soon surpassed the female explorers who were running in front. When Dadier and Noel rushed to the front to protect Leon on both sides, probably because they were afraid that the Magister would be in any danger. Only Windife was still in a daze. Amy was also on the spot. Of course, she, a musketeer, didn't need to rush in front and Leon wouldn't let her fight hand to hand. Seeing that Wendy was still in a daze, Amy stepped forward and put her arms around her shoulders. Wendy, what's wrong with you? Amy, is Master Leon really a magician? Wendy was still looking uneasily at the horse carcass that was blown to pieces outside the city gate. Her purple eyes were full of suspicion, and it looked like there was a cloud lingering inside. Ah, people who can make gunpowder can probably be considered. After all, Gunpowder can probably be regarded as magic. Buckley Continent used to call it magic fire. Amy also found it difficult to explain. She was only a half-understood beginner. It was really difficult to explain gunpowder to someone who had basically no scientific knowledge. But I don't want to be Sindari. Hearing what Amy said, Wendy held Amy's hand nervously. It is said that after becoming a Sindari, you will become emotionless. I don't want to. Huh? Huh? Don't worry. Wendy. You won't. You are not a Sindarin elf. Amy laughed twice. And she felt that it seemed even harder to explain now. She knew the stories of the elves. With the help of their mentors, the Sindari elves would gradually master the ability to materialize magic and become stronger and stronger as they grow older. But it is said that as the Sindari elves acquire powerful magic, their emotions will become more and more indifferent. Just like the legendary dragons and titans and other extraordinary creatures. They not only have no regard for life, but also have little humanity. This is actually something that will inevitably happen after an individual life becomes powerful to a certain extent. When an individual possesses the power of a god, it is inevitable that he will regard himself as a god himself and will naturally not value other small lives so much. 
They will only be in awe of beings with equal abilities. Even humans whose individual strength can never reach this level will mostly ignore other weak people after they have abilities and power beyond ordinary people. However, Amy at least knew that Leon was definitely not a magician. And Windolf was not a Sindari. Wendy! Let's go to the city first and talk about this later. Leon will make it clear to you. Seeing that Leon had already led his troops into Eagle Claw Fort, Amy carried Wendy towards the city. She felt that it was better to leave this kind of difficult to explain matter to Leon himself and let the guy do whatever he wanted. The various forces in Eagle Claw Castle are now exhausted from the fight. They each guard one direction at the crossroads in the center of the castle. The fighting between them was not fierce at first. However, after hearing the thunderous sound from the east gate of the castle, all parties in the city began to fight fiercely again. Because at this time the Jata people launched a violent attack like crazy. The Jata people did not immediately go to inspect the blown open city gate. They did not dare to do so. In fact, the explosive itself did not cause any damage to the Jata people. Just as Leon said to Amy, there was a slight problem with the proportion of the explosive. And the power was smaller than Leon imagined. Leon originally made explosives with a ratio of 75% nitrate, 11% sulfur, and 14% charcoal. The powder was soaked in a nitrate solution and then dried and crushed to form granular gunpowder. This is very close to the exact ratio. But obviously the materials of this era are not pure enough. Sulfur can be purified, but charcoal cannot, and the charcoal produced by simmering different trees has different effects. Even moisture protection is a big problem. Therefore, even according to scientific proportions, the explosive power of explosives manufactured in this era is still difficult to meet expectations. In addition, there is no built-in ignition device, and no container that can withstand high pressure is used. If a high-pressure environment is not formed during detonation, the explosive will not be able to accelerate the reaction process. And the power of the explosion will be reduced by at least 10 times. For an explosive package that is ignited by external ignition, the pressure of the explosive is directly released during the detonation process. It is impossible to achieve full detonation. So the sound after the explosion is quite loud. But the city wall is basically not damaged at all. Leon used 10 pounds of explosives and deliberately used the corpses of horses to restrain the explosion space but he only blew up the city gate. But even so, the Jata people were still afraid. The people of Jata have never seen such a scene of heavenly punishment. Who dares to see the city gate shattered with a roar? What if it happens again? Therefore, after the Jata people's east gate was blown open, their first reaction was not to rush out from the open city gate, but to launch a crazy attack to the west and north. They want to stay as far away from the terrifying, heavenly punishment as possible. Even if the city is full of enemies that look like tin cans. At least they are humans and creatures they can kill. And Leon did not rush into the city immediately after the explosion. He wanted to confirm the situation in the city. It wasn't until he saw the Jada people starting to poke their heads at the east gate that he launched a charge. When the Lord rushed into the city, more than half of the Jata people were already dead or wounded. There were corpses everywhere. And blood pooled in streams on the ground. It's unclear what the situation is with the Lion Knights and the Crow Kingdom's troops. But it's probably not much better. The sounds of fighting coming from the center of the city seemed a bit weak. The Jada people near the East Gate were exhausted at this time. Although they were still brave, they obviously couldn't withstand Liang's new force. Liang's troops killed half of the street without much effort. The troops advanced step by step, while the Jata people continued to retreat until they retreated to the center of the city. The Nolder Elves are now truly fighting side by side with humans. In the street fighting environment, the teams gradually mix together. In such a dense battlefield, mutual support between friendly forces is often subconscious. The Nolder would use their tough shields to block fatal blows to friendly forces. And human soldiers would also use war spears to pierce the Jata men who were about to pounce on the Nolder. No one will mention any racial hatred at this time. The Jata people are the common enemy. Benditeel, take the rangers up to the roof. And you use your bows and arrows. Leon reluctantly gave an order. He was closely protected by a group of Nolder masters. And he didn't even have much room to develop. Noel stood in front of him. There was no enemy in front of the Twilight Knight. And not a single enemy was missed. And Windadier stayed by his side. More like a bodyguard than Lisa Dillon. Windadier looked around and saw that Leon was probably quite safe. So he nodded and led the rangers to climb to the roof. But the Lord realized that he still had no work to do and several Nolder nobles under Noel surrounded him again. In fact, the scene in the center of the city was quite terrifying. The entire area of Eagle Claw Fort, 
if placed in modern times, would only be equivalent to a medium-sized community. But for such a small ground sword, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. There were corpses everywhere, and there was almost no place to stay. The blood had turned into a thick paste, and one foot could submerge the ankles. Every step forward was bound to step on some body. Soldiers holding shields that blocked the view of their feet often fell down due to corpses or blood and mud. But Liang didn't feel any danger at all. He was surrounded by Nolder masters holding shields. Roland! The army is entrusted to you! It seemed that he was no longer needed for things like killing enemies. Leon simply let Sir Roland lead the army. He climbed up to the tallest house in the center of the city with a flag and planted the griffin flag on the roof. Then he took a piece of leather and rolled it into a trumpet and began to shout to the other side. Brothers of the Lion Knights! I am Leon! Are you afraid of being beaten by the Jada people? The Royal Knights are not so timid. Are they? Lion Knights! Charge to my flag! The Lord is not trying to boost the morale of the Lion Knights. He just doesn't want the Lion Knights to retreat. Leon led the team to launch an attack from behind the Jata people. In fact, it was the Lion Knights who were under the greatest pressure, because the Jata people were frantically attacking the Lion Knights. And now Leon attacks from the east. The Jata people in the east retreat step by step, and all the Jata people are pressed into a ball in the center of the city. This is tantamount to further pressure. The Jata people in the front row on the west side fought harder. At this time, the Lion Knights were under considerable pressure. They were already exhausted and were likely to collapse completely. So Leon had to cheer them up. Dot, have you seen that even the Nolder Elves are supporting us? You are all men. Don't be inferior to these girls. Charge! Don't tarnish the honor of the Royal Knights. Kill those Jata people! The Lord Lord shouted loudly. Honor is my life! The Lion Knights can indeed see the Nua Nua girl on the roof. I don't know if it was the power of the word honor or the reason for the promise of many girls. But they did muster up the last strength, roared and started fighting. And they seemed to be more energetic. Then, the Lord turned his head and pointed the horn towards the Crow Kingdom. Warriors of Ravenland! The disputes between kingdoms can be put aside. Now our enemies are the Jada people. As long as you are in this city, my troops will not attack you. The Nolder Elves will not attack you either. Gregory IV who was wearing a crown helmet, looked up at Leon on the roof, pulled down his mask, and asked the people around him, Who is that? Is it the leader of the previous army? It should be. The troops that intercepted our scouts were flying this flag. Just now, he seemed to have said his name was Leong. A nobleman wearing Highland armor answered, Remember this bastard. He dragged us into this quagmire. Gregory IV said with a frown, Your Majesty, while they are attacking the Jada people, we can try to retreat and then guard the city gate. The Jada people should be unable to attack us now. We can wait for them to fight until both sides are injured. The noble suggested to Gregory IV that the Jata people in front of them were indeed gradually retreating. Under the attack from both sides by the Lion Knights and Leon, the Jada people slowed down their attack to the north. Okay, let's retreat first. Gregory IV turned around and walked back. But at this moment, he heard Liang's voice again. Is the Crow King here? Is the king of the crow realm here? His majesty Gregory the Fourth. You must not leave the city. I will only attack you if you leave the city. After all, this is the land of the Lion Kingdom. In order not to harm the peace, you'd better not let the troops withdraw from the city gate. Chapter 202 The established goal is achieved. Although the Lord warned Gregory the Fourth, the crow kingdom seemed a little unconvinced. Gregory the Fourth looked back. His face twitched a few times. And he said, Humph? still signaling the rear team to change to the front team, and asked the soldiers in the rear row to retreat outside the city gate. But just two minutes later, before Gregory IV could reach the city gate, a ranger came to report in panic. Your Majesty, a group of rangers are surrounding the city gate. If you go out, you will be shot. Kill! We don't have arrows and can't fight back. The gate space is narrow. If we rush out, we will suffer heavy losses. At this time, Leon's trumpet began to roar again. Raven warriors, do you remember Countess Valera? Do you remember the glorious Falcon Talon? They have returned to the city. They are fighting with GA. The people are fighting hard. Did you see it? The mixed force of female explorers and Nolder elves has just reached the center of the city. And a small group of ravens standing on high ground should be able to see them. Amy and Windife also came to the center of the street of Eagle Claw Castle at this time and happened to hear the Lord mentioning the Countess and Falcon Claw. So Amy and Wendy went to the roof together and stood next to Leon. 
Just right. Wendy, I just need you. Leong nodded towards Wendirf. Sir, are you going to shoot those Jada people? Wendy consciously took off her bow and set an arrow. No, shoot whoever runs away, especially the crow. Look at that guy over there. Shoot him. Leong pointed to a retreating crow armed infantry to the north. The outstanding student representatives among the Nolder female rangers are indeed outstanding in ability. As soon as the Lord finished speaking, Wendy had already shot the arrow. The Nolder arrow accurately penetrated the helmet of the armed infantry and was inserted into the head of the infantry. The infantryman fell to the ground without saying a word. The raven then let out a low cry of terror. Then Leong raised his trumpet again and shouted, No one can retreat until all the Jada people are dead. Whoever dares to retreat will die. Gregory Ivy's face twitched even more. And he issued an order through gritted teeth. Send the order. The entire army dot attack the Jata people. Attack. Sir, you asked me to keep the arrows just to supervise the battle? Wendy knocked another arrow. But she couldn't find a target at the moment. No one in the city was retreating now. They were all fighting Jata together. Of course not. What kind of battle are you supervising? They are not Liang's subordinates. This is to declare control of the battlefield. Wendy, this is to tell them that we have dominated the battlefield. If we don't want to die, we must obey even the king or the duke. Everyone must obey. The answer was Amy. She took off her musket, loaded the ammunition, and monitored the battlefield with Wendy. Leon nodded, holding the big flag and gesturing his thumb towards Amy. You have graduated, Amy. Afterwards, the Lord Lord said to Wendy, Your arrows can control this battlefield at this time. Wendy! Even if there are thousands of people on the battlefield, you only need one bag of arrows to control the battlefield. They all listen to me. Wendy nodded slightly. I understand. Sir. Indeed. No one dared to express objections under the intimidation of a sharpshooter like Wendir. Because the troops of the Raven Kingdom had already run out of arrows. And the arrows fired were useless in the melee between several parties. Legal Recycling. The Crow people knew very well that the new force brought by Leon could easily defeat their remnant army that had run out of ammunition and food at this time. Leon forced everyone and the Nolder Elves to join forces to deal with Jatu. The battle became fierce again, with all forces trying their best to kill the Jatu people. Surrounded on all sides, the Jatu people howled like wild beasts, just like what Leon had seen before. And all the Jatu people started fighting as if they were crazy. The suicidal charge is still as horrific as the last time we saw it. But the ending is also the same as last time. Soon after, the Jata people's voices gradually weakened, and finally disappeared in the center of Eagle Claw Castle. Still no Jata people flinched, and no one surrendered. In fact, the Jata people's desperate mentality is exactly why Leon must kill them. Both Ralph and his son and Drash told Leon about the situation of the Jata people, mainly about Judah's tribe. The tribe of the destroyer Judah occupied the southern part of the Jata grassland. It was this tribe that had been plundering the Lion Kingdom. Ralph and his son were only familiar with Judah's tribe. Another great warlord, Zakar's tribe, is in the northern part of the grassland. They are more likely to attack the Crow Kingdom in the north. All the Jata people of the Judah tribe are soldiers. And from birth, they have received a twisted warlord-style enslavement and brainwashing education. On the verge of adulthood, the young men of this tribe must prove themselves to be brave warriors by killing people with their own hands. Only by becoming a fearless warrior who dares to kill people can one be considered a human being in the Judah tribe. Otherwise one can only be a slave. The way these Jata young men used to prove that they had grown into qualified warriors was to personally kill the women of the Lion Kingdom that their fathers had captured. That is, their mothers. Biological mother. In Judah's tribe, women are slaves and a kind of property. And they are cheaper than iron pots or saddles. They can even be said to be a consumable. When this kind of property is too old to have children, they will have their heads cut off by the sons they raise by themselves, becoming a deliberately distorted proof of courage. Therefore, the infant survival rate of the Jata people is actually very low. After giving birth to a baby boy, many women are likely to strangle their children to death with their own hands. If the child is a daughter, it would be better. When girls from the Judah tribe reach the age of 13 or 14, they are basically sent to the Zakar tribe in exchange for daily necessities such as iron pots. Because of this, Judah's tribe will continue to rob more women. Under this kind of warlord-style brainwashing, Judah's tribe gradually regarded those who were unable to fight and plunder as burdens. If a Jata young man does not have the courage to kill, 
then the fate of this young man is actually not much better than that of the women who were robbed. Not only will he become a slave, but he will also be regarded as a coward and become abandoned by Indar as chief slave. Indar is the god of the Jata people. It is said that he is an image of an archer who specializes in shooting deserters on the battlefield. The destroyer Judah likes to do this kind of thing with his own hands. So Judah is also regarded as a cause by his tribe. Dal itself, if a Jata man is struck by an arrow in the back, whether due to bad luck or escape, he will become a slave and will be considered a coward punished by Indar. Therefore, in order to avoid getting arrows in the back, these Jata people will fight to the death and move forward bravely at any time and will not surrender. These Jata raiders, who have been brainwashed since childhood, are like pure tools, killing, pillaging, breeding horses, and producing offspring as brainwashed as themselves was all they had in life. Those who can really have some brains, or have some thoughts that belong to humans, but some relatively high-level small warlords can become managers, which shows that their brains have not been thoroughly washed, and they still have a little bit of their own thinking ability, such as Drash. In fact, this is the case most of the time, in organizations that use brainwashing education to control people. Those who are completely brainwashed can only work hard all their lives, while those who are not brainwashed can become high-level officials. In MLM organizations, the person who least believes in MLM is the top leader in religious organizations. The person who least believes in God is the Pope himself. Because of this, the Lord can find a way to unite the older elves, or he can find a way to unite some people from the Misty Mountains such as Andonga. But he must destroy the Jada tribe of Judah. As for Zahar, another Jata warlord, Leon currently lacks an in-depth understanding of him. So it is hard to say. Moreover, Judah's tribe is indeed the mortal enemy of all forces. And only when facing them can humans and the Nolder truly fight together without conflict with each other. As corpses piled up in the center of the city, several forces finally joined forces to kill all the Jata people and met in the center of the castle. Some of the Lion Knights had already collapsed on the bloody ground. The Crow Kingdom's troops were also swaying a bit, and they didn't have the strength to take action again. But they didn't dare to relax and were still on guard, because the Nolder Elves on the roof were holding bows and looking at the battlefield. The female explorers who were similar to Falcon Claw were also eagerly waiting in formation. Now only Li Ang's troops have sufficient physical strength and enough arrows. Everyone knew that the Nolder's arrows could penetrate heavy armor, and no one dared to touch them. Duke Brennus also rushed to the middle of the city and looked up at Leon posing on the roof. Since the south gate was completely blocked from the outside by Windadier, he had been holding on hard on the south wall until Leon entered the city and the siege was finally lifted. Baron Leon, you should give me an explanation. Brennus seemed to be injured a little, and the armor on his shoulders was damaged. He pointed at the blood-stained flag carried by the attendants beside him and yelled at Leon. Why don't you obey my order? Why do you want to block the city gate? Are you going to rebel? The marshal's flag looked inconspicuous on the street below. But Leon held his griffin flag on the roof. It looked like Liang's flag looked more like a marshal's flag. What should I explain? I am the duke who finally broke through the city gate and came to save you. I just saved your life. Can you have a better attitude towards your savior? Leon looked down at Brennus casually. The people from the Crow Kingdom are still here. What do you think will happen here if I withdraw my troops if I am unhappy? Brennus was furious and roared furiously. How dare you! But he only said these two words and wisely kept his mouth shut. If Leon really left him alone, he would have no choice but to surrender and save his life. The Lion Knights and the Royal City Guard suffered heavy losses. Behind Brennus were all the wounded, and there were no more than 500 people who still maintained their fighting capacity. Although the Crow Kingdom is not much better, there are more people after all, and they are fighting on foot in the city. The Crow Kingdom is not afraid of the Lion Knights. Besides, it was indeed not Leon who blocked the South Gate, but the Nolder Rangers led by Vindadil. Brennus saw with his own eyes a large group of Nolder Rangers on the city wall using all kinds of messy stones and wood. Something blocked the door. Although the Nolder blocked the city gate and almost killed Brennus, it really had nothing to do with Leon. Even though Brennus knew that most of the Nolder elves were acting according to Leon's instructions, he also knew that he was the vulnerable group here now and could only hold back any dissatisfaction. And Brennus didn't understand why the Nolder elves obeyed Leon's command? But before he could ask, Leon himself gave the answer, but not to Brennus, but to the Lion Knights. In order to jointly fight against the Jatu, the Nolder Elves temporarily formed an alliance with me. Now, 
With the help of the Nolder Warriors, we have destroyed the Jatu. Lion Knight, I hope you will remember this battle today. Don't forget who saved you. Now, put down your weapons. Sit down and rest where you are. The people of the Lion Knights listened in silence. In the eyes of the knights and followers of the Lion Knights. It was indeed Leon and the Nolder Elves who saved them. They had not been blocked before. It was because they were unable to retreat during the battle. If they had the intention of exiting the city gate, all the Jata people would rush towards them. If Brennus had been with the Knights of the Simon Lion at that time, it would have been possible for them to arrange for a break in the rear and forcibly evacuate most of the people. But Brennus was blocked on the south wall, and there was no one to command the Lion Knights on the west side. They were all noble knights. And of course no one wanted to die. Now Leon asked them to put down their weapons and sit down. And most of the Lion Knights obeyed. In fact, this was what they wanted to do. And they had already run out of energy. Breda seemed to want to say something when he saw this. But after pouting, he remained silent. Soldiers of the Crow Kingdom. Do you want to go back alive? Seeing that the Lion Knights all complied silently. And no one jumped out to interrupt. Leong turned around and started shouting to the Crow Kingdom. If you don't want to die, put down your weapons and sit down where you are. There was no reaction from the Crow people. But the place was completely silent. I say it again. Put down your weapons and sit down where you are. If you don't do it, I will order an attack. The whole army is ready. Leon raised his voice and spoke again. And raised the flag in his hand. Ha! Huh. Upon hearing the order, the whole army is ready. Liang's various troops cooperated and let out a neat war cry. This is the feedback that most well-trained troops will give after hearing the general's order. Indicating, understand. This energetic roar obviously formed a considerable deterrent. The Nolder Rangers also responded to Liang's orders uniformly. Most people present could realize that the relationship between these Nolder Elves and Leon was probably not just a temporary alliance. Most of the Ravens sat down directly, without even waiting for Gregory Ivy's order. Everyone is honest. Gregory Ivy's current expression and reaction are exactly the same as Brennus's. Leon nodded with satisfaction. Very good. Your Majesty Gregory. Duke Brennus. Please come out. I'll wait for you on the east wall. After shouting, the Lord handed the flag to Amy, got off the roof, and walked to the stairs of the east wall. Wendy and the Nolder Rangers led by Vindatil were still staring at the battlefield with their bows in hand. Gregory IV and Duke Brennus were in two places, but basically sighed at the same time. No matter what Leon wants to do, they can only do it now. After all, Liang's troops are the most powerful in this area, and he appears as a savior. Your Majesty, Give me your helmet, and I will take my place. The raven noble, wearing highland armor next to Gregory IV, looked quite brave. But Gregory IV shook his head and refused. These Nolder are so obedient to military orders. They are obviously well-trained mercenaries. How could they be demons? That Leon will not hurt me. Otherwise, he would have attacked long ago. Duke Brennus didn't say anything unnecessary. He just looked at the Nolder rangers on the roof with concern. Then separated the guards in front of him and walked towards the east wall. However, his steps were so slow that he seemed to be lame, and his legs seemed to be shaking a little. The two bosses basically met in the middle of the battlefield at the same time, and then passed the array of Nolder elves tremblingly at the same time. They even looked at each other, probably to embolden their courage. In fact, Leon could complete the negotiation in the middle of the battlefield. The reason why King Raven and Duke Brennus were asked to go to the East Wall was to allow these two bosses to pass through the Nolder's lines and all the human soldiers present should see the scene. This can tell everyone that the Nolder Elves are not the devils in legend, but reliable warriors who obey orders. At the same time, it can also put the two bosses under huge psychological pressure. To be honest, it is really scary to pass through a group of Nolder Rangers who are holding weapons and staring at them coldly. It is so scary that the two bosses have no idea at all. Notice the beauty of many of the girls. Leon had already climbed up the stairs to the east side of the city wall. Looking at the silent eagle claw fort, he knew that his desired goal had actually been achieved. Anything you can get later is considered additional income. In the city, those people sitting on the ground were noble knights and trusted followers from the two countries, or elite warriors with relatively high status. The territories of these people are distributed in various regions of the two countries. Now these people know that the Nolder can fight side by side with humans and will rescue humans. Even if this rescue comes a little late, at least it is indeed saved. Moreover, after these Nolder Elves finally took control of the battlefield, 
They did not attack the troops of the two countries at will, but always obeyed Leon's orders. This shows that the Noldor are controllable, rational, and well-trained warriors. This is actually very important. It will prevent the Noldor elves from being regarded as monsters by these noble knights. Nor as non-human beings who cannot communicate. Instead, they will be regarded as another kind of group servant that all nobles are familiar with. Soldiers, just like the big hunks of Medenheim. The Medenheimers are tall, and most of them look fierce. They look much scarier than the Noldor elves. But people will not regard the Medenheimers as savage beasts, because they are controllable mercenaries. When the Noldor elves are regarded as powerful mercenaries, these noble knights will feel guilty if they plan to capture the Noldor as slaves, just like they are randomly capturing the Medenheimers, and they will be killed as a result. There is nothing left to say. No hatred. When the Barclay Empire provoked the Medenheimers and was killed, everyone sympathized with the Medenheimers. And from now on, no matter how many Noldor elves appear in Li Ang's territory, it will be considered normal. As a mercenary, what's weird about appearing on your employer's territory? At most, people think that Liang secretly obtained so many Noldor warriors, and he may have some other agenda. But in any case, this is much better than treating Liang as a heretic. At the same time, the Noldor elves will truly get a chance to integrate into human society, and they will definitely make every effort to protect Liang's territory. These are the goals that have been achieved so far, and more gains will depend on the negotiations on the East Wall. Chapter 203 Transaction Without Capital Gregory IV and Brennus finally reached the city wall. There was sweat on both of their foreheads. Your Majesty Gregory, I heard that you brought your troops here to hunt down the rebels? Do you still plan to continue the hunt? The Lord did not salute, but directly asked the question with a smile on his face, as if he was the king. Your Excellency Leon, since the rebellion is no longer here, of course I would like to withdraw our troops. If you have no objections, Gregory Ivy's legs were a little weak now, and his heart was still a little weak. What he said was completely unlike what a king should say. To put it simply, he seemed a little timid. Of course I have no objection. If you are willing to surrender. Leon was opening his mouth like a lion. Even Brennus couldn't believe the conditions. The duke even picked his ears, apparently thinking that he might have heard wrongly. This is impossible. Your Excellency Leon, if this is the case, then let's fight to the death. Although Gregory IV seemed a little timid, he would never agree to such a shameful condition and surrender to a baron. Then he might as well have died on the spot. But you have invaded my territory. So you can't just leave. Right. You have to leave something behind. If you are really not afraid of death, I can also ask the Nolder Elves to give you a ride. Leon was still smiling and shaking his head. When Duke Brenna saw that Leon was planning to blackmail Gregory IV, his eyes widened and he didn't even know whether to speak. He simply found a battlement and sat down to watch the two negotiate. This marshal now looks like Liang's subordinate. Your territory? This is the rebel's castle. It's a no man's land. Gregory IV argued. Well, this place can probably be regarded as the territory of Baron Leon now. He is a rebel. Since he led the troops to occupy the rebel castle, this territory is indeed his. Brennus answered for Leon. This scene was obviously intended to blackmail Gregory IV and Brennus did not turn his elbows outward. Now! Your Majesty Gregory! You heard it too! And when you attack Eagle Claw Fort, this place did not belong to the rebels. Besides, my Fletcher village was also invaded by Earl Stephen. This is your arranged it. Right. There shouldn't be any excuse for the Crow Army's invasion of Fletcher village's territory. Right. You came to suppress the rebellion, but your troops attacked all my territory. Say it yourself. Should I compensate for my losses? Leon behaved quite violently, as if he had really suffered a huge loss. Gregory the Fourth really had nothing to say about the arrangements at Fletcher Village. It was indeed he who arranged for Earl Stephen to block the Eastern Lords of the Lion Kingdom there, although he did not let Earl Stephen attack Fletcher Village. Since Leon came here, it means that he must have repelled Earl Stephen. So the losses were indeed caused by the invasion of the Raven Kingdom. Then what are you going to do? Anyway, even if the whole army is wiped out. There is no way I will surrender. Gregory IV stopped defending and expressed his stance directly, looking quite bachelor. Well, your majesty, let your troops disarm. I allow you to take all the noble lords and leave. But your soldiers have to stay here. You can get money to redeem them within a month, but I didn't receive the money after a month. If so, I will sell them to Sinjar. Isn't this an embarrassment to you? Leon gave a condition that seemed very reasonable. 
and the condition was so good that even Gregory the Fourth couldn't believe it. This approach was indeed in line with the wishes of Gregory the Fourth. As long as all the nobles can go back. It doesn't matter if the civilian soldiers stay here. Anyway, to Gregory the Fourth. The civilian soldiers are like leeks. As for whether to redeem the soldiers after returning to the country, that is all conscripted by the noble lords. Whoever wants to redeem them can just let the lords pay for it themselves. If that's the case, of course. Gregory the Fourth was about to agree, but Leon put his hands in front of his face to stop him. Your Majesty, I haven't finished speaking yet. If you group of nobles want to cross the Jata Grassland without soldiers, it will be very dangerous. Someone must be responsible for security. Right? I just happen to be specialized in this business. The Lord's raised hand turned into a gesture of counting gold coins. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Your Excellency Leon. Gregory Ivy's face began to twitch again. Oh, it seems that you and Jata Warlord Zakar do have some shady deals. Okay then. I wish you good luck. And I hope you won't encounter any horse thieves after leaving Eagle Claw Fort. Since this king doesn't care about life safety, there is certainly no need for the lord to force it. You? Duke Brennus. Are all the young lords of your Lion Kingdom such shameless people now? Gregory IV felt that he was being intimidated and threatened, and turned to Brennus angrily and asked, Hada, why do you think he became a rebel at such a young age? I'm not even qualified to use the golden coat of arms. With a trace of ridicule on his face, Brennus turned around and said sarcastic remarks. Okay, dot, okay. Mr. Leon, tell me directly, how much do you want? Gregory IV simply asked clearly. He did not want to stay here any longer, lest he would be so angry that he would have nowhere to be treated. It hurts feelings to talk about money. Just give me the Dark Falcon Castle. You don't plan to take it anyway. Do you? The Lord smiled even brighter. How could a king not cherish his life? Brennus's eyes widened again. And Leon's request once again exceeded his expectations. That's the territory of the Stephen family. How could it be given to you? Gregory the Fourth was also shocked. He was already mentally prepared to be ripped off. But he didn't expect that Leon actually asked for the castle. You are planning to sell Dark Falcon Castle to Zakar. And you are mentioning the Stephen family. Earl Stephen's cavalry withdrew a few days ago and left you here. This is a war deserter. If you don't do this, I can't bear to take back his territory of Dark Falcon Castle. The Lord's intention is to let Gregory the Fourth punish Earl Stephen for withdrawing his troops early on the grounds of cowardice. Take back his Dark Falcon Castle territory and then transfer it to Leon. Are you blackmailing me? What if I don't agree? Gregory the Fourth did not directly object, but he was quite dissatisfied with Leon's approach. Your Majesty, just tell me whether you agree or not. If you agree, just write a transfer document and stamp it. Duke Brennus will be a ready witness. Having said that, give me the crappy place in Dark Falcon Castle. I can naturally send people to protect you back home. Right? Otherwise, do you think my subordinates are willing to go to your ice and snow? Liang's indifferent look really didn't matter. He was not the one who was running out of ammunition and food now. You are just a bandit. A robber. How can there be a noble like you? Don't you have any sense of honor in your heart? Gregory Ivy's eyes were red. He was cursing in a low voice. And he looked like he was about to go crazy. Your Majesty Gregory. I am the Lord of the Kingdom of Lions. It is the greatest honor of a noble lord to open up territory for the kingdom. The lord was completely unmoved. And the kind smile on his face did not change at all. Okay dot I'll give you the Dark Falcon Castle. Let's see how you deal with the Jatu and the Misty Mountain people there. Gregory the Fourth whispered through his back molars. Then find a place to write a territory transfer document. Remember to write an armistice agreement. Duke Brennus, and I will sign it later. Do you need me to find someone to write it for you? The Lord gave a very considerate reminder. Gregory the Fourth snorted. Turned around and walked down the city wall. Ignoring Leon again. However, on the way back to his troops, Gregory the Fourth seemed less timid. Although he was killed, he knew that his safety was at least guaranteed. There were only two people left on the wall. Your Majesty, let's make a deal. Leong turned to look at Brennus, his face no longer smiling, but with a serious expression. You want Talon Castle, right? Brennus twirled his beard and looked at Leon. When he saw Leon asking for the Dark Falcon Castle from Gregory IV, he thought he roughly understood Leon's intention. No, there is nothing to talk about in Eagle Claw Fort. This is the trophy that I deserve. What I want is Chungha Town. Leon glanced at the Lion Knights and Royal City Guards, 
who were still sitting in the city, then turned to look into Brennus's eyes. Lord Brennus, evacuate your people in Chunga town. I am going to crusade against that rebellious Granlon. Brennus couldn't remember how many times he had been shocked here, but this time was the worst. He even trembled all over and pulled off a piece of his beard, but he didn't seem to feel any pain. Dot, how do you know? Dot, how do you know that the troops that Granlon recruited in Chunga town were sent by me? After a full half minute of silence, Brennus asked this sentence in a low voice. You are the most powerful duke in the entire kingdom. You have a rich territory, a large population, and a powerful military. But you only brought the king's troops to this battle. So where are your direct troops? Leon shook his head gently. Your son Marbert replaced you as the administrator of Chang'e Town. And after Granon occupied Chang'e Town, he was able to recruit a large number of highly effective troops so easily in a short period of time. Ha! Huh. Even if it's just a guess. I can guess it. In fact, Leon was indeed guessing just now. But he knew that the probability of guessing correctly should be relatively high. After Granon occupied Chang'e Town, he recruited more than 500 powerful troops in just a few days. This is not normal. The only person who has the opportunity to arrange so many undercover soldiers. Waiting for recruitment. In Chang'e Town is Brennus' son Lord Marbert, who is at least the administrator of Chang'e Town. And judging from Marbert's previous acting skills, he also has this ability. This playboy who seems to travel all day long is actually very smart. There was hesitation and surprise in Brennus' eyes. And he didn't speak for a long time. There are only two of us here right now. Lord Brennus, let me be frank. I know that you probably want Gronlin to stay in Chunga Town for a while. So that the thief can respect himself and get a lot. Benefits. And when necessary, you can always cooperate inside and outside to kill Granlon. Or change a traitor to continue to occupy Chunga Town. But in the end, they are just benefits. And you will never get Chunga Town. You can logically get Chunga Town. The only one left is me. The rebel. Leon simply revealed Brennus's thoughts directly. Leon. I still underestimate you. I can withdraw from Chang'e Town. But do you think you can become the master of Chang'e Town? Your majesty will not be happy. And all the nobles will not be happy. Brennus looked at the young face of the lord and shook his head slowly. Ha. Huh. That's my business. Your majesty will be happy with it. Leon smiled and looked at the lion knight sitting in the city. More than half of them were killed and wounded. And basically all of the remaining people were injured. There are only more than 300 people in the royal city guard still alive. Then let me tell you the truth. I can't suffer losses in vain. Since you said it's a transaction. What price are you planning to offer? Brennus frowned and began to ask the price. It hurts feelings to talk about money. Wouldn't it be? Okay. To send all the people you arranged in Chang'e Town to Shuru City? Shuru City is much richer than Chang'e Town. And it is closer to Chiaoyan Bay. You can make money, there are also more benefits. Liang's transactions have always been done fairly. And all of them cost nothing. How to get it? It's impossible for Shuru City to be sealed to me. It will definitely become a territory directly under the jurisdiction of His Majesty. And there are no rebels in Shuru City now. Brennus didn't quite understand. How could he raise thieves and gain benefits in a place where there were no more rebels? Who said there are no rebels? Didn't Fawcett run away? The Lord spread his hands. As long as we all say that he is still in Shuru City. He must be in Shuru City. This is much easier to control than Chang'e Town. Brennus was stunned for a long time before shaking his head and sighing. You are really good. Lion Lake City is indeed richer than Chang'e Town. And Brennus does find Lion Lake City more convenient. He is currently controlling Lion Lake City. As long as Leon can agree with him to declare that Lion Lake City is occupied by father. He can even take over the entire Lion Lake City. Shuru City is sold out. Anyway, the nobles currently staying in Lion Lake City are indeed those who supported Father in the past. They are all true rebels. It is reasonable to rob them all. Those nobles who are unwilling to rely on Father have long been driven out of Lion Lake City. No one would give Brennus any trouble over this. Dot okay. Then it's settled. I will have my troops withdraw from Chang'e Town. However, I think you may not get what you want. Brennus nodded in agreement. He also needed Leong to be consistent with him. Otherwise Leong would expose the matter, and he would not be able to reap the benefits of Chang'e Town. Since Leong is willing to cooperate with him in doing things in Shuru City, it can be considered acceptable. Leong laughed and stretched out his hand towards Brennus. Then, happy cooperation. Your Majesty the Duke. We can go and sign an armistice agreement with the Crow Kingdom. Gregory IV did draft two agreements. 
One was to transfer Dark Falcon Castle to Leon to apologize. The king's transfer can take effect as long as both parties have no objections. While Duke Brenna signed a third party certificate as a witness. The other was an armistice agreement declaring an armistice and acknowledging that the Crow Kingdom had crossed the border too recklessly. This is actually a letter of credence. Bredas is the marshal of the kingdom and can sign equally as the king's representative. Leon is a witness to this agreement. Dark Falcon Castle has now nominally become Leon's territory. Gregory IV will take Dark Falcon Castle under his direct jurisdiction and transfer it to Leon on the grounds that Count Stephen has withdrawn his troops privately. Although Dark Falcon Castle is an enclave, it is a legal territory with a contract written by King Crow himself. This is at least the expansion of territory thousands of miles away. Moreover, by allowing Gregory IV to transfer directly, Leon was actually saving the face of Gregory IV. This was not a request for peace after defeat, but rather, compensation for the losses caused to Leon by recklessly sending troops. Leon did suffer losses, but it was not at the hands of the ravens. But more than a dozen soldiers were killed in the battle against the Jatu, including five Nolder warriors under Noel. 1,500 civilian soldiers from the Raven Kingdom were disarmed and remained at Talon Keep. The wounded among them were properly treated by Anson and others, while the uninjured began to clean the battlefield under the command of the female soldiers. It was really just cleaning, because the weapons, equipment and valuables on the battlefield had long been taken away by Liang's troops. The main job of these Raven prisoners is actually to move the corpses outside the city and clean the bloody castle. When everything was settled, Liang sent a force to escort the nobles of Crow Kingdom back home. To be precise, it was to take over Dark Falcon Castle. In fact, as long as Liang did not let his men act as horse thieves, Gregory IV would not need anyone to escort him across the grassland. The force he sent was small in size. It was a group of 100 Pender soldiers led by Sir Roland. They were all the Lord's own troops. And Ndongjiao was also in the team. When the team left, Ren also said goodbye to Liang. Ren had never expected that Liang would defeat or weaken the Crow Kingdom's troops. In fact, he did not expect that Liang could blackmail Gregory IV at all. Liang's ability to obtain Dark Falcon Castle was actually an unexpected surprise for Ren. Amy led the troops to save Ren's life. And of course Ren wanted to repay him. Liang detained soldiers from the Kingdom of Crows again, creating excellent conditions for the rebels Ursula and Ren. And this was even more repaying. In addition, Ren also wants to rebuild the Falcon Knights in Dark Falcon Castle. Therefore, Ren swore an oath and promised that as long as he was not allowed to betray Ursula and the Falcon Knights, he would obey all orders from Leon, which was regarded as selling himself to the Lord. In other words, as long as he is not allowed to break his previous vows, he will be Liang's wage earner. Ursula's rebels had been operating around Dark Falcon Castle before. Sir Ren was able to mobilize a lot of troops in Dark Falcon Castle. Although the Falcon Knights were destroyed, their influence in Dark Falcon Castle was still great. This is also the main reason why Gregory IV agreed to Liang's request. And Liang has learned from Ren that Ursula has formed an alliance with the Lion Kingdom. With Ren's relationship, Ursula will also regard Liang as an ally. In this case, the Enclave of Dark Falcon Castle will be a truly controllable territory. Ursula needs a lord who can support them in Dark Falcon Castle, which can give her rebels a way out. Dark Falcon Castle will not be attacked by the Raven Kingdom if it remains in Leon's hands. After all, the two countries signed armistice. On the one hand, Leon needs Dark Falcon Castle to arrange some business in Crowland and Misty Mountain. In the bitter and cold places north of Misty Mountain, he can obtain the greatest profits. On the other hand, it was for Ndongjia to recruit people from the Misty Mountain, White Deer Castle and makes the angling need to wait for the population to grow. It is not easy to quickly expand the size of the army. At present, they can only try to recruit troops from the Bacchus, who are gradually migrating here. They are the Second Empire, who originally belonged to Ledius, the farmers of the Legion. But there is no need to wait to recruit troops from Misty Mountain. Even Dark Falcon Castle can quickly recruit an army. As for how to ensure the actual control of Dark Falcon Castle and the loyalty of the soldiers, this is why Leon asked Sir Roland to go to Dark Falcon Castle. It is impossible for a paladin like Roland to betray, because Roland will not be loyal to anyone at all. Leong is preparing to transform a large number of Misty Mountain people from marauders into good citizens. In Roland's eyes, this is basically a fundamental implementation of the will of the Goddess of Justice. And Roland is an excellent military training instructor. Before Ren left, he asked Leong a question. Sir, do you think Ms. Ursula can become the Queen of Ravenland? Leong thought for a while 
and did not answer directly. Instead, he gave her a few suggestions. I can make Gregory the Fourth give in just because his troops are exhausted and have no supplies. But even so, he is not willing to do anything. Things that will directly lose your dominance. Don't think that catching him or killing him will make Ursula the queen. You can only defeat him in every aspect and prove that Ursula is stronger than him. I don't know if Ren heard it or not. Anyway, he just saluted respectfully and then said, Sir, I think you are better than the king in every aspect. The lord didn't say anything anymore and waved his hand to tell Ren to get out of here. After cleaning up the battlefield, Amy rebuilt the new Falcon Claw station at Eagle Claw Fort. She wants to forge the female soldiers of the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group into the new Falcon Claws. Of course, the extraordinary female warriors of the Griffin Sword Mercenary Group admire Countess Valera. And it is a great honor for them to become a member of the new Falcon Claws. This rebuilt new Falcon Claw only relied on the fame of Countess Valera and the properties of Falcon Claw. They are actually an independent armed force. They are not the retinue of the Falcon Knight. In fact, there it has nothing to do with the Falcon Knights. And the female soldiers have no intention of joining the Falcon Knights, which has been declared illegal. Their organization is actually called Griffin Claws. But to facilitate recruitment of new people, they are announced as New Falcon Claws. The female soldiers were simply following their idol, Valera. And Amy is using this method to gradually make them forget that Mirgon used idol worship to dilute the influence of the Sea King, which is the same as Emperor Marius using Demaya's faith to dilute heretical beliefs. This is just to allow these female soldiers to become Amy's independent troops. Amy will temporarily stay in Eagle Claw Castle to develop relationships with her female soldiers. She is now not only the leader of the Griffin Claws, but also the Lord of Eagle Claw Castle. This was also done deliberately to leverage the influence of Countess Valera. The new Griffin Claw led by a female lord would attract more people to settle here and attract many people to settle here. There are almost no residents in Eagle Claw Castle. And Leon and Amy plan to use this method to attract people from surrounding villages. Amy, the female lord, is actually not legal. But it is reasonable. Whoever Leon wants to take charge of Eagle Claw Castle is Liang's freedom. At the same time, Sarah will stay at Eagle Claw Castle. She will look for more female warriors who are willing to join them. New Falcon Claw, and work with Amy to form a reliable female soldier force. Chapter 2-0 for the common hobbies of two generations of lords. After handling the matters at Eagle Claw Fort, Leon returned to White Deer Fort. Neuer took his troops to say goodbye to Leon. His mission had been completed, and he was going back to report the situation to Islando. Most of the Horn Call Rangers also dispersed back home on the road. Now that there are no foreign enemies, the Rangers will not go to war. Leong even asked when a deer to take the girl rangers to the forest east of White Deer Castle, where Leslie was planning to build a trade area with the Nolder. When the deer, the Tribune, had to cooperate. One time. Of course, Liang's main purpose is to let the Nolder go back and promote it, so that more Nolder elves come to White Deer Castle. Now Leong only has 200 people left in his hands. 100 of them were Pender soldiers, still the most loyal non-commissioned officers of the original batch. The other hundred were male Nolder Rangers led by Rissa Dillon. The other half of Windadir's students. These Nolder Rangers have now become Lion's personal bodyguards. And Rissa Dillon is now the captain of the bodyguards. This is actually what Windadir meant. She values Liang's safety more than anyone else now. Those girl Rangers are not suitable for following Leon around. Their beauty and worth are likely to attract covetous attention. If they cause unnecessary trouble, it will make Leon more dangerous. But male Nolder Rangers don't have this worry. They just need to wear a hood like Rasadlin and... That's it. 100 Nolder Rangers. This must be the most luxurious personal guard lineup in the entire continent. The Nolder would protect Leon so much. Of course. Because of the magic they saw with their own eyes. Although Leon has told Windadier that gunpowder is also available in Buckley Continent. And it is something that everyone can use. But Vindatil still believed that this was magic. Most of the Nolder elves also insisted that the explosion of gunpowder was a product of magic. The explosive bag was a magic item made by Leon. If it could create magic items, it would be considered a magister. Of course, it is understandable that the Nolder have this concept. After all, people in the Middle Ages did regard various chemical reactions as spells, witchcraft, or alchemy. Anyway, they are almost the same type as magic. Older people are basically stubborn. And Noldor, who is several hundred years old, is no exception. They think it is not surprising that there are people in Barclay Continent who can make and use magic items. 
The Noldor originally came from another continent. And Leon is a Buckley man. As for Liang's insistence that this is science and not magic by the Noldor, this is probably because the two continents have different names for things like magic. After all, the Noldor all saw that it was Leon who guided Windy to send out the thunderstorm arrow, which shattered the city gate with one arrow. They felt that it was what they saw with their own eyes and could not be wrong. Leon simply didn't explain. He really couldn't explain it to these guys who didn't understand science and were full of tradition. And when Dadier didn't ask Leon much about magic or magister because she didn't know anything about it and didn't know how to ask, Vindadil is only considered a young person among the Nolder Elves. Her age would be equivalent to a human being in her 20s. And she really doesn't understand anything about ancient magic. In addition, for Nolder, having magic or not actually means the identity of master and servant. If Leon is an elf, then under this misunderstanding, Vindatil and these Nolder rangers are likely to directly regard Leong as their master. After all, this is their long-standing tradition, and it is even engraved in their genes. But the problem is that Leong is a human being. This makes Windadir very entangled. Whether it is Liang's help to the Nolder or Liang's identity as a magister, they all deserve the highest level of respect and protection she can give him. But she cannot let a human become the master of the Nolder. Bar? Human life is too short. So Vindatil simply didn't ask. The Nolder's arrogant self-esteem couldn't tolerate them turning a blind eye to everything they saw. But they also couldn't tolerate a human being becoming the master of the Nolder. Only Windife herself understood that this was indeed not magic. Because she knew very well that she just shot an arrow normally. But similarly, Windy didn't know what to say. She didn't understand the principle and couldn't explain it. In addition, her purple eyes look exactly like those of a Sindari elf with high magical talent. The Nolder now almost regard her as the elf king. If it weren't for the fact that Wendy still needed to learn magic with Leon, maybe the Nolder would have taken her back and forced her to take the throne. Leon also didn't expect that this joke would be taken completely seriously. It was so careless that it was hard to describe. He now somewhat understood why the elves were so powerful in the past, but ended up in this situation now. But this misunderstanding is also a good thing. At least it will make the Nolder elves more willing to cooperate with him. And Leon is even planning to really train Windulf to become the Elf King. Whiteheart Castle. Today's Whiteheart Castle is so different from before that Baron Godric can hardly recognize his own territory. The people are still the same. And the place is still the same. But it seems that many things are not what they used to be. Counting from the time he came to Chang'e Town to serve as the Eastern Military Affairs Chief. It had only been more than half a year since he came back. But Godric almost didn't know his way around now. The originally bumpy dirt road between Mai Xiangling and Chang'e Town actually became so spacious and smooth. There is even a bus. Godric originally rode a horse when he came back from Lion City. But after meeting John, the team leader, at McFly Square, he also tried riding back to White Deer Castle. It was originally just an ordinary box carriage. But Godric had a novel experience riding it. The horse-drawn carriage stops at the wave of your hand. You can throw money into the self-service coin box or show your monthly ticket and get on the bus directly. Find your seat and sit down. Then you can either look out the window at the almost endless wheat fields or chat with the people next to you. Everyone is like this. They look very familiar. Moreover, the people in the car basically didn't bring much luggage, and they were obviously used to frequent trips between the two places. The carriage covered a hundred miles in just two and a half hours, which was basically the same speed as riding a horse. The speed was very fast on the smooth and spacious road. And since the horses would stop at roadside stations every few seconds, the horses also got a rest along the way. On this road, the average speed of the carriage can reach almost 40 miles per hour. In this era, this is a complete miracle. In the past, only the Jata people's horse teams could move with such efficiency on the grassland. After arriving at White Deer Castle, the surrounding wheat fields looked more like what Amy had learned from Leon and asked the civilians in the territory under Godric's direct jurisdiction to grow them. The surrounding area of White Deer Castle belongs to Godric's direct territory, which means that those wheat fields are Godric's property. This made Godric feel extremely comfortable. He really didn't expect that in the six months since he handed over White Deer Castle to Liang, he would actually be able to get tens of thousands of acres of land. My lord! Ah! Lord Godric is back! The guards at the gate of White Deer Castle were still those archers, and they were very happy to see Godric back. Are Leon and Amy in the city? Godric looked around. These old subordinates seemed to be in good spirits. And he was very pleased. Lord Leon and this Amy led troops to support Baron Leofric a brave shield castle a few days ago. 
This is incredible. Sir, you don't know that Lord Leon can actually command the Nolder Elves? It seems like still a regular Nolder army. The archers talk to their old lord about recent events and plan to send Godric to the main building. But Godric didn't let them leave their posts. Since Leon didn't come back, he planned to take a walk first. A huge new barracks was built in White Deer Castle close to the city wall. Godric could see that there were still a small number of soldiers from the Bacchus Empire in these barracks that were originally supposed to be used to hold prisoners. He knew that Leong had defeated Lidius before and captured many people. But it seemed that most of the prisoners had been ransomed. Now the barracks is being renovated. A foreman said that Lord Leon will turn this place into a military camp. And there will be Nolder Elves living in it. Godric didn't have any ill feelings towards the Nolder Elves. After all, he knew that Leon had Resaderin under his command. He just thought it seemed a bit unbelievable. Was this place going to be converted into a Nolder military camp? This means that the Nolder regular army mentioned by the archers just now will serve Leon for a long time? And White Deer Castle seems to have been expanded again. But not because of the barracks. But because more people are doing business. This expansion did not cost any money. Nor was it to increase defense. It was just a comprehensive market formed automatically by small traders under the main castle hill of White Deer Castle. The area at the bottom of the mountain facing the city gate is one of the few spacious flat areas in White Deer Castle. In the past, there were only some shops and hotels. But not many people. But now the place is very lively. At first glance, there must be nearly a thousand people. And there are hundreds of vendors alone. Although the vendors are not large in scale, and most of them set up street stalls. This place where goods are gathered attracts many people from surrounding villages. Godric knew that the population of the entire county was only 10,000. But the number of people who came to the White Deer Castle market to shop was actually one-tenth. This ratio subverted his previous understanding. In fact, the wholesale market of Makes Yangling has overturned his perception. There are now dozens of stores in the wholesale market of Makes Yangling. This small place with a bad geographical location can actually exceed the overall shipment volume of many large companies. Town. This is because many merchants in Chungha Town will first send their goods to make the angling, and then resell them by companies under Maishiong International. As long as you become a supplier or agent of Maishiong International, you will not have to pay commercial tax at makes the angling. These merchants will naturally ship goods and makes the angling. Anyway, Chungha Express is here, and Chungha Town can also use water transportation. So the transportation cost is already very low. Of course, to become a partner of Maishiong International, you need to pay a deposit first. It is not yet known whether the deposit will be returned when you withdraw. Because no businessmen have withdrawn yet. After all, they can get tax exemption. And Maishiong International will bring them orders from other places. Of course, you have to pay rent to occupy Makes Yangling's warehouse. And the rent is not cheap. After all, there are many businessmen who need warehouses. These days, basically no one can understand this kind of platform operation. The only one who can get some knowledge is Amy, a good student who has followed Leon throughout the process. Nearly one-tenth of the people in Ayrshire go to White Deer Castle to sell souvenirs or shop every day. This is actually because people in the county have more channels for the circulation of goods. There are almost no markets in the countryside. If you want to sell souvenirs, you can only go to buy Lubo. After selling the souvenirs, you will have money. So you will naturally buy some things back. Dig out a valuable rare medicinal material from the mountain catch a good game, or get a piece of good leather. This is enough for people from the surrounding countryside to take a trip to White Deer Castle and spend a long time shopping in the market. The circulation of goods has accelerated, and there are more methods of cashing out. Naturally, more people will go to White Deer Castle every day. The vendors in Bailubo are not just sellers. They buy local specialties and sell them to the resident merchants at the Makesy Angling Wholesale Market. At the same time, they also purchase goods at the Makesy Angling Wholesale Market and return them to Bailubo. Sell. So they travel frequently between the two places. The merchants in Makesy Angling rely on Maishiong International, have more shipping channels, and can also carry out some processing and production. They can naturally sell the purchased local products. This allowed Bailubo and Makesy Angling to develop greater cargo export capabilities, and the continuous circulation of money also gradually changed the lives of people in the territory. In fact, the money in people's hands is still the same. And the money itself has not increased. However, as long as the flow of money speeds up and frequent back and forth in people's hands, it can make these people's lives better and their wealth increases in the process of operation. Money is not wealth. Materials and ideas are. This is actually the effect of the tax-free zone. 
It seems that not collecting taxes is a loss for the Lord. But in fact, it can gain more. The business logic is like this. Often the free ones make the most money. Godric watched all this with joy. He felt that it was a good thing that he went to work in Chang'e Town. Although he encountered a lot of troubles in Chang'e Town. Looking at the current prosperity of White Deer Castle, the troubles in Chang'e Town were nothing. Only the main building of White Deer Castle has remained unchanged. It still looks as simple as ever. There are still no maids inside. And the guards are still the same old acquaintances. Lord Godric, are you back? The knight guarding the main building stepped forward to greet his old lord. I didn't expect you to still be guarding here. Aren't both Leong and Amy going out? Godric was a little surprised to see that the knight was still doing his duty faithfully. After all, the lords in the castle were not here. So the guards were not lazy. Miss Amy has told me that no one can enter the main building. Mr. Leon has put a lot of valuable things in the building and the cellar. I can't afford to pay for them if they are lost. Oh, that cellar is the former prison. The one downstairs. The knight pointed to the prison entrance at the bottom of the main building, which was guarded by several soldiers. Oh, it seems that he made a lot of money again. What is it? Godric obviously wanted to see it. There should be some grain seeds in the cellar. They cannot see the light before planting. They are very well protected. Lord Leon has arranged for soldiers to patrol outside all the time. The knight pointed to the highest point of the building again. There are some things on the top floor. But Miss Amy doesn't allow anyone to go up to the top floor. And I don't know what's inside. Since the grain seeds cannot see the light. Forget it. I would like to take a look at the things on the top floor. Godric also knew that some grain seeds cannot be exposed to light when they are stored. They will germinate easily when exposed to light. If the germs die in the cellar, they will not be able to be planted next year. But the stuff on the top floor sounds like it's a real mess. Then I can't send you up. Sir, I can't go to the attic. Of course, the guard knight would not stop his real lord. But he also complied with Amy's request and seemed very disciplined. He was originally a member of Godric's bodyguard. And he couldn't join the bodyguard without the rules. Godric patted the knight's shoulder approvingly and went upstairs. Several rooms on the top floor were locked. But Godric found the key in the room where he used to work. The keys these days are big and long. And a child like Amy, who is afraid of trouble, will not carry them with her. One of the rooms on the top floor contained a lot of foul-smelling black pellets in large jars. Godric didn't know what it was. But out of an old warrior's intuition, he felt that it might have something to do with weapons. There are some iron sh. LS and small clay pots in another room. Some of the iron sh. LS have wooden handles, which look like drum hammers or short sticks. If this thing is used to knock people, is it too short? It's a little too light. Godric didn't understand. But the iron sh. LS and wooden handles were hollow. And they must have been unfinished. It seems like there's nothing mysterious about these things. Right? Amy actually didn't even want the swordsmanship practice room on the top floor and turned it into a warehouse. Godric thought there was a lot of treasure hidden there. In fact, Leong and Amy really couldn't find a suitable place. Black powder needs to be protected from moisture and cannot be hidden anywhere in the wild. Otherwise it will all be over in a few days. The same is because black powder is extremely susceptible to moisture. And the source of saltpeter is temporarily unguaranteed and cannot be wasted. So it is best not to directly package it into explosive bags or grenades. Because there is really no way to save it if it gets damp after being packaged. This thing cannot be dried. In order not to waste materials, it is best to assemble enough before use. In fact, the things in these rooms have not had time to be put into production. Because this is not a warehouse, but a laboratory. The raw materials are not kept here. The reason why it is placed on the top floor is to avoid moisture on the one hand. And on the other hand, if an accident occurs in the basement, it will be troublesome. The top floor must be safer after all. When the Lord returned to White Deer Castle, Godric had been waiting for two days. When Leon came back, since Amy didn't follow him back, the ban on entering the main building was never lifted, so no one could notify Godric. As a result, Leon saw this uncle lying on the bed in his room, reading the novel, The Centurion's Combat Career, under his pillow. Godric watched with great interest and didn't even notice that Leon was back. Uh-huh. Lord Godric. Long time no see. Leon stared awkwardly at the door for half a minute. But Godric was completely immersed in the ocean of knowledge, and didn't even notice that his lord could only say H, low. Huh? Ah. Oh. You're back. Godric stood up in a hurry. 
with a smile that was three quarters awkward and seven quarters stiff, which was basically the same as the expression on Liang's face now. Chapter 205 How Could the Rebellion Be So Smooth? Ahem. Amy didn't come back with you? Godric stuffed the scroll of books in his arms into his arms, put his arm around Liang's shoulders, and walked out the door. The Lord looked at Godric's chest with some pain. The book had slipped into Godric's noble robe. It seemed that he could not get it back. Amy is in the Bibli Gulf. Just in time. Lord Godric, I plan to make Amy a knight. Just like the original Countess Valera. The two of them talked all the way to the Lord's office room, where both Godric and Leon used to handle official business. But Godric did not sit in the Lord's armchair in front of the table. Instead, he pulled out the chair opposite the table and sat down on it. This was the guest chair, used for visiting guests. Leon looked at Godric's movements and was a little at a loss. In any case, Godric is the real lord of White Deer Castle. He took the guest seat. It would be very foolish for Leon to sit in the main seat. Leon, that's your place now. I know Amy wants to become a female knight, but I'm afraid she's not skilled enough to go on the battlefield. Don't let anything happen to her. I only have one daughter. Godric pointed to the main seat and motioned for Leon to sit down. He didn't seem to care about the position at all but directly talked about his daughter. Leon hesitated for a moment, but finally did not go over to sit down. Instead, he opened the drawer and took out a blank document. Amy now has 200 elite female warriors to protect her. Her troops are all very skilled and stronger than most lords. You don't have to worry. I plan to let her serve as the lord of Eagle Claw Castle. As for what she wants to be knight, as she wishes. Leon directly stamped three seals on the blank document one representing the Archon of Ayrshire, one being his own griffin seal, and the other being the three lion seal of Lord Godric of White Deer Castle. Apparently, the intention is for Amy to write the content herself. Lord of Talon Castle? Are you going to support Leofric this time? Godric was a little surprised. What on earth did you do? Oh, I got two counties. Leon spread out the map and took half an hour to finish telling what happened before. So, you got Eagle Claw Fort and Dark Falcon Fort but they are all enclaves. Your troops are too small, and you have to divide them up to garrison them. Godric clicked on the map a few times, then shook his head and looked at Leon worriedly. Actually, I don't need to send troops to garrison anymore. The Jata people in the southern part of the grassland have been defeated. There are no foreign enemies in Eagle Claw Castle now, and Dark Falcon Castle. Now all the forces around Dark Falcon Castle will woo me, and it is safer there. Leon shook his head not looking worried at all. But the king also gave you a task, asking you to take over Chung'a town, either to help him retrieve his seal, or to quickly hand over the money owed to him. How many dinars did he extort from you? Godric hesitated for a moment, but still told Leon the king's instructions. But he obviously felt that it was best for Leon to pay the money now. Oh, is there such a good thing? Can I use his seal to pay for it? When Leon heard this, not only was he not worried, but he was excited. This is good news. I had originally planned to capture Chang'e Town. It's really the best of both worlds. Wait a minute. Why is there such good news? You only have 200 men in your hands now. King Ulrich obviously wants you to fight Granlon to the detriment of both sides. I came back this time to discuss countermeasures with you. We cannot waste the troops of White Deer Castle in the Civil War. Godric looked at Leon with wide eyes. Did he feel that this boy had completely lost his temper after winning a few battles? dare to fight anywhere. White Deer Fort is related to the security of the border, and the garrison cannot be dispatched in large numbers. Lord Godric, I have no intention of leading the troops from White Deer Castle. My countermeasure is to lead my own troops to capture Lunga Town alone. In this case, the king will have to seal Lunga Town to me. Liang clicked on the map a few times. You should know that Chang'e Town has my Lunga Express, and I need to connect both Eagle Claw Fort and Dark Falcon Fort. As long as I can control Chang'e Town, I can use Chang'e Express once the potential is completely unleashed. These enclaves will no longer be enclaves, and each place will become a real territory. Godric frowned and looked at the map. Hearing Long River Express, he could now understand Liang's intention. If enclaves thousands of miles apart want to connect with each other, they definitely need a core hub. But according to common sense, no city in the Lion Realm can be connected to a place as far away as Dark Falcon Castle. But Chang'e Town is an exception, because Liang had arranged the Chang'e Express transport in Chang'e Town early in the morning. If it could ensure the safety of the convoy passing through the Jata grassland, 
Then the Chang'e Express Transport could connect and cover any place for him. For Liang. As long as he can control Chang'e Town. There is no enclave in this continent. Godric was rescued by Eric before. He already had a full understanding of the nature of the Long River Express. It was actually a rapid response force with extremely strong mobility. However, the ruling power of Long River Town had not been maintained before. With everything in the hands of others, the development of Chang'e Express will be somewhat restricted. If Chang'e Town becomes Liang's territory, then Chang'e Express may soon cover half of the continent like Maixiang International. You annihilated the Jata people in the southern part of the Jata grassland and also made the Crow King admit his mistake and seize the war. Such achievements are no less than those of Earl Odin. You will gain a huge reputation because of this. It is indeed impossible to become the Lord of Chang'e Town. There's a problem. Godric understood that Leon already had a lot of reputation. During this period, this boy had won several great victories in the north and south, and he had become a real famous general in the kingdom. Then you came back to recruit soldiers? Do you need to deploy some men from my guard? Godric knew that Leon had already decided, so he would not persuade her. Anyway, his daughter should indeed be quite safe in Eagle Claw Castle. He planned to allocate some of his guards to Leon. No. Sir, I'm not just here to recruit soldiers. I'm mainly here to wait for the war at Eagle Claw Castle to spread to the entire Lion Realm. In fact, it doesn't take too many people to capture Chang'e Town. Leon smiled. He was indeed waiting for his fame to spread throughout the Lion Realm. That is, waiting for the Lion Knights and the Royal Guards to return to their respective territories to repair. When your reputation spreads throughout the Lion Realm, the king will be jealous of you. Even if you capture Chang'e Town, he may not grant Chang'e Town to you. Godric sighed. He is different now than he was when he was young. Leon shook his head. Since the king has given me such a task, it means that he has been wary of me for a long time. In fact, he is also wary of you. Otherwise, he would just issue a warrant and it would be fine. There is no need for you to send me a message. But if nothing else happens, he will seal Chang'e Town to me. Or in other words, to the two of us. Godric was stunned. What do you mean? The two of us? As long as there is a conflict between us, he will definitely do this. Leong raised his eyebrows. Don't he like checks and balances? Godric nodded slowly. You are indeed better suited to consider these things than me. After the town of Chang'e is conquered, I plan to find a manor by the lake to retire and live a leisurely life. I will leave the rest to you. You and Amy. Then, he stood up and took out a flag from the cabinet. Give this to Amy. She is a member of the royal family and should use this. It was the fleur de he had used. Golden, representing the royal knights. A few days later, Chang'e Town. Leon led the team outside Chang'e Town. He only brought 300 people, 100 of whom were newly recruited soldiers. Godric actually came with the guards. But he did not approach Chang'e Town, but was prepared to respond a few miles away. Since the escorts of Chang'e Express are still inside, and Duke Brennus has withdrawn his troops, Leon is indeed confident of taking Chang'e Town even with just his own manpower. But Godric is a cautious person after all. Although Leon said there was no problem, Godric still planned to cooperate at close range just in case. Surprisingly, Chang'e Town did not close the city gate. Not only that, there seemed to be no tense atmosphere in Chang'e Town. Caravans and pedestrians were still coming in and out normally. And everything seemed normal. But this normality now seems very abnormal. Granlon violated the use of the king's seal and illegally occupied the king's direct jurisdiction. This was an unpardonable crime of treason. But Granlon didn't seal off the city to prepare for war? Moreover, when Liang's flag appeared outside Chang'e Town, several cavalrymen actually came out from the city to greet them. Is this Baron Leon? Lord Granlon is waiting for you. He is under the city gate. The leading heavy cavalryman was very polite. Leong didn't understand Granlon's intention. But since he didn't have to fight, he was of course willing to resolve it peacefully. Granlon was waiting at the gate of Chang'e Town at the moment. And he was not wearing armor. It seemed that he was not only unprepared for war, but also did not even plan to start any conflict. Baron Leon, nice to meet you. I heard about your record at Eagle Claw Castle. You are really young and promising. Seeing Leon coming, Grand Long actually took the initiative to greet him, as if he was not a rebel leader at all, but just an ordinary noble lord. Lord Grand Long, have you been waiting for me? But I think I need to remind you that you are now a rebel in the kingdom. Leon felt that this guy probably didn't understand his own identity. I am a rebel? Who said that? 
Baron Godric said that. It was just a misunderstanding. Grenlon shook his head and smiled. And pointed inside the city gate. If you don't believe me, ask him and see who is the traitor. In the city, several sure whose city heavy cavalry escorted out a young man whose mouth was tied with a cloth and his face was covered in blood. Fathered? Of course Leong knows this person. This is indeed fathered. Grandron took out a handkerchief and wiped father's bloody face. Lord Leon, you don't think that a noble like me who caught the leader of the rebels and took back the gold seal for the king is rebellious? Right. I have been waiting for his majesty the king to send someone to take over Chang'e town. And I am only stationed temporarily for the safety of Chang'e town. I'm afraid it's hard to win the trust of his majesty the king with your words. Leon frowned. And he understood what Granlon meant. He wanted to use father for his own legal identity and explain everything before as a misunderstanding. This is not rhetoric. But fact, Baron Leon, I have never done anything treasonous. In fact, I even led the troops to fight against the Ravens. I just had a personal grudge against father and committed suicide. He killed my wife and all of my father-in-law's children. Grandron looked sincere, like he was truly a loyal minister. It seems that you are targeting Shurhu City. Let's do this. Let your troops disarm and leave Chang'e town. And then hand over the king's gold seal. And I will believe you. Leong curled his lips. He felt that Grand Long was just trying to fool him. Baron Leong, I just don't want to conflict with you. You do have a distinguished record. But that doesn't mean I will be afraid of you. I said, I'm waiting for his majesty the king to send someone to take over Chang'e town. But I don't think that's right. It could be you. And I can only give the king's seal to the king himself. Grand Long raised his hand and pointed at the flag hanging in Chang'e town which was still the gold lion flag with a red background. Sorry, I am really sent by the king. Didn't you notice the color of my coat of arms? Grand Long? Leong shook his head and smiled. He understood what Grand Long meant. Grand Long planned to hold Chang'e town hostage to negotiate with the king. As long as the king is willing to publicly admit that he is not a traitor, he can completely hand over Chang'e town and return to Shurhu city. If Grand Long is still a legal noble, then he is likely to inherit Lion Lake City from his dead ex-wife Nelda. Because Fawcett has treason. And Alma's other children are all dead. And the Horton family is also attached. A rebellious traitor. As long as Granon is not rebellious. He can become the legal heir. After all, he did not admit his divorce from Nelda. And even held a funeral for his father-in-law. In addition, he controls the Shurhu City flag guard. And the people of Shurhu City will support him. Therefore, he must show an attitude of not admitting treason at all. And he has always been innocent of Chang'e Jinchio. Fawcett seemed to be unlucky. After he abandoned most of the infantry and ran out of Eagle Claw Fort, he was actually blocked by the Lion Lake City Flag Guard. It makes sense to think about it. Both Fathered and Granlon were familiar with the environment around Shurhu City. They probably went to the same, safe, place at the same time after leaving the battlefield. And then they bumped into each other. But Granron's plan will definitely come to nothing. The Lord knows that since King Ulrich arranged for him to destroy Granon, he definitely does not intend to let Granon go. And he has also dug a hole for himself. If he and Granon negotiation, then the authority of the rebel will inevitably be withdrawn. The rebels cannot compromise with the rebels. Then there is nothing to say. Baron Leon, I know you want to get the seal for the king. And you yourself have a lot of business in Chang'e town. If you don't want this place to turn into a sea of fire, and you don't want the king's seal to disappear forever. Then it's best to just go back and forth from where you came. I don't want to fight you. But if I have to die here, then Chang'e town will no longer exist. Grandron frowned, grabbed father's hair, and retreated into the city. But he didn't seem to be as calm as he said. The cloth strip that was originally tied to father's mouth from behind his head was loosened by his grasp. Spit. Ahem. He wouldn't dare. The Lion Lake City Flag Guard will not be buried with him. Leong. Charge. Catch him. Father was finally able to speak at this time. And asked Leong to charge as soon as he came. Grand Long's expression changed drastically. He blocked Father's mouth. And began to retreat quickly. Blow the trumpet. Charge the whole army. In fact, Leong also felt that Grand Long should not dare to set fire. And Eric was still in the city with 500 bodyguards. As long as his trumpet sounds. Eric will definitely cooperate inside and outside. Even if Granlon wants to set fire to the city, he may not be able to do it. Moreover, now that Granlon seems to be completely unprepared for war, 
it is indeed very possible for him to catch him. Even if you can't catch him, you can still shoot him to death. But Liang did not intend to shoot Grand Long directly. After all, the King's seal had not been found yet. It is estimated that only Grand Long knew where the seal was hidden. Therefore, Liang planned to catch him. But at the moment when Liang led his troops into Chang'e town, the city gate fell. The troops were cut off. And only Lion and his bodyguard, a hundred hooded Nolda rangers, entered the city. The mixed force behind him did not move so fast and was blocked from the city gate. At this time, Liang saw the smiles on the faces of Father and Grand Lan at the same time. Today, only the palace guards and security forces remain in the Lion City. And the Chicha Fortress is even more empty, with only a hundred old, weak, sick and disabled people guarding it. King Ulrich had previously sent out all his powerful troops. The Lion Knights, the Royal Guards, and the main garrison that originally guarded the capital area were all gone. But neither Fields Way nor the Bacchus Empire took the opportunity to attack the Lion Kingdom. In fact, it's not called not having it. It's called inability. King Vides of Fields Way originally deployed heavy troops in High Cliff Castle, obviously intending to take advantage of the situation. But a heretical force appeared strangely near Mist Cage City. As a result, Fields Way had to return to the army to deal with it first. Internal issues. That heretic army was the team of the three prophets. They were released from the swamp near Mystery Castle. And within a few days, they raised an army of more than 2,000 people in Fields Way. By the time Fields Way finally dispersed the army of the three prophets, news of Eagle Claw Castle in the northern part of the Lion Kingdom had spread. Duke Brennus and Baron Leon teamed up to annihilate the 5,000 Jats army. The Crow Kingdom admitted that it had inadvertently crossed the border and signed an armistice agreement. The Lion Kingdom seemed to have solved the crisis in the fastest way. So Fields Way, so he honestly continued to be the ally of the Lion Kingdom. The Bacchus Empire was too busy taking care of itself. The rebels within the empire are wreaking havoc. And there is a large-scale slave uprising within the empire. And the snake cult is also attacking towns everywhere. The entire hinterland of the Bacchus Empire was in flames of war. Fighting was taking place in almost every place. Even General Titus of Saba River Fort and General Creon of Karandir Fort were transferred to quell the rebellion. Even the border guards where the army was withdrawn to suppress the rebellion. And the situation was indeed extremely tense. The source of all this is that King Ulrich supplied a large amount of dinars to the rebel leader of the Bacchus Empire. Sheila Yuzas. Chapter 206 The Price of Reform. Sheila Yuzath is probably one of the few generals to have served in both the Legion of Shadows and the Legion of the Immortals. He was originally the deputy general of the Shadow Army. After Emperor Marius established the Legion of Immortals, he served as the deputy general of the Legion of Immortals. He was the first intermediary between Emperor Marius and the Legion of Shadows. Marius once trusted him. In fact, the general Agathon was only the successor of Sheila. Unlike Agathon, Shira Yuzath is actually a native of southern Pindar. But his family defected to the empire when General OSA established New Bacchus. It was a military family of Bacchus. So Sheila was also from a famous family and was regarded as a member of the Bacchus people. Therefore, Sheila has always called herself a Bacchus, even though his ancestors do not have any blood of Bacchus. But he still insists so. His family has always kept a large number of slaves. And during his tenure, he continued to kill enemies to gain trophies and slaves. It seemed that his thirst for wealth would never end. This kind of behavior is actually quite normal in Bacchus and it is not a big problem. At least it is not like Lydius who bullies men, dominates women and harms civilians. And having a greed for money is a good thing for the emperor. It is precisely because he is from Pindar and is a noble of the Bacchus Empire that Marius gave him such an important task. Both the Shadow Army and the Immortal Army will consider Sheila to be one of their own. And such a person can actually help alleviate the problem. The antagonistic relationship between the two nations. And Sheila did serve the empire conscientiously in the first half of her life whether facing the Principality of Dexia or the Kingdom of Lysher. He killed countless enemies during his 20-year military career and made great achievements for the Empire. Although he serves as a lieutenant most of the time and is therefore not famous abroad. As the lieutenant of the two core legions, he is undoubtedly one of the most important commanders in the Empire. And within the Empire, everyone knows that he is a real warrior of the Empire and the most skilled general in Bacchus. Probably the only flaw is that he is too greedy for money. He is extremely ruthless in order to plunder loot, and sometimes causes massacres in enemy countries. However, treating the enemy as an enemy 
and taking trophies from the enemy is not a shortcoming of a general. Originally, he could retire as a top general and leave his portrait forever in the palace corridor of the Bacchus Empire. But no one expected that he would suddenly lead an army to rebel after Emperor Marius vigorously promoted the reform policy. It wasn't until he launched the rebellion that everyone knew that the massacre Sheila had carried out before were probably not due to seeing the enemy as a bandit. Simply because he is cruel and murderous. And his so-called greed for money and constant acquisition of trophies are just a byproduct of the killing he loves. Yes, Sheila is not greedy for money. He keeps making money not for his own enjoyment but to gain the recognition of the Shadow Army and launch his big plan to return to the OSA era. Silas Uses did not support the reforms of Emperor Marius. In other words, he was extremely opposed to Marius' reforms. It stands to reason that as a native of Pindor, most people would support Marius' reforms. But Shira Uses is different. He insists that he is a member of the Bacchus Nation. This probably means that you can't stand up after kneeling for a long time. It's similar to some people who still have pigtails in their thinking. They always feel that foreigners are superior to others. And Marius's reforms, in the view of Shira uses, were a betrayal of the Bacchus. In other words, it was a betrayal of a local military family like his. It took his family more than a hundred years to abandon Pinder's relatives, endure the name of traitor, endure the oppression and ridicule of the Bacchus, and pay countless prices before finally allowing the Bacchus to take him away. Regarded as similar, from the Pinder to the Bacchus, he was finally accepted by the Bacchus in his generation, entered the Shadow Army, and became a general through his hard work in the first half of his life. At this time, the Yuzas family finally became a master and a member of the highest class. But the first reform of Emperor Marius was to treat the Pend and Bacchus equally. There will be no more masters from now on. Sheila Yuzas felt that this was equivalent to turning half of his life's efforts and the humiliation and sacrifice his family had endured for hundreds of years into a joke. He cannot accept such a policy. He believed that under the reforms of Emperor Marius, the empire had gone off track. In Sheila's view, Emperor Marius was not worthy of sitting on the throne of the empire, and he would overthrow the false Emperor Marius, lead the empire to correct chaos, and return to the OSA era. As a result, Shira Yuzas broke away from the Bacchus Empire and became an independent armed force. He distributed most of the money and slaves to his cronies, who had been installed in the imperial army for many years and used the method of General OSA to get many officers to support him. He said that he would implement civil equality laws, and that he would be based on military rank, the level of military law. However, his so-called military law of returning to the OSA era is not very complete, because there are no people in his structure. He planned to have everything managed by a military system and build a pyramid with a military system. Slaves, Pender soldiers, Bacchus soldiers, Pender officers, Bacchus officers, generals. The Bacchus are on top of the Penders, and the generals are on top of the pyramid. Permissions are determined by class, and there is no other means of governance. Soldiers and below are slaves. Without a structure like the civilian class, it is not even a warlord government. It is far behind the empire established by OSA. In Sheila's logic, starting from the soldiers, the upper class can own everything in their territory, and the official rank can be hereditary. This is probably a suture monster that combines warlord thinking, feudal logic, and nationalism. It may not seem like a big problem, but if it were really implemented, I'm afraid it would be no different from the Jata people. Oh, there is a slight difference. The Jata people actually do not think that their nation is nobler than other nations. But Sheila, a native of Pendor, insists that the Bacchus nation is inherently superior to other nations. However, there is indeed a market for Sheila uses as devil's logic in Bacchus. Restricted by Bacchus's strict military regulations, legionnaires could only receive less pay during their service. And they had to serve for 16 years. After the service period, even if they had great merit, they could only become tribunes or something like that. Officials cannot become hereditary nobles, especially the soldiers of the Immortal Legion. Although they were nominally the Emperor's personal soldiers, they could not get any extra benefits from Emperor Marius. After all, Emperor Marius would strictly implement his own reform policies. Therefore, many imperial soldiers, especially some elite and mid-level officers who have served for many years, do have illusions about Sheila uses as logic. Those who came out of the common people due to policy reasons got opportunities that they would never have had in their lives. However, after they turned over, they were actually more eager to become oppressors than the traditional aristocrats, and they were more greedy. 
Human nature has been like this since ancient times. The traditional nobles, that is, the people of the Shadow Legion, feel that Sheila's idea is actually in line with their original traditions, especially those Shadow Centurions who suffered losses due to the military reform. Therefore, when Sheila announced her separation from the Bacchus Empire, there were indeed many people following him, and basically all of them were veterans or officers who had served for many years. But in fact, Sheila uses did not raise the flag of rebellion at the beginning. Maybe he was not good at governing the country, but he was definitely not a fool. He knew that direct rebellion would definitely be a dead end. He just declared that he would retire with the veterans and become a free man from the empire. Emperor Marius initially did not regard them as rebels, but only allowed them to secede from their nationality and expel them from Bacchus. After all, these soldiers have made many military exploits for the country, and they did not cause chaos in the country at that time. They just did not want to be citizens of the empire anymore, and there was no reason to directly exterminate them. Marius was implementing reforms at the time, and if he went to war because of this, the conservatives would criticize him for it. As a result, this hidden danger gradually grew into a cancer, incited by the Senate of the Bacchus Empire. Augustus, a rebel leader who had been lurking in the empire, approached Sheila Uses. In fact, Augustus was the emperor elected by the Senate of the Bacchus Empire 20 years ago. But in the end Marius used some little tricks to make the Senate change its mind. And Augustus became a traitor. Military. Augustus himself was a politician and did not have strong leadership abilities so he could only hide in hiding. But Sheila Yuzas was a battle-hardened general. As a result, the two sides united and began their journey. Augustus defected to Sheila Yuzas. They planned to join forces to capture Siyuan City, change the day in one fell swoop, and implement Sheila's warlord ideal. But the situation was not very good at first, because the one who was ordered to destroy them was Marshal Kairos, who had experienced hundreds of battles. The rebels were chased everywhere, and did not dare to fight a frontal war, let alone conquer. However, Sheila Yuzas was lucky. Not long ago, he unexpectedly received a large amount of funding from the Lion Kingdom, including countless dinars, food, and a large amount of equipment. As a result, many outsiders who were still waiting on the sidelines defected to the rebel army after Sheila spent a large amount of dinars. These included hundreds of centurions from the Shadow Legion. These people lost the authority to lead peasant soldiers under Marius's new deal. It also includes the 600 Immortals Emperor Marius spent great efforts to build the Immortal Legion. Nearly one-third of the people have joined his command. There are even 300 Imperial Knights. After Emperor Marius implemented the reforms, they were just cavalry in the First Legion of the Empire and were not considered real noble knights. This rebel army quickly formed a large scale. And in addition, it was a rebellion on the battlefield. Shira Yuzu's ability to command operations is indeed very strong. He led the rebels and caught Kairos off guard. Kairos did not expect that his shadow centurions would suddenly switch sides. Thanks to this accidental funding from the Lion Kingdom, the rebels achieved several incredible victories in a row, and even reached a position less than 30 miles away from Siyuan City. In fact, even if Sheila uses his rebels achieved a temporary victory, it was still not enough to damage the empire. King Ulrich provided him with money and food just to prevent the Bacchus Empire from launching an attack while taking advantage of the civil strife in the Lion Kingdom. However, this rebellion caused a huge storm in Bacchus, while Sheila uses his rebels launched a massive attack. In the royal arena of Siyuan City, a group of gladiators took advantage of the rebel attack to launch a slave uprising, while most of the Siyuan City defenders were busy guarding and fighting the rebellion. The gladiators broke their shackles and rushed out of the city. The royal arena in Siyuan City is the highest level slave arena in Bacchus. Naturally, all those who can participate in the competition here are highly skilled fighters. When these gladiators are freed, the fighting power they display is quite terrifying. This gladiator team conquered seven or eight villages and towns in just half a month. From Siyuan City to Boji City, the gladiators continue to liberate various slaves in Bacchus, continue to grow their own team, and eventually form a terrifying scale of nearly 10,000 people under the city of Bashi, although they lacked food and clothing, and most of them had no reliable equipment. Their numbers alone were enough to make all the lords of the entire empire helpless. The reputation of this slave rebel army led by gladiators even spread to the Lion Realm in a short period of time. At the same time, due to large-scale riots by rebels and slave rebels, snake worshippers in Bacchus also began to cause chaos. The entire southeastern part of the Bacchus Empire was filled with snake cult troops, and countless villages were destroyed. 
because Governor Kairos was leading his troops to exterminate the rebels outside and was unable to return to resist. Emperor Lin Gang was attacked by a large number of snake worshippers. Most of the surrounding lords fled, and there were also many high-ranking officials and dignitaries who were forced to adhere to the snake worship cult. D. Lin Gang is now crumbling. It is said that civilians and serfs spontaneously organized troops to resist with difficulty. As a hub town between the three core cities of Siyuan City, Wuji City, and Dailingang, Malisburg has even been captured by the snake worship cult. Almost the entire Bacchus Empire was in flames of war, and there was no normal communication between several major cities. In this case, there is no need to talk about dealing with the Lion Kingdom. Self-protection of the Bacchus Empire is a problem. Siyuan City Emperor Marius stood in front of the map in full military uniform. This is the palace hall. But the current layout is more like a military headquarters. Where is Karos now? There's no reason why he can't send back the news. Right. Shira uses his rebels haven't completely defeated him yet. Emperor Marius looked at the map and asked General Agathon beside him without turning his head. When I received your order, Marshal Karos was in Finrad village with the main force of the Shadow Army. Your Majesty. Marshal Karos probably did not dare to send you a detailed military report. There are many traitors in the Shadow Army. Sheila Yuzas always knows the movements of the Imperial Army in advance. General Agathon frowned tightly, looking much more anxious than Emperor Marius. Alas, not only have traitors emerged from the Shadow Army, but there have also been many traitors from the Immortal Army. The number of immortals who have joined the rebellion far exceeds my imagination. Emperor Marius spoke a little helplessly but did not show any frustration. Agathon, the situation is urgent now. You must immediately recover Malisburg, which is between Siu and City, Dillon Port and Boji City. The key point cannot be lost. Malisburg is located between the three core cities of the Bacchus Empire and is indeed an extremely important connecting hub. Emperor Marius's eyes have also been wandering around Malisburg on the map. But, your majesty, Fort Olega has fallen. The rebels and the snake cult heretics may attack Siu and City from both sides. If I lead the army to leave at this time. You? Agathon looked quite worried. I believe Kairos will kill the rebels. As for the snake cult in Olega Fort, I have recalled the Sawe prostitutes and the terracotta warriors. Emperor Marius pointed to the location of God's port on the map. The snake worshippers who caused the rebellion this time are not simple believers. They have strict organization and military order and have formed a real army. This is not just within the empire. Snake worshippers, their army actually came from the sea, from the Amara continent. Agathon's eyes widened. Your majesty, if this is the case, I'm afraid D. Lin Yang, because we have lost contact with Dillon Port, you must control the surrounding area of Malisburg and ensure the safety of Dillon Port. I will personally go to battle here in Siyuan City. Emperor Marius nodded and patted Agathon on the shoulder. You go now. Don't worry about Siyuan City. As you command? Agathon took the order and left. He had confidence in the judgment of Emperor Marius. Marius looked at the map again, then turned around and poured a glass of wine from a metal wine cup on the table. Is there any problem with justice? We are currently unable to contact Bozier City. But if nothing else happens, my father should be able to convince those slave rebels. But if they are all recruited, Bozier City may not have enough food. A young girl came out from behind the side screen. Your Majesty, why don't you let Brutus lead the gladiators to deal with the rebels of Sheila uses? Isn't that what you originally wanted? This girl looks quite young, but very calm and bookish. Luciana, I didn't expect that Sheila uses could persuade so many troops to rebel. I knew that many centurions of the Shadow Legion might rebel. But I really didn't expect that even my Legion of Immortals would have so many. The elite surrendered to him. Now that the rebels are too close, I can no longer send officers to guide the rebels. The slave army Brutus has raised is too large. It may not be easy to drive them smoothly now. It is better to recruit security quickly to avoid even bigger trouble. The Emperor Marius was quite patient with the young girl and treated her as if he were a friend, just as he had treated Justice, if not more so. Your Majesty, my name is Alina now. In fact, those gladiators have been quite cooperative and Brutus is still their leader. I think I can let him try. The girl corrected the way Emperor Marius addressed her. It seemed that he did not regard Marius as an emperor at all, but more like a close elder. Alina, child, you have never really dealt with gladiators. They will only obey those who can beat them in combat. I'm afraid it will be difficult for Brutus to make all of them completely obedient. Marius shook his head and changed his name. 
explaining it like an elder teaching a child. The only option is to recruit people in advance. I still didn't think carefully enough, Alina said and sighed. The current chaos in the Empire can be said to be caused by me. I'm sorry, Your Majesty. I didn't expect this situation. Alina, this is not your fault. There is nothing wrong with your plan. Using Sheila uses as rebels to drive the gladiators to launch a slave uprising was a good plan that could promote the reform of the slavery system in one fell swoop. But no one expected that the snake-worshipping church in Unlock Continent would suddenly embark on an expedition across the sea. Emperor Marius drank the wine in his glass in one gulp inside. I hope there won't be any bad news from the north. The kingdom of the lion is too busy to take care of itself. However, your majesty... The Nolder Elves seem to be cooperating with Baron Leon of the Kingdom of the Lion. The Viper troops lurking there have sent back news that there are Nolder Elves following Leon and Leon. The Jada people fight. Alina lowered her head and looked at the booklet she held in her hand. Huh? This is probably good news. At least that guy won't come to cause trouble. That Leon can control the Nolder Elves. It seems to be very unusual. By the way, Alina, I heard that that guy Baron Leon is not married yet. Emperor Marius looked back at Alina, and suddenly his eyes lit up. I am only interested in a hero that Madigan once predicted. Your Majesty. Alina shook her head expressionlessly. This is your excuse. You have been using this excuse since you were 16. How many times have you said it now? You can't stay unmarried. Alina, you will be 20 next month. Emperor Marius also shook his head and smiled. Or do you plan to always serve as an intelligence officer here? Justice will definitely complain about me. Dot your law restricts the minimum age for women to get married to 28. Your Majesty. Besides, it's not that I don't want to get married. Those men don't dare to propose to me. What can I do Dot instead of worrying about my marriage? Yen, you might as well worry about the situation in the country. Alina pouted and retreated behind the screen. Huh? You can't be pessimistic at any time. As long as Agathon clears away the enemies near Malisburg, everything will be solved. Titus has also contacted the Ashborn. Alina, this is a mess. It's not a bad thing. The Empire will eliminate all Shinkes in one fell swoop. Bacchus will be reborn from the ashes and will become extremely powerful. Emperor Marius poured himself another glass of wine, drank it in one gulp, then picked up his sword and left the hall. A bright red liquid slowly flowed from the metal wine glass, which looked like blood. Chapter 207 Empire Rebirth Plan Even the Emperor himself had to personally go to war to defend Siyuan City. The situation in the Bacchus Empire was certainly not as lighthearted as Emperor Marius had shown. But Marius remained calm and composed. And he even had time to consider Alina's marriage. This is probably the state of mind and confidence that an emperor should have. He believes that as long as he doesn't mess up, everything can be solved. And everything has two sides. And breaking and then building is not necessarily a bad thing. Besides, many things were originally expected. For example, the gladiators in Siyuan City would take advantage of the chaos to revolt. This was not an accident. This slave uprising led by gladiators was originally what Marius meant. But this plan was the work of Alina. The gladiator who led the rebellion was named Brutus. He was once an officer of the Immortal Legion under Emperor Marius. He had made many military exploits and became a small lord of Granmel village north of Siyuan City. Brutus's sister was named Elena. Elena met Luciana, now Alina, at a party organized by Justice and she became Luciana's only friend. Elena is the only girl of her generation that Luciana has ever met who is willing to listen to her tell the official history rather than follow what others say. It may be due to fate. The two of them also look very similar. So they have a pretty good relationship. Luciana now changed her name to Elena, which is also related to Elena. The brothers Brutus and Elena were in big trouble some time ago. Of course, it should be said that the trouble came to them. Brutus has refused bribes from the Senate many times and Elena just rejected the proposal of a senator on this year's Goddess Day. Brutus is a new generation of lords, who emerged from the reforms of Emperor Marius. It is impossible for a staunch reformist to defect to the conservative faction. Elena will never marry a politician who is old enough to be her father, no matter how high the other party's status is. And this firm refusal had retaliatory consequences. Due to the rebellion of Sheila uses as rebels, Brutus, as a lord, of course had to lead troops to fight against it. However, not long after he led his troops to leave Granmel village, the entire village was deemed to be a den of snake worshippers. All the villagers, including Elena, are accused of being snake worshippers. 
and they will be reduced to slaves. This is of course an unjust case. And the cause of the unjust case is easy to understand. Once Elena becomes a slave, the former member of the Senate can naturally do whatever he wants. Elena was kidnapped by him. Of course Brutus would not give up. After all, no brother could bear this kind of thing. He withdrew his troops and led his troops to directly kill nearly 200 members of the senator's family and rescued Elena. In anger, Brutus couldn't hold back. And he couldn't hold back in order to save people. He did kill a lot more people. And there must be some innocent people who died in his hands. But in order to save my sister, there was nothing I could do. In any case, this matter is indeed too big. No matter what the reason is, it is ultimately serious in nature. In addition, they were members of the Senate. If nothing else happened, all the conservative nobles would want the lives of Brutus's family and his soldiers. So Brutus claimed that Elena had been killed and asked his soldiers to flee quietly with Elena while he went to the royal court of Siyuan City to surrender and bear all the charges. He knew that under the nose of Emperor Marius the chief judge would be more fair. And since he is a member of the Immortal Legion, he might be given a chance. The royal court of Siyuan City was indeed fair. After all, everything happened for a reason and Brutus had made military exploits for the empire. They only sentenced Brutus to slavery, and did not sentence him to death. And it also gave Brutus the easiest way to regain his freedom, and become a warrior again, allowing him to become a slave gladiator in the royal arena of Siyuan City. This result is not bad. After all, he killed a whole family. In fact, most members of the Senate felt that the sentence was too light. But Elena didn't want her brother to die in the arena. So she approached Luciana, hoping that Luciana could help and see if she could find a way to rescue Brutus. Luciana, now Alina, was the daughter of justice. Since the matter involved the Senate and the Supreme Court had already made a decision, Governor Justice originally did not want to intervene. But Luciana thought this was a good opportunity. An opportunity to completely solve the internal problems of the Bacchus Empire. Justice himself was the biggest assistant in promoting the reforms of Emperor Marius and the initiator of most reform policies. Of course, he also knew the two biggest internal difficulties that Emperor Marius faced in his reforms. One is the rebellious conservative faction of the old aristocracy, which holds more than half of the country's wealth and military. They just want to live a comfortable life with their vested interests. Even those among the old guard who are willing to safeguard national interests are, at most, just as strict about their private ethics as Governor Kairos. Another difficulty is the deep-rooted slavery tradition in the Bacchus Empire. It was the slavery system that caused the centuries-old ethnic conflict between the Bacchus and the Ponde. It also gave the empire's biggest foreign enemy, the snake cult, the best soil for expansion. Unlike other countries, the slavery system of the Bacchus empire has been deeply ingrained in the bones of almost every Bacchus. The Lion Kingdom and Crow Kingdom also have slaves, but they are basically indentured servants. That is, they are sold into slavery and can be redeemed. This should actually be called servants or servants. In fact, Close and the others were originally Liang's indentured servants. However, the master cannot execute such servants at will, and will also pay some salary, which is subject to the contract. Farming in most of the kingdom's aristocratic territories is done by letting commoners who have lost their land rank crops as tenants, which is also a contractual cooperation method. In other words, slaves and tenant farmers in countries such as Lion and Crow, including Fields Way, are essentially employment relationships, at least based on treating the other party as an equal person. There is a binding contract between both parties, but the Bacchus Empire was different. The slaves of the Bacchus Empire were purely tools that had lost their personal freedom and performed unpaid labor, and could not even be called human beings. Most of Bacchus nobles used serfs to cultivate their fields, and they were not sold as slaves, but were forced into slavery, that is to say, unpaid labor for life and it will continue to be the case for the next generation. All descendants have to be slaves, without a contract, and cannot redeem themselves. This is the real bottom of society, without any human rights. Even eating depends on rewards, and life is worse than that of pigs and dogs. Currently, nearly one-third of the people in the Bacchus Empire are still such slaves, and they are basically natives of Pender. In fact, Emperor Marius had abolished the civil equality law 20 years ago, and the new citizenship law also stipulated that everyone has equal citizenship rights. But 20 years is indeed too short. And people's ideas have not changed yet. Besides, there are policies from above. And countermeasures from below. 
The emperor said that the Bacchus and the Ponde people are equal citizens. So okay. Citizens are citizens. And they must respect his majesty the emperor. However, criminals and heretics can't be equal citizens. Right? In addition, Emperor Marius also issued a decree to crack down on the snake cult. Anyone who defected to the snake cult was considered a slave. This was allowed by the policy. As a result, numerous snake worshippers appeared in Bacchus. Anyway, as long as the noble lord or the tribune says that this person is a snake worshipper, then this person will most likely become a slave. There are definitely many more unjust, false and wrongful convictions than there are real snake worshippers. But no one will take the risk to overturn the conviction of a slave who is identified as a snake worshipper. The result is that, much like a hundred years ago, the Bacchus, who own the land and power, can still force the pen into slavery. And the current nature may be even more cruel. They are directly labeled as snake worshippers. They have completely lost all hope of turning over. They can't even flee abroad and carry the identity of snake worshippers. Fleeing to other countries is also considered heresy. Will be burned to death. This resulted in many people who did not originally believe in the snake cult. But because they became slaves, they simply joined the snake cult to fight against the empire. Of course, the slaves were not completely hopeless. Emperor Marius's military reform included a provision that allowed gladiators to join the imperial legions after completing a certain number of battles. As long as the period of service expires, they can become free men if they perform meritorious services. There are also opportunities for promotion and wealth. Therefore, a large number of slaves who did not want to join the snake cult became gladiators, hoping to regain their freedom through slave gladiatorial combat. Gradually, Bacchus's slave gladiatorial competition became very influential, and Emperor Marius and his reform policies were regarded by the slaves as the only hope. But, but, most of the people who control the gladiator arenas and gladiator training camps are traditional and conservative high-ranking officials who want to safeguard their interests. Only a very small number of people can actually leave the arena and join the legion. It is difficult for the gladiators to live until the day they are free. Because, although there was nothing wrong with Marius' policies, there was something wrong with the people who implemented them. Regarding the reform policy of slave gladiators, in just a dozen years, slave traders and various gladiator training camps have played new tricks. Originally, slaves who were sold to the gladiatorial arena would be registered for the number of battles they participated in. After reaching a certain number of battles, if the gladiator was alive, he would join the various legions of the Bacchus Empire and become warriors. This was a mandatory restraint policy promulgated by Emperor Marius in order to select outstanding soldiers from the gladiators. And it was also equivalent to training soldiers through the gladiatorial arena. To this end, each legion will also settle certain training funds to the gladiator training camps and gladiatorial arenas to subsidize the cost of the training camps. The gladiator training camps also spend money to buy these slaves. Originally, if this policy was properly implemented, everyone would benefit steadily. But in order to make those gladiators with the best skills become long-term cash cows and for greater profits, slave traders, gladiator training camps, and gladiator ring owners began to cooperate closely and began to continuously tamper with the files of gladiators. So in recent years, most gladiators have gradually lost their names, leaving only code names. After playing the prescribed number of games in one arena, the code name will be changed and transferred to another arena. This is probably the earliest transfer transaction between clubs. If the gladiators do not cooperate with the transfer, then the final battle may be an extremely unfair brawl, or even a battle with a lion or a tiger. Anyway, the uncooperative gladiators will most likely die in the last battle and earn enough profits for the bosses with a completely unfair fight. There are many Bacchus nobles who like to watch the battles with fewer enemies or between humans and beasts. This unfair battle seems fierce and exciting. The bloodier the scene, the more eye-catching it was. The bosses made more money, and the influence of slave gladiatorial games further increased. If the gladiators are willing to cooperate with the transfer, then at least they will face relatively fair battles most of the time and can survive for a while relying on their own fighting power. In this case, it is obvious what kind of mentality the gladiators will have. They are all warriors fighting for survival between life and death. What will they do when they see no real hope at all? Those serfs did not have the courage to resist. So they could only join the snake cult to seek the power of the evil god. But gladiators will not worship evil gods. These warriors will rely on their own strength. Luciana sees this, and she hatches a big plan. 
She planned to let Brutus lead the gladiators to rebel. And then, with the cooperation of Governor Justice, launch a large-scale slave rebellion, and use this rebellion to make all the Bacchus understand that the slave system must change. Then let this rebel army deal with the snake cult and wash away the rebel army's charges of rebellion. Finally, the Empire promulgated policies to abolish slavery, fully implement the indentured employment system, and incorporate the slave rebel army. Brutus, who had done great service for His Majesty the Emperor, would naturally be able to clear his name and become a lord again, and maybe even become the commander of the Legion. However, Governor Justice felt that this plan was too risky and difficult to control if something went wrong. So he did not agree to his daughter's plan. As a result, Luciana secretly ran to see you in city and directly told Emperor Marius the plan. Justice and Emperor Marius were close friends. Marius could be said to have watched Luciana grow up. He was even Luciana's godfather. He was just her godfather. Before he became emperor, Marius had Justice Dukes as an old friend. And Luciana happened to be born on the same day that Marius ascended the throne. So Marius regarded her as his biological daughter. Therefore, Marius knew Luciana. This girl has been a famous child prodigy in the city of knowledge since she was a child. She could read Bacchus' narrative poems at the age of three. Under the age of six, he could translate seven ancient poems from the Nolder literature. This is an incredible ability. And of course, this is also because her father Justice is indeed very knowledgeable. Since she was 12 years old, she has become the largest customer of the candle merchant in Bosch City. Luciana orders candles every year, which is enough to feed an ordinary family for seven years. She always sits there alone and studies endless ancient scrolls and manuscripts. The candles burned all night. Even Justice and Marius were not sure whether she had slept at all. Anyway, she must have slept very little. She liked to spend her nights taking notes on ancient manuscripts. And she had been studying Madigan's prophecy. Luciana will soon be 20 years old. There are very few aristocratic girls in this era who are still unmarried at this age. But she is still single because all the men in the empire are afraid of making a fool of themselves in front of her. And no one even dares to date her. The knowledge she possesses is indeed not on the same level as most young people. Emperor Marius even felt that her talent and learning had surpassed justices. But she just had no political experience. The plan that such a girl dared to propose to the emperor was actually very feasible and in line with Marius' temper. Therefore, Emperor Marius and Luciana perfected this plan together. The overall plan was similar to Luciana's design, but it was related to some specific actual situations. While Sheila uses as rebels are in rebellion, let Brutus, a trustworthy immortal, be the leader and lead a slave uprising from within CU and city. This will allow everyone to see that the slave system must be changed. Then, let the rebels first kill the conservatives, who are the least cooperative and the most violent. Or let these conservatives, who do not support the reform, annihilate the rebels. Luciana will deliver first-hand information to the rebels, and whoever goes to suppress them will die. After no one dared to annihilate the rebels, they allowed the rebels to cooperate with Marshal Kairos and wipe out the rebels of Sheila Uses in one fell swoop. The rebels of Sheila Uses rebelled in order to establish a deeper slavery system. They and the slave rebels are natural enemies. After this, Marius announced a comprehensive transformation from the slavery system to the indentured employment system, which would fundamentally inhibit the development of snake worship. Finally, Marius personally led the rebel army to deal with the snake cult, and then incorporated this rebel army that had been tempered in the battle, adding a powerful legion to the empire that supported reform. This is a method that can achieve multiple goals, and may even make the entire Bacchus Empire reborn. This plan was also named the Empire Rebirth Plan by Marius. So Luciana changed her name to Elena and served as the intelligence officer of Emperor Marius. She and Elena acted as liaisons with Brutus, both openly and secretly, and began to implement the plan. This talented woman was so famous that if she didn't change her name, everyone would know that Marius and Justice were causing trouble, and maybe the gladiators wouldn't be willing to believe her, and it would be very reasonable to change the name, Elena, to Elena. There is only one letter difference between the names. They look like two sisters. Everyone will think that she is also Brutus' sister. Brutus was a very capable warrior. With the cooperation and remote control of Emperor Marius, he successfully launched a gladiator uprising and led a large slave rebel army. However, the plan could not keep up with the changes. This originally good plan for the rebirth of the empire was met with a cross-sea invasion of the snake-worship cult. It was indeed an accident. Emperor Marius and Alina both thought 
that the snake worshippers in the country might take the opportunity to cause trouble and make corresponding arrangements in advance. But no one expected that the snake worshippers who caused trouble this time were not just from the Bacchus Empire, but most of them came from the snake worshippers' headquarters in the Amara continent. The descendants of the conqueror now faced the invasion of another, more evil conqueror. At the same time, no one expected that Sheila uses as rebels would suddenly receive a massive amount of money, food and materials, and their strength would increase greatly. Emperor Marius' arrangements were also disrupted. According to the original plan, after the rebels killed the stubborn conservatives and liberated a large number of slaves and established their reputation, Brutus should be allowed to lead the rebels to cooperate with Kairos and eliminate Sheila uses as rebels in one fell swoop. Then Marius would grant amnesty to the rebels for their great work in eliminating the rebellion and abolish the slavery system. This seemed reasonable and reasonable, and no one would object. Anyone who dares to disobey can attack the rebels. By the way, Kairos, the conservative military leader, will understand that sticking to the old system will only lead to wave after wave of uprisings. But there must be a high-level commitment to this matter, and some loyal troops must be said to guide the rebels. Otherwise a group of ragtag groups may fight Kairos. Originally, Marius planned to personally take care of this matter. But due to the sudden increase in strength that Sheila uses as rebels, they not only defeated Kairos, but also advanced to a position only 30 miles away from Siyuan City. The snake-worshipping cult army coming across the sea from the south has also approached Siyuan City. Under such circumstances, Marius really could not leave Siyuan City. This also caused Marius and Elena to temporarily lose contact with Brutus and Elena some time ago. As a result, the rebel army got a little out of control, grew in size, and headed straight for the city of Bashi, and besieged Bashi City. At the same time, Marshal Karos's rebel army cannot be contacted at all now. They only know that the last place they appeared was Finrad Village. This was when Agathean was recalled, and Agathean met him halfway. Marius realized that it would be difficult for Brutus alone to fully control an army of tens of thousands under the current circumstances. And the plan had to change. Because this thing is inherently risky. And if something goes wrong, it may turn from a rebirth plan into a rebirth plan. Therefore, Brutus cannot be asked to lead the troops to eliminate the rebellion now. He can only be asked to cooperate with Governor Justice to see if he can recruit troops on the spot in Boise City. In addition, the southeastern region has been heavily invaded by the snake worship cult. Malisburg has been captured. And all news from the east has been cut off. Once Emperor's Port falls, the snake cult will continue to land from Emperor's Port just like how General OSA invaded Pender. Therefore, Emperor Marius recalled Agathon from Layla Fortress and asked Agatha to return his army to regain Malisburg and rescue Emperor Lin Gang. Abandoning Layla Fortress is of course very risky, which means that the capital see you in city which is facing enemies on both sides, will no longer have reinforcements. At the same time, General Titus of Sava River Fort had been recalled a few days ago, and Emperor Marius asked him to contact the Ashbourne Empire to jointly fight against the Snake Cult. The Ashbourne Empire was a country re-established on the ruins of the old Bacchus Empire by those who did not want to succumb to the Snake Cult in the Amara continent. But Marius did not ask General Titus to ask for help. Instead, he asked Titus to take the battleship directly across the sea to the Unlock Continent to join forces with the Ashbourne Empire to destroy the Snake Worshippers' port in the Unlock Continent. He wants to draw fire from the bottom of the cauldron. Emperor Marius did not ask anyone for help because of the crisis in Siyuan City. And he had dispatched all the troops that could support Siyuan City. Not only that, he also took the initiative to stand on the outermost defense line of Siyuan City, which was the front line facing the rebels. I am Marius, Emperor of the Empire. I am here. Come on. Traitors. Charge at me. Chapter 208 An Idea from a Dead Man. Chungha Town. The Lord Lord saw the smiles on the faces of Granon and Fathert. I also saw a huge fishing net falling from the sky. A large number of ambushes have also appeared in the city. Granlin's Lion Lake City flag guard appeared on the front street. And the elites, who had followed Fathert to escape from Eagle Claw Castle also came from both sides. Granlon and Fathert the Duke of Alma's son-in-law and son. Actually want to copy Alma's trick to capture Godric? But Leon, whose retreat was blocked by the city gate, did not stop. There was even a mocking smile on Liang's face. Blow the trumpet! Shoot the arrows! The Lord Lord shouted, then accelerated his horse again, rushing straight towards the direction of Grand Lawn and Fathered. Ambush me? Who doesn't have an ambush yet? Yes, who hasn't set up an ambush yet? 
Grand Long did not seal off Changhe Town. The escorts of Changhe Express had received orders to ambush in the city a few hours ago. If there really were no manpower prepared in Changhe Town, the Lord would not dare to approach Changhe Town with only such a few people. In fact, Liang really didn't expect that Grand Long could actually put aside their previous differences and form an alliance with Father. However, do you want to deal with Leon the same way Duke Alma dealt with Godric? Godric came with Leon. And he was a few miles away. Of course Godric mentioned it to Leon when he was covered by a fishing net in Chunga Town. And he said it just an hour ago. There was someone beside him who had been fooled before. How could Leon fall into the same ambush? Besides, Alma was fully armed at first. And he didn't dare to get close to the highly skilled Godric. But Granon and Father were only a few dozen meters away from Leon at this time. Moreover, they were neither riding horses nor wearing armor at this moment. So they could not run or fight. But they closed the city gate. If this fishing net couldn't catch Leong, then I'm afraid it shouldn't be said that they locked Leong in the city. It seems that they locked themselves and Leong together. Although the city gate behind the Lord was closed, it did not prevent the troops from blowing the horns. At the same time, the Nolder guards who followed Leong into the city all shot shining silver Nolder arrows. Dozens of the Shurhu city heavy cavalry on the front fell down under a wave of arrows, including men and horses. The heavy cavalry at the front fell into a row on the street. At the same time, the sound of killings broke out in the city. Changhe Express's escorts rushed out from three directions, catching Grand Lan and fathered off guard. The escorts came out from behind their troops. Eric was the first to charge with his sword. The smiles on their faces disappeared instantly. Now, it seems that Liang's troops surrounded them. Moreover, before the huge fishing net landed on Liang's head, Liang had already rushed to a distance of only 30 meters away from them. Now the fishing net has indeed fallen. But it was crushed together by more than a dozen sharp knives raised from Liang's side almost instantly. It basically did not form an effective obstacle. Liang still charged with a small piece of broken fishing net hanging on his body. Without even a horse. How to stop? What to do when faced with fishing nets falling from the sky? Cut it off. As long as the weapons are sharp enough and the mentality is stable enough. The fishing net cannot cover people while charging and cutting at the same time. But it won't work if you just stand there. If you really wait for it to fall and catch yourself. People will tighten the net rope. If your hands and feet are restrained at that time. You won't be able to cut even if you want. As long as people entering the city are mentally prepared. This tactic of covering people with fishing nets is actually not that effective. This is not a steel mesh. Besides, the guards around Leong are all Nolder Rangers with nimble skills and sharp swords. They are not the slow and heavy iron cans. Surrender or die! While shouting, Leong continued to rush towards Grand Lan and Father, who were turning around and running away, and casually threw aside a small piece of broken net hanging on his body. Leong didn't dismount at all. The spacious streets of Chang'e Town were enough for the horse to run. In fact, the heavy cavalry of Shurhu City on the opposite side were also riding horses but they could not rush over at this time. The Lord asked the Nolder Rangers to fire arrows immediately in order to kill the heavy cavalry in the front row and let the ownerless horses and corpses block the opponent's charge. Although the street is spacious, it is not a plain after all. Dozens of corpses are enough to make the heavy cavalry unable to run for a while. As long as these heavy cavalry fail to speed up and form a charge in the first place, they will never be able to run again because the Nolder Rangers will create more and more corpses. The Nolder Rangers who had just fought in the street fighting at Talon Castle knew very well how to hinder the enemy. The Nolder Rangers in the back row had already dismounted consciously and jumped up to the roof in two or two. In fact, Nolder Rangers prefer to fight on foot most of the time because their equipment is light and their skills are flexible enough. Although they can all ride horses, riding horses tends to limit their advantages. Besides, they are not good at using long pole weapons. They will fight on horseback only when they need to mount and shoot. The real advantages of the Nolder Rangers are their superb archery skills, their lightweight, their agility, and their quick feet. Just like now, the Nolder easily climbed onto the roof and occupied a favorable position. But Father's armored archers had no intention of getting on the roof. They did not dare to go up and could easily fall down. This is the advantage of lightweight and flexible steps. The weight of the Nolder's equipment is half lighter than that of a human archer. The total weight of the entire body, including underwear, is only 30 pounds. This includes a full quiver of 32 arrows. Nolder arrows are relatively heavy. And a quiver of Nolder arrows is enough. There are 8 pounds. The Nolder Ranger's armor is very strange. 
It is a set of sigil armor weighing only a dozen pounds. It is clearly cloth armor. But it has the defensive power of plate armor and the buffering effect of cloth armor. This is enchanted equipment. In addition, their swords, shields and bows are relatively light. And the hoods they wear on their heads make the whole set quite lightweight. Moreover, all the Nolder elves are slender and slim. Not very big. Even the male Noldo weighs at most 150 pounds including the person and equipment. So he is considered relatively strong. Rasadalin is the strongest among the Noldor, but he only weighs 120 pounds, or 55 kilograms without weight. For adult male humans, this is definitely too light a constitution. But all the Noldor elves are like this, and the Noldor still have great power despite their thin appearance. This is probably caused by the environment. They often appear in virgin forests and need to jump up and down the branches of big trees. It is really inconvenient to be too heavy. He has a light load, is agile and is used to fighting on swaying branches. Now it is very easy to get on a roof or something. But human warriors are not so convenient. The average human archer, including the person and equipment, must weigh at least more than 200 pounds. Only a strong man with enough strength can become a qualified archer. No matter what, he is not much lighter. In addition, after all the weight of the equipment is there. Moreover, it is difficult for humans to learn the light steps of the Noldor. Therefore, it is quite difficult for humans to fight on the roof. The load-bearing capacity of roofs, these days, is not very good. There are just a few wooden beams covered with wooden boards or clay tiles. If you are not careful, you will definitely step on a big hole and fall. Go. However, the Nolder Rangers have been accustomed to moving in trees since childhood. Over the past hundred years, they have naturally developed extremely light footsteps. As long as the Nolder can theoretically bear the weight of their bodies, the Nolder can basically move freely on it. Action. This gives the Nolder Rangers a great advantage in places with complex terrain. The terrain cannot restrict them at all. As we all know, a battle is basically half won if the location is favorable. If there is another personal draw, then we will basically win. The situation was now favorable. With the Nolder Rangers at a high vantage point, and the bodyguards behind the enemy, there are people and people. Chungha Town is Liang's home field. And since he is fighting against rebellion, the local nobles and civilians will support him. In addition, if this battle lasts longer, Godric will realize that something is wrong and will definitely come to reinforce him. As for the weather, no need. There are no enemies anyway. Surrender or die. Seeing that Leon was about to rush in front of them, Granlon and Father could only retreat step by step. The expressions on their faces fell. They neither expected that Leon would stop for a moment when facing the fishing nets. Nor did they expect that there was such a large and well-equipped army in the city. Wait! Leon! You don't want to lose both sides! Do you? Fawcett shouted, turning around and taking a few steps back, waving his hands. He knew Liang's skills after being captured once by Leon, and knew that he couldn't run away or fight. So his reaction was obviously much faster than Granlon. Granlon glanced at Father with some surprise, hesitated, and slowed down a little. Tell your troops to lay down their weapons. Leon shouted as he galloped past Father and directly chased Granlon. Ah! I surrender! Granlon looked back and saw that Liang's sword had been raised. So Granlon immediately knelt on the ground and raised his hand. Both are talented people who understand current affairs. This carefully arranged ambush ended quickly and hastily. The two leaders surrendered. And their troops certainly could not resist to the end. Father! Tell me! What do you think? Didn't you defect to Ursula? Why are you still causing trouble in Chang'e town? Leon grabbed one by one and dragged Father and Grand Lawn to the base of the city wall for interrogation on the spot. Ursula? Huh? She and Keldrin set up a trap for me, throwing me at Talon Castle to resist the Crow Kingdom's army. I even want her life now. Fawcett heard Ursula's name and his teeth itched with hatred. Oh! What's more? I thought you captured Ketalan's Talon Fort. Then where did Ketalan go? Leon really didn't know that there was such a thing. Brennus didn't mention it when he was at Eagle Claw Castle. And Leon had never seen Ketalan. He only knew that there was such a person. Who knows? If I find him, I have to kill him. Yes, Ketalan is the real bastard. Granlon was also scolding beside him. Okay, let me explain your affairs first. I hope you can survive until it's time to kill him. Leon frowned. It seemed that these two guys came together because of the same hatred. In fact it is. After leaving the battlefield of Eagle Claw Fort, Granlon and Father arrived at the same place. Pain Village. 
the two of them were indeed familiar with the terrain around Sherhu City. And even their running routes were similar. They had rescued each other before at Eagle Claw Castle. And now after meeting each other, both of them were yelling at Kedron. This hatred of the same enemy really made them think of the same fallen people in the world feel. In fact, they don't have much hatred towards each other. If there is any hatred for killing his wife, there is really no mention of it. If Grandron really had such deep feelings for Nelda, he would start a mutiny in Sherhu City. What caused their conflict was just that both of them lacked a sense of security. Fawcett killed Nelda and captured Lion Lake City. Of course, he would want to kill Granlon so as not to increase hidden dangers. Of course, Granlon could not sit still and wait for death. But now that Sherhu City has been lost, the two of them have calmed down. After communicating with each other, they both felt that they had been tricked by Ketalan. Ketalan had no good intentions from the beginning. So the two decided not to kill each other until they killed Kedron. And their current situation is not very good. It goes without saying that Father is a traitor. And Granron deceived Godric into using the King's Seal to get to Longla Town. He also knew that he would inevitably face the pursuit of the kingdom. So they decided to cooperate and planned to go to Chunga Town first. At least to survive first. Later, they met an acquaintance in Chunga Town. Who gave them an idea to set up a trap in Chunga Town. He asked Granlon to act with Father in the same way he deceived Leon before in front of the city gate. That is to say, Grandron's previous rhetoric claimed that he did not commit treason, but only captured the rebel leader Father and regained the gold seal for the king. But the gold seal can only be given to the king. So he has been waiting for the king to come to take over Chungha Town in person. If anyone dares to attack, Chungha Town will be burned down and the city will be buried with it. This set of rhetoric failed to scare Leon because it was not prepared for Leon. This set of rhetoric was originally prepared for Brennus. They did not expect that Leon would attack Chongha Town. The two of them ran away before Leon launched the attack on Eagle Claw Fort. They only learned through the news sent back that Leon and Brennus had wiped out 5,000 Jata people and repelled the Raven army. But he didn't know that Leon could command the Nolder Elves. Nor did he know that Leon still had so many troops in the city. In their opinion, there are sure who city flag guards and father's troops in Chongha Town totaling nearly 900 elite troops. Although the more than 500 newly recruited mercenaries escaped secretly a few days ago. Even so, in the Lion Kingdom, only Brennus or the king himself should be able to capture the city. And it was indeed the Eagle Claw Fort that Brennus led the team to before. In fact, their judgment was correct. The main force arranged by King Ulrich to rebel was indeed Duke Brennus. Brennus originally planned to raise thieves in Chang'e Town so he arranged for an undercover agent in advance. But now, Brennus made a deal with Leon, and then sent an undercover agent to scrape the land in Lion Lake City. It was Leon who came to Chang'e Town. In fact, even their ambush in the city was not originally prepared for Leon. If Brennus comes, the Duke will not benefit even if he captures Chang'e Town. And it is impossible for Chang'e Town to conquer the drought. Plan. They would not enter the city if they could not attack it and the fishing nets and ambush they arranged were not for Brennus. Sooner or later, Brennus will definitely let someone inform the king and prompt the king to come in person to take over. Chungha Town is the king's direct jurisdiction, and the king's seal must always be withdrawn. Ulrich could take back the king's seal and resolve the rebellion with just one visit. This was actually a good deal. And Ulrich himself would not refuse it. Then Grand Ron and Fawcett would stage another scene in the city and capture the king in ambush. Dot that's it. We didn't expect you to come. But after seeing your flag, we had to try to see if we could stop you. But we found that you don't have many troops and your attitude is very firm. It seems that you can't be deceived. So I deliberately asked you to charge. Hoping to catch you by force first. I didn't expect you to have an ambush in the city. Fawcett finished talking about the plan with a bitter look on his face. Although Grandron's rhetoric seems a bit crude. If it is used on Brennus, it might actually be effective because Brennus had no intention of taking down Lona Town. Nothing is gained. He originally wanted to collude with the inside and outside to scrape the land. So Brennus might extort a sum of money first, or let undercover agents rob Chang'e Town. But no matter what, after he gets enough benefits, he will probably let the king make a trip. Unfortunately, Brennus didn't come, but Leon came. Only Leon will not be fooled by his rhetoric, because Leon is a rebel, and the rebel territory he independently recovered can be legally occupied. If Leon captures Chang'e Town, King Ulrich will at most find someone to share Liang's power, or increase the tax requirements of Chang'e Town, but he will not let Leon get nothing. 
Otherwise it will be difficult for him to be the king. Only Leon will really capture Changla town. Do you want to capture the king and then defect to other countries? But if that's the case, no country in this continent would dare to truly accept you. Who gave you this bad idea? Listening to these two people talking about this simple but somewhat feasible plan, Leon was a little confused about capturing the king. Once this happened, any country would regard them as enemies. Which king dares to accept a lord who has captured the king and defected to him? Aren't you afraid that you will fall into the same situation in the future? No. It's not about defecting to another country. Dot, but Alan Rick. Dot, His Royal Highness will sign a contract of immunity with us. Father shook his head. We also understand that if King Ulrich is captured and defected to other countries, he will definitely die soon. This is indeed possible. If they could capture the king, their negotiating partner would become Prince Alanric. Because Prince Alanric is likely to take the throne immediately because the king is captured by the rebels. It is indeed possible to exonerate them by using King Ulrich in exchange for Prince Alanric's pardon for them. As long as they do not harm Ulrich at all. As long as Alanric is willing to sign a contract of immunity with them. The two rebels will not only survive, but they will not lose their noble status. Catching people with fishing nets is indeed a reasonable way that will not harm Ulrich at all. And if Ulrich was released after being captured, it would definitely be impossible for him to regain the throne. It was a good plan for Prince Alanric to ascend to the throne without harming his father. Alanric, that makes sense. Who gave you the idea? Is this guy in the city? Leon understood and asked about the person behind the scenes. Igor, Grand Bachelor Igor. But he is not here now. He said he was going back to Lion City to prepare a contract. Gremlin explained. How is this possible? Igor is dead. I killed him. How could a dead man give you advice? Liang's expression changed drastically. Igor was shot to death in Chicha Fortress and died in front of him. Two masters, one Deer and Wendy Fei, shot it together. One arrow pierced the chest and the other hit the throat. Both places were fatal and he ran out of breath on the spot. How could he still be alive? Chapter 209 Heresy and Twilight Lord Leong, I swear Dot that is really Igor himself. Fawcett and Grand Lawn looked at each other, their voices obviously trembling. I can also swear that I really killed him. Leong frowned and thought for a while, then turned to Grand Long and asked, You just said that he went to prepare a contract? When can he come to Changna Town again? If nothing else happens, he will come in two or three days. After all, we don't dare to attack the king without seeing the absolution contract first. Granlon answered quickly. He also saw Leon's face and realized that Igor should really be dead. In this incomprehensible situation, he seemed quite cooperative. Well, regardless of whether Igor is dead or alive, we must catch him anyway. Leon thought for a while, looked back at the fishing net fragments on the ground behind him, and asked, Granlon, where is the king's seal? Your Excellency Leong, if I hand over the king's seal, I'm afraid I will die. Right. When asked about this, Grand Long was not so cooperative. He looked at Leong and shook his head. I want to live. Oh, hand over the golden seal, and I promise to give you a way to survive. Leong sighed. He really didn't want to kill Grand Long without any grudge. Grand Long himself had never done anything harmful to nature or harm Leong. There was no need to kill anyone. Lord Leong, I know what my crime is. Just because I know it, I have never admitted it and will try my best to make up for it. It's not that I don't believe you. I just don't believe that I can do anything else. A way to survive. Grand Long smiled bitterly, still shaking his head. Since you knew the crime, how dare you arrogantly use the king's authority? Leon replied angrily. Before, father planned to eliminate all hidden dangers in Lion Lake City. In order to save my life, I had no choice but to leave Lion Lake City. I deceived Lona Town from Lord Godric. It was out of helplessness. After all, the Lion Lake City flag guard was impossible. Follow a wanderer. And if I lose this army, I will definitely die. So I have to find a base. Using the King's Seal to control the King's direct territory was my only option at the time. And I could still give back. The opportunity to go to Lion Lake City. Father would have been willing to exchange territory with me. Grandron didn't seem to regret his decision at that time, but looked at Father mid-sentence. Fawcett also sighed beside him. He didn't lie. Of course, I would be happy to trade Shurhu City for Changna Town. After all, I have been the administrator here for so long, and I must join Ursula at that time. I understand. This is likely to lead to an attack from the Crow Kingdom. 
but it is safer in Long River Town. I just didn't expect the Crow Army to come so fast. And I didn't expect that bastard Kedron to let us go to Eagle Claw Castle to negotiate just to trick us there. Stop the enemy. Fortunately, I called him my uncle for 20 years. Fawcett was indeed caught by Granlon after he held Alma's funeral in Long River. The two reached a consensus in Chang'e Town and negotiated a deal. Father exchanged Shuru City for Chang'e Town in Granlon's hands. For Granlon, this can solve the problem of his arrogance of using the king's seal to defraud the city. Granlon will give the gold seal to Fawcett. And Fawcett will bear the crime. Anyway, Fawcett is guilty of killing his relatives. He defected to Ursula again. He was already treasonous. But holding the king's seal in his hand allowed him to negotiate terms. For Fawcett, he had killed too many brothers and sisters in Shurhu City. And it was inevitable that some members of his family would seek revenge on him. It would be better to take his trusted family members and the army to Chang'e Town, where he served as acting ruler for a period of time. I am no stranger to this place either. This is a way that benefits both of them. But the problem is that the two of them don't trust each other very much. In fact, the grudge between the two of them originally originated from mutual distrust. So, they decided to let Kedron be the middleman. Kedron had a good relationship with both of them. With such a middleman, the two of them would feel at ease about the transaction. But Kedron said that the Raven Kingdom army might be coming soon. And he couldn't get away from Eagle Claw Fort. He hoped that the two of them would take the army to Eagle Claw Fort to fight against the enemy with him first. And complete the deal at the same time. On the one hand, guarding Eagle Claw Fort is equivalent to protecting Lion Lake City. Which is the hometown of the two of them. And they are indeed willing to protect it. Besides, the heavy cavalry of the Lion Lake City Flag Guard are definitely going to defend their hometown. Granlon couldn't afford to lose this force. So he had to go. On the other hand, Ursula also expressed her hope that Fawcett would fight against the Crow Army. And Ursula was indeed at Talon Castle at the time. Because they have to fight the Crow Army together. Ursula's rebels can form an alliance with the Lion Kingdom. And Fawcett, who has taken refuge in Ursula, will no longer be chased by the Lion Kingdom. Fawcett had come to Ursula for this purpose. So he had to go too. So the two took their troops to Eagle Claw Castle. And while they were engaging in battle with the Crow Kingdom's troops, Ketalun slipped away to Lion Lake City. They all indeed made the most reasonable judgment under the circumstances. And no one was stupid. And now, they are still awake. Although the Golden Seal is Granlin's trouble. It is also his amulet. Of course, he is unwilling to hand it over. Granlon! Actually, for me, if you don't hand over the Gold Seal, I can kill you dot whether the king has a seal to use. It doesn't have any impact on me. Liang started to bluff. If you captured Chunga Town, but said you didn't find the seal, then everyone would suspect that you were hiding the Golden Seal for evil purposes. Master Liang, don't bluff me. I know that as long as I don't hand over the seal. I won't die. Liang's bluff failed as soon as it started. And Granlon was sober that he was not fooled at all. Father, you cooperate with him. You should also know where that thing is. Right. If he hides it from you, how will your cooperation be maintained? Seeing that Grand Long was difficult to deal with, Liang changed his target and used provocation this time. Lord Liang, there is no need for me to know this. And I didn't ask. I can only cooperate with him now. However, although I want to kill Ursula right away, I am still her vassal. She is an ally of the Lion Kingdom. So I will definitely not die if I fall into the hands of the Lord of the Lion Kingdom. So don't scare me. Fawcett also saw clearly. So he was the first to surrender. Indeed, Ursula is now an ally of the Lion Kingdom. Even if Fawcett is a traitor to the Lion Kingdom, no one will kill him during the alliance. After all, Lion Lake City has returned to the hands of the Lion Kingdom. And there is no need for the Lion Kingdom to turn Ursula, an ally, into an enemy. At most, he could be locked up first and wait for the queen to settle the accounts. Or he might be released by the queen. If Ursula becomes King Ulrich's queen, then father will most likely be pardoned. You really don't know? Then why do you take this risk with him? Your life is not in danger now. These two guys are difficult to deal with. And Liang is a little troubled. As expected, every noble is a human being. And no one is stupider than the other. I want to return to the kingdom of lions. Ursula's insidious woman can deceive me once, and she will deceive me a second time. My declaration of allegiance to her is just a temporary measure. Lord Leon, don't ask me. I really didn't know. I understand now that sometimes knowing less can lead to a longer life. Fawcett shook his head and smiled bitterly. 
looking very sincere. It seems that these days, the then dandy young master is indeed growing up rapidly. Not only has he become ruthless, but he has also really learned a lot of truth. Let's do this. I will give you a way to completely wash away your sins and ensure that you can still be the nobles of the Lion Kingdom. But you must cooperate with me well, and the gold seal must be handed over to me intact. Both of them were difficult to deal with. So Leon had to sincerely give them a way out. In what way? Both of them are interested. And this is what they are pursuing. It would be better if they don't have to kidnap the king. I probably know what happened when Igor came back from the dead. Leon could indeed guess what happened to Igor's resurrection from the dead. After all, he had seen the three prophets use the body of the doom inducer to resurrect the corpse. This is probably with the help of the power of the dark goddess Arida. According to what Sarah knew back then, probably only those who wholeheartedly believe in the dark goddess Arida can resurrect from the dead in this way without losing their sanity. It is estimated that Igor is also a senior member of the heretical sect known as the Dark Goddess. Recalling Igor's appearance, he was thin and withered, as if a gust of wind could blow him over. His whole body was weak, and even his hair was withered. Igor is only in his forties, but he looks like he is in his seventies. When he first saw him in the throne room, Leon felt something was wrong. Now that I think about it, I'm afraid he dedicated all his blood to the Dark Goddess. Right? After settling in Chang'e Town, Leon did not fly his flag in Chang'e Town and basically did not show up. He was just constantly arranging tasks for the escorts of Chang'e Express. And one fleet after another drove to all directions in the west. Godric checked into his eastern warmaster's office again and did not show up. Grand Lon and Father, on the other hand, have been maintaining law and order in the city. After hearing Liang's plan, they acted very cooperatively. Leon told them about the abilities of the three prophets. And of course, these two people would cooperate. After all, they really don't want to have anything to do with heretics. Three days later, Leon hid in a corner of the city wall and saw Igor's arrival with his own eyes. This is indeed the Igor from before. He is still wearing the aristocratic collar tightly around his neck. It is early September and the weather is very hot. But this guy has his collar wrapped around it as if it were winter. This must be to cover up the collar on his neck. Arrow wound. Today, Igor seems very low-key with only five or six followers. But those followers look mysterious. Those entourages were all knights wearing black hoods. And basically every knight wore a black robe. The robe looked a bit like the style from Dexia. But these people were definitely not Dexia people. Moreover, each of these knights has two horses, and another pack horse should carry their armor. Of course, they wouldn't wear armor when they were on the road. But Leon could tell from the expressions and movements of these people that they should all have extraordinary skills. Granlon stepped forward to welcome Igor into the city. And then the city gate fell. A big net also fell at the same time. When Igor saw the net, he subconsciously glanced at the top of his head. Because this idea was originally his. Granlon! Don't you want to live anymore? Igor danced and shouted. But he was obviously unable to avoid the area covered by the fishing net. Granlon watched expressionlessly as the fishing net fell down and caught Igor. Enjoy your own ideas. And Igor was easily caught in the net. The entourage led by Igor was also cut off by the city gate, and the two who were at the back failed to enter the city. This is not an intentional truncation. After all, there are only so many people in Igor. The city gate was closed just in case. No one was sure whether this guy, who had come back from the dead could escape from the fishing net. So his escape path had to be cut off. Then, a group of soldiers emerged from all corners and began to close the net. The purpose of using a net to capture Igor was of course to avoid him getting into any trouble. After all, Leon was not sure what other strange abilities these heretics would have. However, Igor doesn't seem to have any special abilities. On the contrary, the knights he brought showed extremely strong combat effectiveness. There were four knights following Igor into the city. They were several meters away from Igor, and not within the scope of the fishing net. And these people are indeed very skilled. They reacted immediately to the unexpected situation and all drew their swords and rushed towards Igor. It seems like you want to save someone? The people in charge of closing the net were all fathered soldiers. Seeing this, they immediately dragged the net and started running back, lest the net be cut and Igor would be released into trouble. But no one expected that the few followers Igor brought did not seem to intend to cut through the net. The knight running at the front simply threw the sword in his hand. Throw it at Igor. Damn it. This is going to silence you. This situation of cannibalism caught Leon. Gronlong and others a little unprepared. They didn't originally plan to kill these people. 
They really didn't expect that Igor's guards would react like this. Are you going to kill Igor after seeing him being caught in a net? That certainly won't let them get what they want. Fortunately, the thrown sword bounced off the flexible fishing net rope and only caused a cut to Igor. It should not be fatal. But Igor seemed to have no reaction and did not struggle. Igor did not faint. His eyes were still open. But he did not cry out in pain at all and did not even have an instinctive contraction reaction. He felt no pain now. But his eyes still retained the look of fear. And it seemed that he himself didn't expect those knights to kill him. The soldiers who were encircling him had already surrounded him. But the knights in black were still chasing Igor. It seemed that they would rather die themselves than kill Igor first. Leon originally planned to watch the show on the city wall. In this situation, he could only run down quickly. But he felt that it might be too late. The soldiers who were in charge of closing the net pulled the rope of the net. They were several meters away from Igor in the net. And they had no time to stop the knights in black. But they were all elite veterans of Father's Command. And they dragged the net back quite quickly. Which prevented Igor from being hacked to death on the spot. Everyone knows that the person who is captured alive with a net must be for questioning. So of course, he cannot be allowed to die. Although Igor was dragged for more than 10 meters on the uneven road paved with stone slabs and must have been rubbed badly, he managed to save his life. The knights in black were now blocked. However, what is unexpected is that blocking the other black clothed knights, Wang Qian's seduction, Nawei's hand, and the hand pulling force were all blocked. It was a middle aged knight with a beard on his face. He seemed to be quite skilled. He actually blocked three other knights by himself. Jocelyn! What are you going to do? The other knights brought by Igor didn't seem to expect that the bearded man would stop them at this juncture. And they all looked shocked and angry. What are you doing? You do these shameful things every day. And you have to die for such shameful things. How can I be complicit with you again? The bearded man named Jocelyn roared loudly, swept the broadsword in his hand, and forced the three black knights back. Jocelyn had already stood in front of Igor. Traitor! You will regret it! The three knights in black launched an attack on Jocelyn together. But there was obviously a big gap between them and Jocelyn's martial arts. Even though they were three against one, they still could not break through Jocelyn's obstacles. At this time, Father's other men finally surrounded them. Leon had also run down the stairs inside the city wall at this time, holding a sword in his hand. Put down your weapons! I won't kill you! Leon shouted to those knights. He felt that this matter was getting complicated and wanted to give more lives. I surrender. I am not on the same side as them. Jocelyn readily dropped his sword and raised his hand, not intending to resist at all. He also took a few steps back to allow the soldiers to more easily surround the other three knights. Outside the city gate, the other two knights in black, who had been left unattended, have now begun to run away. It will be difficult to chase after the city gate is closed for a while. The archers from the city tower are shooting arrows at them. However, since it is inconvenient for the Nolder Rangers to appear here, the archers on the city wall are all father's people. If Leon's men appear near the city gate, then Igor will definitely not enter the city. Maybe far away if you see it from a distance, you will turn around and run away. Therefore, there were only a few fierce Lion Realm archers on the city tower, and their skills were relatively rough. Although they shot and wounded two knights in black, they still ran away. After all, they are riding horses and can run quite fast. And bows and arrows are not the traditional strengths of the Lion Kingdom. It is difficult to describe the level of these Lion Kingdom archers under Fathered. Jocelyn! Traitors will not end well! The three knights in black looked very determined. They ignored Leon and rushed towards Jocelyn resolutely to kill Igor and silence him. They wanted to kill Jocelyn, who dropped his sword. But such an action was tantamount to suicide. The soldiers stabbed each other with spears and the three knights in black fell. There was no way. They were completely fighting to the death, and the soldiers did not dare to stop. Those are the Twilight Knights! Right! Leon glanced at Jocelyn, who was showing his honesty with his hands spread out, then walked to Igor with a frown, and nudged Igor with his toe. Who are you? Igor? Why do the Twilight Knights want to do this? Kill you and silence you? Chapter 210 Jocelyn Who are you? Igor looked at Leon, and gave an extremely surprising answer. He shrank in the net and couldn't move. But it seemed as if he didn't recognize Leon at all. And the eyes he looked at Leon showed no emotion at all. You actually don't remember me. The Lord Lord saw that Igor's expression was completely unique when facing strangers. Can you even forget to kill your own enemies? Is this still Igor himself? Leon kicked Igor again. 
and what he received in exchange was another emotionless sentence. You will regret it. Has Igor become a fool? He may have lost most of his soul. He was probably dead to begin with. Jocelyn said something next to her. Igor is indeed a dead man. Jocelyn had just used actions to prove that he had different ideas from these people. And he still kept spreading his hands. So fathered and Grand Lawn did not tie him up. However, there were still several soldiers around who pointed their spears at him uneasily. Leon turned his head. You know the inside story? What's going on? Sir, since you are arresting heretics, of course I am happy to tell you everything, but I need your protection. If you are willing. Jocelyn obviously saw that Leon was the leader here, but he probably thought that Leon used the net to catch Igor to catch the heretic. With your skills, do you still want to seek asylum? Why? The one who spoke was fathered who had already asked several soldiers to tie up Igor. I don't want to associate with heretics. I originally planned to take advantage of this mission to leave the Twilight Nights. But two witnesses just ran away outside. I will be regarded as a traitor. They always go to great lengths to hunt down traitors. Jocelyn sighed. And this is not the only night group chasing me. I originally escaped here from Barclay. But now, the continent of Pender is also very dangerous for me. He took off his black hood and threw it to the ground revealing white skin with blue blood vessels clearly visible on the sides of his cheeks. A high nose bridge. And deep set eye sockets. This was indeed a typical feature of the Barclay nobles. Father! Take Igor to the inner castle first. Leong nodded towards Kaiselin. I happen to be in need of manpower. It's no problem to give you a suitable job. Come with me. In the inner castle of Chongha town. Jocelyn told his story to the lord. Jocelyn was originally a knight of Buckley. A minor noble. But unfortunately, he was deprived of his noble status a few years ago and was hunted down. The reason is simple. He was designated as a heretic by the Knights of the Dawn. But in fact, Jocelyn did not do anything related to heresy back then. The reason why he was accused of being a heretic was simply because he had inadvertently helped a Ficavian. The Ficavia woman was simply lost and out of food and water. So out of chivalry's virtue Jocelyn sent the stranger to the port. But the Ficavians actually have nothing to do with heresy. They are a small country isolated overseas and ruled by women. The biggest difference from other countries is that this country is a feminist society. In other words, in Ficavia, except for giving birth, women do men's things and men do women's things. But this is just a difference in the history and culture of this country and has nothing to do with faith. However, the Knights of the Dawn believe that in a country like Ficavia, where men have low status and are easily castrated, all people are heretics. And those who help heretics are naturally heretics. And heretics must of course be burned to death. Anyway, anyone who is different from them is called heresy. And the Dawn Idiot group has always been like this. Of course Jocelyn was not convinced. No one would be convinced by this kind of unjust, false and wrongful conviction. He was a noble after all. So he took the initiative to seek a trial decision. But at that time, the Knights of the Dawn had considerable influence in Buckley. Not only did Jocelyn fail to be cleared in the Inquisition, but he was officially deprived of his noble status. Jocelyn was helpless. He didn't expect that his good deeds of helping others would lead to such disaster. But the reality was so ridiculous. In order not to be burned to death, he had to rely on his own skills to escape from his hometown. Because of this incident, he was full of hatred for the Dawn Knights. So he joined the newly formed Twilight Knights and followed the Twilight Knights to the continent of Pender. The Knights of Dusk were actually separated from the Knights of Dawn. As the Knights of the Dawn gradually turned into a twisted form that killed others at will in the name of the goddess. Many members of the Knights could not stand the current atmosphere and cruelty. And serious disagreements emerged within them. This disagreement eventually broke out into a schism. And some Knights withdrew from the Knights of the Dawn and reorganized the Knights of the Dusk. Their only purpose was to confront and correct the Knights of the Dawn. The rivalry between the two Knights can actually be seen just from their names. However, a few years ago, the Buckley Empire had lost all patience with the actions of the Dawn Knights and was too lazy to pay attention to the internal affairs of the Dawn Knights. So it expelled both Dawn and Dusk Knights from the country. After being expelled from Buckley's continent, the Knights of the Dawn landed at Light Howling Bay in Fields Way and established a new garrison in Hall there. At that time, the Fields Way Alliance was not integrated into a unified country, and the local lords did not deal with the Knights of the Dawn. In fact, when the Knights of the Dawn first came to Pendor, their sanctimonious appearance did not arouse anyone's disgust. The Urzwi people initially thought they were the embodiment of justice. As a result, 
many civilians were quickly influenced by the righteous style of the dawn knight holding a torch in one hand and a sword in the other. The local Velociraptor knights were quickly conquered and fell under the command of the dawn knights. They served these fanatical knights as attendants and became the fanatics minions. The dawn Velociraptors. This allowed the knights of the dawn to gain a base in Pender continent very quickly and continued to expand and preach, becoming the colonial pioneer of the Buckley Empire. They are still powerful and continue their fire purification in Pendor, leaving a mess wherever they go. Like Sir Roland, Jocelyn is still hunted by these fanatical knights of the dawn. After all, the Dusk Knights were traitors to the Dawn Knights, and Jocelyn himself was considered a heretic. The Dusk Knights who broke away from the Dawn Knights at that time also came to Pender. Due to the small number of Dusk Knights and the constant pursuit of the Dawn Knights, they had to choose to take root in Single where various dark forces were entangled. Single is a paradise for crime. Slave trading is everywhere. And all kinds of thugs are everywhere. Of course, fanatics who flaunt justice like the Dawn Knight dare not approach here. In order to grow in strength as quickly as possible to compete with the Dawn Knights, the Dusk Knights had to lower their standards for joining the group. So various criminals, killers, gangsters, including nomads from the Dexia tribe, as long as you are willing to follow the Twilight Knight, almost anyone can join. This allowed the scale of the Twilight Knights to expand rapidly. But it also made the quality of its members uneven. In addition, in order to understand why the Knights of Dawn have such a twisted obsession with heresy, the Dusk Knights plan to study the heresy theoretically. They seek to discover the fundamental nature of the heresy in order to correct the order of the Dawn and better combat the heresy. The starting points are all good. But the problem is that due to the hasty recruitment of a large number of personnel of worrying quality, coupled with a proactive contact with heretics, this has actually given the heretics an opportunity to take advantage of them. In just a few years, heretical ideas have penetrated into the Twilight Knights. And many Twilight Knights have been corrupted by heretics. In addition, the environment in a place like Single can easily have a negative impact on people. As a result, the beliefs and purposes of the Twilight Knights quickly changed. In order to strengthen their strength and fight against the Knights of the Dawn, they used the method of the Knights of the Dawn. Those who did not agree with their statement would use swords and maces to convince them. In fact, researchers from the Twilight Knights have indeed uncovered some heretical theories in the past few years. But these discoveries have made them even more confused. Because the more they study, the more they feel that the goddess of justice and the goddess of darkness may be one and the same. In fact, this is really possible. From the perspective of the Lord, light and darkness should be one. After all, these two goddesses even have the same sacrificial inscriptions. Justice or not is inherently relative. The Knights of Twilight also changed as a result, and most of them began to fully believe in the dark goddess Arida. But unlike the heretics, they believe that the goddess of justice Astalia and the goddess of darkness Arida are twins. Therefore, in the Hall of the Twilight Knights, there is a statue of a god with both sides, because they feel that this is the correct belief. Since justice and darkness are one, then believing in Arita will not violate the oath once made to the goddess of justice. But at the same time, you can get the favor of the goddess of darkness. They do not consider themselves heretics. But they no longer fight against heretics. And will even help them in many cases. Moreover, their behavior began to move closer to heresy. For example, they would cause massacres among innocent people and offer the flesh and blood of the dead to the goddess to see if they could harness the power of the dark goddess. For another example, Study the sacrificial rituals of the Dark Goddess and try to see if you can summon a powerful undead demon. The uneven quality of personnel has gradually led them to the same extreme as the Knights of the Dawn. But to another extreme. For Knights like Jocelyn, the Dusk Knights have become another kind of Dawn Knights. Now they are no different from heretics. This time, our mission is to protect Igor when he comes to Chang'e Town. There are not many people dispatched. So I plan to take the opportunity to break away from the Twilight Knights. After Jocelyn finished talking about himself and the Twilight Knights, he started to talk about his mission this time. Igor is not one of yours. Right. How did you get together? Leong didn't quite understand. He knew that Igor was probably not a member of the Twilight Knights. Sir, I am no longer a member of the Twilight Knights. Jocelyn expressed her objection to Leong using the title, you, and then looked at Igor, who was tied up in the hall. That Igor may be a heretical priest, and his organization masters some heretical witchcraft. Former a few days ago, he went to Single to find cooperation with the Twilight Knights. It is said 
that his organization is willing to use this method of resurrection from the dead in exchange for the knights to provide them with troops. And the order we received is to follow and protect him. But if he, if he is caught, he must die. The dark goddess Erida can resurrect people from the dead. This is of course a very important reason why heretics can recruit followers. Even the most important reason. Of course the Twilight Knights want to find out the reason. And I'm afraid it's not just for the sake of finding out. What is the specific content of the cooperation between the heretics and the Twilight Knights? With your skills, you shouldn't be an unknown person in the Twilight Knights. How did you get sent as a bodyguard? When the Lord came down the stairs of the city wall, he saw Jocelyn fighting one against three. I only know that the Twilight Knights sent most of the knights to the Lion City. It is said that this matter has something to do with the Prince of the Lion Kingdom. And it is also related to the witchcraft of resurrection. But I really don't know the more specific content of the cooperation. No. Jocelyn shook his head inside. I was deprived of my noble status when I joined the Twilight Knights. They can continue to call me a knight and still make me a knight instead of a slave. This is already my skill. This is the greatest benefit it can bring. I am not a senior official. And I am not even the captain of the team of knights protecting Igor. Then, why did I have to kill Igor after he was caught? You should know this. Right. Leon nodded. He knew that Jocelyn was not lying. If he really were a high-level official, he would not be sent as a bodyguard. I really don't know about this. Within the Twilight Nights, orders from superiors do not allow us to inquire about the specific reasons. A trace of helplessness appeared on Jocelyn's face. Leon nodded. After receiving the order, he could only execute it and could not ask for the reason. This was normal operation for most regular legions. You said before that Igor may have lost most of his soul. What did you mean? Leong turned to look at the silly Igor and asked Jocelyn. I don't know the specific reason. And I'm just guessing. This Igor looks a lot like the kind of heretical degenerate who came back from the dead. The Twilight Knights have studied this matter. And it is said that they sacrificed their souls to Eridar heretics will be resurrected as degenerates after death. But they abandon part of their souls. So they will forget many things after resurrection. And sometimes they will become dementia. Jocelyn thought for a while and gave an answer in a relatively easy to understand way. After finishing speaking, he added a few words. In fact, it is not a secret that heretics can be resurrected into fallen ones. Many people believe that if you want to kill the heretics completely, it is best to burn them to ashes directly with fire. If there is not enough firewood, just chop off the head. Then the head is cremated. The soul is in the head. And if all the soul is burned, they can't be resurrected. This is a common understanding among people in this era believing that the human soul is in the head and that the soul will be burned by fire. There is nothing wrong with this understanding if the soul is regarded as consciousness and memory. This is why heretics are burned at the stake, not for any sense of ritual. In fact, all the strange operating methods that have been circulated for many years were not originally for the sense of ritual, but were based on practical functions. For example, the burning stake is actually a cross made of wood. The cross-shaped wooden frame is used to nail the victim to it and burn it. Because if tied with a rope, the rope will be burned. Do you know what method their heretical organization uses to resurrect people? Is it a spell or something else? Leon particularly wanted to figure this out. He had seen the fallen ones created by the three prophets, which seemed to rely solely on pure spells. But the fallen ones created by the three prophets were not complete at all, had no sanity at all, and were completely disobedient. At best, they could only be used to scare people. In fact, in Liang's view, all the witchcraft of the three prophets are half-baked. They can summon the fallen, but cannot control them. They can change people's skin, but cannot grow with muscles. They can charm men, but rely on beauty and poison. They definitely don't have the ability to resurrect Igor into what he is now. I don't know Dot just to find out the specific method. The Twilight Knights cooperated with Igor's organization. Jocelyn shook her head directly. Okay. Jocelyn, from now on, you will become my subordinate, and I will protect you from being hunted down by the Twilight Knights. What is your position in the Twilight Knights? Recruit coach, I am responsible for training the new recruits in basic skills, but those people in single are really... Ugh. Forget it. Jocelyn shook her head as she spoke, seemingly quite dissatisfied with the new members recruited by the Twilight Knights. Then now, I will give you the same position and my recruits will definitely be much easier to discipline. I am Leong. And like you, I am also from Buckley. Jocelyn explained everything very clearly, and his sincerity was obviously enough. 
Leon also happily gave Jocelyn a position, letting him also serve as the recruit skills coach of his army. I am willing to serve you, Lord Leon. Hearing the Lord say that he was also from Buckley, Jocelyn seemed relieved and his expression became more relaxed. Jocelyn has joined your team. You go and change your clothes first. It's best to change your sword too. My subordinates can't wear the Twilight Knight's equipment. Leon waved his hand to take Jocelyn away. When Fawcett saw this, he also asked all other soldiers to leave. Jocelyn's knowledge was limited. So now she had to turn her head to study Igor without letting the soldiers be present. Yes, I can only use the word research. Because Igor is almost unable to cross-examine now. The fishing net on Igor's body had been untied. And Granlon and Father personally tied him to a chair. This was mainly to treat the wound on his body. But in fact, the long wound barely bled. Considering that this guy was resurrected from the dead. A few people didn't dig into it, compared to his bloodless wound. His current state seemed a little weirder. Igor's current appearance is similar to what Jocelyn said. He probably has indeed lost part of his soul. He has always seemed a little stupid. No matter what Leon asked, he had no reaction. At most, you can say meaningless words such as, Who are you? You will regret it. And torture is of no use. Father tried it. Even if a bamboo stick was inserted into his finger. Igor had no reaction at all. It seemed that he had lost all feeling. It feels like a walking zombie. But? Leon has seen this kind of scene before. Even Leon has seen Igor's current deathly appearance. His lips were blue. His face was pale. His hair was withered. He looked like a dead person. And he did not move. Refuse. Resist. Or cooperate. That dead face spy from the Bacchus Empire was like this back then. Presumably this is what they will become once they are injured and caught. Exactly the same. Regarding this matter, I wonder if Governor Justice of the Bacchus Empire knows the reason why the Bacchus spy was originally a subordinate of Justice. But is Igor related to Governor Justice? Probably not. Igor is the king's brother-in-law and a bachelor of the kingdom. With his status, he would not be a spy for the Bacchus Empire. But now, Igor has become like this, which has interrupted Liang's plan.